Tonight, we again present the famous Mr. Chameleon of Central Police Headquarters in his famous cases of crime and murder. Mr. Chameleon, as you know, is the famous and dreaded detective who frequently uses a disguise to track down a killer. A disguise which at all times is recognized by the audience. Tonight, we give you Mr. Chameleon in The Dusty Room Murder Case. As the curtain rises, we look into the study of an old mansion in Midtown, New York. A man about 50 sits at an old-fashioned oak desk, a telephone receiver at his ear, ready to speak the words that bring up the curtain on one of Mr. Chameleon's most interesting murder cases. The man at the desk is the wealthy inventor, Hiram Stevens, and we hear him speaking into the phone. Hello. Hello there, Fitch. Connection was broken. I'll go back to where I was. No, I didn't misunderstand you. I know exactly what I want to do. I know what you mean. Just follow out my orders. That's all you have to do. All right, then come out here. All right, Fitch, I'll be waiting for you. Uh, guess that'll fix him. Uh, okay. Hey, hey, what's that? Hey, stop it. <laughs> stop it. Stop it. <laughs> Oh, you... You murdered me. Uncle Hiram! Uncle Hiram! Uncle Hiram, is anything wrong? Open the door. I can't get in. What's the matter, Dick? I heard shots coming from Uncle Hiram's study, Tina. Now I can't get in and he doesn't answer. Well, let's go inside then, Dick. Well, how? He's evidently locked the door. Oh, here. Here's a chair. Oh. Get up on it, Dick, and look through the transom. Oh, I'd forgotten the transom. Tina! Tina! What? Uncle Hiram is slumped over his desk. He's committed suicide. Suicide? Let me get up there too, Dick. No. It's horrible. His head is almost blown off. You'd get sick. Come down from that chair, Dick. Try to break the door in. We must get in there. If you can't do it, I'll run out and call the gardener. No. Don't call anybody. I'll ring the police. Yes? You call the police? I'm Chameleon of Central Police Headquarters. This is Detective Arnold. Oh, come in. Dick! Dick, here are the police. Oh, yes. Uh, glad to meet you, Mr. Chameleon. My husband's uncle committed suicide. The last thing we ever expected of him. But he had been brooding lately. Your uncle's name was Hiram Stevens, Mr. Um... Uh, Dick Stevens, Mr. Chameleon. Will you take us to the body, please? It's... it's in that room. But you'll have to break the door down to get in. Uncle Hiram must have locked himself in first. Uh, Dave... All right, try your keys. Okay, Mr. Chameleon. The lock turns all right, but nothing happens. Hmm. Seems to be bolted from the inside. Any other way to enter this room, Dick? This is the only door, Mr. Chameleon. Let's break it in, Dave. <coughs> Here we are, Mr. Chameleon. There's the gun next to the body. I'll get it. Stay where you are, Dave. Don't walk across that floor. What? The floor and everything in this room is covered with dust. And there are no footmarks leading to the body. It's strange. It's very strange. Strange, Mr. Chameleon? What do you mean, Mr. Chameleon? I wonder how your uncle got to that desk without leaving any sign on this dusty floor. I, I suppose he was sitting at the desk and killed himself there without walking anywhere. He still had to get there somewhere. Unless... Unless what, Mr. Chameleon? Unless the murderer made a very silly mistake, you know. Murderer? M murderer, you say? Exactly, Dick. Your uncle was murdered. But how could he have been, Mr. Chameleon? That's what I'm here to find out. Dave? Yes, Mr. Chameleon? Stand in front of this door until the police photographers get here. Right. And don't let anyone enter under any circumstances. Dick, Tina? Suppose we go into the room across the hall where we can talk. Of course. Uh, come on, Tina. Won't you sit down, Mr. Chameleon? Thank you, but I'll do better standing up. Oh, that's the doorbell. I'll answer it. Detective Arnold will answer it, Tina. It's the police photographer, I'm sure. Oh. 
Can either one of you explain why the room in which your uncle Hiram Stevens was murdered was completely dust-covered? My husband's uncle was an inventor, Mr. Chameleon. It was not very tidy. That's not the point I'm getting at, Tina. I don't understand. I'll explain later. The first thing I want to know is where were both of you when the murder occurred? Dick and I were both in the house, upstairs. That's right, Mr. Chameleon. We had just come in from... from the airport. The airport? We went out to get our tickets. We're flying to Europe tomorrow. I see. Were you both together upstairs? Uh, well, uh, yes and no, Mr. Chameleon. Yes and no, Dick? Well, what I mean is Tina went into the dressing room and changed her clothes. Changed her clothes, so you were not together. Oh, what difference does that make, Mr. Chameleon? Did you change your clothes, Tina? I started to, but changed my mind. Then the clothes you are now wearing are the same ones that you had on when the murder took place. Yes. Step over to the window with me, please, in the light. In the light? Why? I can't see very well here. Come along. All right, then. Thank you. Ah. Hmm. Well, what are you looking for on my wife's clothes, Mr. Chameleon? Dust, Dick. Dust. Well, you don't see any on me, do you? No, Tina, but... Mr. Chameleon? Yes, Dave? The pictures have been taken. We used the distance lens from the door. Good. We can go into the murder room now. Come along, Dick. Tina. Mr. Chameleon, you act as if you think Dick and I know something more than we've told you. Not at all. You haven't told me anything yet. Shall I try to raise the body now, Mr. Chameleon? Uh, first make a note, Dave. This entire room is dust-covered, including the murdered man. Write that down. I have, Mr. Chameleon. Also write down every object in the room... The pictures, the two glass mirrors, the mantelpiece, even the dead man's hair. Everything is covered with a layer of dust. Set it all down, Mr. Chameleon. Everything except the murder gun. That is clean. Well, what does that mean, the gun is clean? Obviously, the murderer threw it on the desk to make it look like suicide. I tell you, Dick, Mr. Chameleon suspects you of murder. Suspects me? Why should he, Tina? Dave, let's raise the body from the chair. Yes, sir. You take this side. I'll take the other here. Exactly as I guessed, Dave. The only spot in this room that's not coated with dust is the seat on which the unfortunate man was sitting. There's no dust on the seat of his trousers. Well, I'll be... Dick... You and your wife go back into the living room. I'll see you in there in a few minutes. This is outrageous. It's a murder investigation, ma'am. Now do as Mr. Chameleon says. Oh, all right, then. We'll be in the living room, Mr. Chameleon. What's it all about, Mr. Chameleon? Those two people were at the airport arranging to fly to Europe, Dave. Uh-oh. Tomorrow. So there you are. They could have killed their rich uncle, left a perfect suicide set behind, and been off like birds in the air tomorrow. But I can't figure that dust, Mr. Chameleon. The dust, Dave, would make it seem that no one had entered or left the suicide room and that the dead man had been lying there for days. But how did all the dust get here? The dust was sprayed in here, Dave. Probably with an insecticide sprayer, like the kind used to spray plants. What do you think of that? Have the house and grounds search for the sprayer. Call headquarters right away. Shall I use this phone? Yes. Also order men with vacuum cleaners out here from headquarters. Vacuum cleaners? Mm-hmm. Have this room vacuumed. Send the dust they collect to the lab for analysis. Okay. Say, Mr. Chameleon, look here. This notepad attached to the telephone. Yes, I've already seen that, Dave. Murdered man was evidently phoning a man named Fitch just before he was killed. Yes, the pad says, call John Fitch about changing papers. I wonder what that means. While you're phoning headquarters, I'll go in to see Dick and Tina. Well, Mr. Chameleon. Yes, Dick? I've been talking to my wife, Tina. Yes? She says I should make her clean breast of one thing. Of what? She thinks I should tell you I'm the sole heir to my uncle's considerable fortune. That's interesting. Interesting? Is that all you have to say, Mr. Chameleon? There is one thing certain, Tina... If you told your husband to say that, you have supplied him with a motive for murder. What? Oh, there's the doorbell again. May I answer it this time, Mr. Chameleon? Yes, go ahead, Dick. Why, Mr. Fitch. Oh, hello, Dick. Will you tell your uncle I'm here with the papers he telephoned for? My 
My uncle has been murdered. What? Murdered? That's what I was afraid of. And the police are here. One is Mr. Chameleon. Chameleon? Yes, Mr. Fitch. And Mr. Chameleon suspects Dick of murder. That's incredible, Tina. Utterly ridiculous. Mr. Fitch, I'm Chameleon. And what is ridiculous about my suspecting Dick? Because this young man had no reason for murdering his uncle. He has every reason for wanting him alive. What reason? Well, let me explain first that I am Hiram Stevens' confidential agent. I say. And I have right here a letter giving these two young people complete control of his fabulously valuable synthetic rubber inventions. What? He phoned me this afternoon and told me he was going to sign this letter the moment I arrived here with it. And uh, here's the letter, Mr. Chameleon. Hmm. Well, oh. certainly gives Dick and Tina what's equivalent to a fortune. Exactly. So apparently Dick and Tina had no reason to murder their uncle before he signed it. It would have cost them a fortune, Mr. Chameleon. Yes, I get the point, Mr. Fitch. It seems that I'm at a dead end. I'd not say that, exactly. Mr. Fitch, if you suspect anyone, it's your duty to tell me. More than a duty, Mr. Chameleon. An obligation to a man who was very kind to me through many years of close association. Yes. And naturally, now, to save his nephew from police suspicion, and also Tina, who was my own secretary before she married Dick. Good. Whom do you suspect, Mr. Fitch? I suspect the people who would have lost the rights to the millions the murdered man was signing over to Dick and Tina. You say other people had these rights and were losing them on account of this letter? Who are they? A man named Seymour Wakefield, who was Hiram Stevens' original partner and his wife, Dona. Well, when does the wife come in? She was a rich woman when Wakefield married her, and she advanced the money to start him and Hiram in the business. I see. The point is that the murdered Hiram, who was a very changeable and eccentric man, had given them the rights that the letter you have gives to Dick and Tina. What did Hiram do? Cancel the Wakefield's rights? That's exactly what he was doing, Mr. Chameleon. Was doing, you say? Yes, here, here's the cancellation itself, duly signed by Hiram. I see. Hiram told me to give the cancellation to the Wakefields after he'd signed this letter to Tina and Dick. This is becoming very interesting. The question is, did the Wakefields know about this, Mr. Fitch? I told them myself this afternoon, and they literally flew out to see Hiram. They left my office about 30 minutes before the murder, on their way here. What it sums up to, then, Mr. Fetch, is that if Hiram had lived long enough to sign this letter to Dick and Tina, the Wakefields would have lost a fortune. Yes. And when I informed them, they said they would kill Hiram before they'd let him take the control from them. I see. Well, there's no time to waste. May I keep these papers? Certainly. Do you know where the Wakefields live? Oh, I have their address, Mr. Chameleon. I'll give it to you. Thank you, Tina. <laughs> Mr. Seymour Wakefield? Yes? I'm Chameleon of the police. This is Detective Arnold. Come in. Come. I came for some information. Yes, Mr. Chameleon? You were a partner of Hiram Stevens? I am a partner of his. Then you haven't heard that he was murdered. Murdered? Oh, that's impossible. Murdered in a dust-covered room. Before you go any further, Seymour, let me say something. Adona, uh, this is Mr. Chameleon, the detective. Uh, how do you do, Mrs. Wakefield? You were about to say... I was going to tell my husband not to say he didn't know Hiram Stevens was murdered. We both heard it on the radio. Donna, please. Acting like we don't know will only make things worse. My husband and I were at Hiram Stevens' house this afternoon. When he was murdered? No, we'd gone. What was the subject of the quarrel that you and your husband had with the murdered man? We had no quarrel. You know we did, Seymour. But it wasn't serious, Mr. Chameleon. I was informed it was because the murdered man was cancelling a paper that gave you control of his valuable synthetic rubber inventions. The only person who could have told you that was John Fitch. Did you or did you not quarrel? Well, uh, it's just as my wife says, Mr. Chameleon wasn't anything serious. The control the murdered man was cancelling was worth millions of dollars. I've seen murders committed for less than ten dollars. Mr. Chameleon, I'd like to show you something. Show me what? I'll get it from this desk. Please read this, Mr. Chameleon. It's a document from Hiram Stevens giving my husband and me complete control of his synthetic rubber invention. And it's signed by Hiram himself. Yes, I see. 
dated last year. Yes. And Hiram's signature is witnessed, you'll notice, by Mr. Fitch, who seems so eager to entangle us in a murder case. And here is a document Mr. Fitch gave me, Mrs. Wakefield. One he was on his way out to give to the murdered man. What is it? It's a letter giving control of Hiram's inventions to his niece and nephew, Tina and Dick. I don't understand. And it's dated today, Mrs. Wakefield, and it is not signed. Had Hiram Stevens lived to sign it, you would have been out a tremendous sum of money. A tremendous sum. If it's not signed, it's not worth the paper it's written on. Of course it isn't, Seymour. Mr. Chameleon knows that. I know also that it's a prime motive for murder. You think we murdered Hiram? I'm going to make an odd request of you and your husband, Mrs. Wakefield. Odd request? I'll ask you both to give the clothes you're wearing now to Detective Arnold. Also the coats both of you wore this afternoon. What for? Go to your room, please, and come back with them. Suppose we refuse. I'll take you to police headquarters and have them removed. All right. We'll give them to you. Come on, Seymour. And don't bother to brush them off. What I'm looking for won't brush off. Mr. Chameleon and the Dusty Room murder case continues in just a moment. And now back to Mr. Chameleon and the Dusty Room murder case. Hiram Stevens, a wealthy inventor, has been found murdered in a room suspiciously covered with dust. Mr. Chameleon has discovered that the murdered man was about to sign a paper taking the rights to his immensely valuable inventions away from his partner, Seymour Wakefield, and giving them to his nephew and niece. And now as Mr. Chameleon leaves the Wakefield house with Detective Dave Arnold, Dave is saying... What do we do with the Wakefield's clothes, Mr. Chameleon? Didn't take them long to get them off and give them to us. The wife, Donna, is a very clever woman, Dave. Maybe too clever. Uh, Start up the car, Dave. We're going back now to see the murdered man's nephew and niece, Dick and Tina Stevens. Okay, Mr. Chameleon. I'm trying to get the commissioner of police now over the radio. Central headquarters, please. Central headquarters. This is Chameleon. Put me through to the commissioner. Okay, Mr. Chameleon. Hello, Chameleon. The laboratory just gave a report on that dust you had vacuumed from the murder room. What's that analysis, Commissioner? Well, you guessed right, Chameleon. The dust had been sprayed over the room with an insecticide sprayer. Traces of insecticide are in the dust. Anything else you want? Yes, I've got a man's suit and a woman's dress and coat in the car with me. I want vacuum, too. Send one of the boys out to get them, please. Send where? Dave Arnold will be in the car in front of the murder house. We're on our way there now, Commissioner. Right, Chameleon. Bye. Dave, you wait here in the car until the commissioner sends out for these clothes. I'll go in now to see Dick Stevens and Tina. Okay, Mr. Chameleon. Oh, it's you, Mr. Chameleon. Come in. Thank you. Dick, the case is shaping up. I'll soon have whoever killed your uncle in that suspiciously dust-covered room. Oh, you... you will? Just a uh, few details remain to be cleared up. I see. Oh, Tina, Mr. Chameleon is here. Good evening, Mr. Chameleon. What are the details you're clearing up? Uh, Dick can answer the first question best, Tina. I, Mr. Chameleon... Why was your murdered uncle giving you control over his affairs? Because... because he wanted to retire from active work and put everything in my hands. It's odd that the first thing that you should do is to start off for Europe. But we were planning to stay only two weeks. I see. I'd like to go back to the murder room with both you and Tina. Come ahead. Very, very well. What do you expect to find in the room my uncle died in? I want to show you something in here. What? Let me pull these draperies aside. There's a door here. 
You and Tina told me there was only one door to this murder room. Well, that door behind the draperies, it's always locked. It's kept that way. Is it, Tina? It's never been opened since we lived here, Mr. Chameleon. It's directly behind the desk where your uncle was murdered. I put it to you, Dick, that while your wife was in the dressing room, you could have slipped downstairs, shot your uncle without Tina's knowing it. But why should Dick have killed his uncle? Why, Mr. Chameleon? The Wakefields are the only people who can benefit by the murder. When I make an arrest in this case, I will then present the evidence. You can't accuse Tina and me of murder. I am not accusing Tina of anything. Then you can't accuse me. One other point, Nick. Yes? The police laboratory reports the dust found in this murder room was deliberately sprayed in here to make the murder look like suicide. What? And we've got the insecticide sprayer that was used. It came from this place. Oh, Dick! Dick! Tomorrow morning, I will send a Professor Simpkins out here. He is the expert man on dust at police headquarters. What for? He won't find anything. We'll see tomorrow. Good night. And remember, Dick and Tina, this house is under police observation. Don't you think we know that, Mr. Chameleon? And the next morning, we find Mr. Chameleon in disguise as Professor Simpkins, police laboratory dust expert with Detective Dave Arnold, Outside the murder house, and Mr. Chameleon is saying... All right, Dave, we're ready for the kill. I've got all the papers and the other evidence here, Mr. Chameleon. Maybe I should say Professor Simpkins. You certainly look like one in that disguise. You have Seymour Wakefield and his wife Dune in the house? Right. Mr. Fitch is in there, too. Good. Let's go, Dave. Now, inside the murder house, we see Mr. Chameleon disguised as Professor Simpkins, a very learned-appearing man with horn-rimmed glasses speaking in the voice of his disguise, as he says to Dick Stevens and his wife, Tina. Mr. and Mrs. Stevens, believe me, I feel most unhappy to reveal uh, certain findings to seemingly respectable young people like you. uh, Appearances sometimes are um, quite deceptive. Quite deceptive. Oh, what are you getting at, Professor Simpkins? They uh, reveal that you, Mr. Stevens, purposely and with malicious intent, sprayed the room where your uncle was killed to deceive the police and make his murder appear as a suicide. And uh, our Mr. Chameleon requested me to so state to you. Mr. Chameleon is trying to pin a murder on me to keep up his own reputation. Still behooves you, young man, to speak that way of an officer of Mr. Chameleon's reputation especially since the murder evidence was found on your premises after an attempt was made to put the crime on others. And I know who those others were, Professor Simpkins. Did, Mr. Seymour Wakeful? Did. And uh, how did you and your wife explain that on careful analysis I discovered dust from the murder room on the clothes both you and your wife like? You see, Your Honor, Chameleon knew you were lying when you said we left this murder room before Hiram Stevens was murdered. So, uh, you were in the room during the murder? Professor Simpkins, we came here after Hiram was killed. We opened the door behind his desk and a lot of dust fell all over us. But we didn't go in. My laboratory findings reveal dust from the murder room in your clothes. Unmistakable evidence of murder. Say that again, I'll choke you. Stay put, Wakefield. Don't manhandle me, Detective Arnold. Professor Simpkins. You something to say, Mr. Fitch? Your findings prove what I told Mr. Chameleon. You told him, Mr. Fitch, that uh, Seymour Wakefield and his wife killed Hiram Stevens to prevent his giving the control of his valuable inventions to Dick and Tina Stevens. Yes, and I was right. You uh, showed Mr. Chameleon the document of control in favor of Dick and Tina from their murdered uncle, but uh, never signed by him. That's correct, Professor. I also showed him a paper cancelling a similar power in favor of the two murderers, Seymour and Dona Wakefield. Quite so, quite so, Mr. Fitch. And that paper was signed by Hiram Stevens. And that is where you tripped yourself, Fitch. And this woman, Tina Stevens, your former secretary. You're not Professor Simkins. You're... Sure, Mr. Chameleon. Mr. Chameleon Dave, in disguise. Handcuff Fitch to Tina Stevens. No, no, help me, Mr. Fitch. What absurdity is this, Mr. Chameleon? You planned the murder, Fitch. You dreamed up the idea of a dust-filled suicide room. That's right, Mr. Chameleon, he did. But you fired the murder shots, Tina. If she did, I, I didn't know it, Mr. Chameleon. You're both equally guilty, Fitch. A clever scheme. 
This woman, Tina Stevens, your former secretary, married Dick for only one reason. I married him for money. Why else? Shut up, Tina. I'll put the record straight, Fitch. The unsigned letter that you gave me purporting to turn the murdered man's rights to Tina and Dick was typed by you. It was a complete phony. How can you ever prove that? And the signed cancellation you used to throw suspicion on Mr. and Mrs. Wakefield was a forgery. And I will put expert after expert on the witness stand to prove that it was. Isn't that right, Tina? Yes. Fitch himself forged it. You brainless idiot, Tina. Dave, write out a confession for Tina to sign. That's all that's needed to close the Dusty Room murder case. And with these words, Mr. Chameleon concludes tonight's murder case. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. again present the famous Mr. Chameleon of Central Police Headquarters in his famous cases of crime and murder. Mr. Chameleon, as you know, is the famous and dreaded detective who frequently uses a disguise to track down a killer, a disguise which at all times is recognized by the audience. Tonight we give you Mr. Chameleon in The Custody of the Child Murder Case. A New York City courtroom is a solemn place. And to Janet Drew, this particular courtroom is like something in a nightmare. For as she stands side by side with her ex-husband, Donald Drew, she hears the judge saying, Donald Drew, I award the complete custody of your son to you instead of to his mother, Janet Drew. Oh, no. No, you can't do that. I base this decision, Mrs. Drew, on the facts which have been fully presented to this court. The evidence was all against you, Mrs. Drew. I have no choice but to award full custody of your child to his father. Thank you, Judge. No, wait. Wait, this isn't right. Judge, you can't take my son away from me. I love him. You should have thought of that sooner, Mrs. Drew. Your son is four years old. According to the evidence, you are unfit to be the mother of any child. But the evidence was faked. My husband Donald faked it. Those things they told about me, they were lies, lies. You had plenty of opportunity during the trial, Mrs. Drew, to refute the evidence. You didn't, however, which seems to me to prove the evidence is true. But it isn't. Judge, you don't understand. I have a greater reason than any that's been presented to... to want this child. For Donald has no right to him. He is not Donald Drew's legitimate child. What? Yes, now the truth is out. Order, please. Mrs. Drew, this is a very serious statement. I hope you know what you're saying. I do, I do. Then why didn't you mention this fact before? Why didn't you bring it up during the trial that your boy is not Donald Drew's legitimate child? Because it's not true, Your Honor. It's a desperate lie. She knows the boy is mine, but she won't stop at anything. She'd rather injure my son's good name than let him go. You're lying, Donald. Isn't the very fact that she would do such a thing? Isn't that final proof, Judge, that all the evidence against the character that it was all true? She's not fit to touch my boy. No! Donald, before I let you get away with this, I'll kill you. I'll kill you! That's enough, Mrs. Drew. The decision of this court is final, and you must accept it. And in the future, if I were you, I wouldn't be so quick to threaten people. The following.
following morning at Central Police Headquarters, Mr. Chameleon, the great detective, is summoned to the commissioner's office. And as he enters the room, he says to the commissioner... Well, you caught me just as I was going out, Commissioner. What's up? Something interesting? Yeah, it looks that way, Chameleon. I want you to take Detective Dave Arnold and go immediately to the Donald Drew home on Park Avenue. Donald Drew? Yes. Murder's been committed there. So, she did it. Janet Drew killed her husband just as she threatened to yesterday in court. No, Chameleon, for once you're wrong. It was Janet Drew who was murdered. Not her ex-husband? No, not the father who received the custody of that child, but the mother, Janet. Her body was discovered this morning in the library of the Drew home. So go to it, Chameleon. And if you ask me, this is going to be a real twister of a murder case. And so, a short time later, we find Mr. Chameleon kneeling beside the lifeless body of Janet Drew. And he is saying to Donald Drew, who stands dazedly beside him, But whoever strangled her, Mr. Drew, approached her from behind. See, the way the scarf is knotted around her throat shows us that. Yes, but who? Who, Mr. Chameleon? For all our terrible differences, Janet was once my wife. This is a frightful shock to me. Yes, yes, I can well believe that, Mr. Drew. Well, there's no need for us to stay here. Uh, let's step into this room here. Your study? Yes. It, it was a frightful shock for Janet's sister, too. Her sister, Mildred, who lives with us. She's nearly prostrated, Mr. Chameleon. Do you mean that even after your divorce, Janet Drew's sister continued to live in this house? Well, I suppose that does seem odd, but Mildred's been our housekeeper for several years. And I needed someone to run this house, quite apart from Etta Hilton, my son's governess. Yes. Well, you really do have quite a household, don't you, Mr. Drew? Um, tell me about your ex-wife. When did you last see her? Last night, Mr. Chameleon, about nine o'clock. Janet came storming in here in a perfect frenzy. Mm -hmm. What'd she have to say? All the usual hysterical threats. She said she'd kill me for having dragged her through the courts. For having dragged her through the courts, Mr. Drew? Yes. She said she'd never live down the disgrace. She went on and on, getting more hysterical every minute. Were you alone with her at the time? Yes, I was. Though I have a feeling Etta Hilton, the governess, was listening in the hall. Mm-hmm. And uh, your sister-in-law? Oh, Mildred's a very discreet woman. She kept out of sight. Well, finally, I couldn't take any more of it, and I walked out of the library and left Janet there. And that was the last time that you saw her alive? Yes, Mr. Chameleon. Where did you go, Mr. Drew, after you left the library? Upstairs to my room, where I bolted the door. Janet was in such a state, I was frankly afraid of her. Whereas she was the one who had reason to be afraid, because later she was murdered. Mr. Drew, who discovered your ex-wife's body? Etta Hilton, the governess. And I'd like to question the governess, and also your sister-in-law. Milton? Yes, Mr. Drew, will you ask her to come here to the library, please? Yes, of course, Mr. Chameleon. Dave? Yes, Mr. Chameleon, right here. What do you make of that bird, anyway? Do you think he murdered his ex-wife? Well, I have no idea. I noticed uh, one thing extremely odd. Donald Drew said that the murdered woman was furious with him because he dragged her through the courts. Whereas the thing that must have really enraged Janet Drew was the fact that she had lost the custody of her child. Yet Donald Drew failed to mention that at all. Mr. Chameleon? Yes? I'm Mildred Lewis, Janet's sister. Oh, come in, Miss Lewis. Mr. Chameleon, what I have to say is very brief and to the point. I know nothing whatsoever about my poor sister's murder, except I'm convinced that Donald, my brother-in-law, couldn't have done it. Who else was in the house beside you and Donald Drew and um, Etta Hilton, the governess? No one. But it could have been a prowler, couldn't it? Someone who'd broken into the house? Perhaps. Miss Lewis, you've had a lot of tragedy in your life, haven't you? I remember reading in the papers, uh, oh, several years ago, that your fiancé, a prominent diplomat, was killed in England... That's right, Mr. Chameleon. I first went to live with Janet and Donald after that. Janet was in England at the time. She... she was very good to me. 
Yet you testified against your sister in court, didn't you? I had to, Mr. Chameleon. Nearly killed me to do it, but Janet was not a fit mother for her child. There's such a thing as right and wrong, and I, I had to put that first. Well, I'd say that you had very rigid moral standards, Miss Lois. I do. Some people might call me prudish, but nevertheless I believe in high moral standards. Does um, Etta Hilton... I beg your pardon? Tell me something about your nephew's governess. I prefer not to, Mr. Chameleon. She can speak for herself. Though most men are so busy looking at her, they fail to hear what she says. Come in. Mr. Chameleon, I met a Hilton. I understand you sent for me. Oh, really, Miss Hilton? Well, that's very interesting. Since I uh, didn't send for you... She was probably afraid that I'd be saying something against him. Why, Mildred, that's not kind. But it's true, isn't it, Etta? Ladies, please. No time for personal quarrels. Miss Lewis, thank you very much. You mean you're through questioning me, Mr. Chameleon? For the time being, yes. Very well. I'm sure you'd much prefer to question Etta alone. Uh, Miss Hilton, I notice that you and Mildred call each other by your first names. Yes, we do, Mr. Chameleon. We all went to school together, Janet, Mildred and I, in England. In England? Where were you at the time that uh, Janet and Donald Drew's child was born? The uh, the boy was born in England, wasn't he? Uh, yes, and mm. that's where I was. My father had left me penniless. That's how I happened to go to work in Janet's home in Bournemouth as governess. I see. What sort of a person was the murdered woman, Janet Drew? Oh, very gay and fun-loving. So different from her sister, Mildred. I mean, Mildred's always been very prim and prudish. And uh, you're the one who discovered Janet Drew's body? Yes. Still makes me ill to think about it. But, Mr. Chameleon, Donald Drew couldn't possibly have done it. Oh, I heard them quarrel. Janet was hysterical because... Uh, because she was dragged through the courts. But Donald couldn't have caused her death. Mr. Chameleon, you're so silent. What are you thinking? You're a very beautiful girl, Miss Hilton. You're disturbingly beautiful. Oh, good gracious, is that all? I thought you'd solve this murder case. No. No. But I may be one step closer... Dave, where is Donald Drew? I just saw him in the hall, Mr. Chameleon. I'd like to speak to him. Thank you very much, Miss Hilton. Mr. Drew. Oh, yes, Mr. Chameleon. Are you making any progress? Mr. Drew, will you please tell me why no one, not even you, has mentioned the fact that Janet Drew, your murdered ex-wife, must have been wild with rage, not because you dragged her through the courts but because she'd lost the custody of her child to you. Well, I... And furthermore, she said in court only yesterday that you were not the father of the child. Do you think I hadn't read about that? Of course not, Mr. Chameleon, but... But Janet was lying. Oh, was she? Are you sure it might not have been another man's child? You any idea at all who the father might have been? I'm the father of my son. Janet was lying. She was simply desperate. I wonder... It's possible, too, that when she cried out in court, that was the first time that you had learned that you weren't the father. Is that so, Mr. Drome? In other words, Mr. Chameleon, you think I murdered Janet because I'd just learned that she'd been unfaithful. Also, Mr. Drew, by saying such a thing, she cast a shadow over the child. You must have hated that, too. You know, if I were you, I'd plead self-defense. What? I'd plead self-defense. Everyone knows that she threatened to kill you. No. This is a trick to make me behave as if I were guilty, and I'm not guilty. Mr. Drew... Your Mr. efforts to trap me won't work. I suppose I can't order a police officer out of my house, but at least I don't have to stand here and take it any longer. Good day, Mr. Chameleon. Shall I bring him back, Mr. Chameleon? No, no, Dave, let him go. Well, at least I provoked Donald Drew into an emotional outburst. Oh, but what does it all add up to? Not one of them has really given us anything to work on. No. We've simply learned that Mildred Lewis, the murdered uh, woman's sister, is a rigidly moral woman, and that Etta Hilton, the governess, is a very pretty woman, and that Donald Drew... It... Dave. What's the matter, Mr. Chameleon? Maybe the dead woman, Janet Drew, can help us more than anyone. Oh, well, how? Come along. We're going to look up the statement that she made in court yesterday. I want to see the exact wording of that statement. But what for? Because, Dave, I think I remember something. It seems to me that Janet Drew, when she cried out in court, 
She didn't say that Donald Drew wasn't the father of the child. Sure she did. I read it in the papers. No, no, Dave. I'm under the impression that she said that Donald Drew wasn't the legitimate father of the child. Now, if I'm right, that's what Janet Drew said. And that throws a strange and sinister light on this murder case. Mr. Chameleon and the custody of the child murder case continues in just a moment. And now back to Mr. Chameleon and the custody of the child murder case. The brutal murder of Janet Drew poses many new questions about her sordid divorce from Donald Drew and her desperate fight to keep the custody of the child. And now, at Central Police Headquarters, we find Mr. Chameleon at his office with Detective Dave Arnold. And Mr. Chameleon is saying... I was right, Dave. I was right. When Janet Drew launched into that tirade in court yesterday, her exact words were... Donald Drew is not the legitimate father of the child. Still in her excitement, Mr. Chameleon, she might have misspoken. Yes, maybe. But on the other hand, Dave, she might have meant that the child was Donald Drew's illegitimate child. Then who is the mother? Dave, Etta Hilton, the governess, was in England at the time the child was born. Beautiful girl. Exceptionally beautiful. Anyway, I've sent for both her and Mildred Lewis, the murder woman's sister... Uh, send Miss Lewis in first, please, Dave. Well, Mr. Chameleon, there's only one thing. Yes? Maybe I'm just soft because Etta Hilton is so pretty, but, you know, that sister Mildred Lewis may not be fair about her. But you... You mean because she's so, uh, prim and proper? Well, sure. And I also got the feeling Mildred Lewis was kind of sweet on Donald Drew, her brother-in-law. I don't know, just the way she spoke his name, but maybe I'm nuts. No, on the contrary, Dave. That may be a very valuable observation. Yes, let's uh, talk to Mildred Lewis and see what happens. Will you come in, please, Miss Lewis? Yes, certainly. Good morning, Mr. Chameleon. Good morning, Miss Lewis. Sit down, please. Miss Lewis, who's the mother of Donald Drew's child? What was that? I think you heard me, Miss Lewis. Your murdered sister Janet declared in court yesterday that Donald Drew wasn't the legitimate father of the child, meaning that he was the father, but the child is illegitimate. Janet Drew was not its mother. She only adopted him as her own. Oh, Mr. Chameleon, you must be out of your mind. This, this is perfectly shocking. Why, of course the child's legitimate. Your murdered sister said otherwise. Janet was frantic. Either that or you misunderstood her meaning. No, on the contrary, Miss Lewis. I understood. Who is the mother of Donald Rose's child? Mr. Chameleon, I just can't go on with this conversation. This whole thing's been a horror to me. My sister Janet and I come from a respectable family with definite ideas of right and wrong, and, and this whole ugly mess has been more than I can bear. You testified in court, however, that your sister Janet was immoral, not a fit mother. I had to. I had to so that the child would have a chance to grow up decently. But just the same in my heart, I loved my sister. Now she's dead. In the name of heaven, Mr. Chameleon, can't we let her rest in peace? Be no rest for any of us till we find a murderer, Miss Lewis. What about the child's governess, Etta Hilton? What about her? Well, has there been anything between her and Donald Drew? It's fantastic to claim that Janet wasn't the mother. Has there ever been anything between Etta Hilton and Donald Drew? Oh, there might have been, yes, Mr. Chameleon. I've suspected it for years, but I've never been sure. Well, apparently, only your dead sister really knew the truth about the situation. Well, I'll see what Etta Hilton has to say about it. Mr. Chameleon, you're not going to tell her what I just said. Well, I must, Miss Lewis. Miss Hilton, you come in, please. Uh, yes, Mr. Chameleon. Miss Hilton, I have a theory that Janet Drew was not the mother of the child for whose custody she fought. Donald Drew was the father, but someone else was the mother. But that's ridiculous. Mildred, that is ridiculous, isn't it? I think so, Etta. Also, Miss Hilton, I must tell you that uh, Mildred Lewis here is very much afraid that there was some emotional relationship between you and her brother-in-law, Donald Drew. And I told Mr. Chameleon I wasn't sure that I only suspected there was something between you and Donald, and it might have been my imagination. Well, Miss Hilton, what do you have to say to that? Nothing. 
Nothing? Nothing, Mr. Chameleon. Oh, come on now, Miss Hilton. You must have something to say. Maybe it was Mildred Lewis that Donald Drew was in love with. Detective Arnold, I'm a governess in that home, that's all. It was not my business to know anything about the personal affairs of the family. It's my business to know, Miss Hilton. Janet Drew was murdered. I'm sorry, Mr. Chameleon. I can tell you nothing. Good girl, Etta. Mr. Chameleon tried to trap us, but he failed. Uh, not entirely, Miss Lewis. You failed and you know it. Come along, Etta. That is, if you've finished questioning us, Mr. Chameleon. Uh, for the time being, yes. Again, thank you for your help, Miss Lewis. For their help? What kind of help were those two, Mr. Chameleon? Ah, don't rub it in, Dave. Miss Lewis was quite right when she said that I'd failed. It's interesting I failed to trick Donald Drew, too. Tremendous amount of strength and willpower in all three of them. Well, at least you've learned that. Yes, that's true. Dave, I'm going to cable Bournemouth, England. Try to learn the facts of that child's birth. And meanwhile, I think the testimony about the murdered Janet Drew's loose models will bear some very close investigating. I'm beginning to suspect that may have been faked. And the following day, in the early afternoon, we find Mr. Chameleon back in his office at police headquarters. And as Dave Arnold walks in the door, Mr. Chameleon is saying over the telephone... That's so. Well, that's very interesting. Thank you, Detective Foley. No, no, no. That gives me quite enough to go on for the present. Dave, Detective Foley just rounded up some professional fixers who admitted the testimony against Janet Drew in the divorce case was fixed. They were paid... To defame her character. But who paid them, Mr. Chameleon? No. They were hired by telephone and received cash in the mail. They swear they can't tell who it was who hired them. What's that you've got, Dave? A cable from Bournemouth, England. Oh, let me see it. Hmm. Well, the records simply say that four years ago, a son was born to Mrs. Donald Drew. That tells us nothing. We... No, wait, Dave. The head nurse may still be at that hospital. We'll send pictures to her of the three women, the murder Janet Drew, her sister Mildred, and Etta the governess, and she'll identify one of them. Hey, that ought to do it, Mr. Chameleon. Yes, but that'll take several days, Dave. I don't want to wait. I have a feeling that we ought to close in on the killer fast. Dave, I'm going to the Drew home and pose as one of the fixers who testified falsely against Janet Drew. Very uh, rough customer named Ed Roberts. You think you can trip them up? Well, this time I may be able to crack their self-control. But um, I'm going to need your help, Dave. And we dare not wait. We daren't wait another day. And so that evening, in the library of Donald Drew's home... We find three tense people facing a rough-looking character, Mr. Chameleon in his disguise of Ed Roberts, the fixer. And as he gazes at Mildred Lewis and Donald Drew and Etta Hilton, Mr. Chameleon speaks in the voice of his disguise. Come on now, kiddies. Don't play hide-and-seek with me. You're the one who paid me, Mr. Drew, to testify falsely against your wife. Can you prove that, Mr. Roberts? I suppose I can't. You think the police won't believe me if I tell them you hired me to say your wife was a bad woman? Poor thing, I feel kind of sorry for that dame. She was murdered. You still can't prove anything. No. Might go hard with you if I go to the police. He's trying to blackmail you, Donald. Be quiet, Mildred. I'll handle this. Mr. Roberts, do you realize if you tell the police you testified falsely that you'll be sent to jail for perjury? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's right. So get out of here. Get out of here, Mr. Robertson, fast. Yes, get out. You shouldn't be allowed in a decent person's home. Decent? You call yourself decent, Miss Lewis? You suppose the cops don't know all about you and your brother-in-law, Mr. Drew? What? Don't get excited, Donald. This sounds like another trick. One of Mr. Chameleon's. That's no trick. The cops know all about you, too. Your friend here, Miss Hilton, told him all about you. How the baby was born to you, Miss Lewis, and your sister Janet took it and raised it as her own to save you from disgrace. Etta, 
Did you tell the police a thing like that? No, no, I swear I didn't, Mildred. All right, Mr. Roberts, whatever your game is, it didn't work. And now for the last time, I'm telling you to get out. Wait a minute, Mr. Roberts. Don't anyone move. Detective Arnold. How did you get in here? The door was unlatched, so I walked in, Miss Lewis. I don't know this character you call Mr. Roberts, but I want you all to stay right where you are. Why? What's the matter? Mr. Drew, I just received some pictures from the hospital in Bournemouth, England, identifying the mother of your child. Pictures? Yes, pictures of your child's real mother. Could uh, I have a look at them? Sure, buddy. No! No, Donald, get those pictures! But Mildred, Destroy you... them! I'll take care of Detective Arnold. The world's never going to know that baby was mine. Put down that gun, Miss Lewis. No, not till I get those pictures. Drop it, Miss Lewis. I have my own gun, and if necessary, I'll use it. Mr. Chameleon. Drop the gun, Miss Lewis. Why, you're Mr. Chameleon in disguise. Yes, you were broken down at last, Arnold Drew and Mildred Lewis. The truth is out. Dave, you got the gun? Yes, Mr. Chameleon. She can't hurt anyone now. A respectable Miss Lewis can't fool the world anymore. It's too bad that she managed to do it as long as she did. She did it with Donald Drew's help. Child was theirs, and they wanted it for themselves. That's not true. So, Miss Lewis, between you and Donald, you worked out a dreadful scheme. You dragged Janet into the courts. You paid to have false evidence presented that would take the custody of the child from her and give it to you. It's a lie. We didn't. Poor Janet Drew sacrificed her life to you, her sister, Mildred. You who bore the child out of wedlock. That she accepted, and even accepted the horrifying fact that her husband was the father of her sister's child. But why should we have killed her? Tell me why. Because she couldn't bear to lose the child she'd brought up from infancy and turn its custody over to you. You killed her before she could tell the real truth and show you both up for what you are. The most vicious murderers I've ever seen. Dave, you handcuffed uh, Donald Drew and Mildred together. The justice of God and man will lead them to the execution chamber. And with these words, Mr. Chameleon concludes tonight's murder case. Listen next Wednesday night at this same time for Mr. Chameleon, the man of many faces, in The Insured Jewels Murder Case. The part of Mr. Chameleon is played by Carl Swenson, with dialogue by Marie Baumer from the original story by Frank and Ann Hummert. Music directed by Victor Arden. Your announcer is Howard Claney. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Tonight, we again present the famous Mr. Chameleon of Central Police Headquarters in his famous cases of crime and murder. Mr. Chameleon, as you know, is the famous and dreaded detective who frequently uses a disguise to track down a killer, a disguise which at all times is recognized by the audience. Tonight, we give you Mr. Chameleon in The Fashion World Murder Case. The curtain rises on a richly furnished suite high atop the fashionable Plaza Sheridan Hotel. A tall, languid-looking girl wearing a fabulously expensive mink coat walks up and down before a full-length mirror as a well-dressed young man watches her anxiously. He is Richard Cheval, whose father, John Cheval, owns one of New York's most exclusive fashion shops. 
And as Richard speaks to the girl in the mink coat, he little dreams that his words are opening the door to murder and horror. Well, Zizi, how do you like it? It's a beautiful mink, isn't it? Yes, it's not bad, Richard. Not bad? Huh. It's worth $15,000. That's what it would sell for in Father's shop. Yes, I suppose it would. Zizi, what's the matter? Aren't you pleased about it? <clears throat> Here, Richard. You can take the mink coat back. Take it? Take it back? Zizi, for heaven's sake, what's wrong, darling? Tell me. Sure, I'll tell you. I'm fed up with this kind of life. I'm sick of it. Oh, Cece, darling, haven't I given you everything? Beautiful clothes, this this expensive apartment. What more do you want? I want to be known as your wife, as Mrs. Richard Chevelle. When we go to the store club in El Morocco and the colony, I want people to know I'm your wife, not just one of the models who works in your father's shop. Oh, Cece, listen to I'm me. I'm sick of this secret marriage. I'm your wife. I have a marriage license to prove but it. But, darling, you, you know why we can't tell anyone. You know what a tyrant my father is. Why, he'd, he'd cut me off without a penny if he knew about our marriage. You have your job at your father's shop? You're making plenty. And how long would I keep it if father found out about us being married? Richard, either you tell your father the truth, that you and I are married, or we're through. Cece. Oh, darling, you, you don't mean that. There are other men who wouldn't be ashamed to recognize me as their wife. You mean Ned Marshall, I suppose. If he's been making a play for you again, well, I'll... leave Ned Marshall out of this. Oh, Zizi, if, if I tell Father about our marriage, he'll change his will. He, he's threatened to cut me off before. I, I lose everything. If you don't tell him, you'll lose me. Well, Richard, it's up to you. Which is it going to be? <laughs> And now, several hours later, we see Richard Cheval, very nervous and ill at ease, entering his father's study in the Cheval home in the East Sixties. Oh, uh, there you are, Father. I hoped I'd find you in the study. Yes, so you're home this evening. How are you, Richard? Well, that's a change. Well, I, uh, I thought I'd like to spend an evening with you, Father. Indeed. Well, what troubles are you in this time? Uh, trouble? Why, uh... Stop why, uh... stammering and tell me what it is. What cheap girl are you mixed up with now? Well, Father, I... I uh... warned you, Richard. One more escape and I'll disinherit you. You'd have done it long ago. You're a weakling and a fool. Oh, Father, I, I don't see why you're so suspicious just because I choose to spend a, a quiet evening at home with you. <laughs> Here, uh, let me pour your glass of port wine, Father. Well, at least you can do something useful. The decanter's on the table. I'll have one with you. What? Huh? You drinking pork wine, Richard? Whiskey is your usual drink. Uh, here you are, Father. Here's your glass, and here's mine. There's nothing like good pot wine to make a man feel satisfied with things. I've always said that... Uh, Father, uh, what's wrong? Uh, Richard, I... Father! Good Lord! Help! Help someone! Come quick! Something awful's happened to Father! He, he's been poisoned! And now, a short time later, we find Mr. Chameleon, the famous and dreaded detective and his assistant detective, Dave Arnold, just entering John Cheval's house. And a frightened, rather plain-looking young woman is saying... You're Mr. Chameleon. That's right, and this is Detective Arnold. Please, come in. Thank you. I'm Marie Cheval. My... my uncle's body is in the study. Marie Cheval? You're the dead man's niece? Oh, I don't wonder you're being surprised, Mr. Chameleon. Am I wearing this dreadful blue dress? I'm not here to talk about clothes, Miss Chevelle. Uh, just what happened here tonight? Oh, Mr. Chameleon, it's... it's horrible. Uncle John and his son, my cousin Richard, were having a glass of port wine in the study. And then suddenly Richard came running out crying that his father was poisoned. And a few minutes later, his father was dead. Where is your cousin Richard now, Mary? In his room. He's, he's almost at the point of collapse. I see. Was anyone else here this evening about the time that your uncle, uh, John Cheval, was poisoned? Why, no. No, Mr. Chameleon. Mm -hmm. Mary, I understand that your uncle had been in uh, poor health lately, that he was no longer active in running the famous John Cheval fashion shop. Well, yes. Well, I mean, Ned Marshall is supposed to be running the shop. Ned Marshall? 
The rather well-known young man about town, famous for his champagne parties. I see his name in the gossip columns. Ned Marshall got publicity for the shop, Mr. Chameleon. But Uncle John pulled the strings. Like Richard and me, Ned Marshall was just Uncle John's puppet. You sound bitter, Marie Chevelle. Not bitter, Mr. Chameleon. It's... Well, it's just that Uncle John was a very dominating man. And someone hated him enough to murder him by poison. Marie, will you tell your cousin Richard to come down, please? Detective Arnold and I will go to the study where you say your uncle's body is. Yes, Mr. Chameleon. The study is at the end of the hall. Thank you. Come along, Dave. Yes, sir. Here we are. And here's... John Chevelle's body slumped across the desk. What poison do you think it was, Mr. Chameleon? I don't know, Dave. Several possibilities. There are two decanters on the table. One contains whiskey, other port wine. Here are two glasses. Only one of them is empty. Well, that must be the one John Chevelle drank from. Dave, you take this decanter of port wine and the two glasses and have one of the boys rush them to the laboratory to be analyzed. Gotcha, sir. Mr. Chameleon, this is my cousin, Richard Cheval. Murdered man's son, huh? Come in, Richard. Mary, you wait outside, please. Very well. Mr. Chameleon, I... I just can't believe my father is dead. I'm sure it must be a great shock to you, Richard. You were fond of him? Fond of him? Why, why, of course I was. And you got along well together? You never quarreled? Why should father and I quarrel? We, we were devoted. Uh, Mr. Chameleon, uh, can't we go into another room? I, I mean, seeing my father lying there like that? Yes, of course. Come along. Father's den is the next room. It's right in here. Thank you. Uh, Richard, tell me everything that you know about tonight, please. There, uh, there isn't much to tell, Mr. Chameleon. We had dinner about uh, seven. You and your father? And my cousin, Marie. Your cousin lives here with you? Uh, yes, Mr. Chameleon. Father took Marie in when her parents died some years ago. And you three had dinner together? Uh, the three of us and uh, Ned Marshall. Ned Marshall, who runs your father's fashion shop. Now, that's strange. Your cousin Marie didn't mention his being here this evening. Marie wouldn't mention his being here. She tried to keep Ned's name out of a mess like this. Why? Because Marie is crazy about Ned Marshall, Mr. Chameleon. She'd do anything to protect him. Why should Ned Marshall need to be protected? Because he's the one who murdered my father. What? Richard, have you any proof of that? No, no, I haven't any proof, Mr. Chameleon. But I can tell you this... Ned Marshall was sick of being ordered around by father. In spite of his high position at the shop, his name in the society columns, father treated him like a lackey. Well, Ned Marshall could have left your father's shop. Father wouldn't let him. Nobody crossed father, Mr. Chameleon. When he said to do something, people did it. Well, your cousin, Marie Cheval, did your father order her around? You saw her, Mr. Chameleon. Marie could be attractive if she had some decent clothes, but father never allowed her to spend money on clothes. He wanted her plain and colorless, so she wouldn't be, to use his words, a bait for men. Hmm. Marie must have hated your father for that. I should imagine any normal he girl... He said every woman who came into his fabulous shop to buy clothes did it to attract men. He laughed at their weakness and scorned them for it. But he wasn't above taking their money. Mr. Chameleon! I'm in here, Dave. Mr. Chameleon, I found this character sneaking around the side of the house. He says his name is Ned Marshall. I assure you I wasn't sneaking, Detective Arnold. I was about to ring the bell... Uh, you must be Mr. Chameleon, the detective. I've heard about you. And you must be John Cheval's manager. I've heard about you, Mr. Marshall. Especially your famous champagne parties. Tell me, you were here to dinner tonight, Mr. Marshall. Why did you come back? Because Marie Cheval telephoned me that Mr. Cheval had been poisoned. Marie, he phoned you? Richard, how could you do a thing like this? How could you think you'd get away with it? I? Get away with... Marshall, you must be crazy. Ned Marshall... Are you accusing Richard of murdering his father? I was afraid it would happen, Mr. Chameleon. Afraid Richard would lose his head. A man can be driven just so far. Richard, if you didn't care about yourself, at least you might have thought of Zizi. Zizi? Well, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Judging by your expression, Richard, it's obvious that you're lying. All right, who is Zizi? Why, she, uh, she's a model at Father's Fashion Shop, Mr. Chameleon. Uh, she's also the girl you married secretly a month ago. You... How did you know, Ned Marshall? Zizi herself told me. Well, well, a secret marriage. 
Where is your wife now, Richard? She has an apartment at the Plaza Sheraton, Mr. Chameleon. And why did you keep the marriage a secret from your father? Because, uh, well, he, he wasn't well. We were afraid the shock would be too much. Oh, why uh, don't you tell Mr. Chameleon the truth, Richard? You were afraid your father would disinherit you. Keep out of this, Marshal. You're trying to frame me to cover up your own guilt. You hated father. No, I didn't hate him. He was difficult, but he paid me well for my services. And I'd have been a fool to destroy the hand that fed me. Richard, tell me. After you finished dinner, now what happened then? Were you and your father alone in the study? Uh, yes, Mr. Chameleon. I poured him his usual glass of port wine. He drank it. And then suddenly he, he cried out in pain and, and died. You poured him a glass of port. Now, there were two glasses of port on the table. Uh, yes, the, uh, the other glass of port was for myself. For yourself? Richard, since when have you taken to drinking port? Uh, why, I... Ned Marshall, you're not framing me for father's death. Get out of my way! Richard, you... After him, Dave. Hold on, you don't You're staying here. Let me go, you... <laughs> Mr. Chameleon, look at this. It's a gun, and it just fell out of Richard Cheval's coat pocket. Well, well, a gun. I wonder, Richard, did you plan to shoot your father in case the poison in the port wine didn't work? <laughs> Mr. Chameleon and the Fashion World murder case continues in just a moment. And now back to Mr. Chameleon and the Fashion World murder case. When John Cheval, owner of the exclusive John Cheval Fashion Shop, was mysteriously poisoned after drinking a glass of port wine, Mr. Chameleon discovered that three people might have had reason to kill him. John's son, Richard, who feared his father would disinherit him when he learned of his marriage to the model Zizi. Marie Cheval, John's niece, and Ned Marshall, the manager of John Cheval's shop. Now in a room in the Cheval home, Mr. Chameleon is saying to the murdered man's son... So, Richard Cheval, you carry a gun. Perhaps you plan to shoot your father if the poison in the port wine didn't work. No, no, I didn't murder my father. Ned Marshall is the guilty one. He hated father. Don't be an idiot, Richard. Tell me, Richard, about this uh, secret marriage of yours, about your wife, Zizi. Why did your father disapprove of her? Well, father didn't disapprove of Zizi. It was just... Mr. A... Chameleon, I'll tell you about Zizi and I'll tell you the truth. Mr. Chameleon, it's Marie Cheval, the murdered man's niece. Yes, Marie, I told you to wait in the other room. Well, I, I couldn't help hearing what Richard said, Mr. Chameleon. And there's something you ought to know. Keep Zizi out of this, Marie. Go on, Marie. Mr. Chameleon, Zizi was here tonight, about an hour before Uncle John was murdered. What? Here in this house? She came here to model a plain suit for me from the shop. Before she left, I... I saw her go into the study. A few minutes later, she came out and left the house. That's a lie. It's the truth, Richard. Marie, why didn't you tell me this before? Well, because I... I didn't think it was important, Mr. Chameleon. Dave, come along. Where to, Mr. Chameleon? To pay your call on Zizi, Richard Cheval's secret bride. Okay. It's a cinch that everybody in this case is connected with the fashion world, and somebody worked out a clever design for murder. All right, you three, I'll want to question you later. Right here. I'll say. This way, Dave. Well, Marie, I hope you're proud of what you've done. Richard, I told the truth and I... Where are you going? To my room. But don't think you're going to get away with this. Ned. Oh, Ned. Marie, why did you do that? Why did you try to incriminate Zizi? Oh, Ned, darling, don't be angry because I told Mr. Chameleon about Zizi being here. I know you're crazy about her, too. Marie. But let me tell you this, Ned Marshall. I'm as pretty as Zizi is. And now that Uncle John is dead, half his money will go to me. I'll be able to buy all the clothes I want. Uncle John will never rule my life again. Never, never. Good heavens, how you must have hated it. <gasps> I didn't say that. No, no, but it's in your voice, Marie. In that wild, intense look in your eyes. I never realized how much you hated your uncle. And now, a short time later, Mr. Chameleon and Detective Dave Arnold have just rung the bell of Zizi's luxurious hotel suite. Some setup, Mr. Chameleon. Must have cost Richard Cheval every cent he had to keep a secret wife in a place like this. Yes, Dave. Yes, what is it? You are Zizi, the model at Cheval's shop? Yes. Secretly married to the owner's son, Richard Cheval? Uh, that's right. I'm Chameleon of Central Police Headquarters, and this is Detective Arnold. 
May we come in? Why, sure. I've got nothing to hide. Thank you. Then you won't object to uh, Detective Arnold searching your suite. Why, now, wait a minute. Get going, Dave. You know what to look for. Yes, Mr. Sir. Chameleon, you've got no right breaking in here. In a case of murder, the police take on certain rights, easy. A, a case of murder? Now, but... don't pretend that you didn't know old John Chevelle was murdered. Why, I so You're had... a very attractive model, Zizi, but not a very clever actress. It was obvious when you opened the door that your husband Richard had warned you that we were coming. Okay, so Richard did phone me. What of it? Mr. Chameleon, take a look at this, will you? Small bottle of white liquid. White arsenic. Deadly poison. I was searching Zizi's bedroom closet and I found that bottle in the pocket of her coat. No. No, you couldn't have... I don't know anything about that bottle. Don't you, Zizi? Tell me, what were you doing in John Cheval's study earlier tonight, just before he was poisoned to death? Who... Who told you I was there? Never mind that. Answer my question. I... I wanted to talk to John Cheval, Mr. Chameleon, to tell him about my marriage to his son, Richard. Or oh, perhaps it was to put some of this deadly poison in the decanter of port wine. No, no, I didn't. Well, then, Zizi, explain how this bottle of poison got into your coat. I think I've got a pretty good idea, Mr. Chameleon. I left my coat in the hall while I modeled a suit for Marie Cheval. She must have poisoned her uncle's wine and planted the bottle of poison in my coat pocket. Why, sure. Marie Cheval hates me, Mr. Chameleon. She hates you? Why, Zizi? Because of Ned Marshall, who runs her uncle's shop, the one where I work. Ned's crazy about me. Marie's so jealous she can't see straight. So Marie Cheval is in love with Ned Marshall. Yes, I'll say she is. What's more, she hated her uncle for making a dress so plain that Ned Marshall never even noticed her. I see. Zizi, the fact remains that we found a bottle of poison in your coat pocket. And it was the same poison that killed John Cheval. That man who didn't want you for a daughter-in-law. What's wrong with a model for a wife? Nothing, as far as I'm concerned, but uh, John Cheval had set ideas on the subject. Richard said the old fool would cut him out of his will if he knew. But I didn't poison him, I didn't. That's all for the present, Zizi Cheval. Come along, Dave. We're going to police headquarters. And now, some time later, at Central Police Headquarters, Mr. Chameleon is saying to the Commissioner of Police... Well, Commissioner, the laboratory confirmed my suspicions. The port wine that killed John Cheval contained white arsenic. And you found a bottle of that same poison in Zizi Cheval's coat pocket. The girl Cheval's son was secretly married to. Yes. Zizi says it must have been put there by Marie Cheval, the murdered man's niece, who's jealous of her. Mm -hmm. You think Marie is the guilty one, Chameleon? Well, Marie had a strong hatred for her uncle. Richard Cheval hated his father, but he'd hardly frame his own wife for the murder. Nor would Ned Marshall, who it appears was also in love with the beautiful Zizi. Well, it could be any one of those four people. Yes, but which one is it? It's a question. Well, maybe I found a way to get the answer. You mean through one of your disguises, Chameleon? Well, Commissioner, John Cheval owned a fashion shop specializing in everything rich women buy, but particularly in furs. Mm -hmm. And white arsenic is used in the preparation of furs. Yes, go on, Chameleon. Well, I'm going to disguise myself as, um, say, uh, Pierre Dupre, an unassuming little Frenchman, one of the many employed in John Cheval's workroom. Tomorrow morning, Commissioner, Pierre Dupre is going to pay a visit to the murder house. And now it is the following morning, just around the corner from the Cheval home, Mr. Chameleon is saying to Detective Dave Arnold... All right, Dave, you know what to do. You bet, Mr. Chameleon. And that's one of the cleverest disguises you've ever had. I'd never recognize you. Uh, Dave... Did you tell Sergeant Matthews to attend to that matter that I spoke about? Yes, sir. It's been taken care of. Good. I'm going into the Cheval house now. In a few moments, you're to follow me, but through the side entrance. Good luck, Mr. Chameleon. Or should I say, Pierre Dupre. And now, a few minutes later... We see Mr. Chameleon in his disguise as Pierre Dupre, a slight, unassuming little Frenchman being ushered into the drawing room of the Cheval home by Marie, the murdered man's niece. And Mr. Chameleon is saying in the voice of his disguise, You are uh, Mademoiselle Marie, she Cheval's niece. Yes, I'm Marie Cheval. Marie, who is this man? What does he want? He says his name is Pierre Dupre, Richard. And he came here at Mr. Chameleon's orders 
just as he ordered the rest of us to be here. Pierre Dupre, who the devil are you anyway? You uh, do not know me, Monsieur Ned Marshall. Well, I am not surprised. You are the manager of the great Jean Cheval fashion shop. You would not have noticed me. I am only employed in the workroom. In the back. In the workroom? Richard, I never saw this man in your father's workroom. Neither did I, Zizi, but... Uh... This uh, morning, I read in the paper that Monsieur Jean Cheval was poisoned. And uh, suddenly, I recall something I see in the workroom. Something which uh, may help to find Monsieur's murderer. What, what do you mean, help find the murderer? Like all uh, police headquarters, Mademoiselle Zizi. And I'm told by Monsieur uh, Chameleon uh, to come here and wait for him. Dupre, uh, what is it you have to tell, Mr. Chameleon? I'm not at liberty to say, Monsieur uh, Richard. Uh, when uh, Chameleon arrive, then I will talk. You, you're bluffing. You don't know anything. Be still, Marie. I don't see what you're all so worked up about. Sit down, Dupre. Ah. Merci, Monsieur Marshal. Uh, Mr. Chameleon will be along soon. Here, let me pour you a drink. Ned! A drink. <laughs> but yes, thank you. I will have a drink. Well, here you are, Dupre. You look as if you could use a good drink of whiskey. You are very kind, Monsieur Marshal. <sighs> I feel better already. I... <gasps> uh, Monsieur Dupre, what is it? What's wrong? The pain. Such terrible pain. Great Scott, he's going to keel over. Uh, here, let me help you, to pray. Uh, there's a couch in the other room. You can lie down. Uh, wait here, Richard, Marie. I'll take care of him. Uh, 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 right in here, Dupre. Easy now. Lean on me. The whiskey. There was something in the whiskey. Yes, you old fool. There was poison in it. And you will never be able to tell the cop chameleon what you saw in John Cheval's workroom. You'll be dead before chameleon gets here. Will I, Ned Marshall? What? Will I die just as John Cheval died from the poison that you put in his port wine? Mr. Chameleon, you're, you're not Pierre Dupre. That's right, Ned Marshall. I hope my disguise would reveal the killer of John Cheval, and it did. You'll never get me. I'll... I'll... Stay where you are, Marshall. I've got you covered. Detective Arnold. I've been framed. It was a dirty trick. I suspected you were the murderer, Ned Marshall. All I needed was proof. All right. All right, I admit I poisoned the old tyrant. I was fed up with his treating me like dirt, with taking his orders and licking his boots. I wanted to kill old John, and I meant to kill his son Richard, too. Yes, that's why you poisoned the whiskey, too, wasn't it? Because Richard usually drank whiskey, not port. I had one of my men refill the decanter. But you thought it still contained the poisoned whiskey when you gave Pierre Dupre a drink. Yes, and I'd have gotten away with my plans if it hadn't been for you, Chameleon. You wanted both John Cheval and his son out of the way, Ned Marshall. And then Zizi would have inherited the Cheval fortune. And you hoped to marry her and have the money, too. There's just one thing. Why did you plant the bottle of poison in Zizi's coat pocket? I thought the coat belonged to Marie Cheval. I was going to frame Marie for the murders. And I almost succeeded. That's what often happens in murders, Marshal. It's one small error, one little slip that'll send a killer to the electric chair. Take him away, Dave. And with these words, Mr. Chameleon concludes tonight's murder case. Listen next Wednesday night at this same time for Mr. Chameleon, the man of many faces. The part of Mr. Chameleon is played by Carl Swenson, with dialogue by Gene Carroll, based on the original story by Frank and Ann Hummert. It is directed by Richard Leonard, with music by Victor Arden. Your announcer is Howard Claney. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
we again present the famous Mr. Chameleon of Central Police Headquarters in his famous cases of crime and murder. Mr. Chameleon, as you know, is the famous and dreaded detective who frequently uses a disguise to track down a killer. A disguise which at all times is recognized by the audience. Tonight we give you Mr. Chameleon in The Titled Husband, Murder Case. The story opens in the fabulous McGinnis Mansion in New York, where one of the season's most fashionable weddings has just taken place. And we find the bride alone with her mother as she changes from her wedding gown to her going-away clothes. And we hear her say... Oh, come now, Mother. Admit it, you think it's utterly thrilling to have a real princess for a daughter. Look at me, darling. The Princess Minerva of Romany. Oh, if Dad had only lived to see this day. Well, if he had, he'd have kicked that feller down the back step. Mother! My own daughter, Minnie, marrying a guy that nobody can half understand when he talks. Because he can't even talk English good enough. Mother, this is my wedding day. Don't make it unhappy. Well, I'm only telling you what I think. You'll learn to love Ludovic and appreciate him the way I do, Mother. In a pig's eye. Why, you should hear what he says about you. What's he say about me? Oh, Ludovic's simply crazy about you. He'd do anything in the world for you, Mother. Well, then tell him to wash the oil out of his hair and stop soaking himself with perfume. You can't cover a skunk, Minnie. Don't call me Minnie. My name is Minerva. And don't talk that way about Ludovic. He's my husband now. Pardon, but impatience overcomes me. I cannot wait outside. Oh, Ludovic, you're so impetuous. But I could not wait. Mm, silly boy. You'll have me all your life. You like this dress? Oh, my princess. Every second you grow more beautiful, more charming, more delectable. The Princess Minerva of Romani, the most fascinating woman in all Europe. Plain Minnie McGinnis here in the United States. Oh, madame, my princess need not fear the embarrassment of her humble ancestry being remembered. Its memory will fade away as quietly as twilight ends the day. Isn't he wonderful, Mother? Hmm. Minnie and me was talking about you when you busted in here, Prince Ludovic. Then I know why my ears, they burn. <laughs> I hadn't reached the spot where I was going to tell her that if you ever harmed her, harmed one hair of her head, I'd kill you quick as a rat in a cellar. Mother! You married her because her old man left her five million round American dollars. My Minerva, what you call a great heiress, but believe me, it is completely a surprise. I, I believe that I, the Prince of Romany, was making the marriage with a poor and humble girl. Where'd you think the money to run this 20-room house come from? Think the fairies were bringing it? <laughs> Your mother, Princess, she will have her little joke. Delicious. <laughs> Getting a bullet poked into you wouldn't be something to laugh about. Don't ever forget what I told you. Come in. Oh... It's you, Gladys. What's cooking? Begging your pardon, madam. Forget the madam stuff, Gladys. What's on your chest? Oh, begging your pardon, madam. His Highness, the Earl of Pension, presents his compliments and wishes a word with his Royal Highness, the Prince of Romney, in the library. He's worried, your Royal Highness, about his boat back to England. It's clear in the docks in half an hour. You will tell the Earl that I shall see him presently. Very good, your Royal Highness. This kind of monkey shines in my house. Run along and see the Earl, Ludovic. After all, he was your best man at our wedding. Your wish, my princess, is my command. But these Englishmen, they are born with ice water running through their veins. Absent from their hearts is romance. They put the sailing of a ship before a, a husband's first moments alone with his bride. But I shall see him a few brief moments, my princess. Isn't he a darling mother? There's something up between them two men, Minnie. Something vicious, something sneaky. What do you mean, mother? Come downstairs with me. Maybe we can hear what they're talking about. I think he married you to murder you and get your money. You've lost your mind. Come with me, Minnie, come. <laughs> What do you want, Fenton? Don't be naive, old boy. You're not taking a ship anywhere. Quite so, Ludovic, quite so. Forgive me, won't you, for not wanting to cool my heels down here forever. What do you want? 
the initial payment on our bargain, old boy. All in due time, my dear Fenton. The due time is now. But my... The bargain and a strange bargain it was. In one month, Fenton, one month. The bargain was that if either one of us married that bit of fluff upstairs... The lucky bloke would pay the other $250,000 for stepping aside. <laughs> and she took me because I was a prince and you, my dear Penton, a mere earl. 20000 was to be the first payment, the remainder to follow later. 5000 a month, wasn't it? Well, old boy? How can I pay you $20,000 now, Penton? I've been married to her only one hour. She's so entranced with the idea of being a princess, Ludovic. She'll give you the money. Toddle up and get it. I don't mind waiting. A few minutes. Her swine of a mother. She's already suspicious of me. Jolly good reason, too, Ludovic. The old trout and I see eye to eye on that one. I'll not endanger five millions by making a false step now. Besides, I ask you, Penton, have you a single piece of writing to reveal our arrangement? Get Show me our agreement in writing. I'd hate like the devil to kill you. What? As best man at your wedding, I'd feel called on to send you a wreath. <laughs> but after all... Killing, I... killing. Everybody talks of killing. The old woman, she has already made the threat if I harm her daughter. <laughs> oh, that's fruity. You think she means it? Murder. It blazed from her eyes, Benton. That presents a highly practical idea, Ludovic. Idea? Yes, quite. If you tried a double cross on me, I could kill you and put it on the old woman. When it came out that you had a few other wives... Her motivation would be perfect. And if I told what I know about you, you Penton... You couldn't, my friend. You'd be dead. Now go up and whisper 20,000 in your bride's ear and be quick about it. Well, did you hear that, Minnie? What did I tell you? I'll have him arrested. I'll expose him, Mother. I'll get rid of him. I'll show him something. There's only one way to get rid of a man like that. I could kill him. I didn't love him. I only wanted to be a princess. Maybe that Britisher ain't so smart as he thinks. Figures he could plan a murder on Bridget McGuinness and get away with it, does he? Come on. Where, Mother? Back upstairs. And when that prince of yours comes up, don't let on we heard anything. And half an hour later, as the astute and dreaded detective, Mr. Chameleon, is riding up Fifth Avenue with Detective Dave Arnold, we hear... Uh, calling Mr. Chameleon. Commissioner of Police, calling Mr. Chameleon. Oh, I'll take it, Dave. Hello, Commissioner. Chameleon speaking. Oh, hello, Chameleon. Now, proceed at once to the McGinnis Mansion. I've got just your kind of murder waiting there. Uh, who killed whom, Commissioner? Well, how should I know, Chameleon? All the information I have is that the Prince of Romany, who married the McGinnis girl today, was murdered. Report came from the bride's mother. Old Bridget McGinnis, eh? Okay, I'll get over there. Bye. Step on it, Dave. Ms. McGinnis, I am told that you reported a murder here. I'm Chameleon of Central Police Headquarters, and this is Detective Dave Arnold. How do you do, ma'am? I know funny ain't the right word for it, Mr. Chameleon, but I never got the education my daughter Minnie got. Anyhow, this is the kind of murder that just don't happen. I understand the chap that your daughter married today in the season's most fashionable wedding was murdered. Yes, the Prince of Romany. And poor Minnie's heart's just about breaking. Well, naturally, Mrs. McGinnis. She was wild about him. And him, a prince of the blood, too. Minnie always had her heart set on marrying into royalty. Uh, she inherited a fabulous fortune from her father, didn't she? At least that's what I heard. Five million bucks, Mr. Chameleon. My poor dead husband, Mike. Rest his soul. Hid oil. Dig in a cistern. And pulled out ten million that he split between Minnie and me. Have you any idea who killed the prince? Sure. His best man did him in. What? The Earl of Fenton. Sounds like one of them dime novels I used to read when I was a kid. Earl killing princes and things. You say the prince's best man at his wedding killed him? It's amazing. Yes. Ain't it, Mr. Chameleon? 
Did you actually witness the murder? Sure. I wouldn't be telling you what I am. All right. Uh, let me hear what happened, Mrs. McGinnis. It was like this. Mm -hmm. My daughter and the prince was just starting off on their honeymoon. And sudden like, that Earl Penton come running in. Yes? The Earl said something about the prince owing him $250,000. The prince got real hot and said he was only $20,000. Uh, both big sums of money. Then they really got to brawling. So to settle things down, my daughter Minnie stepped in and gave the Earl her check for $20,000. Uh, the prince didn't have a bank in account big enough in this country, you see. Oh, I didn't think you would. Uh, go on, please. The Earl takes the check mm -hmm. and then pulls out a jackknife and sticks it nice as you please into the poor prince's heart. A jackknife? It's a strange thing for an earl to be carrying. It was the gift the prince gave him in honor of being his best man. He called it a hunting knife. It looked like something from a bargain basement to me. Hey there, Minnie, you been listening? Not Minnie, Mother dear, but Minerva. Mother insists on calling me Minnie, Mr. Chameleon, but my baptismal name is Minerva. Well, Minerva, uh, have you anything to add to your mother's evidence? Oh, not a word, Mr. Chameleon. Mother didn't forget a single thing. She has a perfectly marvelous memory. Uh, Detective Arnold. Yes, Mr. Chameleon. Send out a general alarm for this uh, Earl of Penton. Save yourself the trouble, Mr. Chameleon. What? Uh, my maid, Gladys's husband, is a chauffeur here. And, and he's he... got Earl Penton cornered in the library at the point of a gun, waiting for you to arrest him, Mr. Chameleon. I uh, think I'll talk to him first. Come along, Dave. And uh, take off your hat. You're about to meet the nobility. Thank you for your information, ladies. See you later. For a newly bereaved bride, there's a strange lack of tears, Dave. Yeah, and if you're asking me, Mr. Chameleon, both those dames are plenty on top of the ball. Pinch them and you've got the killers. Well, here's the library, Dave. We'll speak to the Earl of Penton first. Wonder why the deuce he calls himself the Earl of Penton. What? After we've finished with him, we'll have a look at the international who's who. Find out if an Earl of Penton or a Prince of Romany ever existed. All right, open the door, Dave. The Earl of Penton? I'm chameleon of the police. Oh, splendid. Toss this fellow out of the room. And looking at the business end of a pistol makes me nervy. Uh, certainly, Glanto. Let me have the gun, please. Yeah, yeah, here you are. You're the chauffeur, Ham? Yes, sir. Bill Spiller. And I'm telling you, I got this job chucked down my throat by Mrs. McGinnis. I got no stomach for it. I see. All right, you may go now, Spiller. When you uh, got a minute, Mr. Chameleon, my wife, my wife Gladys, the maid, would like a word with you. I'll be finished with the Earl Penton very quickly, Spiller. I'll see Gladys then. I'll have a waiting, Mr. Chameleon. Oh, decent of you, old man. Thank you very much. But I say, have you any idea why those women should have me detained here at Pistol's Point? It's uncivilized. Both Mrs. McGuinness and her daughter Minerva, the newly married and widowed Princess Romany, say that they saw you murder the prince. Look here, chameleon, they killed Romany. That old trout and her daughter would kill a man and sing hymns at his funeral. They both say that you killed him with a hunting knife that the prince gave you. But that winds up your case, Mr. Chameleon. Oh, really? Quite, quite. Uh, the bride came down here and said the prince wished to put a memory card in the holster of the knife and took it upstairs with her. Yeah. Stupid thing to do. Puts the evidence straight on her. They also say that you came upstairs, had a quarrel about $250,000, you claimed the prince owed you. What? And that the prince said it was only 20000 and that his wife gave you a check for that amount, and that you blew up and killed him. Oh, utterly stupid, Mr. Chameleon. I, I never left the room. I was waiting to tell the prince goodbye. Would you prefer having Detective Arnold search you for that check or have me do it? He stashed it under that big lamp on the table, Mr. Chameleon. I saw the end of it sticking out. Here it is, right here. Well, well, my lord, the Earl of Penton. It, it's what you call a plant, Chameleon. One of those women planted it on me. I've never seen that check before. All you need do to keep out of the criminal courts, Penton, is prove that. You stay with this uh, bird, please, Dave. While I talk to that maid, Gladys. <laughs> Mr.
Mr. Chameleon and the titled husband murder case continues in just a moment. And now back to Mr. Chameleon and the titled husband murder case. In the fabulous McGinnis Mansion in New York, a shocking murder has occurred. Only a few hours after the marriage of Mrs. Bridget McGinnis's daughter Minerva to the Prince of Romany, the prince was found stabbed to death. Mrs. McGinnis has accused a man who calls himself the Earl of Penton and reveals that he had tried to extort money from the prince. And now in the McGinnis Mansion, we have just heard Mr. Chameleon say to the Earl of Penton, All you need do to keep out of the criminal courts, Penton, is prove that. Dave... You stay with this bird, please, while I talk to that maid, Gladys. Look here, Chameleon. Are you about to take the evidence of a maid over a peer of the realm? You say that you're the Earl of Penton? The title goes back some hundred years, Chameleon. And uh, Pentonville Jail is one of the oldest jails in England. What's it? Yes, it's the place where so many famous British murderers have been hung, isn't it? Oh. I'll see Gladys now, Dave. You keep your eye on Penton, please. I'm Gladys, sir. You have something to tell me, Gladys? Yes, sir. His Highness, the Earl of Penton, didn't murder His Royal Highness, the Prince of Romney, sir. Well, then who did? Why, Mrs. McGuinness or her daughter, the Princess Minerva, sir. I heard all the causes leading up to the brutal crime, sir. What causes, Gladys? Well, the Prince and the Earl were having an argument, as gentlemen sometimes will, sir. They were quarrelling? Just a pleasant difference, sir, about a matter of money... The two gentlemen was talking about a strange bargain they had made. Ah, uh-huh. what was the strange bargain? Oh, a very proper one, sir. Both gentlemen had agreed that if one married Miss Minerva, he would pay the other gentleman $250,000 for stepping aside. So that is your idea of a gentlemanly agreement, eh? Well, to me, it sounds like clear murder evidence. Oh, but don't you see, sir? Both the gentlemen knew all Miss Minerva wanted was a title... A fair arrangement, to my way of thinking, sir. I'm afraid in trying to help the gentlemanly Earl of Penton, you're helping him to the electric chair. Oh, thank you anyway, Gladys. Goodbye for now. Off a minute, sir. Both Mrs. McGuinness and her daughter was listening to the gentleman talking. And so was I. Oh, come now. All three of you at the keyhole? There's two doors to the room, Mr. Chameleon. They don't know I heard. But I heard Mrs. McGuinness tell Miss Minerva... The only way to get rid of a man like that was by killing him. What? Then both of them sneaked away, sir, with Mrs. McGuinness saying she could murder the prince and put the murder on the Earl of Penton. I'd go into the witness box and swear to that, sir. I may call on you to do just that, Gladys. Mrs. McGuinness, before I leave, Haven't I... Haven't you arrested that Earl of Penton for the murder yet, Mr. Chameleon? Uh, Detective Arnold is holding him downstairs. I uh, stepped in to ask you something first. What, Mr. Chameleon? Was your daughter's marriage to the Prince of Romany a love match or a marriage to get a title so that she could be called princess? Oh, Minerva wanted a title, all right, but the marriage was love on both sides, Mr. Chameleon. Uh-huh. And uh, what was your feeling about it? I wanted Minerva to have what she wanted, Mr. Chameleon. And take it from me, the prince was one swell guy. He wasn't a money hunter like some of them furners. Thank you, Mrs. McGuinness. Goodbye. What a liar you are. Now, a few hours later, we hear Mr. Chameleon speaking to Detective Dave Arnold in police headquarters and saying... Well, after we couldn't find an Earl of Penton or a Prince Ludovic of Romany in the international who's who, I asked to get in touch with the English and Continental Police. Yes, sir. I've got the reports from them right here, Mr. Chameleon. They just came down. Well, what's the dope on them? Penton and Romany are phonies. They've been working together for years as confidence men in Europe until it got too hot for them. Then they came here. Uh-huh. But the big break is that the guy calling himself Penton 
is known as being pretty quick with a knife. Well, well. Uh, speaking of knives, Dave, there were two knives involved in this murder. Two knives? Mm-hmm. And get this, Dave. One of them was bought yesterday by Mrs. McGinnis. What? And not in a bargain basement, as she said, but from one of the most expensive places in town. Bought at the same shop that Romney bought his, and an exact duplicate. Hey, that pins a tight on the old dame, then. Looks that way, but uh, we'll soon find out. How? By my disguising myself as a clerk in the place that she bought it. Then we'll go out to the murder house. I'll identify her. And we'll see what happens. And now, inside the palatial living room of the McGinnis Mansion, we see Mr. Chameleon in one of his clever disguises, this time as Peter Gates, a mild-mannered clerk at one of New York's most expensive cutlery shops. And we hear him speak in the voice of his disguise, saying... Uh, Detective Arnold, it's my understanding that you wish me to identify the party who bought this knife from me yesterday. Well, that's easy. Don't look at me, whoever you are. Uh, Gates, sir. Peter Gates. If you say I bought that knife from you, you're lying. Oh, so you're the Earl of Penton. Yes, I thought so. Well, don't get up your blood pressure, my lord. I didn't say that you did. Uh, that lady over there bought the knife. I remember you perfectly, Mrs. McGinnis. Pleasure to serve you. Say that again, you old fossil, and I'll conk you on the head. I never seen this guy, Detective Arnold. And I never been inside Smith and Jones, that dump where he worked. Uh, Smith and Jones, eh? Oh. How do you know the knife came from Smith and Jones if you didn't buy it then? It's Mr. Chameleon in disguise. Oh, dear heaven, Mother. I warned you. I warned you not to kill Prince Ludovic. I say, Chameleon, I told you that old trout did the prince in. He wasn't a prince any more than you're the Earl of Penton. Your name is Sniffins. The prince's name was Martier, and both of you are crooks. What's that? Both with long police records in Europe. And you, you phony, are quick with a knife. We've got your records. Save your breath. Then Mother didn't kill the prince. Oh, forgive me, Mother. Please, Mother. Turn off your tears, Minerva. <laughs> you killed your phony prince yourself. I killed him. I killed him. Tell me why, Mr. Chameleon. I was mad about him, mad about him. You killed him because you overheard the strange bargain that he made with this man here, this bogus Earl of Penton. You're the murderer, Minerva McGuinness. I killed him when I heard the low-down bargain he made. I married him because I... Because you thought even with him dead, you'd go through life as the Princess of Romany. Only you won't. You're still Minerva McGuinness, any way you slice it. It's a darn sight better name, Mr. Chameleon, than the Princess Romany. I'm with you there, Mrs. McGuinness, to the limit. My mother planned the murder, Mr. Chameleon. She planned it all. She got me to execute it. That's why I'm arresting her, too, Minerva, as your accomplice. You can't arrest me, Chameleon. Just try it. You're a tough old baby, Bridget McGuinness, but you'll find out. Dave, handcuff them both. Take them in. It's a brutal shame that a time-honored name like old Mike McGuinness, boy, should be dragged in the dust by his wife and daughter. But murder is murder. And with these words, Mr. Chameleon concludes tonight's murder case. Wednesday night at this same time for Mr. Chameleon, the man of many faces. The part of Mr. Chameleon is played by Carl Swenson with dialogue by Frank Hummert from the original story by Frank and Anne Hummert. It is directed by Richard Leonard with music by Victor Arden. Your announcer is Howard Claney. Listen for Mr. Chameleon in The Dazed Girl, murder case, next Wednesday night at this time.
This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Tonight, we again present the famous Mr. Chameleon of Central Police Headquarters in his famous cases of crime and murder. Mr. Chameleon, as you know, is the famous and dreaded detective who frequently uses a disguise to track down a killer, a disguise which at all times is recognized by the audience. Tonight, we give you Mr. Chameleon in The Dazed Girl Murder Case. It is three o'clock of a bright autumn afternoon, and in grim contrast to the brisk air and brilliant sunshine outside, we look into the foreboding office of the astute and dreaded Mr. Chameleon at police headquarters. Attracted by the beauty of the day, he steps to the window and gazes at the street below, when suddenly his door is flung open, and the commissioner of police hurriedly enters, saying... Uh, Chameleon, let me give you this quick. Yes, Commissioner? I'm sending Detective Arnold in with a dazed, hysterical girl who says she just saw a ghastly murder committed. What? Yes. I saw it. I saw it that horrible knife. The blood. Easy, Miss. Take it. Yeah, that's all she'll say, Chameleon. The knife and the blood. Uh. Oh, Miss Wren. This is Mr. Chameleon. The knife. The blood. Oh. Uh, leave it to you, Chameleon. Maybe you can get something out of her. Bye. Well, you look like a girl in need of a friend, Miss Wren. What do your friends call you? Eileen. But I have no friends. The only one I have. I saw murdered this afternoon. It was my guardian, Glenville Ferguson. Oh, he was so kind. He couldn't believe there was wickedness in anyone. Eileen, uh, start at the beginning. And tell me exactly what happened. Well, Mr. Chameleon, I was in my guardian's study this afternoon sitting across the desk from him when he said... Eileen, dear, you're making me very happy. I know you're getting better. You'll soon be the girl you were when you came to me. Yes. But I still keep seeing murder in this house. Oh, da, 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 Eileen, don't get back on that track again. It's just what we're trying to cure. But I tell you, I beg you to listen. Your own sister, Mrs. Lambert, she's going to kill you. <laughs> Elizabeth going to kill me? Nonsense. She's bringing people to this house to murder them. I I've heard the screams. The terror of it. <laughs> well, at least she's not murdering anybody now. She's baking a loaf of bread. Oh. And any minute, she'll bring it in here. Hot and give each of us a piece. How's this for homemade bread, Glenville? Oh. Make your mouth water? Oh. You here too, Eileen? You... You haven't cut it. That knife on the tray. Eileen. I'm going back to my room. Eileen, don't, don't, don't. Stay. Watch out! Jump! She's coming behind you with a knife, huh? <laughs> at last, Glenville, at last. The time to kill you has come. Ah! Oh, no! Oh! No! Help! Help! I ran out of the house, Mr. Chameleon, and came here to police headquarters. Oh, the knife, the blood, the way she laughed. It's drumming in my ears. It's driving me mad. Detective Arnold, Dave, quick, get the car. Come along, Eileen. Here's the house. Here's the house, Mr. Chameleon. I'll, I'll give you my key. Now, let me open the door, Eileen. Here's the room, Mr. Chameleon, where my guardian was murdered. Huh. I don't see a body here, Dave. 
Not a sign, Mr. Chameleon. That's what she does. She murders people and destroys their bodies. I know. Mm. I know. Eileen, where were you? I've been looking everywhere for you. Keep her away from me, Mr. Chameleon. She's the woman. My guardian sister, Mrs. Lambert. Easy, Eileen. There's nothing to be afraid of now. Who are these men, Eileen? I'm Chameleon of the police. This is Detective Arnold. The police? Why are you here? To investigate the murder of your brother, Mrs. Lambert. Where is his body? His body? Why? Glenville? Glenville! Yes, Elizabeth? Did you call me? No. No! Oh, it, it can't be. I, I saw you murdered. Oh. Poor child, she's fainted, Elizabeth. I'll run up and get something to give her. I prefer that you give her nothing, Mrs. Lambert. What? Dave, you pick up Eileen, please. Put her on the sofa in the hall. Right. Mr. Chameleon. I've taken care of Eileen ever since she came here a year ago. For the present, the police are going to take care of her, Mrs. Lambert. I have no objections. But I can't understand your attitude. The girl is insane. I wonder. She's not insane, Elizabeth. Eileen's only subject to hallucinations, Mr. Chameleon. They'll, they'll soon pass over. Hallucinations and insanity are one and the same, Glenville. She came to police headquarters in an hysterical state. Insane state, you mean, Mr. Chameleon. And reported that she saw you murder your brother this morning. That doesn't surprise me, Mr. Chameleon. Strange it should you, a famous detective. Is Eileen the first case of insanity you've ever met with in your career? Besides, my brother, the murdered man, is standing right here. Mm-hmm. So he is. Well, I should think that's what would surprise you. It would. If it weren't for that big splotch of red on the carpet behind the desk. Where? It's not blood, Mr. Chameleon. I knocked over a bottle of red ink when I dusted my brother's desk early this morning. What's that, Elizabeth? I forgot to tell you, Glenville. Besides, Mr. Chameleon, what great mystery is there in a bit of red ink on a carpet? It's not a bit, Mrs. Lambert. It would take a quart to make that bigger splotch. What if it's a gallon? Does red ink indicate murder to you? I'm beginning to think you're as insane as Eileen, Mr. Chameleon. Who knows? Anyway, please leave the room, Mrs. Lambert. Why, I won't. I want to talk to your brother alone, Mrs. Lambert. Please leave. Don't make a scene, Elizabeth. Very well. I'll leave. But let me tell you, Mr. Chameleon, my brother is as insane as Eileen. Strange, Mr. Ferguson. Uh, when you said don't make a scene to your sister, it flashed across my mind she would have made a wonderful actress. Oh, that's what she was. And a great one, Mr. Chameleon. Oh, I don't recall ever seeing her. It was in South Africa. That's where I come from. Elizabeth was an idol there. You didn't follow the uh, profession yourself, did you? <laughs> Heavens no. I was in business, import and export. But I've lived in America some 20 years. Uh -huh. Tell me about Eileen. Now, she says that uh, she is your ward. It was a surprising thing, Mr. Chameleon. I knew her father years ago in Pretoria. Oh, so she comes from South Africa too? Yes. I'd almost completely forgotten her father when I got a cable from his lawyer saying he died. And made me Eileen's guardian. Uh -huh. That was a year ago. Uh -huh. And on top of the cable, in popped Eileen. We all loved her on sight. Your uh, sister Elizabeth doesn't indicate that. Oh, well, she's highly strung, temperamental, always the actress. Mr. Chameleon, you know, but at heart she's kind and devoted. Just like my son is. Your son? Yes. Tragedy for him. He married Eileen before... before your son uh, is married to her? Uh, does he think that she is insane? Yes, he and my sister. But I don't. I know she's not. She began getting temporary hallucinations when she learned the real truth about her father. Somebody told her. The real truth about her father? From believing that he was a rich and respected man, she learned he was a dangerous criminal. He was actually killed in a bank robbery. And Eileen did not know that until after his death. She was at school in Switzerland at the time. Some kind friends kept it from her. When she found it out, she... Uh, she... They developed the hallucinations that you speak of? Yes, yes. That my sister Elizabeth lures people to this house, murders them, and does away with their bodies. It's horrible. But she'll recover, Mr. Chameleon. I know she will. Um, Mr. Glenville, do you notice an odor of acid in this house? I believe I do. I was wondering what it was. What do you think it can be? I don't know yet. 
It might be something pretty terrible. Let's wait until we find out. But what... Very glad to have met you, Mr. Glenville. I shall tell you when I know. Goodbye. Oh, Dave. You're still here in the hall waiting for me, eh? Well, you're looking brighter, Eileen. Yes, she came out of her faint pretty good, Mr. Chameleon. You don't think I'm insane about what's going on in this house, do you, Mr. Chameleon? No, Eileen, I don't. Come along. Dave Arnold and I will put you up in a hotel. No. No, I can't leave my guardian, Mr. Ferguson. She'll kill him. All right. If that's the way you feel. But I'll be back. I'm going to find out what's going on in this house. All right, Dave, let's go. Hey, what is all this about coming back here, Mr. Chameleon? That kid's nuts. We're out on a dud. We're coming back, Dave, tonight. Probably to dig up the body of a murdered person from under the garage that connects with the library. What? A body that's probably being eaten away in a buried acid tank. Or maybe there's more than one body. Holy mackerel. Dave, did you notice how long that man has been walking up and down in front of this house? Oh, that, that one-armed guy. Mm-hmm. Gosh, it slipped me. He was at the door asking to talk to you. Oh. All right, I'll talk to him. Okay. Hey, mister. This is Mr. Chameleon. Thank you, Detective Arnold. I don't want to intrude, Mr. Chameleon, but I think I can help you. Yes? How? By informing you that Eileen is not insane. She knows precisely what she's talking about. If you permit anyone in that house to put across to you that she is mad... You'll be making a frightful mistake. You seem to know a great deal. What's your name? When the proper time comes, I'll tell you. In the meanwhile, think of me as the man who knows. Don't listen. Oh, incidentally, the next time I turn up, it will be when you need me most. Goodbye, Mr. Chameleon. Hey, how do you figure that bird, Mr. Chameleon? I think he's exactly what he claims, Dave. A man who knows a lot. And who'll turn up again at the right time. It looks like this is turning out to be a pretty dirty case. We've never been on a worse one, Dave. All right, let's be off to headquarters. I want to pick up a couple of our boys to dig up under that garage tonight. Well, everything's set, Mr. Chameleon. Got a couple of the boys waiting with shovels ready for digging. When do we start? Well, it's uh, nine now and about half an hour, Dave. You better take a couple of charges of dynamite along. We may have to blow up the concrete floor. I hope we don't, though. Some kid just left this letter for you, Mr. Chameleon. Oh, thank you, Foley. What is it, Mr. Chameleon? Hmm. I'll read it, Dave. Dear Chameleon, I've always admired you, so I'm giving you a tip-off. The parties you suspect are fixing to murder Eileen Wren in the bushes about 200 feet down from the 110th Street entrance to Central Park at 9.30, prompt tonight. Be there and you'll bag them all. Signed, a friend. It's that bird who called himself the man who knows. He's out to get you, Mr. Chameleon. Don't go. I'm going. And alone, Dave. Take your boys out to the mystery house and start digging. I'll meet you there later. This is the spot, I guess. Hi, Chameleon. Yeah. So you fell for my bill, I do. <laughs> Smart cop. Well, bless my soul. Sandy Hauser. Gotta feel pretty proud, Chameleon. <laughs> I'm getting five grand for bumping you off. Drop that gun. Drop it. Why, that's very easy. I don't need it, Sandy. I've got three cops standing behind you. What? Are you dirty double crossing? <laughs> You murder, chameleon. You, you kill me. Hmm. 
He's dead, all right. Oh, poor dumb Sandy. You shouldn't have looked around. Chameleon calling central headquarters. Foley talking, Mr. Chameleon. I just killed Sandy Hauser near 110th Street in the park. Pick up the body. Okay, Mr. Chameleon. And send a detail to surround the house where Detective Arnold is waiting for me. Get word to him that I'll be there right away. Gotcha. And put out every tracer on the force to get the lowdown on a man named Glenville Ferguson. And especially his sister, Elizabeth Lambert. Bye, Foley. Mr. Chameleon and the Dazed Girl murder case continues in just a moment. And now back to Mr. Chameleon and the Dazed Girl murder case. It is a few minutes later, and we see Mr. Chameleon whispering to Detective Arnold as they quietly enter the garage, where he has said he believes the bodies of murdered persons will be found. And we hear him say... Have you unearthed anything yet, Dave? The boys are still digging, Mr. Chameleon. Uh -huh. Putting the earth on top of sacks to keep everything nice and quiet. Good. I think they hit it now, Dave. Quick, everybody. Put on those gas masks. Those acid fumes may be deadly. Hey, boys, put on these masks. Okay. Okay. Now quietly lift the top off that vat. It's loose. It's a vat, all right, Mr. Chameleon. Mm. But I don't see anything in it. Fish around the bottom, boys, with those grappling hooks. Good thing you brought them. It's part of the body, Mr. Chameleon. Uh, there's not much left of it, Dave. Seems to be in pieces. Keep on dragging the bottom. Okay. There comes a skull. Keep moving. We want to get out of here without being caught if we can. It's the rest of the body. Practically nothing left of it. Well, there's not much for us to go on. I may be able to get some fingerprints, though. Uh, maybe. All right, gather it up, Dave. Rush it to the laboratory. We can at least get the approximate height. And there's a bullet hole through the skull. Okay, Mr. Chameleon. Come along, Dave. Help! Help! That sounds like Eileen. Quick, Dave, come! Help! 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 What's going on here? He's trying to murder me, Mr. Chameleon. Keep him away. Who are you? I'm Jim Ferguson, this batty dame's husband. Glenville Ferguson's son. I'm not married to him. He's not my husband. I loathe him. Oh, don't let him touch me, Mr. Chameleon. I told you she was nuts, Mr. Chameleon. I don't have to murder her to get rid of her. She'll kill herself someday. I'm not married to him. Like to see the marriage license, Mr. Chameleon? I'll get it out of this drawer. Look out, Dave. He's got a gun. Sure. And I'll kill you before I'll be arrested on a crazy girl's word. I'll kill you anyhow. My Aunt Elizabeth told me you were after me. No! Oh. Oh. Did you shoot him, Mr. Chameleon? I was just getting set when... No, no. The shot came through the window, Dave. It's lucky he's not dead. We need him in our business. But who fired the shot? I think that the man who calls himself the man who knows. He said he'd turn up when I needed him most. Oh, what next? Uh, look in that drawer. See if there is a marriage license there, Dave. Holy mackerel, there is. Look at it. Oh. That well, seems to be in order. Oh, I never married Jim Ferguson. He's a loathsome creature. What's happened here? I heard a shot. Oh, this insane girl killed my nephew, Jim. He's not dead, Mrs. Lambert. Just a flesh wound. Glenville! Glenville, come here. What is it, Elizabeth? This insane girl, Eileen, shot Jim. Eileen is in not insane, Elizabeth, and I don't believe she shot him. Are you all right, Jim, my boy? We're taking him to headquarters for treatment, Mr. Ferguson. Dave, you help him along, please. Chameleon's lying, Father. He's arresting me. You have no right to arrest this boy. No, Mrs. Lambert. I found a body in an acid vat under the garage of this house. I told you that girl Eileen was insane, Glenville. Oh, what has she been up to? This girl is behind everything, Mr. Chameleon. She's always shrieking about murder. I'm taking Eileen to headquarters, too, for safekeeping. Come along, Eileen. Yes, Mr. Chameleon. Good night, Mrs. Lambert. 
And Mr. Ferguson. Oh, what a night, Mr. Chameleon. You come over here, Dave, please. Yeah? I'll take these people in. You stay here. Take every radio out of this house and then call headquarters. Uh huh. Have every radio station broadcast that Mr. Chameleon is urgently in need of the party who called himself the man who knows and does. And ask him to come to my office in the morning. And Mr. Chameleon's message bore fruit. For next morning, we find him in headquarters with a man who calls himself the man who knows. And we hear this man saying... As I was saying, Mr. Chameleon, my name is Talbot and I am a police officer from South Africa. And uh, you are positive, Mr. Talbot, that the acid-soaked body we found was Elizabeth Lambert's husband and that she murdered him when he traced her hair. Certainly. She was purposely trying to drive Eileen mad. She knew Eileen had actually seen her murder her husband. And I'm positive Elizabeth Lambert forged the marriage certificate between her nephew, Jim Ferguson, and Eileen. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, it was forged, all right. She knew Eileen, far from being poor, had inherited one of the biggest fortunes in South Africa. And she proposed to get her hands on it. She made Eileen believe her father was murdered and was a criminal. She did that to shatter that young girl's mind. Elizabeth Lambert didn't tell me that story, Talbot. Her brother, Glenville Ferguson, told me. But our reports show him to be strictly on the up and up. Then his sister put him up to telling you. He doesn't know what's going on half the time, Camille. Did it ever occur to you that Eileen's insanity might be feigned and that she's our murderer? That's impossible, Camille. What about the body you fished out of the acid vat? It matches the Lambert woman's husband, doesn't it? It may be a plant of Eileen's. I know a way to find out, Talbot. Oh, how, comedian? A trigger man hired by someone in the murder house tried to spot me last night, and I killed him. I'm going to disguise myself as one of his pals, and I'm going to confront our suspects as his successor and offer to bump myself off for $5,000. The one who accepts is the murderer. Well, that's an idea, comedian. You go out with us, Talbot? I wouldn't miss it for a thousand pounds, comedian. Later in the day, we see Mr. Chameleon in his disguise as Bill Tosco, trigger man, in the Ferguson home. And as he speaks in the voice of his disguise, he says, Uh, what's my proposition? My pal got bumped trying to bump Chameleon. I'll take the same chance that he did for five grand. I can get Chameleon. I know my way around. Don't fall for this, Aunt Elizabeth. I'm not, Jim. If you don't, lady, I turn you to the cops myself. You're a murderess, Mrs. Lambert. But if you give this man money to kill Mr. Chameleon, I'll warn him. I saw you kill a man myself. Eileen, be quiet. Don't listen to this girl, Tosco. This girl's insane. You told Chameleon she wasn't Glenville Ferguson. I got that through the grapevine. Give him the money, Elizabeth. Don't go up for murder. Well, well, Ferguson, so you're the one. Cover him, Dave. Shoot to kill if he moves. Mr. Chameleon. Chameleon. Right the first time, I'm Chameleon. Listen, Chameleon, I didn't kill anybody. I told my sister to pay you off to keep her out of a scandalous mess. Keep him covered, Dave. Yes, sir. This is outrageous, Mr. Chameleon. My brother wouldn't hurt anybody. You're as crazy as this girl. Not so crazy that I failed to see that red ink on your carpet, Mrs. Lambert. And not so crazy that I didn't get the flash you and your brother were trying to drive this sweet girl mad by simulating a murder before her eyes. Handcuff Elizabeth Lambert, too, Dave. Haul them both in. Just don't move, Elizabeth. I'm pretty handy with this gun. Well, Talbot, Mr. The Man Who Knows, who do you think was right in this case? I think we both were right, Mr. Comedian. (laughs) Yes, it seems so. Well, let's have dinner together tonight. I think I owe you one. Okay, Dave, that's all. Charge them with first-degree murder. Tell them about the charms of the electric chair on the way to headquarters. And with these words, Mr. Chameleon concludes tonight's murder case.
Listen next Wednesday night at this same time for Mr. Chameleon, the man of many faces. The part of Mr. Chameleon is played by Carl Swenson with dialogue by Frank Hummert from the original story by Frank and Ann Hummert. It is directed by Richard Leonard with music by Victor Arden. Your announcer is Howard Claney. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Tonight, we again present the famous Mr. Chameleon of Central Police Headquarters in his famous cases of crime and murder. Mr. Chameleon, as you know, is the famous and dreaded detective who frequently uses a disguise to track down a killer. A disguise which at all times is recognized by the audience. 
Tonight we give you Mr. Chameleon in The Broken Promise Murder Case. Our scene opens in a small but well-furnished apartment in New York's Greenwich Village. An attractive woman in her early 30s and a good-looking young man are having cocktails before the fireplace. The woman is Sybil Kent, and the young man at whom she looks with adoring eyes is Roger Dalton. And Roger, little dreaming that his words are to be the preamble to murder, is saying eagerly, This is the moment I've been waiting for, Sybil. I've got terrific news for you. News, Roger? I've finally landed it, Sybil. That job as an artist with the advertising agency. Roger, oh, darling. That agency is one of the most important advertising firms in town. I'm to start work the beginning of the week. And it's all thanks to you, Sybil. Oh, Roger, that's wonderful. Because it means that now at last we can go ahead with our plans. What? What do you mean, Sybil? Oh, Roger, darling. Do, do I have to say it? Our understanding was that as soon as you graduated from art school and got a job, we'd, we'd be married. Great Scott, you, you mean you took that seriously? What? Roger, you, you know that was our agreement. But, Sybil, I, I never dreamt you were really serious. I always thought it was well, a kind of joke between us. A joke? Roger, you... The fact is, I've made plans of my own. I'm going to marry Vera Langdon. You... That's something else I meant to tell you this evening. You're going to marry Vera Langdon? After all I've done for you. All the sacrifices I've made for you. Sybil, you've been a wonderful friend. And I mean to pay you back someday. Pay me back? Roger Dalton, you're not throwing me over for that society girl, Vera Langdon. Not when I've done everything for you. When I've spent every penny I have to put you through art school. Sybil, listen to me. No, no, you listen. Roger, if... If you leave me, I'll go to the agency where you got this job. I'll fix things so that you'll be through for good with every agency in town. What's more, I'll, I'll go to Vera Langdon and that wealthy father of hers and show you up for the selfish, ruthless here you are. You're not serious. You're, you're talking nonsense, Sybil. I'll, I'll go even further, Roger. I'll, I'll kill you before I give you up to someone else. Do you hear me, Roger? I'll kill you! <laughs> And the next morning, after a sleepless, maddening night, we see a hysterical Sybil Kent clutching the edge of a desk in her living room and saying over and over to herself, I won't. I won't give Roger up. I can't. I can't. Who's that coming in the door? Lucy? Lucy, is that you? Answer me. Oh, it's you. You've come to kill me. You've come to kill me! Ah! And a short time later, we find Mr. Chameleon, the famous and dreaded detective, and his assistant, Detective Dave Arnold, at Sybil Kent's apartment, which has become the scene of violence and tragedy. Near them, a young woman sits quietly as Chameleon says to Dave... Sybil Kent was shot through the heart in that close range, Dave. I'd say the murder took place about an hour ago. Oh, that'd be about ten o'clock, Mr. Chameleon. Mm -hmm. But nothing in the room has been touched, so it doesn't look like the motive was robbery. No. Mr. Chameleon, I, I just can't believe it. Sybil murdered. It's horrible. Yes, Miss Lucy. Uh, you say that you are the murdered woman's sister. Yes. Sybil was all I had in the world. Now, oh dear heaven, what am I going to do? Well, first you must try to compose yourself, Lucy. Now, tell me exactly what happened. Mr. Chameleon, could we open the window? I, I feel as if I were going to be ill. Yes. Uh, Dave, open one of the windows, please. Right away, Mr. Chameleon. Yes, that smell of fresh paint in this apartment is rather oppressive. All the apartments in this building are being repainted. They finished work on this one only yesterday. Now, Lucy, tell me when and how you discovered your sister Sybil's body. I... I left the apartment around nine o'clock to go shopping. 
When I came back an hour later, I found Sybil lying there by the desk, shot to death. You lived here with your sister? Yes, Mr. Chameleon. Alone? Yes, why? Would you mind removing that heavy veil that you're wearing? Yes, I'll remove my veil. Look at me. Look at me. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry that I asked you to do that, Lucy. I've looked this way for over a year. I got these dreadful scars in an automobile accident. The doctors say they can't do anything for me. I'll go through life this way. I asked you, Lucy, because I wondered why a young girl like you should be wearing a heavy veil. If it hadn't been for Sybil, I don't know what I would have done. She was so kind to me. And now he's murdered her. He? Lucy, do you mean that you know who the murderer is? You just told me that you were out of the apartment when your sister was shot. Mr. Chameleon, I know who did it. It was Roger Dalton. Roger Dalton? Who's he? He's an artist. My sister Sybil was in love with him. She gave him money to go through art school. Well, that scarcely indicates a motive for murder. No. Well, Roger led her to believe they'd be married as soon as he graduated and got a job. I see. And yesterday, Roger landed a good job with an advertising agency. Yes. Last night, he came to tell Sybil about it. Instead of keeping his agreement to marry my sister, Roger told Sybil he thought it was just a joke. That he'd never had any intention of marrying her. What did your sister Sybil say to that, Lucy? She was incredulous, Mr. Chameleon. And then Roger told her he was going to marry Vera Langdon. Vera Langdon? You mean the society debutante who's always getting into some sort of scrape? Yes, Mr. Chameleon. Roger said he was going to marry her. My sister Sybil was furious. She told Roger she'd go to the advertising agency. Yes, and to Vera Langdon and her father and expose him for the selfish heel he was. And uh, what did Roger say to that? He left. But don't you see, Mr. Chameleon, Roger must have come back this morning and murdered Sybil. No one else had a reason to harm my sister. Everyone loved her. Everyone, Lucy? Including you? Mr. Chameleon, what do you mean? I was thinking, Lucy, that sometimes sisters don't get along together. I know what you were thinking. That Sybil was a very beautiful girl while I'm ugly. Go ahead and say it, Mr. Chameleon. I know it's true. But if you think I killed Sybil because I was jealous of her beauty, well, you're mistaken. I haven't accused you of anything, Lucy. Roger Dalton killed her, Mr. Chameleon, and I want him to pay for it with his life. You may be sure the person who killed your sister will pay for the crime, Lucy. Come along, Dave. Where to, Mr. Chameleon? Have a talk with Roger Dalton, the man whose career and coming marriage might have been destroyed if Sybil Kent had lived. And ten minutes later, Mr. Chameleon and Detective Dave Arnold are in Roger Dalton's apartment, and Roger is saying dazedly, Sybil, dead? Murdered? Mr. Chameleon, I, I can't believe it. You're either telling the truth, Roger Dalton, or you're a very clever actor. What? I don't know what you're talking about, Mr. Chameleon. Why, only last evening I was with Sybil Kent. We had dinner at her apartment. Tell me about last evening, Roger. What? There isn't anything to tell. I, I don't know what you mean. Roger, this girl in the photograph on your dresser, very beautiful girl. Do you mind telling me who she is? She's Vera Langdon, a girl I plan to marry. Vera Langdon, the daughter of the well-known stockbroker, Hubert Langdon? Yes, what of it? Merely this, Roger. Marriage into a family of such wealth is quite an achievement for a struggling young commercial artist. Some people might think in terms of money, but I'm in love with Vera. So much so that you'd kill to protect your plans to marry her? What? Good Lord, you don't think I murdered Sybil Kent? Well, that's fantastic. Sybil was my friend. She did a great deal for me. In what way? Well, she had a good job, a buyer in a department store. She... Lent me money to go through art school. Lent it or gave it to you, Roger? I had every intention of paying her back as soon as I got work, Mr. Chameleon. Paying her or marrying her as payment for the debt? Roger, tell me the truth. Did you make a bargain to marry her and then try to welch on it? No. No, Mr. Chameleon. Sybil had some fantastic idea that we'd be married, but I never encouraged her. I thought it was just a joke. But you took her money and her friendship and used them to your own advantage. No, no. I, I felt badly when I realized she'd misunderstood the situation. But I didn't kill her, Mr. Chameleon. I swear I didn't. According to her sister, Lucy Kent, you had an excellent motive... The Lucy told you that? That and a good deal more. Mr. Chameleon, why don't you ask Lucy about her own motive? Her own motive? And uh, just what would that motive be, Roger? You've seen Lucy. 
You've seen the veil she wears to hide her disfigured face. Why don't you ask her how it became disfigured? She's already told me. No, uh, automobile accident. Did Lucy tell you who was driving the car? Do you mean that you were driving it? No, I wasn't driving it. Her sister, Sybil, was. And Lucy blamed her for the accident. Blamed her for the fact her face was horribly disfigured for life. I often warned Sybil not to live alone with Lucy. I was afraid she'd go overboard sometime and a thing like this would happen. I see. Mr. Chameleon, if anyone had a reason for killing Sybil, it's her own sister, Lucy. Thank you, Roger. Come along, Dave. We're through here for the moment. What do you think, Mr. Chameleon? Uh, I don't know, Dave. Right now, I think they'll pay a call on Vera Langdon, Roger Dalton's fiance. <laughs> This is some layout, Mr. Chameleon. Well, Hubert Langdon is a very wealthy man, Dave. Devoted to his daughter, Vera, from what I've heard. Yes, what is it? I'd like to speak to Miss Vera Langdon. I'm sorry, but my daughter's not at home. Who are you? I'm Chameleon of Central Police Headquarters. This is Detective Arnold. The police? And you, I take it, are Hubert Langdon, Vera's father. May we come in, please? Now, look, if my daughter is in some sort of little scrape, I'm sure it can be straightened out. I'll come down to headquarters with you and... Mr. Langdon, I suggest that we step inside. Now, see here. This isn't as minor as one of your daughter's little scrapes. It's a matter of murder. Murder? Yes. You'd, you'd better come inside. What is it, Father? Vera. So, your daughter is at home after all, Mr. Langdon. Who are these men, Father? What do they want? Go to your room, Vera. I'll handle this. Stay where you are, Vera Langdon. I'm Chameleon of the police. I'm here to question you about the murder of Sybil Kent, shot to death in her apartment two hours ago. Sybil Kent? Mr. Chameleon, why should you question my daughter about someone she's never even heard of? Mr. Chameleon, who on earth is this, this Sybil Kent? A rather important person in the life of the man that you plan to marry, Vera. And I can hardly believe that her name is unfamiliar to you. You heard what Vera said, Chameleon. She's never heard of Sybil Kent. And you, Mr. Langdon? I suppose you've never heard of her either. Well, I I think I heard that she was a friend of young Roger Dalton's, but I've never met her. I. Uh, why are you staring at me, Chameleon? Because I just noticed something rather interesting, Mr. Langdon. You say that you've never met Sybil Kent. Then how do you explain the fact that the sleeve of your coat is spotted with blue paint? What? Bl blue paint? The murdered Sybil Kent's apartment was freshly painted yesterday. The same color of paint that's on the sleeve of your coat. Mr. Chameleon and the Broken Promise murder case continues in just a moment. And now back to Mr. Chameleon and the Broken Promise murder case. When Sybil Kent is shot to death in her apartment, Mr. Chameleon discovers that several people had strong reason to want to kill her. There is Roger Dalton, the young artist, who had made a bargain to marry Sybil. And Sybil's young sister, Lucy, whose face was pitifully disfigured through an accident in a car driven by Sybil. And now in the apartment of Roger Dalton's fiancée, the debutante Vera Langdon, Mr. Chameleon faces Vera and her arrogant father, Hugh Langdon, and he is saying... Mr. Langdon, you deny ever having met Sybil Kent, the murdered woman. Certainly I deny it, Chameleon. I never saw Sybil Kent in my life. Then how do you explain those blue paint stains on your coat? <gasps> Father! Sybil Kent's apartment was freshly painted yesterday. The same color as those stains on the sleeve of your coat. Now, Mr. Langdon, how do you explain that? All right. All right, Chameleon. I admit that I have met Sybil Kent. I went to see her this morning. You went to her apartment this morning. What time is this? About nine o'clock. Mm-hmm. Last night, my daughter's fiancé, Roger Dalton, came to me and told me about this woman, Sybil Kent, who'd given him money to go through art school. He made a bargain to marry her and then tried to back out. Go on, Mr. Langdon. Well, Roger asked me to lend him the money to pay Sybil back. 
I told him I'd go to see her, find out just how much he owed her, and pay it. Yes? So I went to her apartment this morning. And you quarreled with her? No, of course I didn't, Mr. Chameleon. She agreed to accept my check for $5,000. Langdon, Detective Arnold and I searched the murder apartment, and we found no check from you. I intended to make it out this afternoon, Mr. Chameleon. I... Look, I swear to you, that's the truth. If so, Mr. Langdon, you've placed yourself in a highly suspicious position. I don't know what you mean. You may have gone to the dead woman's apartment, but perhaps not for the reason you claim. You're devoted to your daughter, aren't you, Mr. Langdon? Why, of course I'm devoted to Vera. Enough to kill for her? What? If you knew that Sybil Kent might cause her unhappiness, might prevent her marriage to Roger Dalton... Mr. Chameleon, you're becoming ridiculous. Oh, really, Vera? Well, I'm not overlooking the fact that possibly you also had a motive. Uh, if you believe Sybil Kent threatened your marriage to the man you love... I didn't even know Sybil Kent. Mr. Langdon, have you a gun? No. Why should I? And you, Vera? Oh, don't be absurd. Of course I don't have a gun. I see. All right, Dave, let's be going. Are you through questioning us, Mr. Chameleon? For the moment, Mr. Langdon. But I warn you and your daughter, Vera, that it's a very dangerous thing to lie in a murder investigation. Come along, Dave. Oh, Father, you shouldn't have lied about Sybil. Mr. Chameleon is very clever and... Where are you going? To my desk, Vera, to check on something. It's gone. What is? The gun that I always keep in this drawer. Vera, where is it? What? I don't know what you're talking about. Now, look, don't lie to me, Vera. I told Chameleon that I don't have a gun, but you and I both know that I keep one in this drawer. And now it's gone. Father! Darling, darling, listen to me. No matter what you've done, I'll protect you. Only tell me where you've hidden the gun so I can get rid of it. So we can be sure Chameleon will never learn the truth. Half an hour later, at the murder apartment, Lucy Kent answers the doorbell to find Mr. Chameleon and Detective Dave Arnold in the hall. Mr. Chameleon, you've come to tell me you've arrested Roger Dalton for my sister's murder. Tell me, Lucy, why are you so anxious to see Roger Dalton punished for your sister's death? Because I want justice done, Mr. Chameleon. I adored my sister, Sybil. She gave me a home with her. She took care of me after my dreadful accident. Lucy, why didn't you tell me that you blamed your sister for the accident in which your face was disfigured? But I didn't. I didn't, Mr. Chameleon. Sybil was driving the car, but it wasn't her fault. She... Please don't make me talk about it. Excuse me, I want to get a handkerchief from my bag on the table. Oh, I'll give it to you. Here. Oh, I'm sorry. But... This is clumsy of me, letting the bag slip from my hand like that. I'll gather up these things. Well, well. What is it, Mr. Chameleon? A snapshot of Roger Dalton. Fell out of your bag, Lucy. Give me that picture. You dropped my bag on purpose to find out what I had in it. Odd that you carry a picture of Roger Dalton with you, Lucy. I... I don't know what you mean. It may mean that you're in love with Roger yourself. In love with... He stopped looking at me. And you bitterly resented your sister Sybil's bargain to marry him. I... Mr. Chameleon, even if I did love Roger, I wouldn't murder my own sister Sybil because of him. Perhaps not, Lucy. I won't see any more. Dave, we're going back to headquarters. Yes, sir. What about Roger Dalton? Aren't you going to arrest him? You do hate him now, don't you, Lucy? I'll make an arrest when I have proof of who your sister's murderer is. Come along, Dave. I want to see the commissioner of police. So, there it is, Commissioner. Four people had equally strong motives for killing Sybil Kent. Uh, it's quite a case, Chameleon. Yes. Commissioner, I'm beginning to get an idea. You mean one of your famous disguises, Chameleon? Yes, Commissioner. The murdered Sybil Kent's apartment was freshly painted yesterday, and that gave me an idea. Well, let's hear it, Chameleon. I'm going to disguise myself as Oscar Dobbs, a house painter. 
I want Detective Dave Arnold to get all the suspects together at the murder apartment in an hour. Uh -huh. I have a feeling that disguised as Oscar Dobbs, a house painter, I will trap Sybil Kent's murderer. <laughs> And an hour later, in the hall outside Sybil Kent's apartment, Mr. Chameleon, his face disguised and wearing painter's cap and overalls, is saying to Detective Dave Arnold, You know what to do, Dave. You bet I do, Mr. Chameleon. All the suspects are in the Kent's apartment. Yes, sir. The dead woman's sister, Lucy, Roger Dalton, Roger's fiancée, Vera Langdon, and Vera's father, Mr. Langdon. Good. Get out of sight now, Dave. I'm going to ring the bell. And now, a moment later, the door is opened by Lucy Kent and Mr. Chameleon, speaking in the voice of his disguise, says to her, I, uh, beg your pardon, miss. I was here the other day. Me and another guy painting your apartment. You mind if I come in? Yes, I do mind. I'm very busy. I got a feeling you ain't too busy to talk to me, Lucy Kent. So, uh, I'll just come in. No. How dare you push your way in here? What's the matter, Lucy? Who is this man? He's one of the painters, Roger. He shoved his way in here. Get out of here, whoever you are, or I'll call the police. The police? Uh, that's a good one. What's going on here? Mr. Langdon, this horrid man forced his way into the apartment. Who are you? The name is Dobbs. Oscar Dobbs. I know a young lady was murdered here this morning. Now see here, Dobbs. I bet you're old Hubert Langdon. And that uh, pretty girl there is your daughter, Miss Vera Langdon. How could you possibly know? I've seen your pictures in the papers lots of times. You've been in quite a lot of trouble, ain't you, Vera? How dare you talk to my daughter that way? Get out! Oh, not so fast, Mr. Langdon. I uh, just seen Mr. Chameleon, the detective, in the lobby. I heard him say that he was coming up here to question all the suspects in the murder of Sybil Kent. Well, that's no concern of yours. You're wrong. You're wrong there, Roger Dalton. A house painter gets around. He hears and sees things. About uh, 10 o'clock this morning, I was painting the apartment right below this one. I heard a shot. You... You heard it. I stepped out into the hall where nobody could see me. A couple of minutes later, someone came running down the stairs. Got a good look at this person. A good look. You're lying. And uh, I could point a finger at that person. But a man's got to look out for himself. What are you getting at, Dobbs? Well, Mr. Langdon, I'm willing to forget what I saw, providing it's made worth my while. Wait. You cheap blackmail. No, let's call it protection, shall we, Miss Lucy Kent? Protection for the person who killed your sister. Shut up, Dobbs. You'll never tell anyone what you know. You were a fool to come here. Roger, good heavens, don't shoot him. I'm not as big a fool as you to pull a gun, Roger Dalton. Mr. Chameleon, it's you. You were disguised as a house painter. Yes, Lucy. Oh, you double-crossing cop, you tricked me. And my trick apparently succeeded. Put down the gun, Roger Dalton. Not before I put a bullet in your head, Chameleon. Roger, no! Oh, no! You okay, Mr. Chameleon? Yes, Dave. You shot the gun out of his hand just in time. I've got it now. And it's undoubtedly the gun with which Roger Dalton murdered Sybil Kent. Oh, Roger. Roger, what have you done? How could you kill her? I did it for you, Vera. Sybil threatened to ruin all my plans, my whole life. I couldn't bear the thought that she might turn you against me. Last night I took the gun from your father's desk, came here this morning, and, and killed her. And you tried to put the blame on an innocent girl, on Lucy Kent. That, Roger Dalton, was almost as great a crime as murder. But you'll pay for both in the death chamber. All right, Dave, take him away. <laughs> And with these words, Mr. Chameleon concludes tonight's murder case. Listen next Wednesday night at this same time for Mr. Chameleon, the man of many faces. The part of Mr. Chameleon is played by Carl Swenson with dialogue by Gene Carroll, based on the original story by Frank and Ann Hummert. 
It is directed by Richard Leonard with music by Victor Arden. Your announcer is Howard Claney. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. the famous Mr. Chameleon of Central Police Headquarters in his famous cases of crime and murder. Mr. Chameleon, as you know, is the famous and dreaded detective who frequently uses a disguise to track down a killer. A disguise which at all times is recognized by the audience. Tonight we give you Mr. Chameleon in the locked room murder case. The scene opens in the home of a retired businessman, Harvey Watkins, who, while retired, still keeps a finger on his many business interests and operates an office in his home. And it is there that we find him, angrily facing his confidential secretary, Arthur Finley, as he says the words that lead to a fantastic murder case. Finley, I've been going over your accounts. You're $5,000 short. There must be a mistake, Mr. Watkins. No, there's no mistake, Finley. You stole 5000 I want it back. I've taken a lot from you, Mr. Watkins. But you can't brand me a thief. You get that 5000 back before 3 o'clock this afternoon, or I'll have you jailed. Is that clear? Let me pay it back to you, Mr. Watkins, out of my salary. Hold out $100 every month. I said today, Finley. But I... Get out, Finley. 3 o'clock or jail. When you leave, ask my daughter, Rosalind, to come here. Here she is now, sir. Oh, come in here, Rosalind, and shut the door. Yes, Father, what is it? I just gave Arthur Finley until 3 o'clock to pay back $5,000 that he stole from him. Stole from you, Father? Why, well, that's awful. Rosalind, there's also some 20000 in bearer bonds missing from my strongbox. What? Do you think he stole those two, Father? No. You or your husband, one or the other, stole them. Bruce or I stole... What are you talking about, Father? I'm talking facts. You tidy up this room in the morning? That's because we haven't a maid now. I keep the whole house clean. We haven't a maid because you're too stingy to pay the current wages. Chances are you found the key to the strong box in my room, gave it to your husband, Bruce, and he used it to open the box and nip the bonds. This... This is fantastic. Find that husband of yours, Rosalind. I'll make him the same proposition I made Arthur Finley. Tell him to get those bonds back to me before three, or I'll have him jailed. But, Father... They've only been missing a couple of days. Chances are he hasn't cashed them yet. He never took them, Father. Bruce just wouldn't. You heard me, Rosalind. The bonds back before three, or jail for the both of you. Father, think what you're saying. Having your own daughter and her husband arrested as thieves, it's too horrible. It won't be if you return what you stole from me. Here by three or jail. <laughs> uh, stop slobbering, Rosalind. It's cold in here, Father. Shall I light the gas grate? You light out and tell your husband what I said. That's all you've got to worry about. All right, Father. Oh, Oh, you, Mr. Fisher. Hello, Roslyn. Your father sent for me. I'll say I sent for you, Fisher. Come in. Mr. Fisher, please intervene with father for me. I've done it lots of times, Roslyn. What's up, my dear? Get out, Roslyn, and shut the door. Remember what I said. Yes, father. What's happened, Watkins, old man? You look ready to break a blood vessel. Now, listen, Fisher. I'm telling you this because I'm surrounded by a pack of thieves. Pack of thieves, Watkins? 
<laughs> You've had these ideas before. I caught that confidential secretary of mine red-handed. Stole 5,000 from me. Gave him till three this afternoon to make good or I'd have him jailed. Arthur Finlay, you mean? By George. I'll take the responsibility for that. I hired him for you. Ah, forget it, Fisher. That's not the half. And my own daughter, Rosalind, and her husband, Bruce, snitched 20,000 in bearer bonds from my strongbox. What do you say to that, Fisher? What would you do about that? I'd say Rosalind is your daughter. And that to err is human. And to forgive, divine. That's because you're a soft-hearted old fossil. I gave them the same treatment I gave Arthur Finley. Return what they stole before three or jail. No, not that, Watkins. You simply can't. I can and I will, Fisher. And I'll tell you another thing. Any of the three, including my daughter, is capable of killing me. I know murder when I see it blazing from people's eyes. Let me try to straighten this out, Watkins, old man. Look before you leave. I am looking, Fisher. Ah, here's a letter I've written the police. If anybody kills me, you give it to them. Or, or better still, stick it in the mailbox when you leave. I'll not mail any such letter, Watkins. Do as I say and don't argue with me. I won't mail it. I said to look before you leap. Now it is exactly ten minutes before three o'clock. The hour set by Harvey Watkins to have the money he accused his secretary, Arthur Finley, of stealing returned to him or be jailed. And he dished out the same threat to his daughter, Rosalind, for her husband, Bruce, accusing them of stealing 20000 in bonds. Now we hear Rosalind saying, Bruce, do you smell anything in here? Smells like gas to me, Rosalind. That's what I thought. Rosalind. Bruce, what's wrong, Finley? Come quick. Gas is pouring out of Mr. Watkins' library from under the door. What? And I can't get in. The, the door is bolted tight. Bolted? Come on, we'll run outside and look in the window. I just hope Father isn't in there. He might be asphyxiated. Oh, here's the window. I, I'll try to lift you up, Finley, so you can look in. Okay, Bruce. Come on. Here we are. Uh, yeah, I, I've got hold of the window ledge, Bruce. Steady now. Do you see anything, Mr. Finley? Your... Your father. Your father, Rosalind. He, he slumped down before the door. I... I think he's dead. No, he can't be. I'll break the glass in. Hand me that rock, Bruce. Here, thanks. That'll let some of the gas out of the room. Is... Is Father dead? Yes. I'm sure he is, Rosalind. Then he committed suicide. Call a doctor. I'll phone the police. Why the police, Finley? Because I think you and Rosalind killed him, Bruce. Killed him? What do you mean? How could we gas a man to death in a bolted room? Good afternoon. I'm comedian of the police. You called for us? Yes. My father committed suicide. Oh, please come in. Thank you, we had your call to that effect. I uh, take it that you are Rosalind Watkins Rogers? Yes. This is Detective Dave Arnold. How do you do, Mrs. Rogers? I... I can't understand why Father should have ended his own life, Mr. Camille. Well, after your call reporting his suicide, Rosalind, we had a second call reporting that he was murdered. I don't understand. Detective Arnold and I do not investigate suicide cases, Rosalind. Only murders. Nobody could have murdered my father, Mr. Camille. He locked himself in his study, turned on the gas logs in the grate, and and died in there alone. The door is still locked. We couldn't get in. That's quite true, Mr. Chameleon. Oh, this is my husband, Bruce Rogers, Mr. Chameleon. How do you do, Bruce? That's the door there, Mr. Chameleon. Try it. You'll see it's bolted from inside. Well, I'll leave that to do, uh, Detective Arnold. Shall I smash it in? No, Dave. Uh, try your keys first. Okay, Mr. Chameleon. Hey, 
What do you think, Mr. Chameleon? I think the door was not bolted from the inside, as Bruce and Rosalind said, Dave, but locked from the outside by the murderer. What does that mean? If your father had locked himself in, Rosalind, Detective Arnold's key couldn't have entered the lock so easily. There's no key inside on the floor, Mr. Chameleon. I I can't understand this. Nor can I, Mr. Chameleon. Wait here with your wife, Bruce. After Detective Arnold and I have seen the body and looked over the murder room, we may have something. Uh, There's the body, Mr. Chameleon. Died from gas, all right. See his color? Yes, Dave. I think I look over the gas grate. Well, well. The on and off lever has been tampered with, so the gas can't be turned off. And the damper to the chimney is dead shut. And that's not all, Mr. Chameleon. This murdered man was bashed on the head before he was bumped. What do you know? I know why I never believed in locked room murder mysteries, Dave. And that most murderers are stupid people. Sure, but where does that get us? Easy. Easy, Dave. I think I hear Bruce and Rosalind talking outside. Come, sneak over to the door. It's Mr. Chameleon. It's suspicious of us. It'll be because you told him that door was bolted instead of locked, Bruce. I know how to handle that, Rosalind. I'll tell him a few things when he comes out. Open the door, Dave. Well, Rosalind, your father did not kill himself. He was murdered. How unspeakable. Mr. Chameleon, I've been thinking about that locked door. You have, Bruce? The only person who could have locked Rosalind's father in there to die was his confidential secretary, Arthur Finlay. Really? Father gave him until 3 o'clock today to return $5,000 he'd stolen from him. And threatened him with jail if he didn't, Mr. Chameleon. That's what I was leading to. Why didn't you tell me this before? Why, I had no opportunity, Mr. Chameleon. Oh, oh, it's the phone. I'll answer it, Boswell. Hello, Chameleon of the police speaking. Oh, Chameleon, this is the commissioner. Oh, hello, Commissioner. Funny thing, Chameleon, but a special delivery letter just got here from the murdered man, Harvey Watkins. From the murdered man? Right. Want me to read it to you, Chameleon? Uh, no. Tell me what's in it, Commissioner. Well, the letter says he caught his confidential secretary stealing $5,000 from him. Yes, I know that already, Commissioner. He also says that his daughter, Roslyn, and her husband, Bruce Rogers, nipped 20000 in bearer bonds from him. What? Uh, go on, please. He says he gave them all until 3 o'clock today to make good. Or he'd have them jailed. And uh, follow this, Chameleon. What, Commissioner? The letter says he's afraid the daughter and husband, or the secretary, Arthur Finley, may murder him if they can't make good. Says he saw murder in all their eyes. Well, he saw it in somebody's eyes, Commissioner. Goodbye. Bye, Chameleon. Well, Bruce, that was the Commissioner of Police. The Police Commissioner, Mr. Chameleon? Yes, Rosalind. And it seems I have a pretty clear murder case against you and your husband. No. No! He's bluffing, Rosalind. Don't let him frighten you. Oh, come now. You stole 20,000 in bonds and had until 3 o'clock to return them to the murdered man or jail. That is no bluff. And your wife reported a phony suicide at precisely five minutes before 3. We never stole any bonds from Father. That was pure imagination on his part. Oh, come on. We've got a letter at police headquarters to prove that you did. Written by your murdered father. Oh, no. No. Pull them both in, Dave. Hold them under tension. Okay, Mr. Chameleon. That's the doorbell. Let me answer it, Mr. Chameleon. All right. Open it, Rosalind. Oh, Mr. Fisher. Mr. Fisher. This, this is Mr. Chameleon, the detective. Tell him Bruce and I didn't murder father. Of course you didn't, you poor child. I can explain everything to Mr. Chameleon, dear. Well, if you can, you're good, Mr. Fisher. Incidentally, who are you? My full name is Jazel Fisher, Mr. Chameleon. And I've been the partner of Rosalind's dead father some 30-odd years. And this dear child or her husband didn't kill him. Well, whether you think so or not, Mr. Fisher, I'm holding them on suspicion of murder. You won't hold them after I tell you what I know, Mr. Chameleon. You'd be making a fool of yourself, sir. And I'll tell you why. All right. Why, Mr. Fisher? My murdered partner, Harvey Watkins, got me out here this morning. This morning? Yes, Mr. Chameleon. He was in a state of fury. Why? He told me his confidential secretary, Arthur Finlay, was short $5,000 in his accounts, and he's given him until three today to make good. Yes, I know, or he'd have him jailed. Exactly, Mr. Chameleon. Then he told me Rosalind and Bruce here 
had stolen some $20,000 in bonds from his strongbox and that he'd given them until three to return the bonds. That is why I'm holding them on suspicion of murder, Mr. Fisher. But they didn't steal any bonds, Mr. Chameleon. Watkins later found the bonds in one of his desk drawers. Found them, you say? Yes. Dave, look through that desk in the murder room, please. Right away, Mr. Chameleon. I don't think Detective Arnold will find the bonds there, Mr. Fisher. Not there, Mr. Chameleon? Why not? Because of a letter the murdered man sent to police headquarters. What? Did Watkins mail that letter after all? He asked me to and I refused. He must have been completely insane. Chameleon, here are the bonds. 20,000 even. Oh, thank heaven, Bruce. That leaves us out. You bet it does, Rosalind. Thanks to Mr. Fisher. It's uh, too early for thanks, Bruce and Rosalind. You're both still under suspicion of murder. Father's confidential secretary, Arthur Finley, killed him. I know he did. I know he did. Give me his address. Leave it to me to find out if he did. All I know is that you insisted your father had killed himself in a locked room when he actually was murdered. Mr. Chameleon and the locked room murder case continues in just a moment. And now back to Mr. Chameleon and the locked room murder case. When Harvey Watkins, a wealthy retired businessman, is found dead in his study with a door locked and the room filled with gas, Mr. Chameleon discovers that Watkins' own daughter, Rosalind, and her husband, Bruce Rogers, might have murdered him. But now, shortly after, we find Mr. Chameleon and Detective Arnold confronting Arthur Finley, the murdered man's confidential secretary, in his modest flat. And we hear Mr. Chameleon say, Finley, I wonder if you realize you are giving me one of the most ridiculous stories that I've ever heard. A kid just learning to walk wouldn't fall for that one, Finley. I'm telling the truth, Detective Arnold. Oh, come now, Finley. Are you trying to make us believe that 5,000 cash you've got there was lent you by a friend to make good the 5,000 you stole from your murdered employer, Harvey Watkins? Mr. Chameleon, I didn't steal, embezzle, or make off with a cent of Mr. Watkins' money. Oh, now, let's not be too ridiculous, Finley. Why go back to Watkins' house to make good 5000 you didn't steal from him? It's nuts on the face of it. I tell you, rather than get pinched for a crime I didn't commit, I, I borrowed the 5000 to give Mr. Watkins. Oh, come on. I knew he'd give it back to me when he found out that my accounts were straight, Mr. Chameleon. So just as you were entering the house, you smelled gas, found the door to Mr. Watkins' room locked. That's what I said. I, I ran and called Bruce Rogers and his wife, Rosalind. We ran outside and I, I smashed in the window and saw him dead. Why didn't you unlock the door in the first place, Finlay? You had a key to the murder room, didn't you? Oh, I didn't have the key with me. I, I, I left it here. Who loaned you this 5,000, Finlay? M my mother. Where is your mother, Ham? I... I lied about that. My mother is dead, Mr. Chameleon. But I won't tell you where I got the money. Oh, you won't, won't you? Never mind, Dave. Come along, we put men up for murder on less likely stories than this bird's. You can't put me there, Mr. Chameleon. I'm telling the truth. Well, I've caught you in one lie. Tell me, did Bruce Rogers give you this money? What? Him? Why, he killed Mr. Watkins himself. Okay, Finlay, that's all for now. Let's go, Dave. Goodbye, Finlay. But don't get the idea that I finished with you. Oh, brother, what a cockeyed story that guy gave us, Mr. Chameleon. He's near enough to the electric chair to be singed by the sparks, Dave. I'll say he is. The whole case hinges on whether his accounts on the murdered man's books were off to the tune of 5,000 or not. Yeah, I get you, Mr. Chameleon. Now, I'll get back to headquarters, Dave, and start the wheels turning to find that out. Well, uh, what about me? Where do I go? Back to the murder house, Dave. Sneak in if you can and look for any clues that indicate who turned off the main gas line to the house near the meter. Hey, so that's why there wasn't much gas coming out of the grate in the murder room. Oh, what a dope I am. It was probably turned off by the murderer. Afraid perhaps that somebody might snap on a switch or light a match and blow up the house. <laughs> And 
And now, one hour later at Central Police Headquarters, we hear Detective Dave Arnold saying... Well, that turned out to be another dead end, Mr. Chameleon. The gas was shut off near the meter, all right. But otherwise, there wasn't a single clue. Get anything yourself on Arthur Finley's books? Well, I found out they seem to be in order, Dave. Didn't take you long, Mr. Chameleon. No, Mr. Fisher, the murdered man's partner, put me straight on that point. But, uh... That doesn't mean that Finley isn't our man. No, but if he is, that lets out Bruce Rogers and his wife, Rosalind, the victim's daughter. Nobody's out, Dave. Well, then who did it, Mr. Chameleon? Well, when I get out there disguised as a gas fitter named Al Hicks in the next hour, Dave... Well, I... you want me to get everybody out to the murder house now? Yes, Dave. Especially Finley, the young secretary. Mr. Fisher is going to be there waiting for you. Uh, come in while I'm getting on my disguise. I'll tell you what part you play, then. Okay. But I sure wish I knew who we're coming out with, Mr. Chameleon. I think I do, Dave. But it'll take some fancy footwork to pin the killer down. And shortly after, we see Mr. Chameleon in his disguise as Al Hicks, gas fitter in greasy coveralls, about to enter the murder house. And we hear him saying... Uh, Dave, before we go in... Here's the voice of my disguise. That the gas grate Mr. Chameleon wants me to look at, Detective Arnold? Uh-huh. I got you, Mr. Chameleon. Okay. Now I'll open the door. I don't know. I'd like to know what he's doing. everything I Who is this man, Detective Arnold? He happens to be a gas fitter, Bruce. Name of Al Hicks. A gas fitter? A gas fitter? Yes, that's right, Rosalind. As, uh... That the gas grape Mr. Chameleon wants me to look over, Detective Arnold? Yes, it is, Mr. Hicks. So start moving, will you? Uh, Mr. Chameleon wants me to find out is if the off and on lever has been tampered with. Well, has it been, Hicks? Don't take an expert like Al Hicks to tell you that, Detective Arnold. Look at it yourself. Been fixed, so it can't be turned off. Gas would keep coming no matter what you did. It hasn't been tampered with. Certainly it hasn't, Bruce. You're saying that, Rosalind, because your husband Bruce murdered your father. I saw Bruce fooling it with, with it myself this morning. Well, if you did, why didn't you tell me that this afternoon, Arthur Finlay? I forgot it until this moment. Say, you're not a gas fitter. You're Mr. Chameleon in disguise. Well, that's right. Chameleon. That's right, I'm Chameleon. So you saw Bruce Rogers fix this gas grate so the gas couldn't be turned off, Finley. I suspected as much myself. Oh, Bruce. Bruce, how could you? Bruce didn't, Rosalind, you poor child. Now, don't accuse your husband. Think what you're saying, my dear. Arthur Finley, your father's secretary, murdered him and then locked the door to deceive the police. You're a liar, Fisher. I didn't, Mr. Chameleon. Finley, who gave you that 5000 I found you with this afternoon? Now, answer fast. Nobody gave it to me. It... It was the money I stole from Mr. Watkins. But I'm not taking a murder rap for it. His son-in-law, Bruce, killed the old man. Mr. Chameleon, isn't that exactly what I told you? Isn't it evident Finley murdered my partner, Harvey Watkins, and now is trying to place the crime on these innocent young people, Bruce and Rosalind? Oh, Mr. Fisher, you're the kindest man I ever met. <laughs> I don't think he is, Rosalind. Mr. Fisher killed your father. What's that, Chameleon? I killed him. Well, you've lost your head. I told you exactly what happened. You told me exactly nothing, Fisher. You told me that Finley's accounts were in order. That's what I believed at the time, Chameleon. You didn't believe anything of the sort, Fisher. You told me Finley's accounts were straight because your own were crooked. M my account's crooked, Chameleon. Ridiculous. Ever hear of the police auditors, Fisher? Here is their report. You drained your trusting partner of everything he had. Arthur Finley, his secretary, murdered him. That's what I got the flash on you in the first place, Fisher. When Rosalind Hare was saying that her father was a suicide, you said nothing about suicide. Why should I have, Chameleon? Because you knew it was murder. That's why. Those are guesses, Chameleon, and guesses don't hold up in court. Give me that key you have to the locked murder room, Fisher, or I'll throw you on the floor and take it from you. Quick, now let's have it. All right. Here they are, Chameleon. I'd like to kill you. Don't try it, Fisher. Don't try it. You put those bonds Detective Arnold found back in the murdered man's desk, hit him over the head from behind, and then turned on the gas, locked the door, and left the room, right? 
If I confess, will it help me get a lighter sentence, Chameleon? Confess or not, you'll get the chair, Fisher. Dave, take him. The case of the locked room is over. And how, Mr. Chameleon? And with these words, Mr. Chameleon concludes tonight's murder case. Listen next Wednesday night at this same time for Mr. Chameleon, the man of many faces. The part of Mr. Chameleon is played by Carl Swenson with dialogue written by Frank Hummert from the original story by Frank and Ann Hummert. It is directed by Richard Leonard with music by Victor Arden. Your announcer is Howard Claney. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. There's danger, there's mystery, there's action on the way with Raffles. <laughs> Raffles, formerly Gentleman Cracksman, Gentleman Adventurer, Ace of Knaves. Raffles, now reformed, matches wits with the underworld, devotes his time and talent to upholding law and order, even though his methods are highly unconventional and would never be found in the police manual. Tonight's story, Murder Signs Its Name. The smart set is out in full force this evening for Hollywood's latest million-dollar production is having its premiere. Flash bulbs have popped, visiting celebrities have preened like peacocks, and autograph hunters have had a field day. But inside the theater, the fashionable audience is learning with a yawn that the picture has little in common with his advanced ballyhoo. From his reserved seat in the 20th row, a handsome, well-dressed young bachelor is frankly bored. My princess, oh. already I have offered you my sword. Mm. Now I offer my heart. Thank you to hide your hard ambition beneath soft words. Oh, dear, this is really... I have pity. but one ambition, Highness. To bring you I got an ambition, too, to get out of here. My happiness only requires your absence. The greater the distance you put between us, the happier you make me. The lady has something there. And yeah, not very good, is it, Trent? No, the actors have been close to the screen. Shh, quiet, please. Only the right to protect you. Your lies are as great as your conceit. My heaven, if you were a man. Ah, oh, well... If you are a man, I should not be here. That does it. I can't take any more. Um, excuse me, please. Because I am please. a woman, you think so you're weak. Well, that's okay. I think yeah. I'm not far enough to keep my throne. I beg your pardon. Oh, oh God. Uh, just a minute. Just you. You excuse me, sir. Huh? Oh, oh, can you make it? Yes. Thank you. Sorry to start. Sit down, Harvey. Hmm? Oh, yes, yes. Say, do you know who that fellow was who just went out? No. Why should I? You've heard of Raffles, haven't you? Raffles? Darfon Berger? Of course. Just last week, Anne Van Dant was telling me that he's a kind of detective now. Yeah, so I hear. He spends a lot of time at Filippo's restaurant. Filippo pointed him out to me the other day. Excuse me, lady. Sorry. <clears throat> Could I get my please? Oh, it's quite all right. I didn't see you coming. I hope I didn't hurt you. No, not at all. Uh, excuse me, friend. I'm getting out, please. Oh, oh, certainly. Thanks. Thanks very much. Phyllis, this is really impossible. Let's go ourselves. Thank you, Helen. Just let me get my wrap over my shoulder. Harvey. Harvey, my necklace. Huh? Well, what is it? It's gone. My pearls are gone. Shh, maybe they fell on the floor. Oh. Where's your cigarette lighter? So dark in here. I've got it. Just a minute now. Move your feet. Oh, I never should have worn my pearls. It isn't on the floor here anywhere. I touched it just a minute ago. Oh, my. Now, my dear, it'll turn up. The police or the insurance company will find it. But they'll take weeks. We'll never find it that way. It's been in my family for ages. Oh, it'll turn up, dear. Well, if you won't do anything about it, I will. I'll see you at home later. Phyllis. Please. Phyllis, wait. Where are you going? I'm going to get someone to find my necklace. Oh, Phyllis, wait. Yeah. Ah, that's it, Filippo. Now, another scoop of mayonnaise. Hey, Senor Raffles, I, 
ask you. I beg you. You must not eat this this abomination. Uh, put in some more chili sauce, please. Esperanza for <laughs> Good. Oh. the ice cream melted yet? Please. Fine, fine. Now add a dash of dry mustard. Then sprinkle some bread crumbs on the lettuce before you pour the ice cream on it. Uh, tomorrow I am going to attend your funeral. Uh, now mix it well, Filippo. Uh, uh, ah, don't beat it to death. Mr. Raffles? Seems we have company, Filippo. Oh, don't get up, please, Mr. Raffles. I, I'm in terrible trouble. Really? Well, it's very becoming to you. Sit down, won't you? Thank you. Uh, got it ready, Filippo? Uh, it's all too ready, signor. Excellent. Now, take it to the kitchen. Yes. Hmm? Pour it down the drain and bring me some crab meat or gratin with a small oh. bottle of white burgundy. Oh. <laughs> bon, bon. All the time I knew the signora was joking. And what may I offer the lady? Oh, nothing, thanks. I... No, really. A cigarette, perhaps. Of course. Uh, bring madame some brandy, Philippe. Voici, if you have it. Yes, yes, yes. Fresh, fresh. Right away, signora. Now the then, a light? Thank you. <laughs> we've not met, have we? I mean, I'm sure I couldn't have forgotten. Uh, no, we've never met. That you were pointed out to me this evening at the premiere of the world. Oh, you... don't tell me you went to that awful premiere, too. Yes, we were there. And it was awful, wasn't it? Sitting through that dreadful epic was suffering enough to last us for the rest of our lives, don't you think? I certainly do. My husband and I both oh, thought... Oh, 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 your husband, you are married, huh? Yes, I'm Mrs. Harvey Nestor. I might have known. Why must there always be a husband? Oh, but it was he who pointed you out to me. Otherwise, I might not have known where to come to find you. You were looking for me? Oh, yes. Did you ever hear of the Wenlow Pearl? Why, certainly. The necklace of 48 perfectly matched and graduated pearls. Something to do with Napoleon, I think. Finest string of its kind in the world. They've been in my family for over a hundred years. But how do you happen to know them so well? Well, uh, during my past, I took a rather professional interest in such things. Of course. How stupid of me to forget. Well, Mr. Raffles, those pearls were stolen from me at the theater tonight. Oh, really? That's too bad. Too bad? It's tragic. And I want you to get them back for me. My dear lady, why should you expect me to find them for you? I'm not in the detective business. I understood you were. Oh, only now and then for my own amusement. I'll give you $5,000, Mr. Raffles, if you find them for me. Well, I'm happy to say that I find myself at the moment quite sufficiently supplied with money. But, Mr. Raffles... My dear I... lady, why in heaven's name do you pick on me? And then that told me how you traced her diamond bracelet. Oh, that, that. That was nothing but luck, really. And says otherwise. You've got to help me, Mr. Raffles. But surely the necklace is insured. Why not leave it to the insurance company or the police? The insurance company and the police will poke around for weeks. Whoever took it will have time to break it up and sell the pearls one by one before they're caught. Uh, no doubt the Wenlow pearls unbroken will be quite impossible to dispose of for any thief, clever or not. Then you will help me. My dear lady, you jump to conclusions altogether too rapidly. Mr. Raffle, I want you to listen to me. This evening at the theater, you got up and left your seat just before I missed my pearls. I'm glad it was just before, not just after. It was before. I remember touching them in my hand after you'd gone by me on the road. Ah, excellent. That at least prevents you from suspecting me, which might be unfortunate. But suppose I were to tell the police that on your way out you passed me. I missed the pearls immediately thereafter. But that would be practically accusing me. You're quite right. That's exactly what it would be. Accusing you. So, if you don't feel that you can try to find my pearls for me because I asked you to... I suggest that you try to find them because you don't want trouble with the police. Was ever man so unfairly faced with a dilemma? Well, Mr. Raffle, which is it? A five thousand dollar fee? You you approached me as a damsel in distress. And now you turn out to be a female with a purpose. Very well, dear lady. I'm afraid you've completely convinced me. My reform, as you seem to know all too well, is a subject for scornful laughter as far as the police are concerned. They, uh failed to believe that my intentions are no, no longer dishonorable. Good. Then it's understood. You are to recover my pearl necklace for me, and if you're successful, I pay you $5,000. And that puts the situation correctly, I fear. Despite the fact that I've no need for money at the moment, I'm not one to turn it down when I have fairly earned it. Yes, yes, you may count on me. Oh, good. I'll expect to hear from you very shortly. Oh, you will. You will. It's what you hear from me that troubles me. Here's my car. That's all finished. <laughs> now then, here we are. The wine and the crab meat, that's all. And uh, the brandy for the lady? No. Put the brandy here, Filippo. Huh? 
I'm the one who needs it now. Hello? Jocelyn, this is Harvey Nestor. Hello, teacher's darling. You're called a little bit late after midnight. Yes, yes, I know, I know. I was detained at the theater, but uh, everything's all right, Joss. I've arranged to get the money for you. Ah, you sweet boy. Joss, I'm so glad for you. <laughs> well, you'll get your money tomorrow or the next day. 25000 In cash, lover. And in small bills. Old ones. I can try to give Jocelyn money with nasty old marks on it. It can be traced. I know you too well to try any tricks with you. But, uh, don't you try any with me. Harvey, don't you trust your little Jocelyn? Yes, I do. The way a mongoose trusts a cobra. Well, after the things you wrote to me, I can understand your feelings. As soon as I have my money, you'll have your letters. Take good care of them, Joss. Teachers, darling. Jocelyn's whole teacher is in those letters, and she'll take better care of them than anything else in the world. But, Jocelyn, if anyone should ever... <clears throat> oh, Excuse me, Harvey. I didn't know. Uh, I'm very sorry, madam, but you have the wrong number. I get it. Remember, Harvey, twenty-five yes. thousand by the day after tomorrow. Uh, uh, no trouble at all. Goodbye, uh, oh, Phyllis. Why'd you rush out of the theater like that? I, I had to face the police all alone. I had something I wanted to do. Inspector Hill says it will be easy to trace a necklace as famous as yours. Only as long as it remains a necklace, Harvey. What if the thief breaks it up and sells the pearls one at a time? The police aren't morons, Phyllis. And neither am I. It'll be worth the $5,000 I offered Raffles if I get my necklace back intact. Five thousand? You offered that crook Raffles $5,000? He's not a crook. Not anymore. Raffles can find it if anyone can. Of all the crazy waste of money I ever heard of. Why, for all you know, Raffles himself is the thief you're paying him to find. I tell you, he isn't a thief. In fact, he's quite charming. And he couldn't have taken my necklace because I had my hand on it after he went out of the theater. Then let me ask you this. Not as your husband, but as the manager of your estate. Where will you get the money to pay him? $5,000 just doesn't lie around waiting for you to pick it up. Then sell some stocks or something. What? Dip into the principal? As just... long as I get my necklace back, I don't care what you do. I'll tell you what I won't do. I won't let you waste your money on foolish whims oh, like... stop it, Harvey. Well, it's my money, isn't it? That... That hurts, Phyllis. I'm sorry. But it's the truth. Things always do lately. Bitter and criticize each other. Is... Is that my fault? Oh, I don't know whose fault it is. I... I, I just know I'm tired of it. It's been a bad day. I'm going to bed. You coming? In a minute. You run along. Very well. Good night. Good night. Now. Uh. Hello? Mr. Nestor calling Mr. Edwards. It's okay, Chief. This is Felton. Oh, is this safe to talk? Hey, sure, unless the coppers are tapping your own phone. Oh, don't be silly. What took you so long to get home? I tried to call you once before. Well, I took my time to make sure I wasn't shattered. But it's okay, Mr. Nestor. It come off clean as a whistle. I got the necklace right here in front of me. Now what? Meet me at the same place tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Bring the necklace and you'll get your 6000 That's so pathetic with me, but you said you was broke. You got me to steal the necklace because you needed the insurance money. Well, where are you getting all the dough from all of a sudden? Ah, uh, now, don't you worry. I can dip into my wife's estate for all I want, as long as it's only temporary. I'll pay it back when the insurance company pays for the necklace. Yeah, if I'd have known that, I'd have made the price higher. You're doing all right. Yeah, sure, I'm not squawking. I'll be at the same place at four tomorrow. And maybe I'll have something else to talk over with you then. So long. Who is that, Martha? Uh, just a guy, sugar. About that necklace? Yeah. You know, baby, I'm getting a lot of dough for this necklace. Mm -hmm. First for swiping it, and then for returning it. Sounds silly. Sounds as if someone's double-crossing his insurance company. Ah, that's what I like about you, baby. You're the only society doll I ever see who had real brains. Velvet, double-crossers aren't particular about whom they cheat. The sooner you get your money, the better. I had to pay off on the necklaces tomorrow. 
But I got something worth ten times as much as that. Really? What is it? Right here in my pocket. Take a look, Nora. Hmm? Take a look at a genuine gold mine. What? That's just a packet of letters. Oh, no, no, not just letters. These are special letters. The guy's going to pay me more for these than he is for the necklace. Oh, that's wonderful, Velvet. Uh, but I don't trust this guy. He knows I got this necklace, and he may figure I'm calling coppers on me. Why should he? Well, like you say, double crosses ain't particular. Uh, you want to do me a big favor, Nora? Me? Well, how can I help? Well, nobody knows about you and me. Uh, I should hope not. But heavens, if my guardian ever found out, he'd make me give up my own apartment and go live with Aunt Clara. <sighs> Look, I want you to take the necklace and the letters to your place for the night, hmm? Oh, but Velvet, they're dangerous. If the police... They're not but... hot. They're only hot for me, not for you. It's just for overnight. I'll pick them up for you tomorrow. No, no. I, I, I don't want to get mixed up in anything ah, like you that. you dames, I... you're all alike. All that sweet-talking malarkey you dish out don't mean a thing. But I... The minute a guy really counts on you, you run out on him. Ah, women... Oh, all right, Velvet. I'll do it, but only for overnight. Oh, that's better. Sure, honey, only for overnight. Now, I don't dare to take you home. But remember, the fewer people that see you get there, the better for both of us. Oh, don't worry. There's no doorman at my building. The only other tenant on my floor is some Englishman named Raffles, who talks as though he's swallowing a hot potato. Uh, just keep the letters and that necklace safe. Don't worry. The police will never find them with me. <laughs> Police headquarters, Inspector Hell speaking. Oh, good morning, Inspector. This is Harvey Nestor. Oh, good morning, Mr. Nestor. Wait, we haven't any progress to report. Of course, I, I understand. I called you because, well, because my conscience is bothering me. That's so? What about? About last night at the theater. I, uh, I hesitate to make a false accusation. Yeah. That's why I didn't tell you this last night. But uh, just before Mrs. Nestor's necklace was stolen, Raffles went past us on his way out of the theater. Raffles? He was there? Oh, yes. In fact, he uh, stepped on my favorite bunion on his way out. You should have told me this last night. But maybe it isn't too late. I'll pick you up in a squad car and we'll be at Raffles in half an hour. <laughs> I'm singing in the rain, oh, singing in the rain, oh, blast blazes and confounded. Oh. All right, I hear you, I'm coming. I had a man of no more privacy than a goldfish bowl. I say, old thing, is your fingers stuck on that button or what? We're here officially, Raffles. Keep your shirt on. Well, as a matter of fact, I wish you'd give me time to put one on. Uh, come in, Inspector. Who's your nervous friend? Mr. Harvey Nestor. We're here to find my wife's pearl necklace. Indeed? Here? Yeah. I told Mr. Nestor that searching your place would just be a formality. You wouldn't be dope enough to keep it anywhere near you. Quiet. Uh, pardon me if I continue drying myself, will you? Sure. And um, uh, speaking of formalities, you uh, have a search warrant? Yes, Mr. Wise Guy. Right here. Make Merely making look. conversation, I assure you now. Why not begin with the bedroom? That way I can dress as you're searching. Pretty sure of yourself, aren't you, Raffles? Well, as only the innocent can be, Mr. Nestor. I say, um, that um, cigarette box on the coffee table would be a likely place to hide something. <laughs> Clever, aren't you? That's the one place we won't look. How about the clothes closet in the bedroom here? Uh, just hand me the gray pinstripe suit while you're there, will you? Gray pinstripe, eh? I'll have a look at it first. Oh, me. Really, Inspector, you should emulate the travel posters and ask yourself, was this trip necessary? Run through his clothes, Mr. Nestor. Nothing over here. Okay, Raffles. Here's your suit. Thank you so much. Would you mind examining my shoes next? The black ones are the ones I intend wearing. Cocky as a rooster, isn't he? He always is. Oh, no, Governor. I knows me place, Governor. But I didn't pinch no necklace, Governor. Straight I didn't. There's no sign of it in the closet. Let's try the bureau. Now, that's an excellent thought. My shirts are in the second drawer. Um, look at that white one on top first, will you? All right. Here's your shirt. I tell you, he wouldn't keep it in his own rooms, Mr. Nestor. I do think you're overlooking the likeliest place of all in not examining that cigarette box. All right, funny man, have your laugh. We'll see who gets a last laugh. I may remind you of that very shortly, Inspector. What I don't understand is this sudden about face on the part of the Nestor family. 
Last night, your wife... My wife to... may be a fool, Raffles, but I'm not. So? Or that, it seems, will have to remain an open question. There's none of the rug. There's none anywhere under the bed. Do you suggest a blue necktie with this suit, Inspector, or do you prefer maroon? Whichever you choose, and I hope it chokes you. Ah, that's your chief charm, Inspector. Always a happy word for everyone. Well, I guess you're right, Inspector. He wouldn't keep the necklace here in his apartment. No use tearing the place apart. Well, well, if you say so, Mr. Nestor, it'll be a pleasure. No, no, no. I've got some private business. I can't wait any longer. Sorry I've wasted your time. Well, I'll run along, too. But you're not clean on this thing yet, Raffles. Well, at least I'm dressed, and that's something. Oh, please, just for my satisfaction, do look in the cigarette box. Come now. on, this fellow annoys me. <laughs> Mr. Nestor, I haven't even begun to annoy you so far. Wait till I put my mind on it. You know, there's one thing, Mr. Nestor. He didn't know we were coming here this morning. Suppose we search the rest of the building. Do so, by all means, and I wish you good hunting. But there's no rear door I could have used, and the only other tenant on this floor is a feminine iceberg named Nora Wales. Huh? Wales? Nora Wales? Why, her guardian is one of the trustees at my bank. She, she wouldn't have any truck with the likes of Raffles, Inspector. True. Sad and desolate, but true. Can I drop you somewhere, Mr. Nestor? No, no, thanks. I'll take a cab. Well, at least I've saved my wife $5,000 this morning. Oh, really? Yes. Raffles is hardly the man to represent her if you're so suspicious of him. For which, Mr. Nestor, I have you to thank. Won't be forgotten. Good day, gentlemen. Oh, why couldn't they steal her husband instead of her necklace? I suppose the answer is he isn't worth stealing. Oh, well, a cigarette and then I... Good heavens. The necklace is here. Right in the cigarette box. Suppose the inspector had. Phew. But who could have put it here? What's all this? Letters. Why, Mr. Nestor. What a foolish boy you've been, to be sure. <laughs> Miss Jocelyn Lee. Mm-hmm. And how did they get here? There's only one door to my apartment and it was bolted. And I've been here right a lot. No, no, wait, wait. While I was in the shower, someone could have come along the outside balcony and gone in through the French doors. Must be. Well, if Julia can use the balcony, why shouldn't Romeo? Of course. Balcony only runs from my flat to hers. Well, let's get on with it. Now then, French doors to her living room. Hmm? Conveniently unlocked, too. Well. Just put your hands on the table there. Oh, I beg your Keep mind. your hands where I can see them. I'm not used to handling guns. This one makes me nervous. My dear Miss Wales. I'm not your dear anything. Do as I tell you. Of course. But since you've already cost me a very healthy fee and very nearly caused my arrest, at least you might tell me... I might, but I won't. Put the necklace and the letters on the table and then get out. You can use the front door this time. You're too kind, really. I. Oh, sorry, I dropped the letters. Pick them up. Certainly. Good thing it wasn't the necklace, eh? You see, it might have. <laughs> ah, little girls shouldn't play with firearms. I'll take that gun now. That's better. I hope you didn't hurt yourself <laughs> too much. You'll never get away with this. Seems I already have, Miss Wells. A little girl with a gun should never stand at the edge of a small rug. Or may I help you up? Keep away from me. Just as you say. Now, a few answers, please. Why should you do me a bad turn? Why should you plant these things in my cigarette box? Well, I didn't mean you any harm. I saw that police car drive up, and I thought it was my place they were going to search. Oh. So you skipped merrily out to the balcony and dropped them in my place? Yes. But what were you doing with the letters and the necklace in the first place? Sorry, I'm all out of answers. Well, it doesn't matter. Within an hour, I'll have them back to their rightful owners. What? Oh, you can't. Oh, I'd be worth my life if you... Oh, no, 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 please. What is it you're so afraid of, Miss Wales? Or to be more accurate, who is it? Oh, that... That's one of the answers I can't give you. Ah, too bad. I might have been able to help you. Now, let's see. Jocelyn Lee's place isn't far from here. I'll make that my first stop. Oh, wait. If you're taking those things any place, I'm going with you. <laughs> Raffles, are you 
you sure this is Justin Lee's apartment? According to the address on these envelopes. Um, perhaps one of these skeleton keys. This key should fit. It does. After you, Nora. You know you didn't... Brothers, look. On the floor. Is she... I'm afraid so, Nora. Oh. Jocelyn Lee has been strangled. Strangled? Oh, then that makes it murder, doesn't it? It certainly does. And look at this place. She must have put up a fearful fight. Oh, it must have been Harvey Nestor, don't you think? The man who wrote those letters? Could have been, yes. Oh. You know him? Only casually. This girl has been dead for at least 12 hours. That takes us back to 1 o'clock last night. 1 o'clock? Delta didn't get home until half past. I... What's that? Oh, nothing, nothing. I was just trying to remember where I was then. You'd better phone the police and have them ask Harvey Nestor where he was when she was killed. I intend to, Nora. And wherever you got the necklace and the letters, whoever gave them to you, you tell him that I've still got them. You tell him to come and take them away from me, if he's man enough. Come on, Dopey. Wake up, wake up. Uh, uh, what the... Come on, snap out of it, sleeping beauty. Oh, I must have dozed up. Hey, who are you? I'm the fellow that's man enough to come after the things you heisted off of Nora Whale. Oh, I thought you'd get here sooner. Yeah, I know you did. You were sitting in that easy chair with Nora's gun and your dukes waiting for me. <laughs> that's why I waited till you got sleepy. <laughs> but I, I, I bolted the door and... Oh, of course, the balcony from Nora's flat. Uh-huh, you catch on quick, chump. Now, come on, hand over that necklace and the letters. I know what you'll do if I don't, but what will you do if I do? The same thing, chump. You've seen too much. No more than Nora has. Ah, I got plans for her, too. I see. We've got no more chance than you gave Jocelyn Lee, is that it? Eh, not even as much. I tried to be reasonable with that doll, but she wouldn't listen. He was very selfish about the whole thing. But I've got more than the letters. I've got the necklace, too. Suppose I'm selfish. Then you'll get what I gave her, chump. A little knock on the head and a lot of choking. So you admit you killed her, do you? Do you? Sure, why not? After I leave here, you won't be telling nobody. Look, look, I'll make a deal with you. I... The only deal you can make with me is to die quick and easy instead of slow and hard. Now just hand me this stuff nice and polite. But you've got nothing against me. Just cut me in on half of what you've got for returning the necklace. <laughs> Why, it's only six lousy grand as it is. <laughs> That's all that cheapskate nested ante up. Oh, he might pay more, especially now. Uh, not him. But uh, how did you know about the letters to begin with? Uh, Nestor hires me to lift his wife's necklace. For why? For the insurance money. Why does he need the money? To pay off this Jocelyn Lee. And me? I don't take the job till I wait it out of him. Now, come on, where's the stuff? Inspector, have you heard enough? All right, Robert. Robert, get over. That way, you double cross. Oh, no, you don't. Oh. Oh. oh, dear, I'm afraid he broke the glass of the French doors when he fell through them. But there he is, Inspector, and he's all yours. Hello? Raffles speaking. Raffles, this is Phyllis Wenlow. Oh, hello. I'm using my old name again since I left Harvey Nestor. Oh, yes, I, I didn't know you were back in town. Raffles, I never did thank you properly for getting my necklace back and and everything. <laughs> Will you take me to dinner so that I can? Why, it would be a pleasure, Phyllis. What about tomorrow night at Armando's? Oh, that will be perfect. Ah, oh, fine. I'll pick you up at seven. Oh, and Phyllis. Yes? Just do me one favor. Of course, Raffles. Don't wear your pearls. The radio mysteries of Raffles, starring Horace Braham, are heard over this station every week at the same time. Tonight's story was written by Bernard Dougal, and the entire production was under the direction of Joff McGregor. Be with us again next week when... There's danger. There's mystery. There's action on the way with Raffles.
Squadroom. Lieutenant John Douglas. We are what we're raised up to be. I believe that's the way that old saying goes. Now, this case certainly went a long way to prove it. The Uniform Division got a routine complaint at 12.01 a.m. to investigate what was supposed to be a routine H&W, husband and wife. It turned out to be this. You killed him? Come on, come on. Blood all over your kitchen apron. This man, look up at me. Yeah. Jonas Parle. Is this man Jonas Parle, your husband? Yeah, I kill him. With meat knife, I kill him. This is your meat knife from your kitchen here? Well, is it? I turn our supper on stove. You get out of it. What's your first name? Yeah, I kill the papa. I asked you your first name. What you want from me? Maria. What you want? Let him be buried, and I'll be punished. I hate him. Twenty-five years. We go now, huh? The prison. No. First, I think I wash. No, I no wash no more dishes. It's cold outside. I take coat. We go. Goodbye, mister. Goodbye, papa. You're no good man. Drink all the time of booze. Ma, she works so hard. It's a policeman. I'm not sorry, no. Now, you be ready? Come. Come, you punish me. He beat me. One time too much. I know, kid. He beat you? Is that why you pushed that knife into his stomach? Hmm. It could be me. The on floor if he got hand on knife first. You fought? Fight? You two had a fight? Only to my son. Well, he come home, he find out. You come? Sergeant, uh, make the notifies. Post a man on guard. Uh, yes, Mrs. Parle. You're a cool one. I come. Your age? No more. Well, not so more. Look, uh, yes? What? What, Sergeant? That young man for me? Oh, for her. All right, send him over. No! Oh, no. No, you go home. Sit down. Papa's dead. All be quiet now. You better go from here. I just was home. What's your name? Jim. Where were you all evening? Out. I asked you a question. With friends. Yes, Mama, I was home. You saw... I got home right after they took you. You saw on the floor? I saw. Turn around to the desk here, please. I didn't kill my stepfather, Lieutenant. I know you're a lieutenant because the cop at our door told me it was Lieutenant Douglas took Mama. I'm not sorry, Jim. No. We fight. Again, huh? I took too much. Be there. He want big story. I tell truth. We fight. I get the meat knife first. Jim... Jim, you tell him what kind of people we are. I know got big story. I want a full and complete statement. I tell truth. It's not good enough. I kill him. Goodbye. Lock me up. That's all. Edie. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, Lieutenant. Uh, book her. Murder one. Yes, sir. Come along. Now, wait a minute. Hands off, mister. Can I talk to my mother a minute? But make it a minute. Mom... Mom. T.S., get me the district attorney's office. Mom, what do I do with Mr. Parra? The body they're taking to the morgue. Well, as soon as he comes in, then. For arraignment in the morning, right. Mm -hmm. You can't have the body until the autopsy's complete. Then you bury him. Come, police lady, you take me. We go. I see you. Maybe they let me again, Jim. Sit down. You can't do anything to me. Do I look eager to? He wasn't my father. I just gathered that. To me, he was always Mr. Parle. He was no good. 
So she told me two or three times. Beat her. She tell you that, too? Used to beat me. Till I gave it to him one night. He realized I'd gotten too big. How old's your mother? Didn't she tell you? Age. Fifty-nine, she says. She employed? Twenty-five years she supported him. Where? Where? I asked you where. Cleaning woman, the Acme office cleaners and polishers. They handle... I know who they are. Catch me working, knocking my brains out 25 years. Your mother ever arrested? <laughs> What's funny? <laughs> my mother is the biggest sucker you ever met in your life. I'm not surprised over why she did it, but I never expected... I thought she'd work herself to death putting up with that loud mouth drunk. I'm surprised. I'm actually surprised. You are, eh? That she actually killed him. You can go. <clears throat> Better arrange for a lawyer for her. With what? The court, then. The court will appoint her one. Yeah, I hope. Her language. She always wanted to go to night school. How could she? Yeah, the language. She don't handle it too good. <laughs> Squad Room, the true-to-life enactment, continues in a moment. Let's take a moment to think of the world we live in, of just how small it really is. For example, a modern commercial transport flying from San Francisco would reach Honolulu in a matter of hours. So let's say that you're going to the Hawaiian Islands for the first time. Although there are many reefs and shoals included in the Hawaiian chain, which make it the longest group of islands in the world, you'll probably find that Hawaii is the largest island of all. Probably the most well-known of the group, however, is Oahu, because it's the most highly developed. Seventy percent of the territory's population live on this bit of land, 40 miles long by 26 miles wide. And it's here that famous Honolulu combines old Polynesian traditions with big city conveniences and facilities. Being in a territory of the United States naturally accounts for the Hawaiians following the American democratic way of life. However, they do have laws and quaint customs that are still their very own. Respect them, and you in turn will be respected as a fellow American citizen. Hawaiians are a hospitable people who want to be friends. But remember, the only way to have a friend is to be one. Squad Room. Edie, I'll uh, need you in a minute. Lieutenant Douglas, First Division Detectives. Who? Oh, yes, yes, we're ready for you, Mr. Prosecutor. The woman's name is Maria Parl, P-A-R-L. She admits. Yes, sir, she's ready to plead guilty. I booked her on a... Well, she claims a struggle, fight. This was her second husband, married uh, to him 25 years. Him? Well, she says a no-account leech, monkey on her back. Uh-huh. Him? Well, what she claims, drunk 25 years. Want me, Lieutenant? It's 8 now. Have her over to you by 8.30. Right. Bye. So long. He's in for a surprise. On Mrs. Parle's attitude? Uh, bring her up from detention and get her over to the prosecutor's office. I killed him, she says, and she's waiting to be punished. Eh? You look... Uh, I swing now. I think I'll sleep the whole 24 hours. Go ahead, sir. I'll hold it for you. Police one for us. Yes? Uh, Sergeant Allen will be right back. Uh, you drink the coffee he's bringing me. Uh, what's the matter? Hold, please. Missing persons. They had a complaint on a Mrs. Marjorie Filene, a housewife. 2400 West Elm disappeared on her way to a company party. Sergeant Flannery Communications, he wants to know if you have anything on it since it's our precinct. No. Why? Why query us on a routine missing? I'll tell you that I can't find you. You're left, sir. <laughs> right? You look real uh, beef. All right. Thanks. Hold the fort. He's uh, not around, Sergeant. He's been on a 36 hour. I guess he left. Yes. What? And Forrester, don't forget the triplicate on Mrs. Parle. Uh, you better get started, Edie. Uh, get the Parle woman to the prosecutor. It's five after. Bye, everybody. Lieutenant, wait up. Uh, I have uh, um, just saw him, Sergeant. Hold on. Lieutenant, I'm sorry, but that wasn't routine. What is it? On that missing. You know, Flannery, by the time he got around to us, a man in a car found someone lying in a ditch on Highway 1, miles from the state line, woman, young, bullet hole in her head. 
I'm sorry, Lieutenant. And I'm sorry, too, but it happens all the time, doesn't it? Yes, sir. This is Douglas. Yes? Highway 1 near the line is our precinct, yes. I tell the coroner I'll meet him out there. It's this Mrs. Marjorie Filene, hmm? 2400 West Town. Yes. I got that. Housewife, hmm? Filene, you're sure? Forster, cover. Sign me out. I'm going uh, over on an extra tour. Come on, Edie. Get that Mrs. Parle, that cleaning woman. Oh, uh, yes, Lieutenant. It's ten after now. Good Lord. Are you the husband? Yes, 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 I am. Sorry for your trouble, Mr. Filene. <laughs> Police car just, just came and brought me. We were to meet at a party office. Gay, you know. You identify this woman? <laughs> now, please, try. Oh, it's a shock I don't, I don't feel. Now, easy. Please. I, I know. I know. Well, I was to meet her. She never got there. I came straight from work. At the party, no one had seen her. She, she's been lying here in that dirty ditch. Who knows how long? Well, that's one of the things I want your help on. Well, I was at my office all day. She was supposed to be home. Home till it was time to meet me at the party. It was a big party. Company. My company. Company party. I, I don't know how this will affect my chances now. Chances of what? Well, the fact she didn't show at the party and now all this bad publicity. I, uh, I feel better now. Do you know what time it is? Yes, yes, it's time for the train. I mean, around 8.30, isn't it? I didn't take my watch. I was in such a hurry. A.M.? Do you expect me to believe that you had no knowledge of where your wife was all this time? I mean, uh, no, I, I mean, of course. I, I, I didn't know she was lying here murdered in a ditch. Let's start over. Yes. You worked at your job yesterday. By the way, what do you do, Mr. Filey? Manager, the Westbrook Corporation. Entire facilities in the tri-state. That's why I'm so upset over her not being at the party last night. I'm up on the top team. Now, just a minute now. Of course, I'm terribly upset about what happened to Marjorie here. I, I... Sergeant, take this man downtown. I think you should be, mister. Face down, shot and killed. Your wife found her at 8 a.m., a bullet in her head. I did call several hospitals when she didn't come home at all last night. It sounds worse than it is. You see, we haven't gotten along well lately, and... I didn't want any divorce because of its possible effect with the company. All right, take your mitts off. I'm coming with you. Sergeant Allen's on sick, sir. Forrester's been holding down the room. Oh, I got years on him. I'm only on 44 hours without sleep now. We found her car. Mm. Abandoned down under the arch at the foot of Lower Mulberry. Uh, send me some coffee, Edie. How about a ham and egg and some butter strips? Just coffee. Make it two. Found this in her car. Purse. Party purse. Really stained, isn't it? You should have seen the blood. Inside. Inside the car, I mean. Mm. Also found a fifth of fine whiskey. A thirty-two caliber rifle. Ballistics should call in a minute on the gun. Was she drunk? Hmm, it wasn't opened, obviously, taking it with her to the party. Neighbors have been calling the desk downstairs, Lieutenant. Nice woman, judging from the caliber of the people who called. Where is he? You mean you wish you could say the same for him? Well, he's a prime suspect. Have him brought up. Otherwise, why should I care a fig about him? Sit down, Filene. Yes, sir. T.S., why can't I get a line out of... Well, how would I know you've got my plug pulled? If there's a call, put it in. I'll be with you in a minute, mister. I hope there's no wrong impression. Hello? Yes, I've been trying to reach you. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Well, I can't talk too freely now, but the slug does... I didn't kill my wife, Lieutenant, even if... Slug if... mates uh, with a rifle. you think I, 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 I... 
Yes, definite signs of struggle where she was found. A fur coat thrown, clothes torn. The dirt in the ditch all churned up. The broken eyeglasses. All right, keep in touch. Yeah. Had to wear glasses while driving, Lieutenant. So I discovered from her driving license. I didn't kill Marjorie, Lieutenant. Mister, whether you cared or didn't care, if your wife stayed out all night, is your business. There's one thing in your favor. I didn't the kill her. The pattern in this case is indicative of criminal behavior, not merely a husband and wife situation. However, who knows? You may have a criminal mind. Oh, now look here. It I... was hit and miss. Hurried, animal-like in its fury, and careless. Careless in the disposal of evidence. It indicates to us a tremendous desire on the attacker's part to get away and get fast. So fast, the rifle was left behind. I'm still going to hold you. Do you have anything to add? Take him back down. I got it. Lieutenant Douglas. Yes? Lieutenant? Oh, you got the call. You traced to... Who? No, I can't believe it. You're positive? You're... All right, if that's the way it is, bring him in, Forrester. Yes, step on it. Back here to the squad room. Uh, ballistics made a make on the cereal through the manufacture of the rifle. Traced to a hardware store. They'll be bringing him in. What's the dispose so far on Mrs. Parle? Too soon for the grand jury, isn't it? Women's detention downtown is crowded, sir. The dance hall raid, so the DA asked us to quarter her here. She's downstairs, sir. All right. All right. When they arrive, tell Forrester I'm just sitting, waiting for him. Sit. Hands off, that's all. Jim. Hey, Conley, throw me out of bed. Don't you guys respect the wreath on the door? Jim Parr. So now we've got two of you. You can't prove anything. We can. By means of the rifle you used and left behind. So? You killed the filing woman. I only wanted her money. Money? <laughs> no, at the traffic light about a mile up from where you found her. I, I, I stopped her from starting up when she turned green. I got in. I asked her for her money, and then I was just going to blow and get away. She started to fight me, and the rifle went off. No kidding. So I drove down the road away. I pulled her out, but she wasn't dead. She started fighting again. Then all of a sudden, she, she crumpled up, fell into the ditch. I left her there. I, I drove the car away fast. I ditched it, and then I, I, I went home. Her fur coat was pretty valuable. I was afraid. Afraid to take that. Or even to take her watch and rings. All I wanted was money. Why'd she have to fight me? I... I just wanted money. Money to pay my stepfather's funeral expenses. To get my mother a good lawyer. My mother was very close to me. Sit down. That's all her life amounts to. She's going to get the chair. I might as well get it, too. Quadroom, the true-to-life enactment. Today on duty desk is Lieutenant Douglas, Win Wright. As Jim Parle, Lawson Zerby. As Mrs. Parle, Virginia Payne. Squadroom is produced and directed by Win Wright. Written by Peter Irving. All names are fictitious. Any resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Bill Maher speaking. <laughs> The American Broadcasting Company challenges you to a startling puzzle in crime. The Adventures of Bill Lance, starring Gerald Moore, with Howard McNear as Professor Ulysses Higgins. Hello, 
I'm Bill Lance. I'm primarily a composer, also a criminologist. Perhaps it's more accurate to call me a student of human nature. You know, I believe that crime is the result of a delinquent society, that the criminal mind is a sick mind, and that the symptoms of that sickness are always apparent in the behavior of the criminal. Therefore, if you would expose a criminal, look for fingerprints on the doorknob, but also look for imprints on the human mind. In short, human emotions are my clues. Oh, yes. <laughs> I also play the piano. Well, you can say a lot of things that way. Sometimes it's an accompaniment to thinking, particularly when you're trying to unravel some of the tangles of human behavior, helping to bring some kind of order into the chaos which people seem to create so easily. Why, for instance, when, when everybody was so curious, if not furious, about the new trend in fashions, should death choose to wear a new dress? <laughs> Never can tell how swiftly a familiar human problem can build into a tragic snarl of emotions. <laughs> As a matter of fact, even my friend, Professor Ulysses Higgins, seemed to be building himself up to a passionate fury the night it all started. And just because I felt like doing a little work on my concerto. MGCL2 plus COH2 equals MGOH2 plus COH. Uh, no, 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 C-A-C-L-2, uh-huh, yes, 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 yes. Perhaps if I modulate into F-sharp in this phrase. Uh-huh, but if you add calcium hydroxide to magnesium chloride, you precipitate the magnesium as a hydrate. Maybe a progression of chords ending with a diminished seven. M-G-E-C-L-2 plus C-A-O-H-2 equals M-G-O. Oh! Oh? You're speaking to me, Ulysses? My dear maestro, I'm merely trying to equate chemical compounds in my mind. Or what's left of my mind with that infernal noise you're making? Noise? <laughs> my dear professor, what strikes your tin ear as noise may be heavenly music to a more discriminating auditor. Even if your proposition were true, your premise is false. You cannot call that piano tinkering music. Touche. <laughs> Let's argue the point, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Saved by the bell. Shall I? Yeah, I wouldn't dream of taking you away from your magnesium and hydrates. Hello? Is... Oh, hello. I don't know whether you remember me, Bill. No, you didn't start by saying guess who, so it must be somebody I like. It's Joan Adams. Joan! Why, darling, it's been over a year. Where have you been? Oh, hello. Ah, uh, still in pictures? Oh, that never worked out, Bill. I got wise to myself. I'm modeling now. Yeah, well, I <laughs> couldn't think of a nicer figure for it to happen to. <clears throat> Where? At our Reeves in Beverly Hills. Yeah, oh, very she-she. Bill! From what? Well, you always would give me good advice. Oh, yes. Sometimes I talk too much for my own good. I'm in a jam. Oh, where are you living now? I'll come right over. I, I can't see you tonight, Bill. I... Tomorrow, then? Well, tomorrow is the fall fashion opening at our East. Oh, good. I'll see you there. Well, I, I don't think... Why not? I've been wanting to get a look at the new styles that give every woman's figure a chance. <laughs> Kind of nice, huh, Ulysses? <laughs> yeah. Monsieur, madame. Oh, she's right, yeah. mm -hmm. There has been much, too much idle conversation about the new trends in milady's fashions. As long as I mean, the world can stand still. But no. As we change within, we must change without. <laughs> without what? Shh, talking about clothes. Without clothes? Yes. But, uh, <laughs> but I, Henri, look to the future. <clears throat> and in the future, I see the past. And in both, I see today's woman. The neatest trick of the week. I bet he told fortunes before he got into this racket. So now, with me, today's woman, a la Henri. Oh. Ah. Pull yourself together, Ulysses. Oh, yes, Ulysses. Uh, first, the cocoon. The new swelter silhouette in smooth black wool. No accentuations of shoulders. No accentuations of the waistline. In fact, no situations at all. In fact, no good. A little confining, don't you? Oh, Where? Oh, yeah. <laughs> next, uh, next, the triangle in shimmering red velvet with gracefully sloped shoulders swinging simply but dramatically to the low and white flung hem. It must swing and swing low. Swing low, sweet oh, cherry earth. Oh, 
<laughs> yes. yes that's nice. And now, and now with dramatic style, the wasp. With the diminished shoulders, the padded bosom, the rounded hip line, and the pinched waist. Yes, now uh, that's more like it. Huh? That reminds me of my grandmother. It does. You better not tell Joan that. Oh, is that Joan uh, modeling that one? Yes. Yeah. She doesn't look too good. Why, whatever's the matter with that girl? Hello, Joan. Yeah. Bill. Yeah. Oh. Joan, pardon me, may I get through, please? Yes, Joan, mon dieu, what has happened? What is it? Miss Adams, Joan. She can't hear you, Henri. Joan's dead. I found something, Bill. I want to introduce you to Miss Sandra Weston. <laughs> come in, come in, Miss Weston. You did find something, Professor. Yes, I did. <laughs> yes, you did. <clears throat> oh, <laughs> hello, Miss Weston. Hello, Mr. Lance. Well, uh, why weren't you the cocoon? <laughs> the svelte silhouette and smooth black wool? Yes, I modeled that one. Uh, Sandra, why didn't you tell me that Miss Adams was ill when she came in today? But, Henri, hmm? I didn't know she was ill. Oh. She, she was upset, but she seemed perfectly well. Did she tell you why she was upset? No, why should she? Were you close friends? We shared a dressing room. We liked each other. Is that what you mean? I, I can't understand what... No, neither can I. Oh, there you are, Lance. I got your message and I... Oh, am I interrupting something private? Hi, Inspector. Thanks for dropping by. Inspector? Oh, Henri, meet Inspector Holland, Bloodhound. Oh, oh mon Dieu. Sandra Weston. Hello. Well, you know Professor Higgins, of course. Yeah, I know him. I feel exactly the same way. But, Mr. Lance, this is not a matter for the police. Well, huh? what's the gag, Lance? Well, a girl by the name of Joan Adams, one of Henri's models, died here just a few minutes ago. How? Oh. She collapsed in the salon. Sounds like a job for a doctor, not me. I had an idea it might be in your territory, Inspector. Yeah? I came down here to see Joan Adams. Dead or alive? No jokes. I knew Joan. I saw her die. Okay. I'm sorry. Well, she called me last night. She was in trouble. What kind? That's what I came here to find out. But trouble caught up with her first. Uh-huh. You think it may be suicide? Suicide? Yes, I know, Miss Weston. You're thinking the same thing I am. Joan wasn't that kind of a girl. Uh-huh. Then maybe murder. Maybe. Murder? Oh, no. No, no, no. Impossible. How do you know it wasn't murder, Henry? How do I know? Inspector, this is Beverly Hills. Ah, yes. And naturally, that changes everything. Not for me. What have you got besides theories, Lance? A box of aspirin, a bottle of vitamin pills. Here. Found them on Joan's dressing table. Yeah. Uh, I guess I might as well take them down and have them analyzed. Will you let me know what you find? Sure. I wouldn't want you to waste your time. I'll give you a buzz, too, Henry, in case you're interested. Me? Oh, what does it matter? I'm ruined already anyway. Oh, you listen. Will you answer that, please? No. No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's one way of getting you to stop playing. Oh, it is. Uh, <laughs> hello. Hello, Lance. Ah, uh, you guessed right. That girl didn't want to live. She took poison. Marco benzatrinic acid. There's no proof she took it, Inspector. No proof she didn't. Analysis of the stomach content showed that she'd eaten lunch, had a couple of cocktails, an aspirin, and a vitamin pill. But don't get any ideas. The bottle of aspirin and the vitamin pills you found showed nothing. wonder where she got the cocktails. Listen, Lance. You yourself told me she was in some kind of trouble. Whatever it was, she couldn't face it, that's all. Okay, thanks for letting me know. Goodbye. Hmm. Yeah. A little late for company? Never too late for this place. Oh, don't bother no more. I'll get it. Hello. You have the wrong apartment. Everything's wrong, even this apartment. I can't help that. Good night. Oh, wait a minute, Ulysses. Isn't it? Oh, <laughs> sure, it's George Kincaid. Oh, is this? Then this man here was just killing me. Who is this, Bill? George Kincaid. He's a jeweler in Beverly Hills. Don't mention this. Oh, can I please come in and sit down? Yeah, you better before you fall down. Thank you. <laughs> there goes my dinner. Yeah, oh, George. Here, wait a minute. Here's a chair. <laughs> Feels good. Uh, what is it? Chin some more hair. Hall, Bill. Hi, George. <laughs> Bill, 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 Bill. That's me, Bill. Bill, you don't know how glad I am to see you. Bill, I, I just had to see you. You were there. You, you'll understand. Oh, of course. 
Now, give me a break, George. Start from the beginning, huh? All right, Bill. I'll start right from the very beginning. That's the place. You know... Bill, who is that man over there in the corner? <laughs> Nobody. He just lives here. Oh. Well, all right, then, Bill. I'll start right from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. You see... Don't look at me, you. <laughs> me? <laughs> That's better. Come on, come on, George. Why'd you come here? Oh, look, Bill, you, you saw everything. I uh, enemy told me. Uh-huh. Oh. Bill. Bill, it's all my fault. Oh. That poor girl, Bill. I did it. Oh, he's delirious. Not yet, Ulysses. Give him time. Hey, Bill, you know Bruce Randolph? Oh, sure. Lives in Bel Air. Lots of money. One of my very best customers bought a bracelet for his wife's birthday a couple of months ago. Diamonds and rubies. Red ones. The real thing, too. And then, then a couple of days ago, Mrs. Randolph comes in buying something. So, naturally, I asked her how she liked the bracelet. You know what she said? What bracelet? Doing. You see what I mean? Yes, they've shot people for less than that, Jordan. I know, Bill. I'm no good. I started the whole thing. You see, Mr. Randolph was a little extra correct. Extra correct. He played around. With Joan Adams. Mm -hmm. How did you know? You just told me. Oh? Well, I knew you'd understand, Bill. Oh, Bill, Bill, I feel better. I'm glad. I, I guess it's all gone now, huh? Yes, yeah, so you can make it. I got here, didn't I? Yeah. Bill, I, I certainly am glad I, I had this nice little talk with you. Uh, that man's looking at me again. <laughs> Watch out, Bill. He's got an evil eye. Oh, my. There goes the forerunner of a beautiful hangover. Oh, Bill. <laughs> How can you waste your time on a drunken fool like that? Who wasted time? Ah, Ben, I don't start building a case on a lot of idle talk about a bracelet. He didn't even know who Mr. Randolph gave it to. But I do, evil eye. <laughs> Look, diamonds and rubies. Real thing. Where did you get that bracelet? Off Joan's wrist. What are you going to do? Oh, no. perhaps I'll give it to Mr. Randolph. So he can give it to Mrs. Randolph for her next birthday. <laughs> So long, Ulysses. Where are you going so early? I have a date with a cocoon. A uh, what? Oh, oh, I see. Yes, well, if it hadn't been for me, you wouldn't even know that there was a Sandra Weston. After all, I found her. Why, Professor? I didn't know you cared. Why didn't you say something? I haven't had a chance to speak to her about it yet. i tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll, I'll put in a good word for you. <laughs> Well, Sandra, there are no microphones under the table. Nobody's even looking this way. You can now speak freely. What do you want to know? Well, just what do you think of the broken down hemline and the droopy skirt? <laughs> that isn't a fair question. I make a living showing how fashions change. Honey, this is no change. It's a revolution. That doesn't excite <laughs> me. I've been through too many of them. At Henri's? He ought to give me a pension. I've been there so long, he thinks I'm one of the fixtures. Baby, any time you want to break your contract, I could be interested. That's a nice speech, Mr. Lamb. But you're not in the dress business, and you didn't ask me to lunch. Just talk shop, did you? Would you say Joan Adams is shop talk? I can't get Joan out of my mind, either. I've got somebody else on my mind now. Oh? No. A fellow named Randolph. Oh, you know. A little. <sighs> Well, then, I, I suppose there's no reason for my trying to cover up for Joan any longer. Yeah, I wondered why you didn't say anything. Well, what Joan did with her own affair. And now that she... Well, why start in that any ugly gossip? Yeah. What was Joan really worried about? Yesterday morning, Mrs. Randolph called her and asked her to have lunch. Oh, that explains the cocktail. Huh? Well, she had a couple of drinks with Mrs. Randolph, that's all. Oh. Did she tell you how the meeting turned out? Well, she got back to the shop before I did, but when I started going to go into our dressing room, I heard her calling with someone. Did you recognize the voice? It was Bruce Randolph. But that doesn't prove anything, does it? No, yes, it does. Proves something very important. Huh? Proves how lucky I am. Lucky? Yeah. 
If all this hadn't happened, I wouldn't have met you. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, then, I, I'm lucky, too. Now you've made me an honest man. I don't have to play detective anymore. Just make a date with you. Tonight? Well, there's a slight conflict tonight. I'll break it. That might lead to complications. Oh, I can be so discreet. But it's a friend of yours. Well, that even makes it easier. Who is it? Professor Higgins. Oh, but Professor Higgins. <laughs> Ulysses? Well, what do you know? <laughs> when did he make the date? He called us before you picked me up. <laughs> Wait, a two-timing double... On second thought, more power to him. Right now, he and I have some shopping to do in Beverly Hills. <laughs> I would be only too willing to help you, but of course it is completely unnecessary now. Is it, Henri? Oh, I have talked with the inspector, Arland. Uh, it is very sad. Poor girl destroyed herself. I wonder why. Ah, oh, who knows? There are so many reasons why one can despair. Of course, I, I didn't know poor Joan very well. Uh, well, well enough, she, she had been with me only a few months. But it does not mean that I don't suffer as though she had been with me for years. No, of course. Incidentally, did you know that Bruce Randolph came to talk to Joan just before... Mr. Randolph? Impossible. Why? Why, he's a very old and valued patron of my salon. He was seen leaving Joan's dressing room just before the fashion show. Impossible? Monsieur Lars, may I give you some advice? Uh, what has been, has been, eh? Digging into the park will do nobody any good. <laughs> Bill, I want to apologize. I must have been pretty far gone last night to barge in on you that way. No, I don't apologize, George. You were very cute. Yes, and Mr. Kincaid, you took an intense dislike to me. Oh, were you there? I don't remember you. I must have been a mess. Now you talked enough. You told us a very sad story about a birthday and a bracelet. Drunken nonsense, Bill. Drunken nonsense. Uh, do me a favor, will you? Forget it. Oh, but there are a couple of things I'd like to ask you about Bruce Randolph. Bill... Mr. Randolph has been a very good customer of mine for years. But what I told you should ever get out. I'm a dead duck. Bill, why don't you just give up and admit that you made a mistake? Oh, I know what's on your mind. But there's nothing to it. And if you won't listen to me, well, listen to the others. Inspector Harland, Henri Kincaid. I've listened to them. Well, I can't say I haven't tried. Would you mind dropping me off here? I have uh, more important things to do. Okay, Ulysses. I wouldn't want to break your date. And anyway, you're not interested in what Mrs. Randolph may have to say. Mrs. Randolph? No. No, I'm not. Mm. Uh, well, on second thought, I guess I do have time after all. <laughs> Stop kidding, Professor. You know, in the end, you always come along for the ride. <laughs> Cozy little shack, isn't it? Very pretty. Yes, it's very pretty. I always did think though, that 24 rooms was a little large. No, oh, I don't know. In a pinch, you could turn this living room into a nice skating rink. Yes? You wish to see me? Oh, Mrs. Randolph, my name is Bill Lance. Mr. Lance? This is my friend, Professor Higgins. Oh, was it something connected with the university? Uh, no, no, Mrs. Randolph. I am not here in my official capacity. But my butler said you had an appointment with me. I don't remember making any such... Oh, you didn't, actually. I, I took the liberty of coming here to ask you a few questions about a friend of mine. Oh? Joan Adams. Joan Adams? I'm sorry, I, I don't understand. Well, she was a very close friend of your husband's. Perhaps that'll identify her for you? Who are you, Mr. Lance? Don't you know? Ulysses. Ed, Mrs. Randolph... I thought you'd appreciate my coming to see you before the police do. Police? Mr. Randolph was rather deeply involved with Miss Adams? Yes, I... I'm aware of that. Perhaps you don't realize how deeply. But what has that to do with the police? Joan Adams died yesterday afternoon. I'm sorry. She was murdered. What? Your husband happened to be in her dressing room at Henri's yesterday afternoon. There was an argument. He left suddenly and angrily, and almost immediately afterward, Joan collapsed. She died of, uh, poison. Poison? Bruce? What was the quarrel about? How far had he committed himself? But he couldn't have done it. She took the poison herself. Oh, no, Mrs. Randolph. I knew Joan Adams. She may have been foolish, but she never ran away. 
What did she have to gain by killing herself? But your husband was in a real jam. He wasn't very discreet, you know. All of our reasons knew about him and Joan. Mr. Lance, I'm going to tell you something you don't know. I had luncheon with Joan Adams yesterday. Yes, about uh, please, was... Ulysses. I've never had any illusions about my husband. But I love him. So I accepted his romantic indulgences. I've even felt sorry for some of the girls. Especially when they took him too seriously. That's why I wanted to speak to Joan Adams. You understand that, Mr. Lance? She took him too seriously, huh? I had to find out. She laughed at me. How could a young girl like that know what... what a home means? How could she know how a wife feels? How could she understand that... you don't just give up everything that has meaning because of a whim? You think my husband killed her? No, Mr. Lance. I was the one who had to get rid of her. Well, there are less violent ways of handling that kind of a situation, Mrs. Randolph. You told me the police would be coming here. Y- yes, yes. I'm quite willing to tell them what I've told you. And now, Mr. Lance, would you leave, please? I assure you that I'll be here when the police arrive. Well, now I've seen everything. Not a nerve in her body. Why, well, she made me feel like she was doing us a favor by confessing. Quite a gal, huh? Well, somebody's got to stick around and make sure she doesn't change her mind. Uh-huh. Yes, I guess you're right. Well, goodbye, baby. Well, well, wait a minute. I've got to call Inspector Holland, and I've got to run and catch Randolph before he leaves his office. Why, Randolph? Don't you think he might like to know what's happening? That's none of my well, opinion. Well, if you're worried about your date, forget uh, it. Me? Oh, no, no. Ulysses, I'll guarantee that you keep your date, even if I have to deliver Sandra to you personally. <laughs> Adams? No, I'm afraid not. But let me give you the idea I knew. Well, among other things, Mr. Randolph, this bracelet. I thought you might want it. After all, didn't you buy it for your wife's birthday? Where did you get that? From Joan, after she died. Died? She was poisoned. Oh. Because I gave her that bracelet, you came here to blackmail me? Well, if you... No, no, that isn't why I came here. I just wanted to tell you that your wife had luncheon with Joan yesterday. She learned about the bracelet. And they talked about you over a couple of drinks. Rubbish. I thought you'd like to know also that your wife has just confessed that she murdered Joan. Murdered? Uh, Lance, uh, I'm a rotter. Don't apologize. But I've always been able to get away with it. Always been able to go back home and, until this time. This time I, I lost my head. In Joan's dressing room yesterday afternoon? Uh, Yes, yes. She threatened me. My wife. I, I went a little crazy. I... Oh? So now you're confessing to the murder of John Adams. Yes, yes, of course. I. Yes, that's it. Well, then, Randolph, in that case, I'd hightail it out to your house. The police are on their way now to pick up your wife. What did you do with the professor? Well, he didn't really mean to stand you up. He was he was delayed oh. due to circumstances beyond his control. What happened? Oh, we got our murderer. Oh, was it really murder? Tell you all about it on the way out. Where are we going? I promised Ulysses we'd pick him up. Oh. We can always ditch him later. Well, 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 Miss Weston. Good evening. I hope William has explained. Oh, yes, he has, Professor Higgins. You're forgiven. Well, that's very nice of you. <laughs> very nice. Uh, Bill, the Randolphs are in the living room with Inspector Harland. You won't be needing us any longer, will you? Keep your shirt on, old boy. We can all go out together later. You don't mind, do you, Sandra? Take us a minute or two. Come on. <laughs> Inspector, it's quite unnecessary to make my wife endure this any longer. I've already told you that I did it, and I don't see any... That's not true. You know it's not. Just a minute, folks. Well, Lance, you're just in time to solve the solution. I got one murderer too many. Oh, it's not like you to complain when business is so good, Inspector. But I think we can settle this very quickly. Hello, Mr. Randolph, Mrs. Randolph. Hello, Mr. Lance. Oh, oh, yes, I nearly forgot. Oh, Sandra, come on in. You both know Sandra Weston, of course. 
Well, now, wait a minute. I couldn't be mistaken. You do know one another, or did once. As a matter of fact, that's why I brought Sandra here, to help us with our little problem. What do you mean, Bill? What's she got to do with all this? Well, she knows Mr. and Mrs. Randolph better than we do. Perhaps she can decide which one is telling the truth. I... I... I wouldn't want to take that that responsibility. Oh, just for a moment. Imagine yourself as Joan, huh? Or better yet, think back a little while when you were in a very similar position, weren't you? If you're wondering how I found out, well, it's pretty hard to keep a secret around a place like Henri's. But when you get expensive gifts from a jeweler like Kincaid, Mr. Randolph has always been very generous to his lady friends, hasn't he? You never asked me about that, Bill. I would have told you. It was over anyway. Don't you agree with me that it's pretty hard to imagine Mrs. Randolph killing Joan? She didn't kill you when you were involved with her husband. And when Mr. Randolph had a little trouble shaking you off after he became interested in Joan, he didn't kill you either. You seem to have all the answers. You told me about the luncheon date with Mrs. Randolph, about hearing Mr. Randolph in Joan's dressing room. You knew why Joan was agitated. The stage was all set. Joan had a headache, didn't she? Yes. You were very helpful. She wanted some aspirin, and so you... That's enough, Bill. Inspector, would you like another confession? Sandra, Sandra, you... Oh, oh, Bruce, darling, you wouldn't believe me. I told you I'd never let anyone else... Oh, Bruce! Hey, Lance, this seems to be your night. Three confessions. But only one score, Inspector. Two don't count. At least you could have told me about Sandra. Yeah, I wasn't too sure myself until the Randolphs were cleared. You mean they were cleared when they confessed? Oh, sure. That eliminated them. You see, in shielding each other, they showed how they would behave in a crisis. Uh They've got a motive for them right there. But if either one of them had murdered Joan, they wouldn't have left that bracelet on her arm. That dazzling bit of evidence would have inevitably committed one or both of them with a murder. I see. But what first made you think it might be Sandra? Sandra herself. She told me she'd been with Henri a long time. And Henri told me Randolph had been an old customer. Uh She recognized his voice in Joan's dressing room. She called him Bruce and then caught herself. Well, once I knew that, it was comparatively easy to check up on history and find out more about Randolph and Sandra. And then I had the motive. Yes, but Sandra, why did it have to be Sandra? No, oh, Ulysses. <laughs> Underneath that solemn, austere mask of yours is a heart just palpitating with romance. <laughs> Too bad your dream girl turned out to be Lucretia Borgia. You have been listening to another in the series of intriguing mysteries starring Gerald Moore as Bill Lance with Howard McNair as Ulysses Higgins. Tonight's supporting cast included Cliff Clark as Inspector Holland, Georgia Ellis as Sandra, Leon Velasco as Henri, Lois Corbett as Mrs. Randolph, Paul McVeigh as Mr. Randolph, Charles Calvert as Kincaid, music composed and played by Rex Corey. Join us again next week, same time, over most of these same ABC stations when we bring you another of Bill Lance's strange experiences in a story titled Special Delivery. This Bill Lance adventure, Death Wears a New Dress, was written by Barbara and Milton Merlin and directed by Dwight Hauser. Now, here's a special program note. David Harding steps into a hotbed of intrigue in the case of the phony passport paper. Don't miss David Harding Counter Spy this afternoon on this same ABC station. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Quad room, the second floor of a precinct house. On duty desk, Lieutenant John Douglas and Detective Sergeant Herb Allen. You stay where you are, mister. Be right down. Herb. Yeah, Lieutenant. Wet one, river. Reservoir man uh, spotted a sack, a big plastic sack. Body in the sack. Sign us out. All 
I did. All officers honest. That's my job here. To fish the fish, sh- fish in a reservoir? Keep it clear. Big items float in from the aqueduct. Big items in the inlet have to be careful. They clog the screens. Fishing with that long pole? You caught this? This bag? Yes, sir. This big plastic bag. All my years here, I never hooked in anything like this. I pulled at it, got a hook, pulled it in. Pull a lot of items in. Huh. Well, what more? You untied it. Sure, I untied it. That's an extra source of income, officer. What was the bag tied with? This copper wire hooked into the bag? Broke. Tossed it right behind. When I see anything in the current that could be salvaged, well, I, uh, half my house was furnished with salvage when I used to work out at the waterfront. How'd I know? How'd I know there was a stiff in it? You radio the coroner? Ten minutes. Tech goes on its way. Parts of a man all cut up in pieces and without the head. Till they get here, Herb, uh, take the left bank, I'll take the right. Uh, see what we can find on the canal banks along the way. Right. Just a minute. Uh, Stay right here. But I'm off now. I tagged the stiff right at the end of my shift. Go ahead, Herb. You hide the lieutenant. Say, I'm a city employee, too. Find you something. Is that the thanks? I take pills for my stomach. These pieces in the bag, they got me all upset. You live right here, don't you? At the waterworks? I want to take a look inside where you bunk. Body in the bag. I'll be in here. Keeper's house. Well, what do you expect to see? Where'd you get this wire here? Standing here in the hall. I had to get this wire. Some of this wire to pull the bag in from the river. That plastic bag was heavy. You didn't tell us that before? I was so excited, I guess I forgot. Let's go in. The rest of the house. You let us think the plastic bag came with the copper wire wrapped around it. What's this? Your bedroom? It's open. My bedroom. Lieutenant. Sergeant. Karn is here. No sign to head up or down the canal. Look. What went on in here? What do you mean, what went on? Look at the walls. Look at the walls of this room. Blood? On the walls. But well, what do you call this? Paint? And here, on the floor. It's still a little wet. And here, on the bedspread. Guess you forgot to tell us about this, too. Like you forgot about the wire outside around the mutilated body. My uh, wife, uh, she and me, uh, we'll fight last night. That's the body of a man. What's left of a man, cut up in that bag outside. She and me, it's like a season. A season comes in, it comes and goes. I mean, there's good times, there's bad times. Makes sense. Maybe it's here, living here. I'm the caretaker. You guys know that's in my job. Not only to work a shift, but to reside, to live here on the grounds. It's... The damp odor, maybe. I don't know. Where's your wife now? How it starts, it's hard to figure. But last night, she got the needles out. Uh, Not real needles, but with her mouth. And she starts, she starts in on me. I'm a water rat, I'm a scavenger, so on. The fact that she's wearing a lot of things that I fished out, that don't matter. So we fight. She hits me with a shoe. I hit her back with the other one. Yeah, here... My arm. See the cut where the blood dried? I guess she got one over her eye. Where she is, I don't know. It's the season. Maybe out of mother's, maybe her old maid's sister. She'll be back. She went out after we had the fight. You expect us to believe that caused all this blood sprayed all over this bedroom? How do you spell your name? Reef, R-E-E-F-E. Her last name's Collie, like a dog. Take him out, Sergeant. And I, Sergeant Gross of Technical to get in here and give us a group on this blood. I just want to ask you one question. Who telephoned you? Who telephoned to report a a, a cut-up body in a bag? Take him in. See if we can locate his wife. Let's take a moment to think of the world we live in, of just how small it really is. Today's transportation makes it possible to see much of the world. So, let's say that you are about to visit the fascinating island of New Caledonia for the first time. This small subtropical island of the French Republic, roughly 250 miles long by about 30 wide, is in many respects a paradise, located only 750 miles across the Coral Sea from Australia. New Caledonia has been the home of Frenchmen for more than a century, 
but few Americans had been there prior to World War II. During the war, many personnel of the United States Armed Forces either passed through or were fortunate to be stationed there. The English explorer Captain Cook first sighted the island in 1774. Its mountainous appearance reminded him of the Scottish coast, so he gave it the name of New Caledonia, Caledonia being the Latin word for Scotland. In 1853, the French took control, and it's been a French colony ever since. Travelers visiting the island usually say that it's more like Australia or Southern California in climate and living conditions than the South Sea Islands as we usually think of them. Even the vegetation is comparable in some respects. What makes this dot of land in the vast Pacific a paradise is the wonderful fishing and hunting opportunities and the lack of extreme heat, humidity, dangerous wild animals, insect pests, or fevers that make life so difficult in the real tropics. New Caledonians are a friendly people. And the best way to get along on their island, as anywhere else, is to be courteous and considerate. Above all, respect their customs, their laws, and their privacy. For well, remember, the only way to have a friend is to be one. Now, back to Squad Room. All right, there's nothing more here till daylight. I want a two-man guard on the canal till the divers get here in the morning. The rest of you, uh, knock it off. Get back to the house. Yes, sir. Karen will give you a service. Promises a preliminary by morning. Concentrate on picking up the waterkeeper's wife. I don't know anything about parts of the dead man. Let me see your... Uh, no! Over your eye. You should see a doctor. A psychiatrist. Not for me, for him. The lady's unhappy in a marriage. Oh. The lady substantiates his story. But I... I wasn't hiding out, you know, or anything like that. I, I was just taking a vacation from him at my mother's. We did. We did go at each other. We have these fights regular... I suppose he told you it's me, it's my fault, because of his job. Well, it isn't. It's what the job did to him. It's not that I object to the water, the location. The city gives us free rent, it's an honest living, but when Reef and me got married, he had plans, ambition. Now all he does, he lies awake nights dreaming of what he might find tomorrow in the inlet. You see this watch, this pin, this earring, they all come out of the water. Blood on your bedroom walls, on your bedspread, on the bedroom floor. <sighs> the fight, yes, sir. The blood's being tested in type. Honest, I gave it to Reef and he gave it back, that's all. T.S., a matron, uh, a call downtown, women's detention. She's got a bad cut over her eye. Just one, yes, for overnight. All right, lady. Till the blood group tests. I'm being locked up. Any of those chairs in the back till the matron comes for you, please. Ah. Bad, it's bad, Herb. Ah. Sun up, I'm putting 50 men out on those reservoir banks. And the diver's going down. You've got to identify that murdered man. There isn't much you can do without a head. You're living or dead. Lieutenant. What, Herb? Uh, it's no use. No sign of his. Well, knock it off, then, for a bad job. Forrester! Answer it! Uh, busy, busy. Only one foot away. Yeah, always busy when there's a case we can't cinch. Reports, reports. We got the greatest collection of writers, report writers on this squad. I'm going to get you guys out on our bricks. Hello, Sergeant Allen. Well, what do you bring me all the way back here? You know I get all this cooperation in the room. Send a coroner's report up. But does the great stone face know it's in? Good. I heard that. Well, lock me up, Lieutenant. Finally got the coroner's report. Sergeant Harris just called. That was his call. Do you want to hear this report? From the coroner? I know that. Torso of a man weighing 155 to 165 pounds. Mm. Sergeant Allen. 
Who? Hurry that up. Well, send a man up. A man 155 to 165 pounds. His left arm extremely brown, indicating he drove truck or a car and kept his arm out the window. He should have been about 5'9", had a big black mole on right shoulder. Anything about the blood type? Uh, type O. His coloring was probably blonde or brown. In the water, 30 to 36 hours. What about the prince? Uh, lieutenant, can I see the lieutenant? Go Fingers too shriveled from the water. Him. They're going to try blowing air in or wax buildup in special spoon. Over here. Good ask here. This man wants to see us. I'm Sarge Nell. This is the lieutenant. I am uh, Chris Wilson. I have a boy, Gerald. He's 30. He's missing. Yes? In the papers over the radio, I heard about that case where you can't tell for sure because the body uh, was... Uh, I'm afraid it might be... Sergeant, sir. Yeah, that's it. Gerald is married. He and his wife, they have been living in Glenwood... They decided a week ago to come back here. He should have been here four days ago. Describe your boy. How much did he weigh? Long about 160. Was he dark, fair? Blonde. I, I found a, a large dark stain in, in the dirt in my driveway. I don't know how it got there. It looks like blood. It disturbs me, that stain. I'm afraid my boy was killed there at night as he was arriving to come home and, and, and maybe the killers, they took away his wife. What do you think, Herb? General description, Fitz. Let him draw. Envelope, here. Come on, Mr. Wilson, show me your house. Well, nothing else. It seems out of place. I don't know how it got there. And it does look like blood. Mm-hmm. We'll have the blood checked. Yes. Well, there's no other signs of violence, inside or outside. You were all over my place. When will you know on the blood? Uh, we're anxious too, Mr. Wilson. Sit tight. can go? That's right. Blood in your bedroom didn't type. The wife? Just released. Woman detention downtown. Sending her home? Come on, come on. Out. I gotta lock this cage. She's gonna go home? Yes, Mr. Collie. Home. Oh. Come on, out. That's your problem, not mine. Dirt from the driveway shows blood. Wrong type. Fine. Nice. Our only hope for a positive identification is to find the head. T.S., get me R and I. And if they finally did pull prints from the fingers, maybe the FBI doesn't have them on a file. Hello? Yes? You have? Uh, yes, hold. Uh, pencil. It's a make. Yeah. Shoot. The break. About time. Turn. I got the address. We go. Thanks. Thanks very much, Mr. Stern. Yeah, Lieutenant? The address the FBI had in the fingerprint file is this address. That's his father inside. Father hasn't seen his son, Fred, in two years. Gave me his son's address, 32 Pelham Drive. Police officers, you're Mrs. Fred Stern? Oh. We want to talk to you. About Fred. Uh, where is Fred, Mrs. Dane? Oh, he left me a week ago. Said it was the end. Said he was going to Chicago. Have you read the papers lately? Yes. You're curious about the torso found at the waterworks? Should I be? I mean, I don't get this. Ever occur to you your husband might have met foul play? Huh? He did. He's dead. 
You sure? Sure it's Fred? Fingerprints. We were married three years. He drove buses at one time. For the last year, he drove a cab. He was irresponsible. He loafed. I, I work in a cotton mill. I only make one sixty-five an hour, but that's more than him. The man wouldn't work steady. He loafed. Ran me up bills. I was after him. I was always after him to get a steady job. Ran me up bills on my good name, my credit. Naturally, that made me mad. That's why we argued. He left. Lock your car. Let's go look in the house first. You taking me somewhere? It's locked. Anything else you want to tell us? Yes. When we were married, he bought me a set of rings and a watch for himself. Expensive. You know, he charged them to me. The jewelry store, they came after me. I almost lost my job. It's open. You can go in. Three years, that's how it's been. Is that why you killed him? I said it's open. You can go in. Just this cop and this saw and this hammer. They were out on the back porch. Clean, but they look like they got traces. Well? Uh, I'll start at the beginning. I I came home from work Wednesday night. He's wearing more new clothes. Charged them, he said, but he kept hollering for me to go to sleep. At midnight, we did, but he got up in the middle of the night, goes down to the basement and starts working his power tools. I I couldn't sleep. I got up and called down. He started to hammer things. I yelled. He came charging upstairs and abused me. I I couldn't stand it. I'd pay for all those fancy tools. He never built anything. Put the hammer down on the sink. I picked it up, went behind him. I I hit him and he fell down. Oh, there'd been... If there was any chance of saving him, but I I listened. There was no heartbeat. He was dead. I I went down. I got the saw. I put a blanket under I knew I had him to get rid of of the body. I couldn't... You uh, have a boyfriend? No, no, no. You did it yourself? Separate packages in the heavy plastic. They were heavy, but I I made it out to the car trunk. Uh, Yourself? Dumped all by yourself? The the big one I I threw in the reservoir. A car came, frightened me away. I I drove around looking for another place. I don't believe it. You have to. Where'd you dispose of the other one? Off West Bridge. I could show you. Take her downtown. Booker, I want to look over the house and her car again. I, I cleaned up thorough when I came back, and then and it was time again to go to work. Three years, mister, I tried, I worked, I paid. Hope, hope for three years that he'd leave, just leave on his own two feet and go away. It's my house, I pay, I pay. Am I happy? Am I proud? Did I need a man in good health who don't pay his way? Well, you didn't need to kill. Did I mean to kill? It happened. It just happened that way. When I knew life was gone from him, all I could think was out. I wanted him out. He was too heavy to lift. I I had to get him out. That's when I went to get the saw. I had to get him out. Booker, get going. Some way. Squad Room, the true-to-life enactment. Today on duty desk, as Lieutenant John Douglas, Wynn Wright. As Sergeant Allen... Dan Ocko, as Cully, Eric Dressler, as Mrs. Stern, Bryna Rayburn. Squad Room is produced and directed by Wynn Wright, written by Peter Irving. All names are fictitious, and a resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The American Broadcasting Company challenges you to a startling puzzle in crime. The Adventures of Bill Lance, starring Gerald Moore, with Howard McNear as Professor Ulysses Higgins. Hello, I'm Bill Lance. I'm primarily a composer, also a criminologist. 
Well, perhaps it's more accurate to call me a student of human nature. I believe that crime is the result of a delinquent society, that the criminal mind is a sick mind, and that the symptoms of that sickness are always apparent in the behavior of the criminal. Therefore, if you would expose a criminal, look for fingerprints on the doorknob, but also look for imprints on the human mind. In short, human emotions are my clues. Oh, yes. <laughs> I also play the piano. You know, sometimes you can figure out a lot of things by thinking of how you'd behave under a given set of circumstances. Well, that is, figuring, of course, that you're normal, and who is. If so, your reactions would be normal, and if someone behaves differently from the way you would, well, maybe that wouldn't be normal, huh? And if it isn't, there must be a reason. And that reason sometimes leads to the solution of a crime. As, for example, it did in the case of the stolen necklace. Well, as a matter of fact, it wasn't really stolen. I had it all the time. <laughs> it was given to me. Ulysses. Uh, yes, sir. Listen. You hear that? Doesn't that sound have a familiar ring to you? Listen carefully. Doesn't it mean something? Oh, yes. The doorbell. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes, I guess I was lost in thought. Well, now that you've found yourself, answer it, boy. Yes, all right, all right. I'm coming, I'm coming. Yes, yes. Ah, it's you again. Is Lance here? In just a moment. Bill. Yes, Ulysses. That imbibing jeweler, Mr. George Kincaid, is here again. Oh, George. <laughs> Come in. Oh, thanks, Bill. Oh, didn't expect to see you again so soon. <laughs> Especially sober. Yeah, you listen. Bill, I want to ask a favor of you. I need some help. Naturally, after what happened last week with Mr. and Mrs. Randolph, I immediately thought of you. And then you must be in trouble. In my safe out in my store in Beverly Hills is a necklace worth a quarter of a million dollars. Eh, uh, well, don't bandy the information about it. There won't be. Look, Bill, the responsibility of carrying out my client's wishes, well, it's more than I care to take. I'm well known across the country as a jewel merchant and... And I'm not. Is that the idea? Exactly. I'm sure you won't be disappointed if you'll agree to meet my client. Don't do it, Bill. Only lead to trouble. But, Ulysses, you never can tell what trouble may lead to, huh? It will lead to your death one of these days, William Ferdinand. You mark my words. It will lead to your death. <laughs> Time. Hello, George. This the man you want me to meet? Yes. Uh, Bill Lance, Arthur Banks. How do you How do, are you? Lance? <clears throat> oh, yes. This is my associate, Professor Higgins. I'm pleased to meet you, How Professor. How do you do? Well, you gentlemen will want to talk privately, so please use my office, Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Kincaid. After you, Mr. Lance. Come on, Ulysses. Oh, am I included? You've never been excluded, have you? Sit down, please, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kincaid acquainted you with my problem, I suppose. Well, he mentioned something about a valuable necklace. Yes. See for yourself. Here. Oh, it's a beauty. Large diamonds interspersed with emeralds. <laughs> Green ones. It is worth a quarter of a million dollars. Easily. As a matter of fact, it's already sold for that amount. Sold? Yes. Consummation of the sale depends only upon delivery. Well? Delivery, Mr. Lance, I fear, is going to be extremely difficult. As a matter of fact, impossible for me. Please explain. I have sold this piece to Monsieur André Leclerc in Paris. But the piece must be delivered into his hands before payment will be made to me. The money is on deposit at a local bank and will be released to me upon receipt of word from Leclerc that the piece is in his hands. And? Mr. Lance, it is known by certain parties that I possess this piece. They are, shall we say, expert in their profession. Jewel thieves? Yes. Big combine? No, Mr. Lance. A man and his daughter. His name is... Hans Oglefelt. I beg your pardon, uh, Ogle who? Oglefelt, he's a Hollander. Oh. His daughter is Lena Oglefelt. These two will stoop to any depths to steal this necklace. If I attempt to make delivery to Monsieur Leclerc in Paris, they would kill me for it. However, if you were to undertake... Uh, don't do it, Will. You think my neck won't stick out as far as yours? There huh? is no way that Oglefelt could know of your connection or your mission. You could make the delivery safely. And if I do? Uh, don't do it, Will. There will be $10,000 here with Mr. Kincaid for you upon your return. Bill, you've already got $10,000. No, well, in these times, Ulysses, anybody can use a little extra pin money. I see the incentive will have to be stronger. All right, Mr. Lance, double it. All right. I'll keep the necklace from this moment on. 
As for you, Mr. Banks, don't come near me or Kincaid again until delivery is completed. Good. I can't tell you how grateful I am you're willing to undertake this. I wish you'd stop using that word. It makes me nervous. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Where will I find this, Monsieur Leclerc? 334 Rue de May. 334 Rue de May. All right. Come on, Ulysses. We've got to see about clipper tickets. Could we please stop for some food on the way? I'm starved. You're always starved. Uh, Professor Higgins, are you a gourmet? Yes, spell glutton. Oh, Bill, that's in kind. Food is one of my fondest pleasures, too, Professor Higgins. Yeah, but it's an obsession with him. Why, when Ulysses finishes, our refrigerator looks as if it had been hooverized. Oh, that's very good, Bill. <laughs> you mean like the, by the ex-president? No, like by the vacuum sweeper. Completely clean. Oh. Well, it's patriotic not to waste food these days, Bill. That's an admirable thing. Yeah, and you've got a patriotic stomach, too. All right, we'll stop for a snack, and then we'll get the tickets for Paris. Now that I've got it, I want to drop this bundle of ice as quickly as possible. <laughs> That was an excellent meal. <laughs> I feel completely refreshed. You mean restuffed? Hey, Bill, be careful. Hmm? That car pulling along. You're awfully close to it. It's close to me, crowding me over. Oh, no wonder. It's a woman driver. Hey, look, they're trying to force you to curb. Oh, fine. Well, we'll just... They've speeded up with you. That isn't careless driving, Ulysses. This is intentional. And now that I get a good look, I recognize that car, Bill. It was parked behind us when you got those plane tickets. Three guesses what they're after. Look out, Bill. They're going to crash us. Out, Ulysses, run for it. I knew we shouldn't have gotten mixed up in this. Stop! Stop! You there! Stop or I'll shoot! Stay where you are. Facing away from me. Very sensible of you to obey my order to stop. Well, shooting is too high a price to pay for disobedience. Very sensible. Now perhaps you'll be kind enough to hand over that necklace. Uh, what necklace? I don't have time to play guessing games. Since you won't comply with my request, I'll have to take more definite means. Bill. Bill. Uh, oh, Bill. Oh, why does he have to do it? Oh, Bill. Bill. Oh. Oh, he's alive. Well, thank heavens. No, oh, my head. But, Bill, what happened? What? Evidently, our friend rocked me to sleep. Well, he's gone now. How do you know? Well, I ran in the opposite direction. He followed you. I stopped and hid behind oh. another car, and then I watched. No, oh, that's fine. You just watched while he parted my hair with the butt of his gun. Did you get a good look at him? No. Didn't you? He made me keep turned away from him. Besides, it's dark. Right after he knocked you down, he ran back to our car. Uh -huh. He seemed to be looking through it. Then he jumped <clears> back in the car with the girl, and they drove off. I see. And... Uh, a necklace. What about the necklace? I haven't got it, Ulysses. You haven't got it? You mean that you... Oh, man, that's good. Good? Yeah, that's good. I'm glad he got it. Now we don't have to worry about it anymore. I'm glad it's settled and we're out of it. Ulysses, look in your coat pocket. In my coat? You mean the necklace? Yeah. I figured they'd expect it to be on me, so just as you jumped out of the car, I slipped it in your pocket. See, we haven't lost it after all. Uh, worse luck, if you ask me. I knew oh. this thing would get us into trouble. That's right, Ulysses. And the sooner we get to Monsieur Leclerc in Paris, the sooner our trouble is going to be over. George Kincaid, exquisite jewel appointments. Yes, yes, this is Mr. Kincaid speaking. Oh, hello. Yes. Well, yes, I suppose such a job could be done. We already have the original. All right. All right, I don't know what you're getting at, but I'll do as you say. Yes. All right. Goodbye. Hmm. Why, I ever let myself get mixed up in these wild escapades of yours, I never know. Just never know. Why don't you just relax and enjoy the flight and the scenery, Ulysses? Oh, scenery. You call just plain old sky and gray ocean scenery? Certainly. What do you call it? Monotonous. You know, something tells me your boredom's going to be very short-lived, Professor. Eh? Well, unless I miss my guess, that first attempt to get the necklace won't be the last. Obviously, the jewel thieves Banks was afraid of with the same tool cocked me out last night. That means they know we've got the necklace and have a pretty good idea we'll be hearing from them. Excuse me. How fast can my prediction come true? I wonder if I might ask a favor. 
Mademoiselle, if I knew what you wanted, you wouldn't even have to ask. This timetable. I- I'm so mixed up with the time changes. Do you understand? Mademoiselle, at a time like this, it behooves a man to conjure up all the understanding possible. <laughs> Just what is it you'd like to know? Uh, exactly what time do we arrive in Paris? Just in time for us to have dinner together. <laughs> I'm stopping at the Crayon. Where are you stopping? Now that I think of it, I believe I'm stopping at the Crayon, too. Oh, how charming. Perhaps we'll see something of each other. Yes, yes, perhaps we will. Now, what was it you wanted to know? Or have you already found out? <laughs> Three, four, Rue de May. This is the place. Pull up here, driver, please. Yeah, monsieur. Good. What's good? There's a light on. Monsieur Leclerc, at least somebody's in. Come on, Ulysses. Oh, uh, uh, uh driver. Hey, monsieur. Perhaps you'd better wait. Right, yeah. Yes, we may have to leave in a hurry. Oh, you're such an optimist, Ulysses. Always expecting the worst. And usually right. Now, here we are. <laughs> nice setting for danger. Narrow, dark street, small, lighted shop. And that man behind the counter. Just open the door, Ulysses. Oh, certainly, Master. Ah, bonsoir, Monsieur. How are you? There's something you wish? Yes. We'd like to see Monsieur Andre Leclerc, if you please. I am Monsieur Leclerc. Oh, are you? <laughs> well, I'm Bill Lance. Lance? Bill Lance? Yes. And what is your business, Monsieur Lance? He's a piano tuner. I am not. Pay no attention to my friend here, monsieur. To tell the truth, I'm a... I'm an errand boy. Uh, errand boy? Oh, errand boy. That's right, that's right. I'm running an errand for Mr. Arthur Banks, Beverly Hills, California. Ah. I have a necklace. It's to be handed over to you, monsieur Leclerc. Oh, yes, yes. Now that you explain your mission, I understand. Uh, I've been expecting you, although I was not acquainted with your name. I'm happy to say you have negotiated the trip without mishap. Uh, And now the necklace, eh? Oh, I don't have it with me. You... Well, uh, where is it? Surely you brought it? Oh, yes, yes, I brought it, but you wouldn't expect me to carry it around with me until I'd made contact with you, would you? (laughs) Of course. Uh, Caution is necessary. Extremely. But you do have the necklace. I mean, it is here in Paris. Oh, yes, yes, it's here. In safekeeping. Well, then, now that you have contacted me, you will, of course, make the delivery at once. We are anxious to have the transaction completed. I'm sure you don't wish to keep Monsieur Kincaid and Monsieur Banks waiting for their money. Oh, of course not. Uh, How long will you be here? I can wait until you return. All right. Shouldn't take too long. If you wait right here, I'll get the necklace and bring it to you. Thank you so much, Monsieur Lance. Not at all. Thank you, Monsieur Leclerc. All right, driver, take us to the prefect of police. Prefect police. Yeah, hurry, will you? Yeah, monsieur. Prefect of police, what in heaven's name are you thinking? How would Andre Leclerc know about George Kincaid, huh? A couple of things the police may be able to straighten out for me. I certainly appreciate your cooperation, Inspector. That is perfectly all right, Monsieur Lance. We are always happy to assist in such matters. Now, uh, here is the material you ask for. Oh, thank you. Hmm. Dossier André Leclerc, Jules. Arrested March 2nd, 1946, passing reproductions. Arrested October 7th, 1946, embezzlement. Hmm. Inspector, is there a picture of André Leclerc here? Last page. Oh. Hey, Ulysses, take a look at this. Eh? Did you ever see this man before? Mm, no, 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 can't see the hair. What? This is an authentic picture of Andre Leclerc. No. By well, the man we met was... We... Short, stocky, nothing about him resembling Andre, huh? That's right, Bill, but what does it mean? Well, I have a hunch that it means our Monsieur Leclerc is not Monsieur Leclerc at all. But, but, but... but Obviously, but... Monsieur Leclerc wouldn't turn over his shop to a well-known jewel thief except by force. So if we want to deliver our necklace, we better find Monsieur Leclerc. Come on. <laughs> Thank you. 
Oh, uh, messieurs, you have returned. Yes. You have brought the necklace, yes? Yes, we have brought the necklace, no. All right, monsieur, put up your hands. What, what is the meaning of this outrage? You... Meaning is we want to see Monsieur Leclerc. I have told you already that I am Leclerc. The lack of resemblance between you two is cataclysmic. Now, where is he? You are mistaken. I... Okay, Ulysses, keep this monkey covered. Here's my gun. Uh, yes, but, but, but I... Keep him covered. I'm going to have a look through the back rooms of this place. Yes, but, uh, you be careful, but you can't tell what sort of monkey bank you run into. Oh, I'll be very careful, Ulysses. Just keep your eye on our friend there. Hmm. Empty. Doesn't look as though even Kilroy was here. Father Heavy, Mr. Lance. Well, hello. <laughs> I, uh, I more or less expected us to meet at the Creon. Stay where you are, Mr. Lance. Now, they step closer. E, I'm sure you'll pardon me for mentioning it, but uh, your gun is showing. And, Monsieur Lance, I understand how to use it. Yes, I'm sure you do. Lena? You know my name. Yes, yes, I know your name. And your purpose. And I have an idea that I know the gentleman on the floor, too. He's pretty well tied up, isn't he? Very securely. And, Monsieur Lance, I advise you not to make any attempt to free him. It might cost you your life. Well, everything comes high these days. You're a very determined young lady, aren't you? Yes. You know, of course, you're never going to get away with it. Even if you get the necklace, I'll be able to tell the police who stole it. Will you, Monsieur Clerk? <clears throat> well, maybe I won't. You know, somehow you don't quite fit into the role you're playing, Lena. Meaning? You're a charming, beautiful, intelligent girl. You don't fit the pattern of a jewel thief. You probably know the pattern better than I. Stop! I told you to come no closer. Well, surely you can't object if I have a look at Monsieur Leclerc. I'd like to find out if he's still alive. He's alive. He's been given something to make him sleep. Mm hmm. Something like a good sock on the noggin. He's all right. Now tell me, Mr. Lance, do you have the necklace with you? Huh. Very well. I can find out for myself. Turn around, Monsieur Lance. That's right. Face the wall. Now, put up your hands. Higher. <laughs> I am glad to see that you are willing to cooperate, Monsieur Lance. You know, there's something about a loaded gun that brings out my sense of cooperation. That is extremely wise. Mm. Stand perfectly still, Mr. Lance. I am going to search you. I could never hope to have it done by a more charming thief. Calling names will get you nowhere, Monsieur Lance. I'm sorry. Uh, Mademoiselle. I might as well save you the trouble. The necklace is in my inside coat pocket. Shall I get it for you? No, thank you. I'll get it. Ah. Oh. Thank you, Monsieur Lance. I don't suppose I can convince you you shouldn't take it, huh? That I could wish you were an honest person? I like you, Lena. I... I... Stop it. I know what you <laughs> are, Monsieur Lance. And I can assure you that I am not at all interested in your opinion of me. All right. Just thought I'd try. Now, I want you to walk straight ahead of me, through the next room and into the shop. And then? I imagine we'll find your friend there. He may have a gun, but with you directly ahead of me, he won't be apt to use it. Mm -hmm. Tell me, Lena, were you ever a commando? Walk, Monsieur Lance. Oh, yes, yes. Well... Are we going to leave Monsieur Leclerc like that? I'm not worried about Monsieur Leclerc. When he comes to, he'll call for help. Someone will come. In the meantime, he'll just have to stay there. All right, Monsieur Lance, open the door to the shop. Remember, stay squarely in front of me. Uh, Bill, did you find anything? Yes, I sure did. Uh, Bill? All right, Monsieur Lance. Walk straight to your friend. You with a gun. You can see what may happen to your friend if you fail to cooperate. Uh, yes, yes, I can. I... Be careful, Lena. I will, Father. Do you have the necklace? Yes. Now... You? Uh, me? Oh, uh, Professor Higgins, Lena Ogilvell. Oh, how do you do? Uh, Bill, what? Yes, that's right, isn't it, Lena? Yes, that's right. Now, your gun, Professor. Thank you. All right, Father. Let's go. Good work, Lena. I'm proud of you. Goodbye, Mr. Lance. It's been so nice meeting you. Yes, hasn't it? And profitable, too, for you. Hello, Bill. Does she have the necklace? Yeah. Well, come on, Bill. After them, they'll escape. Well, you can go after them if you like. As for me, I have no intention of chasing two people with guns when I don't have so much as a pen knife. You mean you're going to let them get away? Look, Ulysses, they already got away. But they, 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 well, what do we do now? Well, we'll go into the back room, free Monsieur Andre Leclerc, and then get back to the United States just as fast as we can. You mean you're not going to make any attempt to get that necklace away from that girl? Ulysses, I have a strange feeling that she thinks more of that necklace than she does of my life. <laughs> Uh, 
Well, I cannot understand you. We travel halfway across the world to deliver a necklace. And then you let it slip right through your fingers. And you give up. Excuse me. We. Oui? Hello. We. Oui? We. Oui, yes. Oh, <laughs> we want to place a phone call. We. Oui. We. Oui. To George Kincaid, Beverly Hills. Oh, uh, Beverly Hills? Don't you ever go to the movies? It's in California. His phone number is Evergreen 24545. How soon can you uh, get the call through? Uh, I do not know. This Beverly Hills... Well, you just tell it to the New York operator. I'm sure she's heard of it. Well, I must say, Bill, I'm not going to relish meeting George Kincaid and Mr. Banks. <laughs> not after the dismal failure you managed to achieve. Yeah, too bad, isn't it? Well, at least we're back and alive. Oh, good. George must have received my message. See, there's a light in the shop. Mm-hmm. Oh. Oh, my. Hello, George. You got my message, huh? Uh, message? Oh, yes, yes, Bill. I got it. Oh, no, George. Not again. Ah, <laughs> Bill, oh, Bill, oh, Bill, oh, Bill, oh, Bill, oh, Bill. Yeah, that's me, Bill. <laughs> Hey, there's a evil eye. <laughs> you know, Bill, you're supposed to be in Paris. I've been, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, you're back. Well, it was a quick trip. Now, look, I hoped you'd be of some help to me, but in your present condition, I think you better just go into your back room for a little nap. Well, all right. Uh, what are you going to do? Going to sit out a long wait here in your shop. Uh, why, Bill? Because I'm expecting visitors. Yeah, I cannot understand it. Cannot understand it. Well, I have to sit here in this darkened shop, waiting and waiting. Waiting for what? I told you, visitors. Oh, visitors. Bill, you exasperate me. Why, I get mixed up in these things. Ulysses, our visitors have arrived. Look. Yes, it is. A man and a woman. Look, Bill. Do you see who that is? Sure. It's that woman and her father. Exactly. We left them in Paris. How'd they get back here? We don't have a monopoly on clippers, Ulysses. We got back, didn't we? But, 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 but... Yes? What do they want? Probably the necklace. They already have the necklace. You said so yourself. Look, maybe they didn't like the one they got in Paris. Let them in, will you? All right. What have I to lose? Except my life. Well, Lena. Mr. Ogilfell, we've been expecting you. You're very clever, Monsieur Lamont. Mm -hmm. Put up your hands, both of you. Again? This time we won't fail. So stupid of me not to see that the jewels I got from you are paste. Of course, my father recognized the fraud immediately. Oh, of course, I was sure he would. Uh, you can put your guns down. They won't be necessary. Here's the necklace. Oh, just a minute. I'll get it for you. Oh, George. Uh -huh. Oh, oh, Bill. Bill, oh, oh, what's the matter? Are you sober enough to open your safe? Bill, I resent your implication. Well, stop licking your wounds. Get the necklace. The legal owners are here for it. Now, Lena, Mr. Ogilfell, if you just be patient, Mr. Kincaid will bring you your necklace. Well, in heaven's name, William Ferdinand, have you lost your mind? No. Monsieur Lant, you mean you are willing to turn it over to us? Yes. See, I did a little checking and I found out what your father's occupation really is. He's a jewel thief. No, no, no. He's a jewel smith. The best in the business. And why should he and this woman try to steal that necklace? Because they thought we were working with the real thieves. You seem to know a good many things, Mr. Lant. I do. Let's see if I'm right. This necklace was given to you by a prominent actress for resetting, right? That is correct. Mr. Arthur Banks, or whatever his name is, stole it from you. He contacted Kincaid. Kincaid came to me. You see, Banks knew we couldn't get the piece out of the country. He also knew that I could. You and your charming daughter thought we were in with him. We had no reason to believe otherwise. No? If you thought we were stealing the necklace, why didn't you go to the police? I can answer that one too, Ulysses. Ogle felt would have been ruined if it had become public that he'd been careless enough to lose a valuable necklace left in his care. Well, here's the thing. Who gets it, Bill? There you are, Lena. Monsieur Lance, I can't tell you... Don't try. But remember what I was trying to tell you in the back of Leclerc's shop in Paris? I'd like to finish what I was saying, if you don't mind. How about dinner tomorrow night? Monsieur Lance, you have done us a great favor. I am deeply appreciative. And I should like to see you again. But it is impossible. Impossible? Why? I'm strictly available. Mr. Lance, what my daughter is trying to tell you is that she is not... Available, as you put it. Why not? Uh, she's to be married next week. Oh, is there anything I can do, Bill? Me. Yeah. Call Inspector Holland. Have him pick up Arthur Banks on a jewel theft charge. Bill, 
That isn't your composition. Isn't that Pagliacci? Yes. Why are you playing that? I don't know. It seems appropriate, Ulysses. I'm a broken man. Oh, that girl? She's cut me, Ulysses. I'm bleeding. Oh, you mean that you're... Adelina. There's the most interesting woman I've met in years. She's going to be married next week. <laughs> well, sir, you right. If you hadn't gone chasing off to Paris, if you'd have given her the necklace in the first place, you wouldn't have gotten so involved. Ulysses, I didn't know the answers in the first place. Well, I still don't. What about that phony necklace? How'd that get in? Oh, I believe Banks' story at first, but if there was to be such a desperate attempt made to steal the necklace, I wanted to be sure the thieves didn't get the real one, you uh -huh. see? But I wanted the attempt made so that the thieves could be taken into custody. So before we left, I called Kincaid and had him make up a duplicate out of paste. He worked all night. Oh, yes, over a hot bottle of bourbon. Yes. <laughs> and then when I got a look at Andre Leclerc's record in Paris, I realized that a legitimate jewel merchant in America would have nothing to do with him. Mm -hmm. Then somehow I could never believe that Lena was a thief. You know, she and her father, their efforts were so clumsy. They were more desperate than professional jewel thieves would ever have been. Yeah. So when we got back, I checked up on her father, and once I discovered his occupation, the rest fit perfectly. And I knew when they discovered the necklace they got was a fake, they'd be back at Kincaid's shop as quickly as they could. I see. And now you're in love with the girl. I'm afraid so, Ulysses. What do you intend doing about it? Just suffer. Well, the only cure for love is his love, William. I suggest the company of some other charming female. <laughs> now, I know a couple of young ladies. Ulysses, compared with Lena, the girls that you know would be shallow, giddy, tepid, pale, uninteresting. Oh, is that so? You're going to lead a very boring life from now, huh? Aren't you, Bill? You've been listening to another in the series of intriguing mysteries starring Gerald Moore as Bill Lance with Howard McNear as Ulysses Higgins. Tonight's supporting cast included Alma Lawton as Lena, Charles Calvert as Kincaid, Bill Conrad as Ogulfelt, John Newland as Arthur Banks, Michael Dine as the inspector, and Nina Barra as the phone girl. Music composed and played by Rex Corey. Join us again next week, same time over most of these same ABC stations, when Bill's composing is again interrupted by... Hello, Mr. Lance. Lena. Lena, darling, Mr. you Lance, came... I need your help. Huh? Don't tell me you've lost that necklace again. No, but you remember I told you I was to be married next week? Yes. Monsieur Lance, my fiancé has disappeared. Oh. Yes, well. Ulysses, get your hat. We've got to chase down a fiancé. This Bill Lance adventure was written and directed by Dwight Hauser. <laughs> Now, here's a special program note. Next, it's high-powered excitement on David Harding, Counter-Spy, with today's case of the International Food Racketeers. Don't miss Counter-Spy over the same ABC station. the time in London. Time to listen to the adventures of Raffles. Tonight, the Columbia Broadcasting System presents Chapter 20 in the Adventures of Raffles, starring Neil Hamilton. Again, we cross the Atlantic to meet London's man of mystery in the chapter titled The Imposter. London is shrouded in darkness. Down the black canyon of Regent Street, Raffles and Reggie approach their apartment. They enter, step quickly into the lighted lobby, 
and then walks silently down the carpeted hallway. Reggie peers ahead and turns to Raffles. I say, Governor, looks as if our door is standing open. Hmm, so it does, Reg. Did you leave it open when we left? I mean, I might not have locked it, but I'm certain I didn't leave it like that. The light's on. What goes on here? Oh, hello. Hello there, Raffles. Hope you'll excuse my breaking into your apartment this way. I'm Sir Henry Chapman. Well, this is something of a surprise, Sir Henry. I stopped by to see you and found no one at home. The door was unlocked, so I took the liberty of entering and to wait until you arrived. So I see. What was it that you wished to see me about? Well, it's a rather personal matter. Could we talk privately? If you like. I said, Reg, would you mind? Hmm? Oh, oh, not at all. Uh, all right. Yeah. Now, now, what is it? I'm in a very peculiar position. Extremely awkward. You're the only one who could help me out. Really? It's not an easy thing to explain. I'm faced with a very difficult matter involving one of my oldest and closest friends, Colonel Redding. You've heard of him? Colonel Redding? Yes. Why, yes, he's quite a well-known figure. A collector of rare gems. True. He's become famous for his collection of jewels. And that brings us around to my reason for coming here. I, too, am a collector of jewels in a modest way. Nothing to equal or even compare with Colonel Redding. I'm afraid I don't follow you. Well, here's the situation, Rattles. Some time ago, the Mirador necklace disappeared from my collection. Very mysteriously. I gave it up for lost. Until the other night, when I called on my friend, Colonel Redding. Oh, You've probably guessed. I saw my necklace there with his jewels. Mm-hmm. Do you have any idea how it got there? I haven't the faintest idea. I'm certain Colonel Redding knows it's mine. He saw it many times during his visits. A very odd situation, I must say. Obviously, you think your friend stole it. Well, I, I hate to think such a thing, but there's no other answer. I've come to this conclusion. Colonel Redding is an old man. The gathering of rare gems has become an obsession with him. He saw the Mirador necklace, wanted it, and took it. I see. Now tell me, how does this all concern me? I want you to steal it back. I beg your pardon? Oh, no offense, really. Uh, what I mean is that, well, you've been rather successful in such matters in the past, and I thought perhaps you could recover the necklace for me, and no one would be the wiser. Well, I'm afraid you're going to have to think again, old fellow. Your proposition doesn't appeal to me. Oh, but I'll pay you. Don't think I was going to ask you to do this for nothing. I'll pay you well. I wasn't thinking of money, I assure you. Oh, I I understand. You doubt that I'm the real Sir Henry Chadwick. Well, I, I should have thought of that. Here, my credentials. You can see for yourself. Mm -hmm. My bank book, my civilian defense card, ration books. Now, are you convinced? Mm. Suppose that I agree to procure the necklace for you, Sir Henry. Ah, that's better. I'll pay you 500 pounds. Very well, but that's incidental. Where shall we meet so that I may deliver it to you? Meet? Uh, I, uh, I think it would be better if you posted the necklace in a plain package. Simply address it to uh, Central Post, Box 366. As soon as I receive it, I return the check. You have my word for it. I see. Tell me, where does Colonel Redding keep this necklace? Uh, it's in a wall safe behind the mirror in his study. You recognize the necklace at once. Twelve panel stones with octagonal pendant. It's the only necklace in that part of his collection. Good. I'm sure that I'll have no trouble at all. Now, wait. This one thing is most important. You must do the job tonight. Tonight? Yes. Colonel Redding is alone. He retires at 11, so I suggest you enter the house no earlier than midnight. Midnight it shall be, Sir Henry. And remember... As soon as I have the necklace, uh, as soon as you have it, place it in the post immediately. You may depend on it. Excellent. I give you my word, Raffles. You're doing me a great favor. Mm -hmm. That, Sir Henry, remains to be seen. If you ask me, that's a rum safe for a valuable collection of jewels. I wouldn't ridicule the safe until it's open, Drench. Pull the light closer. All right. How's this? That's better, thank you. You know this Colonel Redding who lives here it must be off his crumpet going around stealing his friend's jewelry. <laughs> yes, yes, so we'll see him. Mm. Well, I hope he don't get up and come lurking about. If he came in now, he'd have a fair and proper reward. Well, for heaven's sake, be quiet or you'll have him coming down here. Oh, dear. Ah. Now we're getting it. You found the combination? Yes, yes. This turn we'll get it. Ah, 
that did it. Opened without a struggle. What's inside? Well, we'll see. There's a box here. Locked? No, no, just a fastener. Hold the light down, hold the light down. Oh, right. Oh, I say, will you look at that? Diamonds. Uh, let me feel of them. Uh, uh, well, I just wanted to touch them. Oh, I say, they're beauties. Hey, this must be the necklace that Chadwick is talking about. Well, it answers the description, all right. There's only one thing wrong. What do you mean? This necklace is nothing but a cheap imitation. These are not diamonds at all. They're paste, every one of them. Are you sure? Positive. Here, hold the box open. Oh, what are you going to do? I'm going to put it back. Oh, dear. I don't understand this at all, Governor. If those diamonds were just imitations, why was old Chadwick so blooming anxious to get them back? I don't know, Reg. Here, slip the box back into the safe. Uh. Yeah. Good. Now slide the mirror back in place and let's get out of here. All right. Reg, out with the light. Oh, dear. It's a car outside. Someone's coming in. It's Scotland Yard. This may be a bit awkward, Reg. I, I think you'd better leave. Out the back door. What about you? I'm going to stay. Hurry now. Out of sight. I'll meet you at the apartment. All right, but I hope him you know what you're doing. Good evening, gentlemen. Hey, good evening, Colonel Redding. I'm Inspector Higgins from... Raffles. Surprise, Inspector. Awfully glad you stopped around. Anything wrong? Why, why, why you... What are you doing in this house? What am I doing? Why, that's a rather impertinent question. I was paying a friendly call on Colonel Redding and was just about to leave when you came to the door. Oh, you were, eh? Come inside with me. I thought you'd given up burglary, Raffles. Burglary? <laughs> Dear me. God, now, Inspector, surely you're joking. I'm not joking. The people next door called the yard and said there was someone with a flashlight moving around on the second floor over here. Well, that's utterly impossible. There's been no one here except Colonel Redding on the second floor. Mm, suppose we go up and have a look. Well, all right, if you insist. But I think it's a rather shabby trick to go routing Colonel Redding out of bed again. No, mm, I don't think the Colonel will mind. Come along upstairs. Well, yeah. which room is his? I couldn't say, Inspector. Doors all seem to be closed, everything quiet enough. Why disturb the Colonel? You can see there's no one up here. Now, don't be in such a hurry. I didn't expect to find anyone. Then why waste time? I want to make sure that the colonel knew you were in the house. Yeah, we'll try this door. Well? Well, this appears to be the colonel's room. Colonel Redding. He's going to be in a very bad temper. Imagine if someone were to come shouting into your bedroom at this hour of the night. Hmm, there's something wrong here. Turn on the light. Oh, just as you say, Inspector. Great Scott! The man's been murdered! Colonel Reddy! Well, stand back, Raffles. He's been shot twice. Yes, and here's the gun that killed him lying on the floor. I thought you were too smart to try a thing like this, Raffles. Oh, now, hold on, Inspector. I refuse to be made the goat in a murder charge. Well, this time I'm afraid you've no choice in the matter. This is your gun, is it not? My gun? Why, Why so it is. Yeah. There are two cartridges fired. If you didn't kill Colonel Redding, how did the gun get in this room? I can't say exactly, Inspector, only, only believe me, I didn't kill this man. You're asking me to believe too much. It's plain what happened. You came here to rob Colonel Redding of his jewel collection. He awoke, surprised you, and you shot him. Now, wait a moment, Inspector. Doesn't all this seem just a bit too obvious? It's a clear case, that's all. Absolutely clear. Careful now. Now, just think a moment. If I'd killed Colonel Redding, do you think that I would have left my gun there on the floor... Do you think that I would have remained in the house when I saw your car pull into the drive? Well, I must confess I gave you credit for more intelligence than that. Thank you. How do I know that you didn't deliberately make it appear over-obvious? You'll have to take my word for that. I'm sorry, Raffles, but under the circumstances... Under the circumstances, Inspector, you owe me at least a trance. I see now that I was led into a trap. Whoever killed Colonel Redding intended that I was to take the blame. What are you talking about? Look, I'll explain everything later. You'll explain everything to the court. I'm asking you a favor, a personal favor, Inspector. Give me 24 hours and in the meantime say nothing to the newspapers about the murder. And what are you going to do? I give you my word, I'll bring you the real murderer. 24 hours? All right, I'm taking your word. But if at the end of that time you haven't produced the killer with proof... Then I'll surrender myself and stand trial for the murder. Very well. But heaven help you if you try to get out of London.
Well, this must be the street, Governor. The sign says Coxpur Lane. Right, Reggie. Sir Henry's house must be right around the corner. Uh, I don't know as I like this. This fellow Chadwick must have been the murderer, and he tried to pin it on you by stealing your gun and leaving it by the body. Now we're walking right into his lair, so to speak. Seems to me you're asking for trouble. Perhaps, Reg. The chances are we may catch him off his guard. After all, the way he planned it, he probably thought the first I'd learn about the murder would be when I was arrested. Mm, I get you. He thought you'd be behind bars before you even had a chance to figure out it was him. Exactly. And I very nearly was. Uh, what was that address again? Uh, number 94. Oh, here. This must be it right here. Right, come on. Let's hope our little surprise works. Mm, and it better add. Scotland Yard's been waiting to get something like this on you for a long time now. <laughs> well, I've managed to keep out of trouble so far, so... Yes, sir? What can I do for you? Oh, I'd like to speak to Sir Henry Chadwick, if you please. It's most urgent. I'm sorry, sir. Sir Henry's been out of town for over a month, and he's not expected back for another week at least. Out of town? Yes, sir. Hunting, you know, in Scotland. I'm sorry. I I thought I saw him on the Strand yesterday. Oh, no, sir. You must have mistaken someone else for Sir Henry. I'm sure that if he were back in town, I would have heard from him. Yes, yes, of course. Well, thank you. Not at all. Uh, may I tell him you called? No, that'll not be necessary, thank you. Good day. Good day, sir. Well, wouldn't that cook you? What do you make of that, Governor? Hmm. What do you make of it, Reg? Well, it's obvious the bloke was lying, covering up for his murder and master. I think not. What do you mean? I think he was telling the truth. I don't think his master is in town. But we saw him. Did we? Oh, I should have guessed it before. He went to too many pains to assure us of his identity. He was too anxious to convince us that he was Sir Henry Chadwick. You mean the bloke who called on you was an imposter, eh? Well, I think that's pretty evident, isn't it? He apparently knew both Sir Henry and Colonel Redding, knew of their friendship, and developed a story that was likely to lure me into the murdered man's house, and thereby expose me to the hangman's noose. But if he isn't Sir Henry Chadwick, who is he? I don't know. That's what we've got to find out. Come on. Where are we going now? To the post office. If the man calls to pick up the package of jewels that I was supposed to have mailed him, we have our murderer. Now, this blinking post office is no place to be standing for three hours like this. I'm near frozen, I am. Never mind. Looks like we won't have to wait much longer. What's up, Governor? Spotted him? No, I'm afraid not, Reg. And it doesn't look like we will. They're closing the post office. Clo but it's only one o'clock. Yes, but today they close early for the weekend. Oh. Come on, we might as well leave. We're not letting anyone else in. Blimey, Governor, he didn't show up. We've just wasted our time. Well, not entirely. I've had a chance to do some thinking. I should have known that he wouldn't show up here so soon. At least not until he knew that I was safely behind bars. I don't get you, Governor. I'll explain when we get outside. Come on, come on. All right. Eh, nasty looking. Looks like a bit like rain. Yes, yes, it does, little. Reg, I want you to do something for me. Fair enough, Governor. What is it? I want you to take a tour of all the jewel fences in town. Find out whether any of them have any information of the real Mirador necklace and who sold it. Right. With your friends in the street, it should be easy enough to trace. Yes, yes, and it's just possible that we may learn the real reason behind all of this. Well, that'd be a relief. I must confess it's as clear to me as a pea soup fog. <laughs> Not as complicated as it looks, I think, Reggie. And now, for instance, Governor, if that necklace was made of paste, why did the murderer want you to steal it? Oh, I guess he didn't know it wasn't real, huh? Oh, I rather doubt that, Reg. Supposing this man, whoever he is, had put the paste necklace there, and mm -hmm. then... To avoid Colonel Redding's finding out the substitution, he wanted it stolen, so that it would look like the real one had been stolen. Oh, I get it. Of course. Uh, but wait, then why would he have to kill Redding? That's just it. You hit it exactly. We go one step further and we find that Colonel Redding must have known of the substitution and had probably threatened to expose the murderer. That would account for the murder. But then why would he want the phony necklace stolen? To cover up his trail by making it look like robbery. By me. He could throw any suspicion away from himself. Ah. And by destroying the paste necklace, he would eliminate the last shred of evidence which might point to him. And they'd never be able to trace the necklaces, the real or the phony one, to him. Right. He figured no one would believe me with all the evidence against me. And besides, 
I don't know who he is. Oh, blimey, Governor. He's a clever one, he is, and he's got you in a nasty spot. Yes, but I think maybe I know how to get out. You do? How? Well, while you're making the rounds of the fences, I'll be at Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard? Mm Mm-hmm. I'm going to give myself up. Oh, Governor, are you off your noggin? (laughs) Not at all, not at all, Reggie. There's one thing our murderer didn't figure on. And that's that I should be caught and placed behind bars before I had gotten the paste necklace and sent it to him. That leaves the evidence still there against him. But blimey, that's so. So don't be surprised at what you hear. Just find out all you can about that necklace and meet me at the apartment at 8.30 tonight. In the meantime, I'll be under arrest for murder. <laughs> Raffles, what the devil are you talking about? I want you to arrest me now, in time for the evening editions. I say, what have the newspapers to do with this? A great deal. By their reporting of my arrest, they'll catch the real murderer for us. Uh, Very well, Raffles. This is the way you want it. I'm genuinely sorry to see this day, but I arrest you for the murder of Colonel Redding. Good, good. Now, Now, the next thing I want you to do is this. Call the newspapers immediately, tell them you have me charged with murder... Tell them that uh, through the superior work of your department, the jewel theft was frustrated and that the Mirador necklace is still safe. It, along with the rest of Colonel Redding's jewel collection, will be sent for safekeeping to the Royal Museum, where it will be on display. What? I blast you, Raffles. What tomfoolery is this? I assure you that it's quite necessary, Inspector. And I'm hoping that you'll do this for me as a friend. Well, if you put it that way, I, I suppose there's no harm in it. No. Of course not. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Inspector. You, you'll not regret this. Now, I have things to attend to, so I'll run along. But I'll have the murderer for you tonight. No, no, you don't. Stop. What? You're not going anywhere. You're under arrest for murder. You're staying right here, behind bars. But, Inspector, that's just for the newspapers. I hope... Oh, no, it's not. Scotland Yard doesn't lie to the newspapers or anybody else. If I say you're under arrest, you're under arrest, and here you stay. Oh, but that will spoil everything. I have to be free to catch the real murderer. No, I'm very much afraid the real murderer is caught, Raffles. And there's no use trying to get away now. You've had your chance to prove your innocence and given it up. From now on, the law will take its course. Say, Joe, would you look at this in the evening paper? Raffles arrested for reading murder. Jewel thief caught in the act, eh? Well, what do you know? I say, do you happen to know anything about the Mirador necklace? I've seen pictures of it, but I ain't seen it about here. Well, now, look. It's a necklace of 12 panel stones and an octagonal pendant. Nothing like that in my shop, and I haven't heard nothing at all from the grapevine. Oh, dear. Well, never mind. We'll search for it till we find it. Inspector, please. It's 8.30 now. In half an hour, the museum will be closing. And then it'll be probably too late. Raffles, is that what you got yourself up here to my office to ask? I've told you 50 times. I'm not going to release you to go out to any museum. You don't have to. You can come with me. Handcuff me. Anything you like. But our murderer will get away if we don't catch him out there. Well, you'd better concoct a better excuse than this to get away, Raffles. It's not worthy of your talent, really. But I tell you, you're letting the real murderer get away. I hardly think so. This time you were a little too clever for your own good. Your whole story is just too, too fantastic. Sir Henry Chadwick, imposters, asking you to steal his jewels back. Preposterous. <sighs> no, the evidence is too clear. You went to steal the jewels, Colonel Redding caught you, and you killed him. Well... Looks like you have me dead to rights this time. You you admit it then, Raffles? A man's a fool not to admit what is obvious. Well, good heavens. Well, I I didn't really think you did it. Well, I can hardly believe it. Well, I I can only say I'm I'm deucedly sorry, old chap. I never really wanted anything like this. I know, I know, Inspector. But that's the way things work out sometimes. I bear you no grudge. Uh, Thanks. I'm glad to hear you say that. It's just my duty I'm doing. You see that? Of course, my friend. 
Tell me, do you suppose just for friendship's sake that we might have a last nightcap together? You know, before I go back to my cell. Why, of course, old fellow, of course. I, Liz, I, I have a bottle of Hennessy right here in the cabinet. Yeah, we'll have a swallow up in a jiffy. Yeah. Here we are. Yeah, it's just the thing for a raw evening like this. I can use a bit myself. Yes, and speaking of the weather, it seems to be getting chillier every minute. I'll, I'll have to call for some heat if I'm going to stay here much longer tonight. Hey, now, here we are, Raffles. This will warm you. Raffles! What? Why is that? Don't bring Caesar. He's tricked me. Sergeant! Sergeant! Raffles! He's gotten away. He got out the window. Hurry, surround the place. Hey, there he goes, over the wall. Hurry up! Hurry up! Don't you have to hurry. The museum's closing. You must be locked in two minutes. Oh, dear, that ruddy place is deserted. Well, watch your step. It's pretty dark. They've turned off the lights in this corridor. Yes, I know. These blinking rooms give me the creeps. I... Oh, Governor, look out. What's the matter? What in thunder do you see? Look, in the doorway there. Them eyes. Nonsense. Come on. That's just a sarcophagus. It's just a what? Sarcophagus. It's an Egyptian coffin. Probably has a mummy inside of it. You mean... You mean dead people? Well, of course. Been dead for a thousand years. Oh, Governor, I don't like this. You ain't going in there, are you? Well, of course. That's the room where the jewels are being displayed. Come on, that sarcophagus won't hurt you. Even if it does have a ferocious face painted on it. No, uh, them Egyptians was blinking heathens, that's what. A plain coffin wasn't good enough for them. <laughs> oh, hey, what's that? That's the bell signaling nine o'clock. The doors are closing. You mean we're going to be locked in here? That's right. The saints have mercy on us. Now, quiet. Our murderer may be in this room, so move carefully. Much more. Close this, Governor. That's fine, that's fine. Stay out of the moonlight from that window. Where are the jewels? Right there in that case in the center of the room. No, I may be easy enough to lift them. Why, nobody seems to know what it is at all. No, no, this is a pretty big place. Easy to lose a lot of people in here. But if, if they lock the doors, how is the murderer going to get in? Probably already in. Same way we got here. You mean, you mean hiding somewhere? Yes. And when he comes out and tries to get the jewels, we'll get him. Is that so, gentlemen? <gasps> what? Careful. Put up your hands. I have you covered. Don't turn round. Any move out of either of you means a bullet. You probably have realized by now that I'm not afraid to use a bullet. Yes, that's evident, Chadwick. Yes. You've been rather smart, Raffles, but not smart enough. Otherwise, you might have made sure that sarcophagus you passed did have a mummy inside. Blimey, he was inside that coffin. Quiet, both of you. From now on, I do the talking. All right, <laughs> keep quiet, Reggie. Rest assured, you will not hang for the murder of Colonel Redding. I will save you that humiliation, but neither you nor your man here will leave this room alive. Oh, Governor. Steady, you... steady, Reg. What do you propose to do with us? Give you a very elegant burial. You and your friend will be honored with coffins made for King Tuck's family. You mean the sarcophagi? Yes, two of them. I assure you, they are quite comfortable. For a time. <laughs> and a few drops of chloroform will make it quick and ensure that you attract no attention for several days. At He's least. a fiend he is. Quiet, Reg. Very well. Let's get on with the Chadwick. Walk to the center of the room, both of you. Remember, I'm standing here behind you, ready to shoot if you make one false move. Very well. I presume you wish me to walk to the jewel case. Exactly. Go ahead. All right. Now, what? Now, you will open the case and take out all of the jewels. Mm. Yes, of course. Governor, let me do it. Yeah, no, Raffles will do it. And Raffles' fingerprints will be on the case. You stand aside. Better do as he says, Reg. But I... Hurry, oh, hurry. All, all right, all right. Good. A neat job, if I say so myself. Never mind the compliments. Take out the jewels. All of them? Why not? Now that you're the culprit, you'll never trace them to me. Perhaps not. All right, I have them now. Now what? Yeah, give them to me. Very well. Here they are. Hurry, Merchant, quick. Stop, I... Get this. Get this. Oh, dear. Oh. Oh. Reg. Go. 
Whenever he gets you. No, confound it, Reg. Let go of my throat. Oh, I'm sorry, Governor. I thought it was the other bloke I had hold of. Where is he? He's here on the floor. Oh. He's knocked out. Oh, dear. What's he here? Who's this? Turn on the lights. Ah, that's better. Good evening, Inspector. Breakfast. Come in, man. Not grab him. That won't be necessary, Inspector. I'll come peacefully. But I'll also ask you to bring along the real murderer. What do you mean? I told you I'd deliver him to you, and here he is. A little the worse for wear at the moment, but he'll recover enough to give you the story in a few moments. Raffles, you had proof? I think I'll be able to prove my case, yes. And besides the evidence you find in this room, I can produce the fence who bought the real Mirador necklace from this man. Oh, then, then this is the imposter you told us about, eh? Yes, except for one thing. He's not an imposter. This is Sir Henry Chadwick. Oh, it's incredible. How did you know? Because I can also produce the bookmaker to whom Sir Henry owed huge gambling debts and to whom he paid the money that he got from the real necklace. Mm. That's right, Inspector. I talked to them all myself, and they'll all testify for Mr. Raffles. You see, this time I have Reggie here to thank for saving my skin. While you kept me hooped up in Scotland Yard, he was digging up the evidence I needed. Well, both of you will have to come along with us until we... Then we can check up on this. But I must say, Raffles, I'm glad it turned out you didn't do it. Oh, thank you. But I'll be hanged if I'll ever forgive you for making a monkey out of me by escaping it from my own office. Blast you! <laughs> I know, I know, Inspector. Was rude of me to turn down that drink. But uh, suppose we go back and have it now, hmm? But uh, this time I will do the pouring and you can watch the windows. You have been listening to Chapter 20 in The Adventures of Raffles, starring Neil Hamilton. Next week, Raffles goes to Scotland to meet adventures on the moors. Be sure to listen. These original stories of the adventures of Raffles are written by Paul West and John Dunkel and produced by Ted Bliss. Musical effects are by Gaylord Carter. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. National Broadcasting Company presents the first program in a new series, exposing the inside secrets of gamblers, racketeers, and con men. It's called Easy Money. Easy Money? There's no such thing as Easy Money. That's the opinion of Mike Trent, the famous magician who turned detective to break the Easy Money rackets wide open. Mike Trent is the man who knows all the answers when it comes to confidence games and gambling frauds. Tonight, he has a story that's going to blow off the lid on the football pool swindle. Here he is, Mike Trent. Thank you, Bill McCord. In this sports-minded country of ours, almost all of us have had experience with making up our own pool on football, baseball, or boxing. It's a small-time harmless amusement. But there's another kind of pool, and that's the big-time football pool. A nationwide lottery based on the scores of the leading games each week. Well, getting inside of this kind of a pool has always been a tough problem. These pools are big business, with a network of straw bosses out front and a head man whose identity is a mighty well-kept secret. I had the luck, and could have bad, to get a personal invitation to meet one of these football lottery kingpins. It came suddenly and surprisingly one day while I was in my office with Patsy Ryan, the little Irish whirlwind who runs my office. And, uh... Occasionally, he tries to run me as well. She was typing a letter when all of a sudden she said... Mike, with your reputation as a detective, why do you have to take the kind of cases you do? Hmm? What's wrong with the kind of cases I take, Patsy? I like to help people get their money back when they've been gypped. But the people you have to associate with, who well, might they're just... There's nothing wrong with my clients, Patsy. They've just been trapped by easy money bait. It can happen to almost anybody. I'm not talking about your clients. Oh, I feel sorry for most of them. 
But your work keeps you constantly around gangsters, hoodlums, cheap racketeers. Mm. Well, what kind of a detective would I have to be to hobnob exclusively with the upper crust? Hmm? Well, I don't know any other detective who never brushes up against honest, respectable people. Oh, really, Mike? You're clever enough to handle bigger things. Patsy, do you know any detective who makes more money than I do or charges his clients less? Now, that's not the point. Money is Money not... isn't everything? No. No, it isn't. But, uh, well, I get a lot of satisfaction from helping my clients, Patsy. Getting their money back for them. Money they can't afford to lose. Well, I like to teach racketeers a lesson. Patsy, there's only one way you can hurt a racketeer without killing him. And that's hitting him in the pocketbook. Now, my clients aren't ever crooks. They... Well, how do you do? Uh, something I can do for you, uh, gentlemen? Uh, yeah, yeah, we got a case for you. Oh, a case? What kind of a case? Well, this is one... Got it, Lenny. The boss said he'd do the talking. Look, Trent, there's a lot of dough in this. You'll make plenty. Yeah, uh, come on. Uh, come on, where? To see the boss. He wants a conference with you. This is a real big business type stuff. A conference. Oh, but just who is the boss? But he's a guy Shut who... Shut up, Lenny. He said don't spill nothing. But where? No buts. You heard him say bring Trent and anybody else happens to be in his office. No rough stuff. He can help it, but bring him. And don't tell him nothing. Remember, Lenny? Well, sure, Grabs, but... Orders I... is orders. All right, come on, both of you. The dame, too, but she... No buts. Orders. Both of you, come on. Well, uh, just where do you think you're going to talk me into going? Uh, to the bar. Quiet. Mister, you're going with us, and we ain't talking you into it. We're taking you. No rough stuff, if we can help it. Yes, but I, uh, presume that bulge in your pocket isn't a slingshot. It's a thirty-eight. Only I won't use it. Oh, Lenny? Well, if you'll give me a guarantee on that, I don't think I'll go with you. I won't use it. Lenny takes care of the rough stuff with his fists. You want to try him? Uh, no thanks. But, uh, what's this all about, anyway? But the boss Shut wants Shut up, to... Lenny. Let the boss do the talking. You ready? Uh, now look, fellas, there's no reason why Miss Ryan should be forced to go along. Orders. I don't mind at all, Michael. Really. If your clients weren't such lovely people, it would be different. But they're always such upright, respectable citizens. I'd love to go with you. <laughs> <laughs> you like it? The boss Never said... mind, Lenny. Why, it's one of the most beautiful country estates I ever saw in my life. And I thought we were involved with gangsters. Oh, Michael, I apologize. Apparently, you have a very high-class client here. A lady, we ain't gangsters. We got one of Never the mind what we got. The boss will tell him what he wants him to know. All right, come on, get out. Here, here he comes now to meet us. Oh, Mike, this is fantastic. Just as I make up my mind we've been kidnapped by hoodlums... We pull up at this gorgeous estate, and, and that handsome elderly man comes down the lawn to greet us. Here they are, boss. Well, well. Good afternoon, Mr. Trent. Delighted to meet you. I've heard so much about your work. I'm happy you accepted my invitation. Invitation? Uh, won't you introduce me to the charming young lady, Mr. Trent? She's quite welcome here, I assure you. Any friend of yours... Uh, quite a charming way you pick your weekend guests, Mr. Uh... Oh, how stupid of me... I haven't introduced myself. Um, uh, Carvel. Barton H. Carvel. And the young lady, Mr. Trent? Hmm? Oh, Miss Patsy Ryan. Oh, well, so glad you could come, Miss Ryan. You're going to enjoy your stay here, I'm sure. Just how long am I invited for? Oh, 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 oh that ready Irish wit, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I've always so admired it. Well, won't you come up to the house? We can talk much more freely there, and you must be very tired after your ride. Uh, sorry, Mr. Carvel. I, uh, I don't know what your game is, but I don't think I'm having any, thanks. Oh, now, Mr. Trent, please try not to be difficult. I lead a most respectable and conventional life here. I try to keep my employees from using any kind of violence. Won't you please cooperate? You want them up at the house right away, don't you, boss? Oh, now, 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 Grabs. Try to remember that these people are our guests. We want them to feel welcome. Well, so don't use any... Uh, not unless... But then... Uh... That's right, Grabs. Oh, now, wait a minute. Oh, Mr. Trent, I'm so glad you understand. Well, this way, please. <laughs> Now, what's this all about, Carvel? I don't get it. And why did your gorillas force Miss Ryan to come with me? Uh, she happened to be in your office. 
She might have caused trouble. In my business, I don't take any chances, Trent. Or just what is your business? Are you acquainted with football pools, Mr. Trent? Mm. You mean the gambling racket where the customer pays a dollar for a ticket with a combination of football or baseball teams and a score, and the high score for the week wins a prize? Uh, precisely. <laughs> Rather roughly stated, but you do grasp the basic elements. Mr. Trent... I own the King Midas football and baseball pool. A big business tycoon. Oh, I knew you couldn't be a racketeer, Mr. Carvel, the minute I saw you. Now, think of it, Michael. The King Midas football pool. Uh, Miss Ryan, I don't appreciate your sarcasm. As a matter of information, it is big business. Much bigger than you realize. I have a network of distributors in nearly every state of the Union, each with numerous agents who deliver the pool tickets to cigar stores and handbooks. We offer a weekly first prize of $1,000, with numerous local prizes that total several times that much. Well, you're pretty reckless with your money, aren't you? Sell $100,000 or more worth of tickets a week and only give back a couple of thousand. I've uh, never complained about the profits. The point is, for the last two weeks, there haven't been any profits. Oh. You don't mean to say the public's finally gotten wise to what a jip your racket is. A hundred thousand to one shot that pays off a thousand to one. I don't care for that type of comment, Trent. Please confine your activity to listening for the time being. Sure, sure, go ahead. I'm listening. The, um, uh, what the betting public calls the payoff is vitally important in my business. Promptness in giving out the thousand dollar prize awards is imperative. The average little man in the street gambler loves long shots. He doesn't complain when he loses, but let him win... And have any trouble collecting his money, and he yells to high heaven. So you're a student of psychology, too, huh? Oh, yes, 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 indeed. Now, getting back to my story, two weeks ago, we got a report of a winner, as usual. I wired the thousand dollars to my agent in the territory with instructions to deliver the award. And the agent skipped with the thousand? No, he paid it. But I'd no sooner gotten a report of a winner than another report came in. From another city and state, a thousand dollars again. Two people held winning combinations, huh? Two people held the same combination, and that's impossible. No two of the pool tickets are alike. But they were this time, huh? Not two, but ten, Mr. Trent. Ten tickets calling for payment of a thousand dollars. What'd you do about it? I paid off. Paid ten thousand dollars knowing that nine of the winners were fraudulent. I imagine you could afford it. Uh, yes. Yes, I could. It was apparent that there was some organized attempt at dishonesty. The tickets, the winning ones, were all sent to me. And uh, nine of them were forgeries. Nine of them had to be forgeries, Mr. Trent. But I don't know yet which is really the winning ticket. They're identical. The same kind of paper, the same type, the same printing ink. My printer can't tell which ticket he printed and which are the fakes. Hmm. So somebody picked up $9,000 without much work. Pretty clever. This last week, there were 25 winners. $25,000. Wow. You ought to go to the police. Miss Ryan, I am not amused. Now then, this has to stop, Trent. Somebody's framing me, trying to run me right out of business. Very interesting, Mr. Carvel. Now, uh, just what do you want me to do? You're acquainted with this sort of thing. You have a reputation for it. I want you to find out who's behind this before I'm ruined. Mm -mm. Sorry, Mr. Carvel. Right information, wrong man. Your business is catching crooks, gambling crooks. Crooks who are trying to cheat honest people, Carvel. But crooks who try to cheat crooked gamblers have my blessing. Be careful what you say, Trent. I am not crooked. I pay off. Oh, sure. Sure, $1,000 a week against a take at least 100 times that. Oh, you're a public benefactor, you are, aren't you? Taking dollars from errand boys. People who go without lunch to take a chance on winning $1,000 because it seems like all the money in the world to them. Giving them such a slim chance, they might just as well toss their money right in the river. You're not a crook. I disagree. Whether you agree or not is not important. I want you to find out who's trying to ruin me. And I said no thanks. I'm prepared to pay you $50,000 for your services, if you find the guilty party for me. Um, on a level... I shall post the money with a reliable person. Oh, Michael, you wouldn't... Uh, please, Patsy, $50,000 is a lot of money. But, Mike, Trent, you can. I rather think I can, Patsy. Yeah, well, uh, see you later, Mr. Carvel. Not so fast, Mr. Trent. You're conducting your investigations from here. Oh, well, I'll have to get out and talk to some of your agents around the country, your distributors, the retail places, some of the winners. That's one reason why you'll work from here. 
You'll have Grabs as your chauffeur on those trips. He's an excellent driver, and he never gets lost. <laughs> he knows his way home. But how about me? I'm not staying here, am I? I'm afraid you are. What? Uh, now, Patsy, <laughs> let's not question Mr. Carvel's hospitality, especially since it'll keep on costing him $25,000 a week not to make us welcome. Oh, no. No, not another one. Looks like, boss. Here's the phone. Well, you answer it. I'm sick. Forty-nine winners this week. Forty-nine thousand dollars. Hello? Yeah. Winner, huh? Okay, give me the name and address. Sure, we'll pay off. Just give me... No, no, we can't go on like this. I won't pay off. I won't be robbed by a bunch of dirty crooks. Easy, boss. There's nothing else you can do. You've got to pay. I have to do no such thing. When swindlers deliberately set out to rob me blind, I don't have Remember to... what happened to Joe Framwell, boss? He didn't pay off on a ticket, and he went out of business awful quick with a bullet through his head from a bum loser. But I... Don't talk about him. And even if the winners don't get sore enough to plug you, you're still out of business. Nobody's buying pool tickets without a payoff. But, great Scott, how many payoffs do there have to be? Fifty this week, fifty thousand dollars. Trent! Uh, yes. Yes, Mr. Cravel. Trent, you've accomplished nothing so far. Good Lord, man, I can't wait around here all summer. Well, if I could talk to you alone without Lenny and Grabs around, I might be able to help you. Now, look, mister, if you think you're going to frame Grabs and me on... Shut up. Business, Let him talk. Well, I think he's bluffing. Look, when I'm working for $50,000, I don't bluff. And I wouldn't take a chance of letting someone jip me out of it by tipping off the guilty party. Oh, so that's your angle, eh? All right, boys, clear out. Yes, and, uh... Get far enough from the door so your ears can't pick up anything either, huh? You want us to go, boss, on the level? Trent doesn't have a gun. He couldn't do anything. He could try to get away from here. With Miss Ryan still here? No, no. I don't think so. Go on. Well, if you say so. Hey, come on. I look, boss, if he tries anything, you just holler. We'll be waiting. Well, all right, Trent. What is this strictly confidential matter you want to discuss? I've found your man. You but What? Then why in the name of common sense uh, haven't not, you... Not so fast, Carvel. I, uh... I won't talk until you've put your money on the line. Now, look. I'm not giving you the money till you've given me something besides mysterious talk. Oh, I don't want your money until I've delivered the man to you with absolute proof of his guilt. Oh. You want to get away? Is that your angle? Well, you still have Miss Ryan. Well, um, how long will you need to be gone? Not over three or four hours, alone. No grabs or Lenny to help me. But I... All right, very well, I think that can be arranged. But no tricks, remember. Because Miss Ryan will still be here. You'd hate to have anything happen to her, wouldn't you? Oh, if anything happens to her, Carvel, you'll regret it as much as I will. What? You mean to say Mike Trent drove off and left me here alone? Oh, now, 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 my dear, you're not in any danger. That is, unless he tries to be dishonest with me. I can't understand him anyway. Taking a case from a crook like you. Oh, oh, oh careful with your language, my dear. It isn't like Mike. He hates your kind of people. Oh, he has something in common with most sensible men, Miss Ryan. He likes money, especially in large round figures. Yes, Grabs. Oh, boss. You shouldn't have let that guy Trent get away from here alone. No? Why not? He might have gone straight to the cops. I may come back here with a couple of squad cars. Well, 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 you don't say. But he could do it, boss, easy. And with what he's got on you, oh, boy. <laughs> You're a genius, Grabs, a positive genius. Just why do you think I had Lenny tail him? Huh? You mean you didn't let him leave alone? My dear, I never take chances. If he tries to bring any law enforcement officers into this, I'll get a call from Lenny. There won't be anyone here when they get back. What? Not even you. <laughs> I can't understand what's taking Michael so long. How long did you say he'd be gone? Hey, he's back, boss. Just coming in the driveway. Hello? 
Oh, there's somebody with him. A dame. What? A woman? Oh, but that's impossible. Nothing's impossible with Mike. Yeah, not even a very good-looking dame, Mike. Uh, not anywhere near as good-looking as... Uh, oh, well, well, thank you, Grabs. I'm flattered half to death. She's kind of, uh, well, shabby from what I've seen of her. Michael Trent, what in the world... Hi, Patsy. Sorry I had to leave about you. I hope you weren't worried. Worried? Mike Trent, someday uh, I'm gonna... If we might dispense with a little social amenities, please. Uh, Trent. Do you want me to believe that this woman with you is the crook who's been trying to run me out of business? Well, I told you I'd bring back the guilty party, didn't I? This is Mrs. Joe Framwell. What? Remember? Joe Framwell, he was a competitor of yours. He got shot for not paying off on a winning baseball pool. But that's ticket. a lie. He was murdered by these crooks to scare their competition out of business. Madam, please, do you think I'd soil my hands with murder? Well, don't put on such a noble act, Mr. Carvel. You killed Joe. Maybe not with your own gun. Maybe not in person. But you set out the word. I'd like to get this straight. Mrs. Framwell, your husband was in competition with Carvel, running another football pool? Yes, but he was just one of the little people out in front who take the chances for the big shots. Carvel's outfit began making threats, telling him to quit or, or something would happen to him. They told the same thing to the other agents, but, but they had to pick Joe for their fall guy. As I remember this case, he was found with a winning number in his hand and a bullet through his head. It was proved he worked for some little, uh, little fly-by-night football pool outfit. Whether he was given the money to pay off the winner and kept it for himself Don't or... Don't lie like that. Joe was honest. He wouldn't steal from anybody. He wouldn't have been doing such dirty, rotten work if he hadn't been framed and sent to jail once. So he couldn't get a job anywhere else. He wasn't hurting anybody. If other people were doing dishonest things around him, well, well, he had to make a living. My dear lady, did it ever occur to you that your husband might have been killed by members of his own uh, organization? No, you killed him. Your outfit made all the threats. You wanted it all to yourself, all that dishonest money. Just a minute. You admit that you're responsible for what's been happening to me. Admit it. I'm proud of it. And I'll keep right on doing it until you're out of business. I'm afraid you're quite mistaken there, Mrs. Framwell. Also, I'm hurt that you should be so vindictive. You bet I'm vindictive. Maybe Joe didn't amount to so much, but, but we were in love with each other. He was just trying to make a living. Trying to make enough to get by. And then a dirty crook like you comes along and kills him. And now you're sorry I'm vindictive. Don't get hysterical, Mrs. Framwell. Now then, just how have you been... Oh, this? don't you wish you knew? Frankly, yes. Well, you're never going to find out. Do you have any idea how she managed to work this business, Trent? I simply can't understand it. It's ridiculously simple, Carvel. Oh? Then suppose you explain. Surely. Mrs. Framwell made arrangements with a good printer. She bought a few baseball pool tickets and told the printer she wanted exact copies, even as to paper. She was willing to pay well enough to make it worthwhile. How about it, Mrs. Framwell? Am I correct so far? I... Yes. But the, the people with the winning numbers from different cities all over the country, she couldn't... She have... couldn't, but she did. The first week, she had people in ten different cities go in and buy a football pool ticket. The minute the last game was over, her printer fixed up the fake tickets. The tickets were delivered to her stooges real fast. Oh, you're out of your head, ma'am. The woman didn't have the money for an operation like that. Why, it would take a, a whole organization, a big organization, and it would cost a good deal. Oh. If what Mr. Trent has told me is correct, however, Mrs. Framwell, I propose to find out from you who invested that money. And do you think you could do anything that would hurt me worse than what you've already done? Murdering Joe? Oh, no. And you're through, Carvel. Washed up. On the contrary, Mrs. Framwell. It's you who are washed up. Ah, Grabs. Where have you been? Putting Trent and the dame's luggage in the car, like you told me. Isn't Lenny back yet? I ain't seen hiding a trace of him. Odd. He was supposed to stay right behind Trent. And I'd like him to take Trent and Miss Ryan back to the city immediately. So? I was being followed, huh? Naturally. I told you before, old man, that I don't take chances. Even if it means breaking a promise? Honesty and promises have their place, but not in my business. Ah, I wish Lenny would hurry up. Well, I could drive back myself if you're so anxious to have me leave. And uh, Lenny could pick up the car in town tomorrow. No, we'll have to wait. Yes, as a matter of fact, Carvel, Miss Ryan and I aren't ever supposed to reach town, are we? Why, my dear fellow, 
I simply don't know what you're talking about. Nobody knows you're connected with the King Midas football pool. You've spent a lot of money on your masquerade as an amiable, retired businessman. You've hired plenty of front men, but nobody's ever been able to get to the boss. You're being rather melodramatic, aren't you? Patsy and I know all about your connections, Carvel. We know who your key men are. If we ever talk, you could get the book. You'd hardly betray me after my paying you $50,000. I'm not going to hold my breath till I get that money. Well, Mr. Trent, I congratulate you. You're even more astute than I thought. You mean to say you don't plan to pay Mike that money? Well, I would have preferred to play the game to the finish, but if he wants to be blunt about it, well, it can't hurt anything now, can it? You got him here to help you, to do a dirty job, to, to bring in a woman who had plenty of reason for trying to hurt you. And after he's done the job, you'd kill him? Miss Ryan, I'm genuinely sorry that there's no other way to handle things, but I could hardly trust either of you. You should be able to appreciate my position. Michael, why don't you slug him? Now go ahead, Michael. Try it, I dare you. Now, 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 Grabs. Mr. Trent has performed a service for us. We mustn't be any more unpleasant than is necessary. Now then, who financed your plot against me, Mrs. Framwell? Either you'll tell... No. Oh, well, go ahead and tell him, Mrs. Framwell. What? You mean... You mean really? Mm -hmm. I mean really. It can't hurt now. I'm waiting, Mrs. Framwell. Who financed your little scheme? It was... It was Mr. Trent. I'm afraid you don't understand, Mrs. Framwell. I said I wouldn't stand for any nonsense. Who financed you? I told you. Mr. Trent. She's telling the truth, Carvel. I financed her. As a matter of fact, I planned the whole scheme from start to finish. Isn't that a bit fantastic? The police believe Joe Framwell was killed by a holder of a winning football pool ticket. One who hadn't been paid off. Well, they weren't able to find anyone who'd bragged about holding a winning ticket. That struck me as odd. Go on. Getting a winner in a football pool happens so seldom. The uh, average person brags to high heaven about it. He advertises. But we couldn't find anybody who'd held that winning ticket. Perhaps the murderer was discreet enough to keep quiet. There was a glaring fallacy to what the police were supposed to believe. You see, if a man had held a winning ticket and had come to Framwell expecting to be paid off, he certainly wouldn't have known he was going to commit murder. That idea would never have occurred to him until after Framwell's failure to pay. Well, brilliant deduction, Trent. You know, you're quite amazing. And the fake ticket gave you an idea? Oh, no, no, not till Mrs. Framwell had come to me for help. She was sure her husband had been murdered by the King Midas Pool, but she couldn't even find out who the King Midas Pool was. She wanted the head of the outfit. There didn't seem to be any head. Oh, agents, distributors, territory managers, yes, but no boss. Quite so. Well, getting a rat out of his hole is quite a trick. One good way to do it is to starve him out. Well, I figured the one way to bring the boss of the King Midas pool into the open was to start banging away at his money, which I did. But, Mike, you couldn't possibly have known he'd come to you for help. He's a very clever man, Miss Ryan. You should be quite proud of him. He took care of that rather adroitly. How? Practically every key man in my organization told me that Trent would be the one man who could help me. Yes, I... Uh... Staged a little propaganda campaign and then uh, hoped for the best. It worked. Yes, it did. And now I wonder what satisfaction you're going to get from it. Oh, any one of your breed I can put out of business is a big enough satisfaction, Carvel. <laughs> but you see, I'm not out of business. And I don't intend to be. As soon as Lenny gets back, he'll take you toward town. Lenny's loyalty is simply wonderful. I'm quite sure you'll never make it. Oh, there he is now. Lenny, what took you so long? I've been worried about you. Uh, you're worried, huh? Look, this guy here gives me the slip on the way back. He takes all kinds of crazy turns and stuff, and I get lost. I'm afraid you're wrong, Carvel. You see, I got rid of Lenny long enough to call the police. What? Yes, a couple of squad cars are on the way. He's got a squad. Shut up! Well, they haven't got me yet. Miss Ryan, you and I are leaving together. If they get within shooting distance, I'm using you as my shield. This would be a good time for one of your magic tricks, Mike. Get in front of me, Miss Ryan. Go on, move. You heard him. Let's go. But I... Oh, please. You're too late, Carvel. Open up, Mr. Police. Cops boss at the door, and we ain't got a chance. Better get rid of your guns, boys. They have orders to shoot anyone with a gun. That's good enough for me. Here. No, Grabs, don't. I ain't swapping bullets with any squad of cops. Here. I'll take yours, too, Carvel. Why, you... That's better. Now we'll all go outside, huh? There ain't nobody here. Who was that? Oh, uh, I, I neglected to tell you, Grabs. 
You see, I used to be a ventriloquist. What? Yes, and uh, uh, those knocks you heard were a spirit rapping device. It's just a little gimmick that fits around your waist, you see. A little wooden sounding box with a hammer inside it. The kind children use for noisemakers. Uh, flexing the body muscles makes it work. Here, listen. You mean... You mean there aren't any police out here? Well, sometimes you don't need the police if you have a good gimmick. So, uh, from here on, Carvel, you're my guest. Let's go. And here's the ex-magician turned rackets detective for a final word. Thank you. Well, I hope you all enjoyed tonight's story. The big-time football and baseball pool racket gives you such a slim chance it doesn't have to be crooked. It's just a fancy form of larceny. I hope you don't fall for it. Next week, I'm going to bring you a story about one of the most elegant devices for parting people from their money. A crooked roulette wheel. If you've ever played roulette or wanted to play the game, I think you'll find it most enlightening. Until then, this is Mike Trent signing off with the thought that when you gamble with a professional, he isn't doing any gambling. Remember, there's no such thing as easy money. <laughs> to listen next Sunday night at this time for another expose of gambling frauds and confidence games featuring Mike Trent, the famous ex-magician turned rackets detective. Featured in tonight's cast were Larry Haynes, Jerry Ann Raphael, Irene Wicker, Ivor Francis, and Maurice Tarplin. Easy Money is produced and directed by Blair Walliser for Air Shows Incorporated. Tonight's script was written by George B. Anderson. This is Bill McCord speaking. Join your... Join your... Join your... Join your... The National Broadcasting Company presents another program in a new series exposing the inside secrets of gamblers, racketeers, and con men. It's called Easy Money. Easy Money? There's no such thing as Easy Money. Mike Trent, the ex-magician turned rackets detective, is an expert on Easy Money schemes, gyps, frauds, and swindles. Tonight, he blows the lid off of one of the vicious gambling rackets that's being worked in this country year after year. This one's called Galloping Ivories. And here's Mike Trent to tell you about it. Thank you, Bill McCord. Professional gamblers are so used to trimming their victims that sometimes they get impatient. They see a chance for a fast cleanup and they jump at it, especially if they feel they've got a soft touch for their prey. My story tonight is about a big operator who got mixed up with some kids and came mighty close to wrecking their lives. It opens in the back room of one of the suburban gambling clubs where the boss's right-hand man had just brought in his report of the night's receipts. It's nice night, Soapy. That's the biggest take we've had in three weeks. Yeah. Only look, Gunner. Giving this kid, Junior Alwyn, sky-high credit, that don't seem so sharp. No? How much did he lose tonight? 820 bucks. All we got is this little piece of paper. 820, eh? That makes uh, $7,160 altogether. Yeah. I'll take all that kind of paper I can get. Well, Gunner, how are you going to collect? His old man said the last time he settled up, he wasn't paying any more crap game debts for Junior. I know. Old man Elwin ain't the kind of guy we will stand for muscle. Don't worry. I'm not planning to put any heat on Junior's daddy. You... Uh, I don't get it. That's fine, Soapy. If you don't get it, Junior won't either. You and young Elwin are about on a par on brains. Yeah, look, boss. You don't need to get nasty. <laughs> don't I? Listen, Sophie, I'd like to run that Junior Elwin account up to about uh, $15,000. You, you mean uh, fast? Fast. Give the kid a break. Let him double up. Get him to uh, shoot the works, trying to get even. You, you, you're going to let him get even? Now, what do you think? The minute the bill gets up to fifteen grand, tell the kid I want to see him. Well, if you say so. I do say so, and uh, don't scare him. Be nice to him. Yeah, I should be nice to a dumb phony who owes us all that dough. All what, though? 
I'm playing for big stakes, Soapy. $15,000 is just my first roll. Okay, Gunner, you're going to roll like that. Be sure you're throwing your own dice. Soapy, when I gamble, I never take chances. <laughs> Mr. Elwin, I haven't seen you for a long time, have a chair. Huh? Thanks. Your dice man said that you wanted to see me, Gunner. If it's about money, I... Money? What's that? <laughs> Your credit's always good for a few hundred dollars in my gambling club, Junior. Thanks. I know your father gives you a nice allowance, and I know you're the kind of fellow who thinks a gambling debt is important. You're a gentleman. Thanks again. A few hundred dollars doesn't mean any more to you than it does to me. If you don't have it... I know you will get it. Well, I've been having a lousy run of luck lately, Gunner. Uh, but it's bound to change sooner or later. I never worry much about gambling losses. Well, that's one of the things I like about you, Junior. Well, I bet you could run up a bill of $1,500 without batting an eyelash. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. You're a natural gambler. The smart kind of a gambler. Why, I haven't even checked on your account. Fine. <laughs> By the way, Junior, how does your account stand? Why, uh... Well, I've been having rotten luck, Gunner. Well, that's what you told me. Well, how rotten? I owe you $15,000. Fifteen... That's an awful lot of money, Junior. I'm a little surprised. I'll pay off. Don't you worry. I never worry about anybody paying off. Let's, uh, face facts. Where will you get $15,000? Wait, I'll get it. Where? I'll borrow it. You couldn't borrow 15 bucks. Well, it'll take a few days, of course. Tuck her but... up your lips more when you're whistling the dark kid. I give you six months, you couldn't raise the money anyway, short of killing your old man. You've been playing me for a sap, and I'm getting sore. You said I could have all the credit I wanted. You let me oh, run up... Oh, shut up. If there's anything I hate, it's a whiny loser. I'm not whiny. You but... kept right on doubling up until you found yourself in a spot. I'm not you... in a spot. I. Oh, no? Well, guess again, Junior. You're in a real spot. What do you mean? I run this gambling club to make money. Maybe that never occurred to you. If I let one loser welch on me, get by without paying, I quit making money. I said I'd pay. I have a couple of pretty fair ways to collect, kid. Collect or else. You wouldn't dare. Oh, don't lay any odds on that one, kid. When you run a place like mine, you'd be surprised what you dare. What do you want me to do? Well, now you're talking sense. Well... You run around with a pretty speedy bunch of kids, huh? You want me to steer some of my friends to your club? I wouldn't have them cluttering up the place. But, uh, I'd like to meet a few of them, uh, outside. What do you mean? From what I uh, read in the papers, you're uh, quite a party boy. Well? Well, I like parties, too. I'd uh, like to be invited to a few parties of yours. I don't get it. You and I are going to be partners, Junior. Partners? We're going to pal around together. You introduce me as a friend who's just come to town. We start a few little um, five-dollar crap games. I still don't get the idea. You can't make up $15,000 in a five-dollar game. Did you ever see a five-dollar crap game stay in that class? You started playing here with dollar chips and you owe me 15 grand. Get me the suckers, I'll get you 15000 back and a lot more besides. Oh, but I, I couldn't do that to my friends. Oh, no? I bet you could, Junior. And what's more, I bet you will. I'll bet you two to one. Want to take me? No, I guess not. It looks like they're your dice. So Gunnar Gorman was the life of your party, huh? That's the funny part of it, Mr. Trent. He was. Everybody liked him. And he didn't even suggest a crap game. I suppose you did. Well, yes, when he gave me the high sign. And I'll bet Gunnar Gorman was lucky, wasn't he? Well, not at first. Oh, no, no. Not while you were shooting for five dollars a roll, I suppose not. The game couldn't have been crooked, Mr. Trent. They were my dice. But Gorman knows something about the game I don't know. How much did he win? Five thousand mm. dollars. He said it cut my loss to twelve thousand five hundred because we're partners and I get credit for twenty five hundred. Mm-hmm. He's giving your friends a chance to get their money back, of course. Oh, yes. He uh, put on a good act, like he was embarrassed at taking their money. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a very clever operator. He's taken a hotel room, and the rest of the crowd think he's just in town for a few days. 
He's throwing a party at the hotel tonight to give them a chance to get even. Well, just where does this concern me? Well, I may be a heel. Everybody seems to think so, even Gorman. At least I've been a prize sap. But I'm darned if I'll double-cross my friends. You've already done that, haven't you? Well, I was scared, I guess. And there didn't seem to be anything else to do. Until I saw Gunnar Gorman take their money. Because they trusted me. Well, what do you expect me to do about it? Well, I may be dumb, but I don't think Gorman's on the level. If he is, I'll go to Dad and take my medicine, whatever it is. But if he isn't playing fair, I'd like to catch him. Mm. From what you've told me about him, Gorman will be rough. If he finds that you're double-crossing him as well as everybody else. I guess I had that coming to me, all right. Well, it's nothing to what you'll have coming if Gorman discovers you're trying to trap him. I thought it was your business to catch crooked gamblers, racketeers. Oh, it is, it is. But there's one type of gambler I dislike almost as much as the crooks, and you're that type. Oh, now, Mr. Trent, after all, you don't need Well, it's true. People who get a big thrill out of hobnobbing with dirty, cheating criminals until their charming friends take them and then come crying for help. But I'm not crying for myself. I can't let him rob my friends on my say I don't even know that the man's a crook. He wouldn't need to be, you know. To win so surely and certainly? Oh, Gorman knows the dice odds backward and forward. He knows his chances on every roll of the dice. He could play percentages and win. But sooner or later, in the most honest game in the world, he'd clean them out because dice is his business, and he knows his business. But $5,000 in one little Look, game... Look, there's no rougher, tougher, faster form of gambling ever been invented. One flop of the dice, he can make more money than a whole evening of poker. $5,000 would make me think Gorman was holding back. One of my best friends, Marge Terrence, lost 1500 of it. That makes me feel worse than anything else. She... Well, I'm sort of crazy about wait her. Wait a minute, and... wait a minute. You mean there were girls in this dice game and will be in the next one? Yes, Mr. Trent. That's why I'd appreciate your help. Well, I won't take the case to help you or your friends. You all need a good spanking when you need help. But you will take the case? Yeah, on one condition. What's that? It's understood I'm doing it strictly to put Gorman in his place. Swell. There's nothing swell about it. Do you have a revolver? Gosh, no, I'd be scared to death of one. Well, then you're going to be scared because you'll be carrying one. But why? You might need it. You've crossed up your dad and he's taken it. You've crossed up your friends, they don't know it. They wouldn't do much about it if they did, probably. But if Gunnar Gorman ever finds you're double-crossing him... You think he'd get tough? Well, I think there's undoubtedly a very good reason for his nickname being Gunnar. I don't know why you're feeling so big about winning five grand at a party. The joint does better than that most any night. Well, you're going to meet some nice people at the party, Soapy. Me? Hey, listen, Gunner. Oh, hadn't I told you, Soapy? You're going to be my butler this evening. Me carting trays of sandwiches around? <laughs> Look, boss, I stood for a lot, but... It... Well, it's a chance to see the elite at play, Soapy. I suppose you want me to be loaded down with fake dice like an old copy of the police gazette. Oh, don't be naive, Soapy. Don't be... Huh? We won't use odd dice. Hey. Are you kidding? They'll bring their own dice. These are respectable people, Soapy. I never see the guy so respectable. I trust his dice. You gotta be sure of winning, ain't you? I win. Don't you worry your little brain about that. You ain't no dice mechanic. I don't have to be. Not with a thick pile rug on the floor of our hotel suite. And with a good thick pad beneath it. Huh? Listen, Gunny. You ain't give him the old blanket roll. No. Why not? You couldn't get away with it. Ain't where a crapshooter in the country doesn't know about the soft roll. I'm not dealing with crapshooters, Soapy. I'm playing with wealthy no-goods who want a thrill. I have so much money that the only kind they'll show any interest in is easy money. I'll be disappointed if I don't win $50,000 tonight. And they'll come back and back. This is just the start. But you'll have to give Junior Elwin uh, half the profits, won't you? Oh, you need a head cleaning, Soapy. After tonight, my partnership with Junior is dissolved. Well, can you can you do that? He might squawk. He wouldn't dare. If he lets these saps know anything, they'll find out he was working with me, helping play them for suckers. You think he'd do that? Who'd be coming around here with the sun still out? We'll get the door. Find out. Oh, hello, Junior. Hi, Gunner. Say, I thought I'd better warn you. There may be trouble tonight. Oh, yeah? Listen, Bright Boy, if there's any trouble, you know who'll wind up with it, don't you? I, yeah. That's why I thought I should tell you. All right, what's up? You remember Marge Terrence, the girl who lost so much money? How could I forget her? Well, her brother found out about it. And he's kind of a hothead. You don't say. Well, what about her brother? Well, he blames me for letting Marge lose so much money. And he threatened me. Threatened you? How? He said unless I brought him to your party tonight, he'd beat me up. 
He wants a chance to win that money back for Marge. Man, just when you get to thinking Christmas is five or six weeks away, here comes Santa Claus. Don't be too sure. Tim Terrence has a reputation for being awfully lucky. Oh, I like him lucky. The rest of the crowd's going to the theater, just as they'd planned, and then dropping in here afterwards. But Marge's brother, uh, Tim's his name, he wanted to come up here earlier with Marge and me. Just can't wait, huh? Mr. Gorman, I, I know you think you're pretty hot with the dice, but I'm warning you. Tim Terrence is plenty lucky. Well, maybe his luck's due for a change. Bring him around. The earlier, the better. Well, don't say I didn't warn you. I won't, Junior. I won't say a thing. Except thanks. Oh, Mr. Gorman, I think your butler or valet or whatever he is is a character. Where in the world did you ever find him? (laughs) I picked him up in a rough and rugged gambling joint, Miss Terrence. He's a real authentic type and such a wonderful name, Sophie. All right, cut it out, Marge. I haven't met Mr. Gorman yet. Oh, pardon me. Uh, this is Marge's brother, Gunner. Tim Terrence. How do you do? You folks are a little early. Yeah. Yeah, Marge told me how you took her money last night. Well, Gorman. she didn't have very good luck. You sure it was luck? It's luck. Timmy, be nice now. I don't like cracks like that, Terrence. Well, I don't like having my sister Marge lose $1,500 either. Oh, Tim, be yourself. I can afford she it. She doesn't know a thing about the game. Shooting craps with her is like taking pennies out of a baby's piggy bank. Uh, look, Terrence, I didn't ask her into the game. The game wasn't even my idea. She lost. The money doesn't mean anything to me. I'm giving her every chance in the world to get it back. You better be careful about your insinuations. Well, you sound very noble, Mr. Gorman. Yeah, you're a great guy, all right. Taking money away from a girl who doesn't even know what the game is all about. Listen, boss, you want me to give this bird the bums right? Just stay out of this, Soapy. I, uh, suppose you're quite a crap shooter yourself, Mr. Terrence. You bet I am. Oh, he's simply wonderful. He's won money from real professionals. You don't say. He talks to the dice. He says the craziest things about fever and Decatur and new shoes and... Go ahead, Timmy. Tell them some of the things. I think I've heard him, lady. Uh, you're a real hot shot uh, crapshooter, hmm? Hot enough to cool you off, and you need to be taught a lesson. You think you could do it, huh? You bet I can. I'd just as soon take your money as your sister's. I'll just bet you would. Well, it looks to me like there's only one way to settle this. Oh, yeah? Sure, with the dice. You and Tim. But I want to play, too. Now, you stay out of this, much. I'm going to give Gorman a lesson he needs. I'm uh, not in the habit of carrying dice around with me. It uh, just happens I got some in my pocket, boss. I- here. I'll uh, just take a look at those, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. Go right ahead. Look them over all you like. You think I'm a crook, huh? I'm reserving my opinion. Give them the sinker test if you want to. Go ahead. The sinker test? Isn't the terminology of this game fascinating? I love it. What does it mean? The sinker test means, lady, that you drop the dice in a tall glass of water and let them sink to the bottom. I can't imagine why anybody would drop dice into a glass of water. On a counter, you can tell that way if the dice is loaded. If the same points come up every time you drop them, well, they are. They're loaded. Mm-hmm. Well, they seem to be all right. Of course they're all right. Oh, we'll uh, have to clear all this stuff off the table before we can shoot. Oh, well, that's too much trouble. Get down on the floor, on the rug. It's more fun that way. On the rug? Well, yeah, sure. Okay. I'll bet ten dollars. Huh? Ten dollars? I thought you were such a red-hot sport. Well, before you get red-hot, Gorman, you have to get warmed up a little, you know. Ten dollars. Okay, big shot. You're covered. Go ahead, roll them out. I won't even bother looking for that kind of money. Oh, Tim, a twelve. The highest point you can make. That ought to be worth something. Lady, that's box cars. You get many of them, you ain't going to be traveling in style. I'll shoot another ten, Gorman. You're covered, big shot. Six deuce. Ada from Decatur, huh? All right, come on. Dice show the folks you know your arithmetic. Let's make the point with a five-three. Shake, rattle, roll. Two and two is four. That, that's half of what you're after. Oh, we'll get the rest of it this time, March. <laughs> and six deuce right back. Okay, I'll let the twenty ride. Six two. But, Timmy, you said you'd make the eight with a five-three. Does it 
town this way? I thought you wanted to get your sister's 1500 back. We've been going half an hour, and I'm 70 bucks ahead. This way we'll shoot all night, and nobody will get anywhere. Well, the dice haven't gotten hot for me yet, I can tell. Yeah, well, I'm tired of this penny ante stuff. Maybe your sister's ready to shoot for some real money. Why, sure. Now, you keep out of this, Marge. You're not going to win her money back for her this way. Your sister makes you look like a piker. All right. All right, if you feel that way about it, Gorman, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll shoot the whole 1500 she lost all in one roll. Oh, Timmy, that's a lot of money. Put it up, big shot. Well, uh, suppose you cover it, too. Here's mine. Hey, you know? I've got it covered. Don't worry. Go ahead, shoot. Oh, Tim, how wonderful. A seven. That wins. Yeah, something tells me. Not, Sophie. Well, I guess that was all I needed. Now I'm getting hot. I'll let the 3,000 ride. Well? You're covered. But, boss, will, will you stay out of this? It's 2,500, uh, 3,000. Go ahead, roll them out. Yeah, you bet. All right, be good to pop a dice for 3,000 nice big dollars. Be alert, dice. Come on, you sit. Oh, too bad. A five. Fever. Get hot, dice. Let's five right back. A bank account waiting for money. Little old easy five. Come on, dice. Eight. Five, deuce. Five for Papa. Just one little five is all I ask. Six, that's close. Oh, I'll get closer than that. Come on, I'll be good, dice. Oh, there it is. And up jumps a five. So I let the 6,000 ride. You're covered, bright boy. Of course, can't you see? Will you sh- shut up. You're covered, Terrence. Shoot. Okay, Dice, let's have an 11 this time to break the monotony. Ride high, wide, and handsome on a wave of prosperity, Dice. Right. Oh, I'm sorry, Marge. I said I'd make an 11, and it's a 7. But that wins, Tim. Boss, you ought to call this guy. Will you keep your mouth shut? You mean he's doing something crooked? I've been watching, and I don't see anything. You wouldn't. Is somebody insinuating I'm crooked? I haven't said a thing, bright boy. You're letting the 12,000 ride. Sure. If you can cover it. I can cover a lot more than that, Sonny. Get the uh, leather bag out of the bedroom, Soapy. Boss, this is your fault. Have you no keep still, Soapy? Will you get the bag? Okay, boss. Timmy, I think this is perfectly marvelous. And it's so honest, too. What? He told you how good he was before he started taking your money. Here you are, boss. Right. All right, there you are, bright boy. If you think I'm going to run short of money, look it over. There's a fortune in that bag. Yeah. Anybody who's good enough to take it away from me can have it. If they take it honest. Is that a crack? Oh, no, I'm not saying a thing. Your 12,000's covered. Go ahead, roll them out. Nothing will give me more pleasure, Mr. Gorman. What would you like? What do you mean, what would I like? A point or a natural? Oh, don't be so smart. Just go ahead and roll. All right, if that's the way you feel about it, okay. Tim, aren't you forgetting something? What? You aren't talking to the dice. Oh, oh, well, I don't have to, Marge. With $24,000 on the line, I don't want to disturb the dice. I'll just roll them out like this, you see? You win. A four and a three. A beautiful four and three. Prettiest little dice faces I ever saw in my life. Just look at their eyes. All seven of them. All right, save the comedy. Boss, you ain't got... You shut up. All right, Terrence. You've had your fun. What do you mean? I just wanted to see how far you'd go with it. What are you talking about? Oh, you think I'm a sap? You've been giving those dice the old blanket roll. What does he mean, Tim? He knows what I mean, all right. I've been watching him. He's been using the blanket roll every time. I don't see what you mean. Well, it looks like you'll have to tell them. I'll tell them, all right. On any soft surface, like a bed or a blanket or a rug of this kind, the dice roll in a straight line. If you hold them right, you see? Here. Like this. But what difference does it make whether they roll in a straight line or not? The difference between winning a fortune and depending on luck. I don't get it. I don't either. Oh, that's because you're dopes. You hold the dice side by side in your hand. On the first roll. With a six on one dice facing an ace on the other, you see? The two faces against each other. Well, there isn't a chance in the world of rolling a deuce or a twelve. And the odds are two to one in your favor coming up with a seven. Well, you might explain the rest of it to him, Gorman. On the off chance that you roll a point, the faces of the dice you hold against each other determine how you'll make the point. You see, the dice roll over and over, but not sideways. So you admit you were using the blanket roll, huh? Well, I never said I wasn't. But, boss, why did you let him get away with it so long? Well, I'll tell you, Soapy. Because he didn't want to expose his own racket unless he had to. He didn't want to let Junior and Marge see how they'd been losing their money. Oh, you know all the answers, don't you? When I lost the 1500, we rolled the dice on a rug just like this one. Smooth and soft. And you had just as good a chance to roll them right as I did. The dice aren't crooked. You got no beef. Should I pick up the dough, boss? Why, no, Soapy. I'm really shocked at you. We aren't going to have any strong-arm stuff. 
Mr. Terrence won the money. You mean... He won it the same way I won it from these suckers. But we're just going to roll a few more hands, and, uh... Well, this time, I'm going to handle the dice. Mike, that soapy, he has a gun. Didn't you expect he would have? You won't get hurt, mister, if you play along with Gunner like he wants. You see, I wouldn't dream of hijacking you. All I want is the same chance you had. You have uh, $24,000 on the table, and I uh, cover it. But this time, I roll the dice. It's all fair and square. That's certainly making armed robbery refined. All right, give me the dice, mister. Well, sure. And uh, you'll have no beef when I take it. Six and an ace uh, facing each other, the same way you held them. Any complaints? Oh, no, no, no. Not a complaint in the world. <laughs> For uh, $24,000. <laughs> I could roll naturals all day. Well, aren't you even going to shake them? Oh, why bother? You and I both know how it works. I'll uh, just give them a nice, gentle roll. He rolled boxcars. Twelve. Hey. Hey, what's going on here? Well, I don't know, Gorman. They're your dice. Want to shoot again? You're losing your grip, boss. Keep still. Just take care of that gun. Would you like to shoot again? Just a minute. I'm going to give these dice a few rolls here. Well, well, well. Another 12. And another one. I ain't seen so many boxcars since I was riding the rods. What are you done to these dice? Well, they're your dice, Gorman. You ought to know how to handle them better than that. Maybe you're nervous. I'll bet he isn't hot. It's just not his night. Grab up the money, Soapy. What? I thought you were keeping this technically on the up and up, Gorman. Oh, you're lucky I'm not having Soapy put a slug through you. Keep him covered, Soapy. Don't I even get my 15 You're lucky to get out of here alive. I don't believe I'd take that money, Soapy. Because the minute your fingers touch it, I shoot Gorman. I've got him covered. You, uh, you... Yes, look... yes, Soapy. You want to risk a lot of trouble, Soapy, go right ahead and pick up the money. You see, Junior wouldn't have to worry. He has plenty of witnesses. But, uh... You'd be in a slight jam, I imagine, if there were any fireworks. Give it to the kids, Soapy. That's a pretty funny bluff, Gorman. I've never seen a crooked gambler yet who'd risk gunplay. You heard me, Soapy. What do you think Soapy's going to risk going to the chair to save your money? You heard me, Soapy. I'm sorry, boss. The guy's right. What? Boss, I've just resigned. Here, mister, you take the gun. I don't want it. Thank you, Soapy. You're showing excellent judgment. You little rat, I ought to... You ought to stay in your own backyard. That's what you ought to do. Well, so long, folks, uh... See it, the junior leaves. Okay. You come back here, you dirty... Uh, 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 Gorman. There are ladies present. No rough talk. I'll rough talk you when I get out of here. And as for you, Al, when you dirty double Look cross... Look who's I... talking. Marge, frisk him for weapons while I'm folding and stacking this money, would you? Oh, wonderful. Mr. Trent, you're a character. Honestly. He's a lousy... Tut, tut, tut. Junior, how much money do you suppose you've lost to Gorman, roughly? Well, about $20,000 altogether. But it was on a regular dice table. Mm. Sure, with six ace flats. Huh? A dice loaded so you're bound to end up loser, even if you win a little once in a while. Percentage dice. You know all the answers, don't you? Yes, I think so. He isn't carrying any guns, Mike. Mike? You called him that once before. Sure. Mike Trent. Maybe you've heard of him. Oh. Yeah. I'll get you for the cell when if You're not going to get anybody, that... Gorman. You can't make a beef without exposing your own crookedness, and if I were you, I'd see that nothing happens to Junior. What do you mean? I mean I'm making a full report of this game to the police. From now on, they'll be watching you all the time. You're shoving me right out of town. That's right. Any complaints? Look, all those uh, boxcars I rolled, I don't this. Oh, that. Any... Well, you see, I had some adhero fluid in a sponge pinned inside my coat. You see? Adhero fluid? What are you talking about? Oh, you should keep up our new developments, Gorman. It's a fluid to load dice while a game's in progress. What? Yes, it's a clear plastic fluid that hardens when it comes in contact with celluloid. I gave the aces on those dice a good heavy coat of it while you were telling me you were going to take over. I didn't see you. Well, all I had to do was get the fluid on my fingers, Marge, and rub my fingers over the aces. The dice were so loaded that when Gorman took them up, they'd uh, turn, even on a soft, padded surface. You're the dirtiest crook I ever read. Oh, no, 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 not a dirty crook, Gorman. An honest crook. Here's your 20,000, Junior, and your 1,500, Marge. Oh, and, uh, here's another 3,500 to cover what your other friends lost, Junior. Gee, thanks. Mm -hmm. But, uh, what do I owe you for your, um, your work, Mr. Trent? Not a cent, Junior. Somehow or other, I seem to have done all right. Here's a last word from the man who knows the rackets inside out, Mike Trent. Thank you. Well, I hope you like tonight's show. 
It should help convince you that anybody can be easy money for crooked dice game operators. And remember, not even the water test is infallible for crooked dice. Any game can be rigged in 50 different ways. So the one way to be safe is to keep out of the game. This is Mike Trent signing off with the thought that you can never stay even with the game when the odds are always against you. Remember, there's no such thing as easy money. You have just heard another in NBC's new series, Easy Money, exposing the inside tricks of the gambler's trade. Be sure to listen again next week when Mike Trent shows how it's possible for you to be gypped on what may look like a perfectly respectable raffle. It's called the Lottery Racket. Featured in tonight's cast were Larry Haynes as Mike Trent with Wendy Drew, Peter Fernandez, Ralph Bell, and Maurice Tarplin. Script by George B. Anderson. Easy Money is produced and directed for Air Shows Incorporated by Blair Walliser. This is Bill McCord. Join your favorite couple, Fibber McGee and Molly, tonight on the NBC Radio Network. In just a moment, easy money. But first, not everybody can visit Carnegie Hall in New York, the home of great music. But NBC's Monday night musical favorite, The Telephone Hour, solves that problem by bringing Carnegie Hall to you. Yes, each Monday evening you'll hear a 30-minute concert direct from the stage of famous Carnegie Hall with Donald Voorhees conducting the Telephone Hour Orchestra. And tomorrow night, the guest soloist on the Telephone Hour is the world-renowned mezzo-soprano of the Metropolitan Opera, Blanche Tebohm. It's a part of your Monday evening of music, listening at its very best. So be on hand for The Telephone Hour with Blanche Tebohm tomorrow night. Now, stay tuned for Easy Money on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents a new series of programs transcribed to expose the inside secrets of gamblers, racketeers, and con men. It's called Easy Money. Easy Money? There's no such thing as Easy Money. Mike Trent, famous rackets detective and ex-magician, has an exciting story of an Easy Money swindle for you. And here he is, that super sleuth who makes an honest living out of fraud, Mike Trent. Thank you, Bill McCord. Some of you may have heard of a particularly daring and difficult type of shoplifting known as the gem switch. This particular swindle started in a small jewelry store on the ground floor of the building where I have my office, the Romner Jewelry Store. How do you do, sir? Something I could do for you? A cruel is my name. I take it you're the... Mr. Romner, the proprietor, yes? Uh, Mr. Romner, I'm interested in buying an unusual ring, something exceptional. A uh, man or ladies mounting? Ladies. I want something extra good. Oh, Mr. Kroll, we have one of the finest assortments of women's rings in the city. Gorgeous gems that defy comparison. I know, but the ring I want must be outstanding. I have the money and, well, I want a ring like no other anywhere else. Mm, (laughs) Such rings cost a great deal of money. Oh, I am prepared to pay, oh, let's say a maximum of $5,000. In such a case, I can really show you something. You'll have to pardon me a minute. Such merchandise we don't keep in the showcases. Yes, I suppose goods like that make ordinary jewelry look rather flat. That's right. I'll be right back. A sure enough customer, Father? I hope so, Sonia. I think maybe he'll buy one of those expensive rings we got on consignment. I've been scared to death having those things in the safe here without more insurance, Dad. Well, nobody knows they're here except us. I think we're safe from gangsters. But, Dad, this customer, do you know anything about him? No, but he looks like a gentleman, and he talked about paying as much as $5,000 for a ring. You sure he has that much money? Oh, don't be such a one, Sonia. You don't hold a gun on a man while you're trying to sell him a $5,000 ring. That's no way of doing business. Wait a minute. I think it's in the drawer of this workbench. Oh, Sonia, you think I carry a gun in one hand and the ring in the other? You think I insult the man? Of course not. But I'm going to have this revolver handy in my purse. 
Well, I'll saunter back out to the front of the store with you. Well, if you do it that way, all right. I guess it couldn't hurt anything. I think I'll show him the Russian ruby first. Yes, it's the most expensive of the lot. We'd make the most money on it. What is more important, it is the finest. Top. Oh, there you are. I thought maybe you'd forgotten me. I had to open the safe. Rings like this can't be traded carelessly. Oh, that's all right. I understand. This is my daughter, Sonia, Mr. Kroll. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. Kroll? I think you'll be thrilled to death with this ring. I know that any woman would be. Well, it's, it's for a very special lady, one who deserves the best there is. Well, let's see it. Oh, Mr. Kroll, before I show you the ring, I want to tell you something about its history. You remember that the jewels of the Tsarina were smuggled out of Russia years ago by the royal family. Oh, yes, yes. It, it seems to me I've heard something of the sort, yes. Among those jewels were two superlative ruby rings made for the Tsarina's nieces. Uh, rubies? Why, I, I thought rubies were rather inexpensive. Oh, <laughs> perhaps you think of synthetic rubies, Mr. Kroll. No, Synthetic rubies are not rare, but... <laughs> well, I don't think I'd know the difference. Well, real <laughs> rubies can be melted at an extremely high temperature. When a genuine ruby is cut, there are lots of scraps. More scraps than genuine ruby in some cases. Those scraps are melted down and made into synthetic gems. Oh, then a synthetic ruby isn't actually a complete imitation, is it? No. Uh -huh. Many of them are quite beautiful. And they're made of the same basic material as a real ruby. But they don't equal the genuine ruby's beauty. And they are still synthetic, no matter how well they're treated. Well, that's interesting, but let's see this ring. It is known as the twin Russian ruby because it is one of two that are exactly alike. It came from the Imperial Russian collection and is mounted in platinum with craftsmanship that can be duplicated today at any price. Where the mate to this ring is, nobody knows. <laughs> well, the build-up is fine, but let's see the ring. Mr. Kroll, prepare to feast your eyes on one of the finest gems of the world. <laughs> that is a beauty. <laughs> uh, do you mind if I, I take it over closer to the window? Well, I'd like to examine it in a little better light. I'll carry it over for you. There. Natural light deepens the brilliance, doesn't it? Oh, yes, indeed. Oh, it, it's a splendid gem. Uh, we'll take it back to the counter now, if you don't mind. And you're awfully careful of it, aren't you? I'd be careful of anything worth $5,000. Well, Mr. Kroll, interested? Well, I... <laughs> I don't know. Honestly, it, it's, it's hard to make up my mind. I naturally thought of a diamond and... Well, of course, I don't want to press you, but... But uh... it is a beautiful ring. Yes. Uh, could I examine the mounting a little more closely? It, it doesn't show up much in that deep plush box. Well, certainly, certainly. Here you are. Father. Please, Sonia. Notice the intricacy of the engraving, Mr. Kroll. Beautiful craftsmanship, worthy of a very lovely lady, yes. Oh, it, it, it's remarkable. <laughs> but it, it makes your daughter nervous to have me handle it. Here, you'd, you'd better take it back. Oh, it, it's not that I don't trust you, Mr. Kroll. It is just that, I well, hope I... hope she hasn't offended you. My daughter sometimes acts like she doesn't think I'm capable of taking care of myself. Oh, that's all right. I'm sure you understand, Mr. Kroll. Uh, we don't own that ring. We have it on consignment from a wholesale jewelry house. Sonia. It's a terrible responsibility. If anything should happen to it, well, we'd have to make up the loss. Well, I I did realize I Sonia, looked like... Sonia, go on back and finish polishing the silver. <laughs> I want to apologize, Mr. Kroll. I oh, hope forget she... forget it. it. It's only that... Well, I am not accustomed to being regarded as a suspicious character, particularly when I want to make a substantial purchase. I'm sorry. For buying this ring, Mr. Kroll, that would not be making any mistake. You say the price is $5,000? Yes. Well, I'll have to ask Catherine how she feels about a ruby. <laughs> I'm sure she's expecting a diamond. Oh, maybe you'd like to bring the young lady in to see the ring. If she doesn't like it, we can show her the diamond. See, that's a splendid idea. I I'll bring her in tomorrow. Uh, maybe I'll send her in alone. That way, Catherine wouldn't feel I was trying to influence her choice. Fine. We'll be expecting her. Well, I'll have to be running along. Thanks for your trouble, and I think we'll be able to make a deal. Goodbye, then. Goodbye. We'll be looking for her. All right. Go ahead and say it. Someday, young lady, you're going to spoil a sale for me. I don't care. I didn't like his look. When a man wants to spend $5,000 with us, does he have to look like Clark Gable? He was all right. I still think there was something funny about like him. Like what? He came in to find out what the ring looks like. 
tomorrow he'll send in the girl, his, his mall, with a cheap paste imitation of the twin Russian ruby. She'll switch rings and skip out with the real one. Too many detective stories you've been reading. It's ridiculous. What's so ridiculous about it? You think there'd be anything funny about having a $5,000 ring stolen from us? In the first place, nobody could make a passable paste imitation of that ring, particularly from memory. Even you would be able to spot it. <laughs> well, oh, I guess that's right, Dan. I'm, I, I'm just jittery. This thing is worth so much money. Isn't and... it a beauty? It'll make, uh, what was her name? Catherine. Uh, Catherine. Very happy. All right. Back into the safe you go. <laughs> but I hope not for long. Hi, Robert. How's business? Glad to see you. Oh, Mr. Morris, a sight for sore eyes you are. Sonia! Oh. Sonia, Mr. Morris from the jewelry house is here. I'll be right there, Dad. Nice girl you got there, Romna. Sonia, yes. I'm certainly glad you came, Morris. I was hoping you'd get around. Say you don't mean to say you want to place a big order. Oh, no. It, <laughs> it's that consignment of rare jewels. It's been driving us crazy. Oh, the consignment. Say, that's really why I came, Romna. Well, that was nice of you. Well... How do you do, Mr. Morris? How are you? I hope you're going to take back that consignment of treasure. Huh? Why so anxious to get rid of it? I got customers be tickled to death to have stuff like that around. The responsibility's too much for us. Oh. Well, there's just one thing. The real reason I came. I've been holding my breath, waiting to find out. Now, let me hold on to the counter before I ask. Did you sell the twin Russian ruby? Well, we almost made a sale on it. The man was interested. But he didn't buy? Not yet. Oh, boy, is that a relief. Wow. Relief? Oh, I, I thought you wanted to sell that jewelry. Not that one, baby. I guess this is my lucky day. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. A secret? I don't see what secret there could be Mr. about... Mr. Romna, I own the other twin Russian ruby. Me. Not the company, but me. But I thought nobody... I know. That's what everybody thought. And get this. Not even the company knows about the other one. I picked it up myself. Well, what will you do with it? Do with it? Do you realize what this means? Alone, the rings are worth about 5,000 bucks apiece. Together, they're worth, worth a king's ransom. Yes, that I can see. I took a plane out here. I've been gone half nuts, wondering if maybe you'd sold the other one so I'd have to pay somebody through the nose for it. And I didn't dare write a phone. Why not? Are you kidding you think I'd let the company get wind of it? That'd ruin everything. They'd say I bought this other twin ruby as their employee instead of for myself. There'd be a lot of complications. Oh, yes, yes, I suppose so. And folks, this is your lucky day, too. Ours? But I don't see how. Mr. Romner, I'm going to buy the other twin Russian ruby from you at the retail price. Huh? You make out a bill of sale of me with my name on it. You turn in the rest of the rings to me as representative of the company and give me 3800 bucks, the wholesale price of the twin ruby. Then the company won't have any beef. But if, do you think that would be honest? Honest? You're giving them their price, aren't you? What's dishonest about making a straight sale? I could send somebody else in to buy it for me. But that isn't the way I do business. Everything above board. The company gets its price. You get your profit, I get the ring. We wouldn't be doing anything wrong, Dad. Maybe not, but... Uh, well, maybe not. It'll give you a 1200 buck profit. Now, that should be worth the worry of having that consignment around, huh? I guess so. A worry like that, I can stand more often. Yeah, fine. Now, bring me the other twin ruby, quick. I can hardly wait to get my mitts on it. It'll just take a minute. I'll be right back. It's a wonderful arrangement, Mr. Morris. The company makes its profit, we make ours, and you make a fortune. Everybody comes out of here. Oh, be nice if all business turned out that way, eh? I should say so. Uh, uh, here you are, Mr. Morris. Uh, do you want to give me a check or cash? Check, of course. Uh -huh. And it's good, don't worry. Now, let's take a look at the ring. Here you are. Yeah, I'll step over here to the window. I've been afraid to let it out of my hands. So much money. I can't say I blame you. It's a... Hey, hey, what are you trying to pull, Ronda? Uh, well, what do you mean? You'll never get away with it. Get away with what? Holding out on me. I offered you a fair proposition. Mighty fair. Uh, what are you saying? You know what I'm talking about, all right? Now, come on. Where have you ditched the real twin ruby? The, the real twin ruby? You, you mean I that... mean this 
cheap-faced imitation wouldn't fool a school kid, not anybody, let alone me. Now, let's have the real one and no funny business. Jokes like that scare me. <laughs> let me see it. Don't act so innocent, Ramna. Here. All right. It's not the twin ruby. Oh, Father. Surprise, all right, all right. You can't understand it, so now find the real one. M- M- Mr. Morris, something terrible has happened. You're not kidding, Ramna. Now hurry up and get that ring. I don't joke. This is the only one I have. Now look, Ramna, I'm being patient. I made what I thought was a nice fair offer. Maybe you think you can shake me down for a cut on a set of twin rubies. Well, you can't. But I don't know anything about it. I don't know where this fake came from. If I... you're trying to fool me... I'm not. I'm... What are we going to do? Who had a chance to steal the ring and leave that imitation? Nobody. Nobody touched it. But, but Dad, you forget. Huh? But, 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 Dad, you forget. Huh? That man there, that Mr. Kroll, he looked it over. Oh, but he just had it in his hands for a few seconds and right under our noses. I was practically burning holes into his hands with my eyes while he held it. He couldn't have switched it. What can we do? I don't know. All I can say is you're in a spot, a $3,800 spot. And me all set to make thousands of dollars. I'll make good to your company. I'll make good. $3,800. A little time, That maybe. wouldn't be so good either. Uh, I'll tell you what. You can have my twin ruby for 3500 That way the company wouldn't know what had happened. Sonia, where, where are you going? Come back here. I will, Dad, later. I'm going out to see a man about a ring. A man named Mike Trent. And, and so the thief has to be Mr. Crow. Nobody else ever had a chance to switch the ring for a fake, Mr. Trent. I see. Uh, tell me this, Miss Romner. Was the imitation a good one? Well, accurate, but not too good. I realized something was wrong the minute Mr. Morris opened the jewel case. Mm-hmm. It was a synthetic ruby. Not cut quite like the real one. Oh, the setting was close, though. I see. I don't suppose you know where to reach this, Mr. Uh, Kroll? No. He said he was staying at a hotel... You see, there wasn't any reason to check up on him until it got down to where we were actually going to make a sale. No, of course not. Do you think you can find him, Mr. Trent? Dad's taking all this terribly hard. Mm. Well, I tell you what, I'm uh, I'm going to be pretty busy for a while, so why don't you look for him? Well, I'll, I'll have not... my assistant, Patsy Ryan, help you. There's nothing to it, really. Uh, you and Patsy check all the hotels and find out if they've had anyone by the name of Kroll registered lately. I'll be pretty busy. But... You aren't going to look for him yourself? Oh, don't worry, Miss Romney. I'll be working on your case. Now, the first thing I have to do is see Laurie Ireland. Ireland? Who's he? Oh, he's the fellow who makes all my magic gimmicks. The uh, gadgets I use in my tricks. Tricks? Mm. Oh, well, really, Mr. Trent, this is mighty serious to my father and myself. It's serious to me, too, believe me. I'm going to have Laurie make me something to use in this case. Oh, a a, a trick gadget? I I can't imagine Well, okay, okay, I'll tell you. But don't you tell anyone else. It's a third hand. Did you say a third hand? Mm-hmm. That's exactly what I said, Miss Romner. A third hand, and I'm not crazy. Oh, uh, but remember. Remember what? Don't tell anyone about it. Not even your father. Hello, Mike Trent speaking. Mike, this is Patsy. Hi. Look, we found him, believe it or not. Mr. Crow, the gem thief, I mean. Good. He's staying at the Arlington Arms Hotel. Well, that's great, Patsy. Thanks. Now, uh, should I have him arrested right away? I should say not, Patsy. But, Michael, he might get away. Well, I'll take my chances on that. Now, look, you and Miss Romner go to her dad's jewelry store right now and get the fake ring, case and all. Tell Mr. Romner and the salesman I want to examine it. Well, all right. And remember, Patsy, I want the whole business, case and all. Goodbye. <laughs> Michael, thank heaven you finally got here to the hotel. Miss Romner and I have been scared to death that Crow would get away. Yo, uh, do you have the ring in the case? Yes, yes. Here. Fine, fine. You sure Crow's in? Oh, yes, we checked. He's in his room all right. Good. Michael, mm. do you have a gun with you? A gun? Now, why would I want a gun? Because this Crow might be a desperate character. Patsy, if he isn't a crook, I won't need a gun. And if he is, I'll use my third hand. Your what? 
Nobody seems to believe me. I said third hand. Oh, Michael, really? All right, all right, never mind. Come on, let's go up to this room. M Michael, hmm? what are you going to do? Well, that all depends, Patsy. Come on. Messenger from the Romna Jewelry Store. Now, look, you two stay out here until I call for you. Mm, all right. Now, what do you want? I, I, I uh, understand you're in the market for some high-class jewelry. Nice room you have here, Mr. Kroll. Now, what's the meaning of this? You said that... that I'm a messenger from the jewelry store? I am. How about a nice Russian ruby ring? Oh, that's... You no, know, I, I talked to the girl, and well, I, I'm not interested. Not even at a bargain? No, not even at a bargain. Well, that's odd, isn't it? A few days ago, you were willing to consider paying $5,000 for a ring, and today you're not interested. The lady isn't interested. She doesn't care for rubies. Oh, so that's the story, huh? Mm-hmm. Now, that's not bad. But uh, I think you'd better come along to the jewelry store with me. What? Now, come on. Well, I, I don't think so. Well, guess again, Crawl. Now, you've got a lot of nerve trying I'm to... not trying anything, pal. I'm doing it. Well, I never heard of such oh, a... Oh, no? Did you ever hear of a twin Russian ruby ring mysteriously disappearing? Why, why no, I, I don't know a thing about it. Now, see here, are you accusing me of stealing a ring? Patsy. Yes, Mike? Did I accuse anybody of anything? Now, what's the idea? There was this girl and... Oh. Yes. I thought you'd remember me, Mr. Crow. Yeah, you were planning to hang something on me when I was in your store, weren't you? Acting so nervous and suspicious. You better come along, Crawl. Yeah, no, thanks. Well, now, get out, all of you. Now, look, I've tried to be nice about this, Crawl. Either you come with me or I'll have to send for an officer to book you on suspicion. Yeah, you wouldn't dare. Oh, you'd be surprised what I'd dare. Now, either you come peaceably or we'll have a lot of trouble. Now, how about it? Well, I, I believe you're serious. Oh, Michael is one of the most serious people you ever met. Thank you, Patsy. Now, how about it? Do I call the police? Well, I, I'll go with you. But you're going to regret this. Believe me. <laughs> There he is, Mr. Morris. That's the man. He's the one who stole my ring. Hold him while I call the police. All right, all right. Calm down, Mr. Romner. Now, look here. I'll take uh, a lot. Getting but excited I won't help you any either. Now, keep calm. Huh? Uh, who are you, mister? And who's this girl? I am Patsy Ryan, Mr. Trent's assistant. Miss Romner and I tracked down this man. Trent, who are you, mister? Who, me? Oh, uh, I'm a jewelry expert. Miss Romner engaged to help trace a crook on this case. Uh, she brought me a ring to examine. I have it right here. Oh, that. Not much to look at. It's a fake. A fake? Well, I'm afraid not, Mr. Morris. I have it here just as Miss Romner brought it to me, and I'd stake my professional reputation that her ruby is genuine. Uh, genuine synthetic ruby, yes. The ring that's gone is a real ruby, one of the finest there is. It's worth 5,000 bucks. Mr. Morris has the other real one. If you'll compare the two, Mr. Trent, you'll see the difference in a second. This this man Kroll stole my ring. Uh, careful, careful, Ron. Uh, call me a thief, will you? Now, why You're I'm... nothing. I'll have you in jail before the day's over, you crook. All right, Mr. Romner, let's be realistic about this. Can you prove that Mr. Kroll stole your ring? Prove it? Of course I can prove it. The real ring there, he handled it and then it was gone. What proof do you need? Did you see him take it? Well, well, no, of course not, well, then but... you see, you haven't a shred of evidence. You can't make statements about people being thieves without some evidence to back it up. It looks but... like you're stuck, Romner, but you can still cut your loss by 300 bucks by buying my ring and turning it into the company. Mr. Trent, mm -hmm. should we buy Mr. Morris's ruby? Well, now, how could I give advice on that? I haven't even seen his ring. I don't even know if it's as good as the one you already have. It's plenty good, all right. Just take a look at it, and then look at that piece of cheese in Romner's box. Here. That's fair enough. Mm -hmm. Mr. Romner, I'd say just offhand that the ring you already have is far superior to this one. This ring of Morris's looks like a cheap paste imitation to me. All right, now don't be oh. funny, mister. Now give me that ring. Certainly take it. I wouldn't have it as a gift. It's strictly a phony. Uh, let me see it. You're right. It, it is an imitation, just like the one I have. Oh, good heavens, that leaves me worse off than ever. Well, don't belittle your own merchandise, Romna. My opinion is that your ring is the real thing. Here, take a look for yourself. The, the twin Russian ruby, the real one, it is. It, it wasn't a fake at all, but... Hey, let me take a look. Get your hands away from that jewel case, Morris, and keep them away. I've got you covered. But there must be some mistake. You can't do this to me. I'm... You won't do a thing. And particularly, you won't exercise that uh, third hand anymore. Well, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do. Feel his right arm, Ron. Oh, no, uh, you don't. Now, get away from me. Uh, uh, I'll get away. There's something that, that, that feels uh, like, like no. metal. Take his coat off. Are you beside? Uh, but this you can't we get can away with it. We can quite a bit. Get that coat uh, off him, Ron. Uh, uh, as fast as I can. Yes, but he... No, no, you don't. Stop. 
Stop or I'll shoot. I... But all right. You got nothing on me. You're going to get that coat off if I have to rip it off. Crow, give me a hand here. There. What? Why, that harness arrangement on his right arm. Michael, what is it? That, Patsy, is a third hand, commonly known as a sleeve holdout. It's a device used only by inferior magicians. Tricksters who don't have the ability to switch articles by sleight of hand. Glory Ireland thought I'd gone crazy when I ordered one today. You ordered one, Mr. Trent? Oh, yes, I remember. Sure, I'm wearing it, too. I wanted to play Morris's own game with him. Then you knew all along that it was Morris? No, no, not, not all along. At first glance, it seemed only one person had a chance to switch rings, and that was Kroll. But even then, Kroll couldn't have been working alone. Well, I don't see why not. Well, Patsy, that duplicate ring. Whoever switched rings had to leave what the uh, advertisers call a reasonable facsimile. And Kroll could only have done that by getting a fake ring from the source where you got the real one, or by working with that source. Now, the wholesale jewelry house is a reputable firm, so if Kroll were in on the swindle, he had to be in with Morris. Then I was right. Kroll's guilty, too. Uh, Not at all. Morris was the only one who had a chance to have a duplicate made because he had the ring originally. But I don't see how you... Now, look, that story about the twin Russian rubies seemed a little on the weird side to me, so I asked myself where it first came from. Mr. Morris told me about it when he left the consignment of rare rings. That's right. But, you see, there were never really two rings. Just one. Morris planned all along to steal that ring from you and sell it back to you. But, uh, uh, Kroll, uh, how about him? Well, you can't call a man a criminal because he wants to buy a ring for his girlfriend. After Patsy called, I checked his record. He's completely reputable and honest. Oh, uh, my apologies, Mr. Kroll. I, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. Well, that's all right, but... Romna. Yeah, but, Trent, mm-hmm. how did the real ruby get back into Romna's jewel case? I was watching. And, and there I... was nothing to see? Here, I'll show you. Well, help me off with my coat, would you? Thank you. Now, the fake ring was not in the jewel case at all when I came into the store. It was in this third-hand holdout, hanging on this little clip. You see? Yes. All right, now watch. I'll hold the good one in my fingers, so. I press my elbow slightly against my side. Oh, uh, you wouldn't hear that noise if I had my coat on. But did you see it? Michael, that's amazing. That's the fastest thing I ever saw. The fake ring came into your hand, and the... Real one went onto the clip. Right, Patsy. but but the, the 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 real ring. I still don't see how you got it back into the jewel case. Well, once I got it from Morris after switching him the fake, all I had to do was squeeze the third hand, and the good ring came into my palm. When I opened Mister Romner's jewel case, I put the real one in. Well, I'll be done. Say, you know something? I've got a hunch that Ruby, the real one, might be good luck for me. You mean you want to buy it? Well, Catherine and I had a little quarrel a few days ago, and it wasn't true what I said about her not liking rubies. If she saw that ring and heard the story, I bet she'd be very willing to make up again. Oh, she would if she's human. You you mean you do want to buy it? (laughs) Yes, I think I will, but I want to be sure to get the real one. (laughs) Oh, you'll uh, you'll get the real one, all right. Morris isn't going to be in a position to make any more uh, gem switches. You got nothing on me, wise guy. I ain't stolen anything and I haven't accepted any money. Guess again, pal. You had the ring in your possession. The same law applies to you that takes care of a shoplifter. Recovery of the merchandise doesn't cancel the crime. Oh, uh, of course, you have one consolation. I'd like to know what. Well, where he's going, Patsy, he won't have to worry about making easy money. His expenses are going to be all paid for by the state. And now, a last word from the ex-magician turned rackets detective, Mike Trent. Thank you. I hope you all enjoyed tonight's story. The sleeve holdout, or third hand, is a useful device to shoplifters, so be on the lookout for it, huh? Next week, I'm going to have a story about an amazing card game. A sociable blackjack game that turned out to be anything but sociable. I hope you'll be around to hear it, same time, same station. Until then, this is Mike Trent signing off with the thought that people who go after easy money usually end up getting hard knocks. Remember, there's no such thing as easy money. You have just heard another program in NBC's new series, Easy Money. Transcribed to expose the inside secrets of gamblers, racketeers, and con men. 
starred in the role of Mike Trent, ex-magician turned rackets detective, is Larry Haynes. Also featured in tonight's cast were Joan Allison, Melba Ray, Greg Morton, and Roger DeCoven. Be sure to listen for Easy Money again next week when Mike Trent gives you the lowdown on the blackjack racket. Same time, same station. This is Bill McCord. Join your favorite couple, Fibber McGee and Molly, tonight on the NBC Radio Network. Radio Network. Radio Network. Radio Network. In just a moment, easy money. But first, Monday evening on NBC means time for the telephone hour, your musical favorite for many years. Each week, the Telephone Hour brings you a 30-minute concert direct from the stage of Carnegie Hall in New York, with Donald Voorhees conducting the Telephone Hour Orchestra. Tomorrow night, the soloist is world-renowned violinist Zeno Francescotti. It's the best in musical listening. So be on hand tomorrow evening when NBC brings you the Telephone Hour with Donald Voorhees conducting the orchestra and Zeno Francescotti as guest artist. And now stay tuned for Easy Money on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents a new series of programs transcribed to expose the inside secrets of gamblers, racketeers, and con men. It's called Easy Money. Easy money? There's no such thing as easy money. Mike Trent, the ex-magician turned rackets detective, has a story tonight about basketball betting pools, which currently menace a great American sport. And here he is. Thank you, Roger Bowman. I'd never given much thought to basketball gambling pools until unpleasant little stories began to crop up here and there in the sports world. My first real experience came one evening when Patsy Ryan and I were watching a thrilling game between a couple of closely matched teams. Oh, Mike, this is the most exciting basketball game I've ever seen. Riley, don't catch it. Look out. Will you relax, Patsy? Oh. It's only a basketball oh, game. Oh, well, what a game. If the Comets can just overcome that two-point lead. Good, good. Kane got the ball away from them. Oh, he's dribbling down the floor. Shoot, Kane, shoot. We want a basket. Kane's wide open. Oh. He caught him flat-footed. And there's time for another basket if he hurries. Oh, hurry. Oh, there's the gun. The game's over. The Comets lose. Mike. Oh. Mike, the game isn't over. What's yeah, I know, Patsy. Done? Patsy, that shot we heard. It wasn't from the timekeeper. Look at Kane. There's blood all over his jersey. He's been shot, Patsy. Oh, Mike. Mike, there's Tully of the plain clothes squad out on the floor. Look. Look, he's pointing to the door that leads from the shower room. What a beautiful spot for a murder. Every eye in the place glued on the playing floor. People waiting for the gun to go oh, off. Oh, they're putting Kane on a stretcher. I hope that boy's not badly hurt. Come on, Patsy, let's get out of here. Michael, do we have to leave? Now, come on. Mike, aren't we going to wait and see what happened? The police have gone to the shower room. Yeah, and the shower room has two entrances from the outer hall. The murderer's had all the time he needs to make a getaway. Murder? Oh, no, please. Patsy, look, I've seen enough murder victims in my time to know. When the thumbs collapse into the palms like that, it's all over. Look. Now, come on. Please. Look, why, why don't you go down and talk to Captain Tully? You might be able to help. No, I'd rather stay out of this for the time being. But a nice youngster like that, shot in a cup of blood. And they talk about sportsmanship. Oh, now, Patsy, you can't think the Comets had anything to do with this. Well, who else right during a game, right when it looked like Kane was going to tie the score? I hope that opinion gets a good play, Patsy. In the meantime, let's go. Max, give me your call, Mr. Trent. Hey, on a level, you ready to teach me that bottom deal of yours? Oh, sure, sure. Glad to do it, Marty. Uh, you got any cards on you? Oh, sure. Oh, wait a minute. This deck of strippers. Uh, they won't do, huh? Well, hardly. Oh, I didn't think so. Let me see. Uh, nope. This here deck's all gimmicked for slick ace work. Gee, I'd better run down to the cigar store and pick up a plane deck. Uh, just a minute, Marty. I want to ask you something. I've been watching the basketball game results. Yeah. Ah, that stuff's getting to be quite a racket, ain't it? 
racket, Marty? Yeah. If you're a very hep G, you can pick yourself up two, three hundred bucks with a very slight amount of work. Uh-huh. Well, I-, I wondered if there weren't some good betting pools, you know. Not good, maybe, but awful big. Only, I don't know. Mm, what's wrong? They're running kind of sub rosa and very quiet, too, since this little accident at the Comet game last Wednesday night. Oh. You mean you think gambling was connected in some way with that murder? Me? I wouldn't know. I'm strictly a small-time card mechanic, minding my own business and trying to work my way up, but uh, I've heard stuff and things. Uh, stuff, Marty? Like what? The teams was awful close, and local Doe was riding on a Comets, but Natch. But Natch. And it was kind of fortunate that this Kane guy dribbles his way right smack into a slug from a forty-five. Well, not very fortunate for Kane. Somebody has to lose. And it wasn't the press that ended up with the shorts. The press? Oh, don't tell me I've missed one of the racket elite. Oh, he's called the press because he's a very hoity-toity operator, see? Oh. Strictly gambling pools, punch boards, and, well, you know, high-class rackets. Oh, yes, yeah, very high-class. Well, he operates big, just like the president of a big corporation. Leather office furniture, the wigs, papers strew all over his desk with with statistics on it. Uh, with what, Marty? Uh, numbers. Oh, sister, so yard numbers, yeah. And uh, he operates the basketball pool? The big one. Mm-hmm. What's his real name? Ah, uh, you wouldn't believe it. Well, I'll try, Marty. Waltham Buff. <laughs> Ain't that a Lulu? Yeah. Uh, where can I find him? The Buff Publishing Company. But I'm warning you, Mr. Trent. Hmm? You're throwing your money to the four winds. You've never felt called upon to warn me away from the city slickers before, Marty. Hey, look, you used to be a magician. You got hands that what they can do, there ought to be a law against. And is. But the basketball pool, ah, uh, that ain't a matter of hands, Mr. Trent. But strictly from the head. I see. And you don't think my head works so good, is that it? Well, when a guy tries to beat odds like what you get on a basketball pool, he's lost up a dead-end street. Mm-hmm. Oh, one thing, Marty. I suppose a lot of people would feel the same way you do, and I don't like to be laughed at, so, uh... If you could keep it, Mom. But Natch. And now, that bottom deal. Oh, yes. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't have time to show it to you now, Marty. But drop in any time when you have a free hour or two on your hands. Huh? I got free time now. Listen, you're Yeah, I know. Show... I know. I know. I tell you what. Here's, uh, here's a little finger exercise you should do first, though. You know, to limber up. Uh-huh. Uh, you practice this for a couple of weeks. Yeah, you bend each finger all the way back until it touches the wrist. Yeah, See? like, like the... Hey! A guy could break his fingers that way. Yeah, that's a thought. Keep trying. Well, what is it you people want? I'm a very busy man, extremely busy. Are you really Mr. Waltham Buff? That's right. But if you young people have written a great American novel, I'm the wrong publisher for you. Oh, we don't write, Mr. Buff. No, no, Michael's a statistician. He fixes... Not so loud, Patsy. Now, do you mind if I close the door, Mr. Buff? Now, what is this, anyway? Well? Mr. Buff, how would you like to put all your competition out of business? What? Now, listen, young man. Do you know what kind of publishing house this is? Oh, yes, sir. We, uh, we have a way for you to run all the rest of the basketball pools right out of business. Bankrupt them. Oh, not we, Michael. It's all your idea, really. Well, oh, I suppose you want me to offer longer odds than my competitors, eh? No, no, well, I'm so- no. It isn't a matter of keeping your competitors from getting business. It's a matter of giving them business. The wrong kind of business. I fail to comprehend. Now, if you'll just get to the point... Now, Mr. Buff, I have a system. The Trent system. It's a system for picking winning basketball teams. Now, with it... You can bet against your competitors and put them all right out of business. What? Nobody ever believes him at first, until they see the results. I'm sorry, I can't give you any more time. If you'll just uh, excuse Mr. me... Mr. Buff, we offered you a real opportunity, and you just laugh at us. You try to put us out of your office. Well, if it's so good, let him make money with it himself. You mean, uh, you'd let me bet in your pool? Bet against you? That's exactly what I mean. Michael, no. He just wants to see what teams you'll pick, and then he'll capitalize on our idea. He'll go out and make big bets with his competitors. I don't care what teams you pick. I will not bet with my competitors. I have never bet on a basketball pool, and I don't intend to start now. And there are people waiting to see me, so if you'll come... I'd like to make a bet with you, Mr. Buff, a big bet, to show my confidence in my system. Go right ahead. Uh, Will you let Michael mark his pool ticket and then... 
seal it in an envelope? I'll let him nail it into a packing case if he likes. Oh, that's not necessary. Just so he can seal it in an envelope. All right, all right. Here. Here's a pool ticket for tonight's games. And here's an envelope. Now, go ahead. Uh, you mustn't look while I'm picking my teams. Uh, the idea is you uh, put a check mark after the team you want. Is that a it? A check mark or an X, either one. Yeah. Uh, by the way, is it all right to try to pick all 12 games? You pick all 12 games, and I will pay you 50 to 1. Oh, Michael, 50 to 1. That means we'll win $50,000. What? You mean to say you're going to bet $1,000? Isn't that all right? <laughs> Why, of course. It's not only all right, it's great. Uh, just put up the money, and I'll give you a receipt. Oh, fine, fine. Oh, uh... One thing, though, if you try to open this envelope and look at my selections before I come in, the bet's off. If you never have anything worse than that to worry about, you live to be an old man. Oh, let me seal the envelope, Michael. There. Now, who can we trust to keep it? How about, uh, Marty Griggs? What? He's a, uh, a mutual friend. Did you think he's your special source of information? I know all about you, Trent. <laughs> You wasted an awful lot of time with that dumb act. Michael, I don't understand what Mr. Bunn Don't tie talking. yourself out acting, my dear. If the boyfriend wants to throw $1,000 down the drain trying to get something on me, let him go right ahead. All right, here's $1,000, Buff, and I want that uh, receipt you mentioned. Of course. Here you are. And Marty Griggs holds the envelope. Right. A rather silly way to waste your money, Trent. Maybe. If it weren't... Don't I look like a good enough businessman to get you out of the way? Oh, uh, Marty tells me you're pretty clever with your hands. Oh, really? If I were you, I'd try using my head. Oh. Well, thanks for the tip, Mr. Buff. I'll see you Saturday night to collect. I wouldn't hold my breath if I were you. Well, thanks for your time. Bye. Yes, boss? Come in here. Uh, right away, boss. You want something, boss? You heard the little act the private dick put on for me, didn't you, Cleo? Oh, sure. I made a record of it, boss. Have one of the boys watch Marty Griggs between now and Saturday night. I don't trust him. Watch him? Well, who you want to do it? Hmm? Leroy, I guess. He's handled himself rather well lately. Yes, I... I think Leroy deserves a promotion. Hey, you oughtn't to pick me to hold this envelope, Mr. Trent. I'm friends with both of you guys. Yes, yeah, so Mr. Waltham Buff informed us. That, uh... Wasn't very nice of you, Marty, to spoil our little act for Mr. Buff. Oh, now, listen, Mr. Trent. If I'd have known you'd take it that way, I'd have stayed away from Buff. But you never said I anything. told you to keep it confidential, didn't I? Yeah, but he was going to know about it anyway if you called on him. And I was looking out for your best interests. I told you these pools were sucker stuff. Let's just have one thing straight, Marty. Sure, sure. You know me, Mr. Trent. Yeah, you bet I know you. That's why I want an understanding. You tamper with that sealed envelope and you'll be in a lot of trouble, and I'm not kidding. No, I can see that. I may not operate the way your friends do, but if you think I can't run you out of town, you're badly mistaken. So it's up to you to keep that envelope sealed and away from idle hands. Understand? Well, sure. Don't worry about it. Hey, on a level, you, you think you're going to win that bet? I know I'm going to win it. Hey, uh... Oh, how do you do? Oh, did you want to see Mr. Trent? Hey, uh... Got the envelope, Marty? Envelope? Oh, oh sure. Yeah, I got it. Why? Come on, then, Pally. Huh? Come on where? I've been given a promotion, Marty. I don't aim to have your louse set up. I don't know what you're talking about, Leroy. The press, he says to me, keep an eye on Marty. To let him out of your sight after he gets this envelope. Of all the nerve. And the press, he thinks that the, <laughs> I've got to do a gumshoe act. Shadowing and all that stuff. <laughs> Ain't that rich, Marty? It <laughs> sure is, Leroy. <laughs> yeah. Straight lines, that's me, Marty. No going around corners. No beating around bushes. <laughs> the order is, is, don't let Marty out of your sight. So, uh, you know what, Marty? What do you mean, Leroy? 
From now till Saturday night, Marty, I'm moving in with you. But that's not fair, Mr. Buck. Care but... what, lady? He can't do that. Now, there, lady, is a bet that calls for real long odds. <laughs> I guess you'll have to sleep in a chair, Leroy. Chair? Hey, what's wrong with a bed? It's a single. It ain't big enough for both of us. Hey, I can see you got to be taught some manners, Marty. Huh? When you got company, you give them nothing but the best. Look at the press. Ain't you ever noticed how polite he is? If you think I'm giving up my bed to a guy that muscles in on me and... Ain't we friends, Marty? Well... Quiet. Who's that? It's me, Cleo. Hey, something must be up at the office. Hey, what are you doing here? Well, I figured you two wouldn't be smart enough to know it's raining dollar bills, so I decided to drop in for a little visit. Listen, Cleo, who are you trying to kid? Look... You two don't think this fella Trent is really going to pick all 12 games, do you? A guy did it two years ago in a five-buck bet. The way those teams are handicapped, every game is a toss-up, right? Sure. I can't figure Trent's angle. He's got me kind of worried. Twelve games, each a toss-up. So most of the suckers figure it ought to be a 12-to-1 payoff, right? Yeah. But it's a 12-bet parlay, and that means the odds are over 4,000-to-1. Buff's very generous, paying 50 to 1. Don't make me laugh. 4,000 to 1, huh? Start figuring the odds against picking all 12, and it gets up into the millions. What are you trying to do, make us cry for Trent? No, anybody with the brains of a gnat knows he isn't going to win. And he'll know it soon as he sees the results of other games posted on the scoreboard Saturday night. Uh, well, so what, genius? So he figures, well, I've lost the dough. Kisses it goodbye, and he don't come around to collect. Natch? Uh, that's where you boys need my brains. I don't get it. I got a pool ticket, unmarked. And I can get an envelope from the press's office, just like the one you boys got. I'm at the game Saturday night, and I check off this ticket as the scores come in. Hey, maybe you got something there at that. I slip you boys the sealed envelope, and you forget the one this Trent fixed up. Yeah, and I suppose you think the press would pay out 50 grand without Trent being there. Oh, you sap. You're the one that's dumb, Leroy. This guy Trent can be handled easy. I ain't so sure about that, Cleo. Oh, don't be dumb. I'll explain to him how we can work things if he loses. All he has to do is give me a high sign after the game is over. We give him 20,000 bucks and keep 10 apiece for ourselves. Hey, why should he get 20 and us only 10? Plenty of reasons. Including the big one that the deal wouldn't be worth 10 cents without him. Well... Are you with me? It ain't exactly being honest with the press. With all the soft dough he's made out of this pool racket, my heart's breaking for him. Well, there's been time when ten grand would have come in handy. <laughs> ain't that right, Marty? I can't think of anything handier. <laughs> then it's a deal? Is it, Leroy? You're supposed to be watching me. Sure, but can I help it if I don't see everything that happens? <laughs> Deal me in, Cleo. It beats killing basketball players for a living. Shut up. The voice crack like that ain't funny enough now. I was just joking, A Leroy. joke like that could laugh you right out of circulation, baby. There's some things you don't talk about. I just wanted to make it clear that we all ought to trust each other, Leroy. Because we all got things we could say about each other. Catch. Hmm. Catch. <laughs> Michael, uh, you look like you've lost your last friend. Friend? What's that? You worried about your basketball bet? No, but I, I... I thought that bet would start things, Patsy. What kind of things? Well, I, I kept thinking something was bound to break, that Waltham Buff would get nervous, that Marty Griggs would get scared, that his overgrown shadow Leroy would get tough, but... Doggone it. Mm. So all you can do is win $50,000. Oh, that's mm -hmm. not the point, Patsy. Look, I want to catch that murderer. I want to put a stop to this sort of thing. Michael, $50,000 isn't the point. I've never seen you work in a case where you didn't ponder as much about your fee as about the actual solution. Well, the people who pay my fees never complain, do they, Miss mm -hmm. Ryan? They're never in a position to complain. Oh, how do you do? Did you want to see Mr. Trent? 
Yes, alone. Oh. Well, I guess that can be arranged. Uh, you were just leaving anyway, weren't you, Patsy? Oh. Oh. Certainly. Yeah. Have a good time. Bye. Bye. <laughs> she seemed kind of sore. I'll forget it. What can I do for you? It's what I can do for you, mister. Uh... I'm going to lay my cards right on the table. I work for Waltham Buff. I know all about your thousand-dollar bet. Well. You got one chance in a million of winning. But that doesn't mean you can't show a neat profit. You know, you interest me. Look, if you've picked all the teams, there's no reason for you to deal. But if you miss, the boys and I got away so you can still do pretty good. Twenty grand. We get the other thirty. Not bad, huh? Uh, no, no. Uh, you mean you'd switch envelopes on Mr. Buff? Sure. And I'm in a spot where I could do it easy, without a chance in the world of getting caught. Interested? Uh, frankly, no. Not even slightly. But well, why not? It's, it's a fair deal all around. Uh, Marty and Leroy have already made me a better deal. They've offered me 25000 Who do you think you're fooling? They wouldn't have the nerve. Oh, no? Well, you just watch and see. If you think you can trick me into offering you a bigger split... Well, I wouldn't even try. As I said, I've already made a deal. And if you don't believe it, we'll just drop around for the payoff. I'll be there, mister. Don't you worry. Oh, they're putting up the score of another game on the board, Marco. Was that one of the games on your pool ticket? Mm -mm, I don't remember, Patsy. Do you mean to say you haven't even kept track of well, What good would that do, Patsy? I'm watching this game. Clock says 40 seconds to go. Michael, huh? what are you doing? Oh, you mean standing up and putting my hat on and then tipping it? Uh, that's a signal, Patsy. That's a signal to whom? Well, that's the funny part of it. A signal to nobody. It'd be funny if this Trent guy actually did pick all 12 games, wouldn't it? Don't be a dope, Leroy. I've been watching him. He'd just give Cleo the high sign. Hey, hey, that's the end of the game. Hey, we're supposed to get back here by exit number four and Cleo will pass us. Hey, look, there's something funny here. Huh? What? Cleo, I've been watching her. She just walked out of exit number seven. And look, Trent and the girl are heading this way. Uh, you think... Could he maybe have picked all 12 games? I don't know. All I know is he's a very clever guy with his hands. Then hold on to that envelope, Pally. Tight. You mean to say you picked all 12 games, Trent? What? Oh, well, I haven't the faintest idea, Mr. Buff. We'll have to check. Uh, you mean to say you don't even know what games you picked or what teams? Nope. That isn't important in my system, the Trent system. But it always works. So there's not much point in worrying, is there? I have the windows here. Not on this card. Mm-hmm. Pretty fancy. All printed up, huh? You send those cards around to the places that sell the pool tickets for you, I suppose. Yes. I believe in running a business on a business basis. Mm-hmm. And we'll be very busy the rest of the evening getting money around to the uh, various spots. So if you hurry and... Here's the envelope, boss. It ain't left our sight neither, honest. Uh, that's right, boss. Uh, just a minute, Marty. I'll open the envelope if you don't mind. I don't trust Mr. Buff. Why, you... I'm not at all sure I'd trust you with this ticket, Mr. Buff. Watch the guy, boss. Now, let's see. First game, okay. Second game, yes. Third... Okay, four, five, five, right, sixth, wonderful, seven... Listen, seven. just let me take that ticket. And let you tear it up? Not a chance. But the games are uh, all checked right, all 12 of them. Here. Isn't that right, boys? I'll be doggone. Yes, sir. Every single one of them. Mike, you're marvelous. I told you what an amazing system it was, Mr. Buff. Don't you wish that you'd believe me? I hope you have $50,000 here, Mr. Buff, and I'd prefer cash. No. What? Listen, Trent. There's something extremely fishy about this. That Comet game. The Comets were 20-point favorites to win, sure things. And they lost. And you picked their opponents. Well, I guess I was lucky. That goes beyond luck, Trent. You mean it wasn't luck that they lost? That's exactly what I mean. 
They're at least 20 points better Don't than the... Don't you see, boss? Marty and Leroy, they've tricked you. They sold you out. I know. I can prove it. Why, you dirty little rat. We sold him out, huh? Yes, you sold him out. Oh, you like that. We sold out the boss. After her trying to get us to double cross him. Trying to? You agreed, you dirty lowdown. So this is the frame, huh, Cleo? You've got your nerve talking about frame-ups. Don't you think I saw Trent signal you to switch envelopes? Oh, we didn't do any such thing while you... You must think I'm an idiot. I line up the deal and then you squeeze me out. This is all very interesting and enlightening. You ain't putting yourself in a very good spot, Cleo, with that kind of talk. You admitting you tried to frame the boss and admitting we wasn't in it with you. I'll admit a lot more, too, smart boy. You think I don't know what's going on around here? Cleo! Don't shout at me. I'm true with you anyway. I may be a crook, but I'm no murderer. Uh, That's careless talk, baby. You think I don't know about Leroy picking up the gun and Marty waiting for him in a car outside? Cleo, shut up! You didn't know I listened in and heard him report back to you, did you, boss? Well, I did. And I remember every word I heard. And if you guys think you're going to shove me around... They won't, Cleo. Don't worry. But she should be worrying, Mr. Trent. Such vindictive slander. Slander? I know which gun it was, even. And I know where it's hid, too. And if you think I'm bluffing... Come back here, Cleo! Mike! All right. <coughs> Lucky you're a bad oh, shot, huh? Oh, my boy, Mike! Stop murder. the papers, Joe! Oh, Mike, help me! Give me a gun quick, boss, uh, while Leroy's holding the dame. Oh, all right, Marty, here. I wouldn't, Marty. This gun I just went out and found knows how to kill people. Now drop it. Uh, well, when you put it that way, match. Thanks, Cleo. Is it all right for me to pick up the gun he just dropped? Yeah, sure. Now, I'll have that $50,000 if you don't mind, Mr. Buff. You said you had a good deal of cash here. Well, not that much, but you can take what there is. Here. I'll pay you the rest. Well, that's real big of you, Mr. Buff. Thanks. Of course, you won't be needing money where you're going. You'd be a sap to give Leroy and Marty their cut, mister. Well, they don't have any, Cleo. I picked the winners. You couldn't have. You know, Buff, when you admitted you'd cheated, that one of those games was fixed, you made me feel a lot less uncomfortable about my pool ticket. What? You see, I hadn't picked a single game, Buff. Hadn't even tried. Until I took the pool ticket out of that envelope. You see, the card was blank. Hey, I don't believe it. Games are all checked. Yeah, sure. I used to do a trick, Leroy, that laid him in the aisles in Peoria. A mind-reading trick. And to do that trick, I used to wedge a little piece of lead under my thumb. I got so I could write fairly well with my thumb. All I had to do on this pool ticket was uh, make check marks. Right while you were looking on the back of the ticket. Oh, Michael, what do we do with all this money? Well, we'll fill up that suitcase and send it back to Mr. Buff in care of Sing Sing. You contemptible crook. Well, that's praise from an expert, Mr. Buff. I'm flattered. That's your fault, Press. I told you the guy was clever with his hands. And here he is for a last word, that incomparable exposer of fakes, Mike Trent. Thank you. Beating the basketball pools is a hopeless proposition. The odds are stacked so heavily against you that you can't hope to win over any period of time. And every time you participate in a pool, you're undermining a great American sport. Because when gamblers get into athletics, they just cease to be sport. Next week, I'm going to bring you a story of the fixed roulette game racket. Same time, same station. I hope you'll be back with us. Until then, this is Mike Trent signing off with the thought that if money were really as easy as racketeers say it is, they wouldn't work so hard to take it away from you. Remember, there's no such thing as easy money. You've just heard another program in the NBC series, Easy Money, transcribed to expose the inside secrets of gamblers, racketeers, and con men. Next week, Mike Trent has an amazing story of how the fixed roulette wheels operate. Same time, same station. Featured in tonight's cast were Larry Haynes as Mike Trent, Joan Allison, Rita Lynn, Ralph Camargo, and Sid Paul. Easy Money is produced and directed by Blair Walliser in association with Air Shows Incorporated. Script by George B. Anderson. 
This has been an NBC Radio Network presentation, and this is Roger Bowman. Join your favorite couple, Fibber McGee and Molly, tonight on the NBC Radio Network. Radio Network. Radio Network. Radio Network. In just a moment, the easy money. But first, from the stage of New York's famous Carnegie Hall right into your own home, the Telephone Hour brings you a melodic 30-minute concert every Monday evening. This week's guest artist on the Telephone Hour is Metropolitan Opera star Blanche Thiebaum, and among her selections are favorites by Debussy and Bizet. Accompanying Miss Thiebaum will be the 57-piece Bell Symphonic Orchestra under the baton of Donald Voorhees. It's part of your Monday evening of music, so listen tomorrow night for the Telephone Hour. Now stay tuned for Easy Money on NBC. <laughs> National Broadcasting Company presents another in a series of programs transcribed to expose the inside secrets of gamblers, racketeers, and conmen. It's called Easy Money. Easy Money? There's no such thing as easy money. Mike Trent, the brilliant ex-magician turned rackets detective, has a most revealing story of the charity benefit racket tonight. You're going to enjoy hearing the inside facts on how this swindle works. Now here he is, the arch enemy of the confidence men... Mike Trent. Thank you, Lionel. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's story deals with a percentage gambler and how charity sometimes begins and ends in a con man's pocket. Patsy Ryan, my girl Friday, came into my office a couple of weeks ago all excited about an idea of hers. Hi, Michael. Hi. Oh, I've just had a brilliant idea. Congratulate me. Uh, when you get a bright idea, Patsy, I'm suspicious. It usually means trouble for me and work, but go ahead, kid. We're going to throw a party. Oh, no. Oh, no, not me. You don't get me mixed up in any hen party. <laughs> oh, no, not you. The children's hospital girls on local committee. Oh, oh, well, that's different. All right, how many tickets am I supposed to buy and what are they uh, called? Uh, not so fast. Admission is going to be free. Free? Mm-hmm. Oh, this sounds like a racket. That's the first earmark of every good con game. Well, this is going to be a Monte Carlo party. Oh, the light dawns. Gambling of all kinds. Mm. chuck a luck roulette, dice, blackjack, everything. Yeah, well, that's a swell idea, Patsy. The take should be plenty high. So many people like to gamble, and they can excuse themselves on the ground that it's uh, for a good cause. That's the way I think it is. Mm-hmm. All right, well, you'll have to get roulette wheels and chuck a luck layouts, and you want to be sure you have competent operators. Oh, that's all taken care of. Uh, not by you, I hope, Patsy. You wouldn't know a good chuck a luck operator from a faro dealer. Don't worry. Mr. Lanning has arranged everything. Mr. Who? Lanning. The head of Monte Carlo Knight's producing company. Oh, yes, yes. It seems to me I've heard about him. You see, he puts on parties like this for organizations all over the country. Mm-hmm. He um, furnishes the imitation money that people gamble with, and yeah. he has a whole crew of game operators. They bring in all the equipment. I see. Well, that sounds like a beautiful setup. Sure, and all we have to do is give Mr. Lanning 30% of the profits. Well, it costs cost us more than that to rent the games. More than what? More than 30% of the profits. How much exactly is 30% of the profits? Well, I don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, Patsy, my guess is that Mr. Lanning's going to be mighty well paid for his trouble. Mighty well paid. You mean you think maybe he's crooked? Well, I don't know. I don't know. But I think I'll talk to him if you haven't any objections. Hey, Michael, I wish you would. He's staying at the Five Oaks Hotel. Yeah. Well, as long as you're mixed up in this thing, Patsy, I want it to work out right. So I'm going to go over to the Five Oaks right now, and I'll soon know whether Mr. Lanning's on the up and up. Would you please? Yeah. I'll let you know whatever I find out. <laughs> How do you do? You're Mr. Lanny? Yeah. And you're the fellow that just phoned up? Yes, that's right. Mike Trent. Okay, Trent. Take a load off the feet. Have a cigar. Thanks. What's the pitch? Well, uh, Miss Patsy Ryan tells me you're going to run the Monte Carlo party for the children's hospital benefit. That's right. Why? Well, I want the girls who are handling that party to make plenty of money for their fund. I, uh... Wouldn't want the promoter to make it all. <laughs> Trent, I've been a gambler all my life. I've won and lost a lot of dough. 
Used to be a hunch gambler. Know what I mean? Oh, yeah, sure. Lost my shirt that way. Watched a lot of other suckers go broke. Finally, I got smart. Oh? How does a gambler get smart? By learning to play the percentages. I started a real sure thing, this Monte Carlo Knight's layout. You mean the percentage is good? I mean, it's perfect. In the first place, I got the house percentages with me, not against me. I'm on the right side of the gambling table for once. In the second place, a society mob out to give their daughter charity don't care how much they lose. Mm. Say, I get 30% of the take. That can be real dough. Yo, yo. You sure there's uh, no strong arm stuff? Well, they don't need to be, pal. I can make too much playing it straight to try any phony business. Yo. Well, what you say sounds convincing, Lanny. It's the truth. This outfit that's putting on the party will get an honest 70% of the profits. My take is 30. See, I ain't greedy. Mm. Well, Lanny, let's set up better be as honest as it sounds. Now, what you driving at? I'll be at that party. And if there's any funny business... I play the percentages, chum. Don't you worry about me. Yeah, well, just see to it nobody monkeys with those percentages. I know my way around better than the girls who are putting on this benefit party, and I don't intend to see them cheated. I tell you, you got nothing to worry about. It's all a kind of friendly proposition. Yeah. Okay. Hope so, anyway. Well, I'll see at the party. But, uh... Just remember what I said. Oh, Mike, I'd say the party's a howling success. I can't remember when I've had so much fun. Well, that's fine, Patsy, but don't be quite so reckless with that imitation money. Michael, it isn't real money. No, but it costs real money, and it's redeemable for real money. You know, you've lost about 20 bucks worth of it already, and the evening is still young. Oh, it's all for good cause. And we really ought to be able to turn over plenty of profits. Everybody's spending scared. Yeah. yeah. I'll have to admit that Lanning knows how to run a party of this kind. He should. It's his business. Yeah. Oh, Mike, come on over here. Let's play some chuckle luck. We haven't tried that yet. Yeah, well, okay, Patsy. But there's a game where you can get rid of your money real fast. Hey, your best, folks. There's only six numbers. This is the game where you get a 50-50 break. Six numbers and three dice. And we pay even money. If Ace, Deuce, and Trey wins, the house pays what it takes off of four. Four, five, and six. Now, here's the game where the house can't win. Well, I don't see why we're running this game. You know what? We can't make any money at it. Oh, well, that's what you think, Patsy. It's got the heaviest odds in its favor of any game in the room. Michael, the man just said that we one could... of those phony $10 bills or one of the numbers, Glenn. Oh, that's half a dollar in real money, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Go on, put it down. All right, I'll play, um, six. Get your bets down, folks. Money on the line. You're already on six, ain't you, lady? Hmm? Oh, yes. I guess I'll just play five. All bets down. And now we spin the little birdcage round and round. Watch the three dice in it, folks. Where they'll stop, nobody knows. Five. Five. Six. Well, now, let's see. Five gets two $10 bills and six gets one. Here you are. See now how it works, Patty? What do you mean? Well, there were six $10 bills on the line. The house collected four of them. Well, certainly, but three numbers won. Yeah, and the house paid out two $10 bills to number five and one to number six. The house collected four. That leaves a neat $10 profit. Well, I guess you're right, but I don't see how it works. That's down, folks. Well, I think I'll play the same number. I can't lose anything this round. Another 10 on number five. All bets down. All numbers covered, and here we go. Round and round, the little birdcage goes, and where it stops, nobody knows. And we got three fives. So we pay number five three ten dollar bills. Well, you see, Patsy, this time the house takes in five bills and pays out three. Mm-hmm. I guess it is a pretty good house game after all. Well, it's the best. You know, this bird next to us is doing all right, isn't he? Yeah, this begins to look like my game. I'm going to risk a few of these hundred dollar bills on it. Well, I hope you're lucky. I most always am. Get your bets down, folks. Oh, we got a big time Monte Carlo gambler with us this round. <laughs> five hundred dollars on number five. Oh, Mike, that's really twenty five dollars, isn't it? Sure enough, Patsy. I thought you figured the screen stuff was just paper. Here we go, round and round. That keeps it spinning. And they stop at five. Five, five. The big time gambler wins fifteen hundred dollars. Here you are, mister. Thanks. Yeah, I guess this is really my lucky night. Why, well, he won $75 in real money. Oh, mister, you're certainly lucky. Well, somebody's got to win, sister. What number should I play this time? Oh, try number three. Yeah, that's a good idea. Should I put the whole 2000 on it? <laughs> well, that's an awful lot of money. Just paper. Yeah, but it's worth $100. Yeah, what's $100 between friends? I'll shoot the works. Oh, big money this time, folks. We'll get your bets down. But please, don't put any more on number three. There's too much there already. All right, now, money on the line. Oh, I'm going to put $10 on number six. Well, that's a time, lady. Hope you win. 
All numbers covered? Here we go. And they show three, three, and one. Ten bucks to number one, and oh, four thousand bucks to number three. Well, here you are, mister. I can't lose for winning. Well, guess I'll try something else. See if I'm lucky at card. All right, folks. Here's the game that really pays out the money. Bet down, but put your money on the line. Get a hunch and bet a bunch. The more you bet, the more you win. Pappy, hmm? watch that guy. Who? Oh, he? Yeah, I'll see if he gets into the blackjack game. Why? Well, I have a hunch he's going to be awfully lucky there, too. Mm, he certainly did well at chuckle luck. You don't say. Too well altogether. Michael, he mm. couldn't have been crooked. He didn't get a chance to handle the dice. They were locked up in that birdcage. Yeah, I know. I know, Patsy. They always are. But you know, something's happening here. And I'm going to find out what it is. And whatever it is, it's being worked on some mighty queer percentages. All right, come on. Let's take a look at that blackjack game. Ought to be good. Listen, pal, why don't you beat it? You've chased everybody else out of the game. Scared of me, huh? You're too lucky. Nobody else wants to play. They just want to watch you. Deal them out. I'm betting $5,000. Mister, go a little easy, can't you? That's 250 real dollars. Deal them out. Okay. Oh, and Mr. Lanning seems to be pretty mad about it, doesn't he? Yep. I don't blame you. How many cards? I'm Pat. The house pays 19. Pay me, mister. I got a 10 up and a king in the hole. I never saw such luck in my life. Hey, boy, bring some more of that house money over here, about $50,000. Looks like I'm going to need it. Patsy, it looks to me like the children's hospital girls are being taken right down the line. Oh, Michael, you're crazy. Everybody's playing like mad. The money's rolling in. Just look around. Yeah, yeah, sure. The money's rolling in and also out. And it's rolling out right now considerably faster than it's rolling in. What makes you think so? Our lucky friend makes me think so. He won 300 real dollars at the chuckalug table while we were there. Oh, yes. And he won 250 on one hand of blackjack. Well, tell me what he'd won before we got over there. My guess would be that he's won at least... Oh, a thousand dollars of real money tonight. Michael, mm. everybody can't lose all the time. You know, Patsy, your friend Lanning gave me quite a line about percentage. My hunch is that he knows his figures too doggone well. I don't see what you're getting at. Well, Lanning gets 30% of the profit, doesn't he? Well, of course he does. He has a contract. Now, 30% isn't nearly as good as 90%, is it? Anybody knows that, but he can't get 90%. Oh, I'm afraid he can't. I don't see how. How much did you expect this party to take in? Oh, Mr. Lanning told me. I don't care what Mr. Lanning told you. Now, how much did you expect to take in? Well, we thought we might make as much as $2,000. Mm-hmm. Lanning's 30% would be 600 That would leave us $1,400 to turn in, and that's a lot of money. Sure, sure. But suppose Lanning's chipping you. Oh, he can't be. That's why we use the imitation money, so we'll know exactly where we stand right to the penny. Mm. Patsy, mm-hmm? just suppose that our lucky friend is working for Lanning. I don't get it. Well, it's so simple, I don't know why I didn't think of it before. I'll admit Lanning had me fooled. Michael, you're just trying to find something wrong. I found something wrong, Patsy. I'm sure of it. Now, if one of Lanning's men can win most of the profit... We get 70% of the profit, and that's that. Yeah, but 70% of $100 is only $70. But we'll make lots more than that. Yeah, not the way Mr. Lucky's going. You know, he's getting lots bigger money than anyone else here, and he's winning consistently. You think he's working for Lanning? Oh, yes, yes, I'm sure of it. You see, Lanning and his dealers are simply turning over the profits to this guy. Which means that the final profits which are left to split with your committee are going to be mighty slim, Patsy. But Lanning gets 100% of the money that goes out to his capper. His capper? Uh, his stooge, you know, his assistant, the guy who's doing the big winning. Oh. Well, you're not going to let him get away with it, are you? Well, not if I can well, help it. stop it right now. There's oh, very many. No, 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 Patsy. Well, the capper has as much a right to be patronizing these games as anybody else. Now, we couldn't prove a thing. He'd deny he ever saw Lanning before tonight. Oh. And we couldn't prove otherwise, could we? Well, hardly. Of course, you could throw the big cheater out, couldn't you? Oh, a lot of good there to do. We've got to play our own game, not theirs. Maybe they won't play. Maybe they will, Patsy, if the percentage is in their favor. And that's the way we'll make it. That's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard of, a butcher's cleaver. That's what I said, a butcher's cleaver, and a good sharp one. Where would I get a butcher's cleaver at this time of night? Oh, you can get one, all right. Why can't you get it yourself? Because my voice doesn't have the emotional appeal for your butcher, Mr. Schultz. 
Now, if I called him at 11 o'clock at night and said, Mr. Schultz, I wish you'd go down to the market and lend me one of your sharpest cleaners, he'd think I was bad. He'd be right. Well, if he got it, he'd use it on me. But with you, honey, he'll run right down and get it. Now, will you hurry up and get going? Michael, hmm? won't you tell me why you want a cleaver? Uh, yours, not the reason why. Yours, but to do or die. Now, kid. Got a dime. You've got about $25 worth of that Monte Carlo money. Sure. But I need a real dime to make a phone call. Hello, Mr. Schultz. Oh, but I wonder if you'd call him to the phone, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Couldn't you please wake him up? It's terribly important. Thank you. Well, hello, Mr. Schultz. This is Patsy Ryan. Uh, Mr. Schultz, I-, I wonder if you'd do me a favor. Oh, I knew you would. Uh, I want to borrow one of your sharpest cleavers. Cleavers? No, I'm not mad at anybody, but I need it tonight, Mr. Schultz. Now, if you could just run down to the market and get it and send it in a taxi to me at the ballroom of the Five Oaks Hotel, I'd be so grateful. But I don't know of any other person in town I'd ask to do such a thing for me, but you've always been so nice, and I just knew you would. <laughs> Have you got it, Patsy? Yes, I've got it, but I don't understand things at all. First, you're in such a hurry to get the cleaver, and then you just have a fit when I start to walk into the party with it, and then you drag me out here to the check room. Well, I was afraid but... somebody might see it. Patsy. What do you mean somebody might see it? You mean to say you had me go to all that trouble to get this thing, and now you don't want anybody to see it? Right. You catch on mighty quick, honey. Now, we'll just leave it out here for now. You mean you want me to hide this thing? Mm-hmm. That's right. Mike, hmm? Trent, you get crazier every day. Yeah, yeah, sure. Now, you go back into the ballroom and find our lucky friend wherever he is and stand and watch him, but admiring him. Well, that'll be lots of no fun. A cheating, crooked low uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. oh. Bad words, honey, bad words. Now, act like you think he's wonderful. And then when I come in, mm-hmm. act like you think I'm terrible. And remember what I told you about the follow-up. I get it. All right, get going. I'll see you in a few minutes. Still winning, I see. Yeah. I've been lucky at everything tonight. Hey, where's the guy you was with? Oh, him. Oh? Thought you two was pretty thick. Well, we all make mistakes, don't we? Well, uh, sit down. I'm all set to win some more dough. Well, I hope you ain't as lucky as you were the other time. Lady, he cleaned this game out like it was a kindergarten marble game. <laughs> 800 bucks real dough he took. Real dough, not this imitation money. And I'm still lucky. I'll bet a thousand bucks... That's really $50, lady. $50 on one blackjack handle? This is exciting. Okay, suit yourself. How many do you want? Oh, the rain makes the trees and the flowers oh, so no. pretty. Why, why doesn't it rain on me? Hey, Polly. Hey, Polly. Hi, your friend's got quite a bun on, ain't he? He is no friend of mine. Don't know, as I blame you. Hello, beautiful. You still mad at me? Hmm? Still mad at me? I don't even know you. Oh, she's mad at me, Mr. Lanny. Patsy's mad at Mike. Can you imagine pretty little Patsy being mad at Mike? I guess I ought to get a drink on that, huh, Mrs. Lady? You want a drink, Mrs. Lady? Will you? No, no, thanks. Now, if you'll just move aside, we're playing blackjack here. Oh, blackjack. You play that with cards, huh? That's a wonderful game. It's really wonderful. You want to see a card trick? I'm a magician. I do card tricks. Hey, give me, give me that here. Huh? Hey, don't pick up those cards. You've messed up our blackjack hand. Oh, that's all right, Bob. Don't you apologize. You'll just think nothing of that. Mm-hmm. Now, you take a card, just any little old card. You at might all. as well humor him. Let him do the trick, and maybe he'll get out. All right. Okay, but I got a card. All right? What is it? Six of diamonds. Six? That's absolutely right. That's correct. Six oh, of diamonds. No. Is that a good trick? <laughs> is that it? It's a bad Scram, huh? fella. I want to play blackjack. Yeah, I'm going to show you another good trick. Here. Now we, oh, <laughs> spill a card. Look, my hand's not working so good. i got to pick up the card. Move on, guy, will you? We're busy. Oh, what's up, guy? Hey, you want to fight? All right, put him up. Go ahead. You're holding up the game. Game. Listen, I'm going to show you something better, that's better than any game, you see? Remember when I came to see you, Lanny? I told you I know a lot of stuff, didn't I? Huh? Well, I do, you see? I don't doubt it, but now you gentleman... just name any card in the deck. Any card at all. All right, the ace of hearts. Ace of hearts, he says. Everybody hear that? The ace of hearts. Now watch me cut it the first time, just like nothing. Zip. There. Well, I'll be doggone. Yeah, she's gonna be doggone. You wanna know something? 
I'm the only guy in the world that could throw that trick. There's nobody else in the whole entire world. I'm the champ, you see? I've seen that trick done before. Oh, wise guy. Hey, want to fight? Michael, wanna... will you please get out of here? You're holding up the game. Scram. Go on, beat Come it. On. I cut the cards right the first time. Tonight, mathematical odds 52 to 1, right? Yeah, sure. Now, run along. Only huh? guy in the world that could do that. I bet you... Ah, uh, oh, I bet you a million dollars nobody here can do that. Dollars. Even money. Hey, is that your real face or you wearing a mask? Now, look, get on. I'm you gonna... said somebody else could credit any card call for us first time. Put up a shut up, Zeus, Newt. Listen, do I have to take that kind of talk? Look, or... look, don't pay any attention to it. Oh, ask any of your lip learning. Now, how about a parrot beak? You want to bet? No. Oh, I get it. you got to turn your winnings over to landing, huh, Captain? I'd be careful what I said, trying to fight with uh, you. I used to kind of know the answers. I was before yesterday, you know. Talking like that ain't the way to stay healthy, uh, but... A bunch of cheap bikers, that's what you had. A whole bunch Mr. of you. Mr. Trent, leave us alone, please. Can't you see you are not wanted? Oh, not wanted. All right, I'll just leave. That's what I'll do. I'm just going to oh, leave. Oh, thank goodness. I thought we'd never get rid of him. Guy's too smart for his own good. He's always that way when he's had one too many. I'd like to teach him a good lesson. Well, he'll get taught, all right, if he keeps talking that way. No wonder somebody doesn't rob him. He goes around in that condition with a couple thousand dollars in his pocket. Yeah? Yeah, and that trick of his, cutting any card called for, he thinks is so wonderful. I wish somebody'd... Beat him with, uh, with, with the cards and, and, and beat him at his own game. That's a pretty good trick at that. Mr. Lanning, couldn't you do it? Me? No. No, it's too tough for me. I've got it. I don't know why I didn't think of it before. Of what? It's so simple. It's so beautiful. Oh, it'd work like a charm. What'd it work? A way to beat him in his own game. It's an old carnival trick with a cleaver. It's a sure thing for a smart aleck. Now, look, I'm going down to the hotel kitchen, and I'll be back in one minute. Now, you wait for me, both of you. Okay. It's the cleaver stunt. Hey, it's an old one, but sure fire for a sucker, man. Sure, I know now. Boy, it's a Lulu. There's a guy I really want to take. Yeah, well, the way he's acting, all the chumps are on our team. Look, bet him a grand. When you win, turn it over to the party fund. Yeah? Why? We can't get away with no strong arm stuff. I got it. Listen, you give Trent's money to the party committee. That way the party shows a profit and we get 30% of it. We also get the real profit and without no heat on us. <laughs> Trent pays for the party. It's a cinch. Man, that's a beaut. And we'll use the old Carney gag. <laughs> Did you say Carney or Corny or both? <laughs> <laughs> I'll uh, keep the cleaver under my wrap, how about it? Lady, I gotta hand it to you. It's bound to work. There's not a chance for a hitch. Uh, it'll teach that Trent the lesson of his oh, life. Oh, do I still love you? Hey, oh, here they are again, the big sports, the little old patsy. You think they know somebody else that can do my trick, but they won't put up any money on it. Oh, no. The reason I didn't tell you who could do your trick was because I didn't want to brag, Trent. Oh, I didn't want to brag. I right? didn't want to brag. You mean you old pelican beak, you think you can cut any card call for you? You better go home before you get lost. Go I don't think I can do it, huh, Lush? I know you can. I got $2,000 right here that say you can. I'll bet you $1,000 I can. Uh, you talking money, Carl? Money or real mint leaves? You don't look like a kind of fellow could raise that much money. Don't you worry about me. I got it right here. Well, he says he can do all my trick, but I offered him at $2,000, and he wants to spend half that much. I knew he was a spiker. Well, huh? at least he is in full possession of his faculties. Oh, his faculties. Sure, such as they are. But if I had all my brains knocked out, I'd still be smarter than he is. You're running no. a good chance of getting your brains knocked out the way you're talking, Trent. I'll talk, talk, talk. I want action. Now, I'm offering about 2000 real bucks that you can't cut any card called for on one cut. Well, that's a lot of money. What do you people think? If I were you, I'd go ahead and bet 2000 Beats the guy a real lesson. He's asking for it. it. Certainly is. Sure, sure, Capper. Ask your boss, the guy you're stooging for. He'll tell you what to you do. You better watch that lip, Trent. Oh, don't you worry about me now. Well, how about it? Is my 2000 covered or isn't it? Yeah, it's covered. Right here. All righty. I will let the little lady here hold the money, eh? Now... Now, let's have everything straight. I name a card, and you're to cut it on one card for 2000 bucks, huh? Right. Are we all set? I'm all set. Okay. Uh, lady, give me the cleaver. Here you are. Cleaver? <laughs> cleaver, what's going on here? You'll find out, wise guy. I bet that I could cut any card you'd name in one cut, and I'm going to do it. Name your card, smart boy. Okay, uh, 
Seven of spades. All right, seven of spades. I better score up the deck first. Ready? No. Mighty nice cutting, mister. Well, what's this all about? Looks like you got trimmed, Trent. He cut right through the whole deck with one blow of that butcher's cleaver. Cut every card right in half. Do you see? He cut your card with one cut. Oh, no. Oh, no, not the seven of spades. Huh? You didn't cut the seven of spades. I knew you couldn't. You want to know why? Why? Because here is the seven of spades from that deck right here. Look oh. it over, Capper. I palmed it off the deck and put it in my pocket. Hey, just a minute. He's right, Lonnie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no seven of spades in this deck? Oh, you're getting smarter, Capper, but it looks like I win. So, if you don't mind, I'll just take my All right, hold on, Trent. Not so fast. This is a frame. You and the girl were working together. The whole idea of this bet was hers. She got the cleaver. Why, Mr. Lennon? Don't try to act so innocent. You framed us. Us? Well, so now you're willing to admit that this fellow's working for I'm not admitting anything, but anyway, bets are all off. This was a frame-up. Certainly it was a frame-up, but all bets are not off. You and your stooge thought you were framing me. Instead, I did it to you, so you lose. Why, I'll... You'll do what? You don't dare cause any trouble here in front of all these people. Hey, Lanny. Part of that's my own money. 800 bucks of it. You told me to bet the whole 2,000. You're going to have to make it up to me. You idiot. Why, Mr. Lanning, is that any way to talk to a faithful employee? He won't be working for me any longer. I can guarantee that. You bet he won't. And since the evening is still young, this party might wind up making a pretty good profit. You are, Patsy. I'll contribute this $2,000 to the fund right now. Michael, you're wonderful. Oh, don't mention it, Patsy. After all, it didn't cost me much. It'll cost you plenty before I get through with you, Trent. Don't think I'll let you get away with it. Lanning... You're not going to cause trouble for anyone. I'm making a full report on this so-called benefit to the proper authorities. And they'll see to it that this is the last benefit you ever promote. No more easy money, Lanning. From now on, you'll make it the honest way. And for you, that'll really be hard. And now, a last word from the famous magician turned rackets detective, Mike Trent. Thank you. When you contribute money to charity, be sure your money is going to the proper place. In recent years, too many unscrupulous promoters have used a good cause as a front. And the benefits these promoters have staged have benefited nobody but themselves. Be sure to be with us next Sunday at this time for another story of the fleeces and the fleeced. Same time, same station. And now this is Mike Trent signing off with the thought that when a gambler offers odds that are in your favor, there's something odd besides the odds. Remember, there's no such thing as easy money. Just heard another program in NBC's new series, Easy Money, transcribed to expose the inside secrets of gamblers, racketeers, and conmen. Next week, be sure to hear Mike Trent's expose of another Easy Money racket. Featured in tonight's cast were Larry Haynes as Mike Trent, Joan Allison, Jim Stevens, Alan Bergman, and Kenny Delmar. Easy Money is produced and directed by Blair Wallace in association with Anderson and Anderson. Script by George B. Anderson. This has been an NBC Radio Network production, Lionel Rico speaking. A few things more exciting to a child than to gather in a small group to watch those gallant firemen struggle with heavy hoses to put out a fire in a burning house. The children see only their heroes fighting fire with water. An adult who had stopped to watch would probably notice other things. The members of the family throwing household possessions out the window. The terrified and confused faces of the children who live in that house. A dog or a cat clawing frantically at a door or window in an effort to escape the heat and smoke and the distress on the faces of the owners of the house. Now, don't let this happen in your home. Check regularly on the following points of fire prevention. Don't smoke in bed. Dispose of all old newspapers and rags. Have a licensed electrician repair defective electrical equipment and wiring. Keep matches away from children. Use a cleaning fluid that won't burn. Remember, don't gamble with fire. The odds are against you.
your favorite couple, Fibber McGee and Molly, tonight on the NBC Radio Network. Hello there, this is Basil Rathbone. I'm so glad you can be with Fatima and me tonight. She helps me solve an uncanny tale that began when a poisoned drink was poured and reached its climax when a dead man came to life. The Tales of Fatima, a new series of exciting mystery stories starring that distinguished actor, Mr. Basil Rathbone. for tonight, Gail Ingram has written an astonishing mystery especially for me. I didn't know the solution until I recalled the words of Fatima. In the words of Fatima, habit is law. We are all of us slaves to a habit. Those words are the key to tonight's tale of Fatima. And here it is. A much expected murder. The evening performance is over, and Basil Rathbone is in his dressing room with Lavender, the wardrobe mistress. Oh, Lavender, I'm glad it's time to go home. I'm tired. It's a nasty night out, Mr. Rathbone. A wonderful night out to be in bed. Thank goodness nobody wants me to solve any cases. Oh. Come in. Yes, sir, what can I do for you? You can drop the case. Drop the case? Or I'll have to drop you. With this gun. Mr. Rathbone, I think he means it. Believe me, I do. Will you drop the case? I'd be enchanted, old fellow, but except that I, I haven't a case to drop, and I'd, I'd much prefer not being killed for something I'm not doing. Mr. Rathbone, you're a very fine actor, but don't play dumb with me. I give you fair warning. Pursue this investigation further, and you'll be killed. But, but what's the investigation he's supposed not to pursue? Uh, never mind, Lavender. It's no use. What's no use? We can't fool this gentleman. I'll drop the case. Huh? Now you're being smart, Mr. Rathbone. Just leave Mrs. Dawson alone. Mrs. Dawson? Yes, Lavender, Mrs. Dawson. You remember Mrs. Dawson? Oh, Mrs. Dawson. Just remember, don't try to help Mrs. Dawson. Good night. Mr. Rathbone, have you been holding out on me? Who's Mrs. Dawson? Lavender, I haven't the faintest idea. Hello? Hello, Mr. Rathbone. This is Mrs. Dawson. Who? Mrs. Dawson. This is Mr. Rathbone, isn't it? I, uh, I, I think so. Mr. Rathbone, I'm in terrible trouble, and I thought maybe you'd help me. Uh, help you in what way? Well, I can't tell you over the phone, but I live on Upper Lake Road. Could you come out and see me right away, please? It's a matter of life and death. So I understand. My life or death. Oh, no, there's no danger. But if you come, you may be able to keep someone from dying. I, I see. Well, in that case, I can hardly refuse, can I? Oh, thank you, Mr. Rathbone. I'll leave immediately. Mr. Rathbone, all these woods. Are we still in New York City? The outskirts, yes. That must be Dawson's house there. And sakes, what a terrible night. All this rain and thunder. Well, should we go? I suppose we have to. Mr. Rathbone. Yes? I'm scared. Then go back to the car. I will not. Ring the doorbell. I'm just going to. I... Mr. Rathbone, the door's opening. You are strangers. Uh, why, yes, uh, but strangers we... Strangers aren't welcome here. Uh, but we were invited. Better leave now. But Mrs. Dawson said... While that... you're still alive. Mr. Rathbone. Bad things happen in this house. It's an evil house. People die in this house. Miss Marjorie? Miss Marjorie, who's there? Oh, Mr. Rathbone. Uh, yes. I'm Mrs. Dawson. Please, come in out of the rain. Miss Marjorie, go to your room. What? Go to your room. It's dangerous for strangers to come in. People die in this house. I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Rathbone. Miss Marjorie, she's my husband's sister. 
is a little peculiar. A little? Uh, she... uh, Lavender, um, is Miss Marjorie what you wanted to see me about, Mrs. Dawson? No. It's my husband. Mr. Rathbone, he's dying of a very peculiar disease. Oh, you have my deepest sympathy, Mrs. Dawson, but why call on me? Why not a doctor? We have a doctor, but he doesn't seem to know what the trouble is. Nobody but you can help Mr. Rathbone. What do you mean? There's something strange happening. My husband is keeping something from me, some sort of a secret. And I have a feeling that if I knew that secret, I'd be able to save his life. But my... Don't you see, I can't call the police. He wouldn't tell a policeman his secret. But you're different. You can persuade him. Appeal to him. My dear lady, Won't you... Won't you try to find out his secret? Please. Well, I'd I'd like to help you, Oh, thank you so much. He's right in this room here. Uh, uh, Just a minute, Mrs. Dawson. What is it? Don't go in there. Why not? Because if your husband's keeping some secret from you, I think it might be better for me to talk to him alone. But, Mr. Dawson, if this doctor doesn't know what's wrong with you, why not call in another doctor, a specialist? I tell you, it's no use, Mr. Rathbone. But why not? And, and what's the secret you're keeping from your wife? There's no secret. She says there is. She's afraid it may cost you your life. It will cost my life. But there's no secret. What, what do you mean? I, I'm not dying of any rare malady, Mr. Rathbone. I'm dying of... of poison. What? I've been eating poison food for some time now. I... I didn't realize it until two days ago. But then it it was too late. The job was done. But I don't understand. Who is poisoning you? My wife. Oh, now, Mr. Dawson. And it's not the first time she's done it either. She poisoned her first husband, too. And got away with it? Yes. But that's impossible. No. No, it's not. She got away with murder the first time because she knew a brilliant young chemist who concocted a slow-acting poison that left no traces whatsoever. Oh, good heavens. The chemist was crazy about her. He showed her how to administer the poison, and it gradually snuffed out her husband's, that is, her first husband's life, just as it's snuffing out mine. But I don't understand, Mr. Dawson. How can you know all this? How can you be sure it was murder? This poison you talk about left no trace. Surely your wife didn't tell you about her first husband and the chemist? She didn't have to, Mr. Rathbone. Well, why not? I was the chemist. That's the story, Lavender. So we'd better get in touch with Harold fast. Where'd you leave the car? so dark, I can't hardly make out a thing. Here it is. Hop in quickly. Just a minute, Mr. Rathbone. Who's there? We've met before. It's the man who came to your dressing room tonight with a gun. Right you are, and I've still got the gun. I believe I told you to keep your nose out of this, Rathbone. Yes, I believe you did. I meant it. Now, unless you're anxious to be killed. Oh, I'm not. I, I'm I'm only anxious to... Get that gun away from you. No, you don't. Stop no. it, Mr. Rathbone. Get him, boy, Mr. Rathbone. Mr. Rathbone, what are you running away for? Oh, no, he isn't, Lavender. I am. Rathbone, why is it that you always have to come up with these fascinating problems at three o'clock in the morning? Oh, don't be unreasonable, fellow. Just suggesting that the body of Mrs. Dawson's first husband should be disinterred for examination. And that Mrs. Dawson be arrested for murder. Uh, Now, look, you two. I'll be glad to arrest Mrs. Dawson. I'll be glad to disinter her first husband. But first, I need one small bit of information. I've got to know who her first husband was. For pity's sake, I clean forgot that. Well, I didn't. The boys are checking now. They have... Yes, Sergeant? On that uh, Mrs. Dawson lieutenant about her first husband? Yes? She didn't have one. She was never married before. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Rathbone. Good morning, Miss Lavender. Good morning. Mrs. Dawson, I owe you an apology. Oh? When I left here last night, I believed you had poisoned your first husband. What? That's what Mr. Dawson told us. I realize now that 
Mr. Dawson was in a very weakened condition when he spoke to us last night. Seems like his mind's been affected by his illness. He told us a totally imaginary story. But maybe if we face him with it, he'll tell us the truth now. May we talk to him again, please, Mrs. Dawson? I'm afraid not, Mr. Rathbone. You see, Mr. Dawson died during the night. We'll be back in just a moment for the second act of tonight's tale of Fatima. Now, back to tonight's tale of Fatima, a much-expected murder, starring Mr. Basil Rathbone. Mr. Dawson died. Good heavens. I'm terribly sorry, Mrs. Dawson. It's an awful shock, Mr. Rathbone. Of course, I knew he was ill, but... Well, it, it's always a shock. Does the doctor have any idea yet of what Mr. Dawson's illness really was? He gave the cause of death as a heart attack. Heart attack? I thought it was a very strange diagnosis. I don't know what to make of it, but that's what the doctor said. Could the doctor have deliberately made out an inaccurate death certificate for some reason? Oh, no, that's not possible. I've known Dr. Rand for years. He's an old bull, my a close family friend. As a matter of fact, he's here right now. He's good enough to stay on to take over for me and pretend the terrible details. Let's see, yes. Well, I'd like very much to talk to him, if you don't mind. Not at all. He's right across the hall. In the study? Thank you. Come along, Lavender. Excuse us, Mrs. Dawson. This must be the study here. Dr. Rand? Yes. What do you want? Uh, my name is Beth. Good heavens. Great day in the morning. It's the man who pulled a gun on us. What are you two doing here? I told you to keep away from this house. I know you did, Doctor. But I'm very nosy by nature. Yes, and mercy is swollen, too, after that wallop you stopped last night. You'd better clear out, Rathbone, or you'll stop another one. I don't think so. Fortunately, I spot Alexander Graham Bell's gift to unarmed detectives. A telephone on the desk. I think I'll just pick it up and call Lieutenant Farrell of homicide. Put down that phone. Certainly. After I tell you, Lieutenant Farrell, to arrest you for the murder of Mr. Dawson, I Will you put down that phone? My dear chap. Do you want to spoil everything? I don't want to spoil anything. Dawson is dead. Listen to me, you stubborn fool. Dawson isn't dead at all. Would you... Say that again, please. Dawson isn't dead at all. Now put down that phone before you ruin everything. Lavender, call a doctor. I think I'm going mad. I guess I have no other choice but to explain the whole plan to you now. I would be everlastingly grateful if you would. It started about two weeks ago. Dawson called me in and told me in strict confidence that he believed he was being poisoned. No, he told me that, too. By his wife to some rare exotic poison he invented. Oh, no, 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 not that. That was just a wild tale we made up to get you out of the house last night so he could pretend to die undisturbed. He's right in the next room. I have him waiting there. A hearse should be along shortly, and we'll smuggle him out of the house that way. Oh, how ingenious. Uh, through this door here? Uh, yeah. Ah, here we are. Mr. Dawson? Uh, Mr. Dawson? Oh, the poor man's fallen asleep. The strain of dying must have been too much for him. Yes, I guess so. Uh, Mr. Dawson? Wake up! Wake up, I... What's the matter? Lavender, I've got to call Farrell. Call Farrell? Yes. Mr. Dawson is really dead this time. Look, his throat's been cut. Farrell talking. Uh, Lieutenant, this is Rathbone. No. Yes. Look, Farrell, I've just... Ah, don't tell me. Let me guess. You've just come across a body. Lieutenant, you have now answered the first question correctly. Now, if you'll come out to the Dawson house on the Upper Lake Road, I'll let you have a try at the jackpot question. What's that? Who done it? That all will be over right away, Lavender. Oh, good. I told the doctor to keep quiet about the whole thing, like you told me to. Uh, did you also tell him to watch the front door so that no one would get out, like I told you to? Yes. Yeah. And we can see the back door from here. We can also see the corpse from here. I see, I prefer not to share such, such close quarters with him. Keeps uh, looking at me. It's this half light. I just... <gasps> What's the matter, Lavender? It's Rathbone. The door over there is opening. Get down. Down there. Behind this desk. Mercy, who do you... Look. It's Miss Marjorie. Dead man's sister. She's got a gun. Lavender, she's mad. 
Capricci and utterly mad. She's going to shoot the dead man. Miss Marjorie, no, don't! Man's sake, she shot him through the head. So I did. I shot him through the head. Miss Marjorie, you meant that gun? Of course. Here. Now, if you'll just explain. There's nothing to explain. I confess to everything. I shot him because he was no good. He deserved to die. But why? What have you got against your brother? My brother? My brother's dead already. Did I shoot my brother? Of course you did. It's the light. I couldn't see in the light. I thought I shot the other one. The one who killed my brother. Who? Who killed your brother? Why, that bad, bad man, of course. Dr. Rand. Now, see here, Sergeant Farrell. It's Lieutenant. Lieutenant Farrell, please. Well, see here, Lieutenant. This entire questioning is an insult. Who's being insulting? You called me a sergeant. And you called me a murderer. Miss Marjorie called you that also, Dr. Rand. Mr. Rathbun, I said it before, I will say it once again. Miss Marjorie is mentally incompetent. How can you for one moment believe that I killed Dawson just because she says so? Now, uh, Dr. Rand, listen. Probably the person who cut Dawson's throat is the same one who was trying to poison him. So we're looking for the poisoner. You've been looking for the poisoner. Let's work together. Oh, very well, if you put it that way. You and the sergeant here. The lieutenant. Lieutenant Dennis are for Robert Farrell. And remember it. Now, who killed Dawson? Candidate number one, Miss Marjorie. Who may not be as unbalanced as she seems. You mean maybe that phony shooting was just a red herring? Exactly. A clever hoax to throw us off guard. But if so, what's the motive? Does Miss Marjorie stand to gain anything by Dawson's death, Doctor? She stands to gain considerable. Dawson was well-to-do. He left his estate half to Miss Marjorie and half to his wife. Mm. Uh, what about Mrs. Dawson? Does she have a motive for murder? No, she's innocent. Absolutely innocent. She didn't do it. And how do you know she didn't? Because she just didn't. She's a wonderful woman. A fine, gentle woman. She couldn't possibly commit a murder, and I refuse to allow you to consider it. You refuse to allow me to consider it? What right have you got to refuse to allow me to consider something? I'll consider anything I want to. And, uh... What I'm considering right now is that you're making a lot of noise about the innocent Mrs. Dawson. Too much noise. Why are you protecting her? I'm not protecting her, but I say she's innocent. And I say I'm not <coughs> sure. What was that? Mr. Rathbone, help! It's Lavender. Come on, Farrell. Let's go. We'll give me that hat. No, no. You give me that go. Lavender. Lavender, what is it? Help me, Mr. Rathbone. Grab her. She's trying to get away. Mr. Rathbone, take this maniac away from Mrs. me. Mrs. Dawson, uh, Miss Lavender, what's going on here? I caught this woman trying to make a getaway. You did? How about that, Mrs. Dawson? Oh, heavens, the vaguest idea what she's babbling about. She says, dear lady, she caught you trying to sneak out of the house. With this bundle under her arm. What's in the bundle? I don't know. I found it in the upstairs hall. I thought it might be important, so I was bringing it to you. I'm bringing it to you. Mercy sakes, she was headed for the front door. I, I thought Mr. Rathbone was in the front room. Poppycock. It's not poppycock. Ladies, ladies, save the cat fight. Oh, what's in this bundle? Let's open it and find out. All right. Here. Thank you. I... Good Lord. Well, 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 well. The murder knife. Oh, take it away. A pair of blood-stained gloves. Turned inside out. What a careless way to leave gloves. Whose gloves are these, Mrs. Dawson? I can't look. I'm sorry, but you'll have to. This is important. Whose gloves are they? <gasps> Why, the... the... Come on, tell us. They're my sister-in-law. They're Miss Marjorie. <laughs> Lieutenant Farrow. Huh? Oh, oh, good, Sergeant. Got Miss Marjorie there? Well, uh, no, sir. Well, well, why not? I told you to bring her in for questioning. Well, I know you did, sir, and I tried to find her, but she's not in the house. Then look outside the house. I did that too, sir, but she's not there either. She's not anywhere. She's just plain gone. <laughs> Rathbone, what are you up to now? I'm looking for Miss Marjorie, Lavender. Up here on the top floor? Anywhere. Mm -hmm. Farrell and his men are combing the grounds outside, and I promised him 
that I do a little combing inside. You've searched the place from cellar to garret. But I haven't searched the garret. Come on. Mm, all right, but I don't approve. Every time you look for a murderer, you land up to your ears in hot water. Oh, don't worry, Lavender. The grounds are swarming with policemen. We couldn't be safer. Hop up these attic stairs here. Do you call that an attic? Mm, it does look a bit like a tomb, doesn't it? Come along, but watch yourself. The steps are treacherous. All right, I... What's the matter? Oh, walked into a cobweb. Here we are. Where are we? Top of the flight. Well, nobody here. Let's go back down. Oh, oh, Lavender, really? Well, mercy, Miss Marjorie may be crazy, but I'll bet she has sense enough not to hide in a gloomy cave like this. You know, I bet Miss Marjorie has quite a bit of sense, Lavender. After all, mentally unsound people are usually the craftiest of all killers. That's why I'm a little puzzled about one thing. What? That bundle we found with a knife and gloves in it. There's something out of character there. Doesn't seem possible that she would just leave it. Oh, good heavens. Of course. Of course. In the words of Fatima, habit is law. We are all of us slaves to a habit. Why didn't I think of that before? Habit. What? Lavender. Got the answer now. I know who the murderer is. You do? Well, mercy <laughs> sake. Shh. What? I heard something. Someone's coming. Lavender. It's the murderer. The murderer's here in the attic. With us. We'll be back in just a moment with the exciting conclusion of tonight's Tale of Fatima. Now, back to Mr. Basil Rathbone for the exciting conclusion of tonight's Tale of Fatima. Lavender, it's the murderer. The murderer is here in the attic with us. Oh, Mr. Rathbone, we'll be killed. That crazy woman will just shoot us on the spot. She... Someone's turned on the lights. I did, Mr. Rathbone. Dr. Rand. <laughs> what are you two doing, crouching here in the dark? We were waiting to be killed. I mean, well, if you're the murderer, why aren't you carrying a gun? Because I'm not the murderer. Miss Marjorie's downstairs. They just found her, and Lieutenant Farrell is questioning her now. I'm delighted to hear that, Dr. Rand. Have they found Miss Marjorie? No. That you are not carrying a gun. Why does that delight you? Because then I feel perfectly free to say that despite your act of innocence, it's you and not Miss Marjorie who is the murderer. Oh, now, Mr. Rathbone, really? You killed Dawson and I can prove it. And just how can you prove it? You try to make it look as though Miss Marjorie had murdered Dawson by using her gloves for the killing. But a little thing called habit tripped you up. What are you talking about, Mr. Rathbone? Those bloodstained gloves we found were turned inside out. A woman removes her gloves by pulling them loose from the fingertips. But a doctor, a surgeon, peels them off inside out, particularly after he's completed an operation. An operation like slitting a throat. Oh, nonsense. You can't accuse a man of murder on flimsy evidence like that. There's other evidence. For example, Doctor, you were the only one who knew Dawson's first death was a trick. No one but you would have bothered to slit his throat. All the others believed him dead already. What about the person who was poisoning him? Ah, you gave yourself away there to Doctor. When you learned Dawson was being poisoned, you should have reported it to the police. Why didn't he? Because he was the poisoner. When Dawson realized he was being poisoned, our friend here pretended it was someone else in the house. But, but why did he cook up that phony death business? That was very clever of him, Lavender. With everybody thinking Dawson was dead, the Doctor could kill him at leisure. Only we walked in. Not exactly. Our presence here forced his hand, so he pulled that very hasty job with the knife and that... A very clumsy attempt to throw suspicion on Miss Marjorie. How about that, Doctor? Am I right? You're a meddling fool. I beg your pardon? I loved her. I've always loved her. Mrs. Dawson? I wanted to marry her, but Dawson wouldn't give her a divorce, and she wouldn't leave him, so I killed him. And I won't let you spoil it. I'll kill you! I'll kill you! I'll kill you! He's not carrying a gun this time. Remember what happened last time, remember? No! Mr. Rathbone, you did it. You knocked him out this time. So I did. But you know, Lavender, I could have knocked Dr. Rand out the first time if I hadn't been prevented. What prevented you? Dr. Rand. Join us.
us again next week when we'll have another exciting tale of Fatima. Right, Mr. Rathbone? Yes, indeed. Fatima helps this hour with an amazing tale that started on a darkened street with a chase and reached its climax in a darkened room with a shot. everyone. Good night. The Tales of Fatima stars Mr. Basil Rathbone with original music by Jack Miller. Agnes Young was Lavender and Lieutenant Farrell was played by Francis DeSales. The entire production is under the direction of Harry Ingram. Michael Fitzmaurice speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Hello there, this is Basil Rathbone. I'm so glad you can be with Fatima and me tonight. She helps me solve a surprising mystery that had in it several sounds of music. And several sounds of murder. Tales of Fatima, a new series of exciting mystery stories starring that distinguished actor, Mr. Basil Rathbone. Our author for tonight, Gail Ingram, has written a startling tale especially for me. I didn't know the solution until I recalled the words of Fatima. Now, if you listen well to those words, you may solve the mystery before I do. Time is the essence. A fact misplaced in time conceals the truth. Those words are the key to tonight's tale of Fatima. And here it is. Time to kill. The Saturday night performance is over, and Basil Rathbone is leaving the theater accompanied by Oliver, his chauffeur. Got my bags, Oliver. Yes, Mr. Rathbone. I got your bags. And did you tell the stage manager I've been Westchester over the weekend? Yes, boss. Well, after the weekend, Mr. Rathbone. That's right, Bert. See you Monday. Oh, don't rush. Stay for a month, if you like. Uh, the show would close in three days. Oliver. Well, it would. But people come to see us, Basil Rathbone, not as understood. Oliver. Bert Randall here is a very fine actor indeed. Well, I like you better. <laughs> Frankly, Oliver, so do I. <laughs> Cheerio, Mr. Redford. Cheerio, dear boy. Oh, beautiful night for a drive to Westchester. Hey, somebody's shooting. And they're shooting at me. That one came close. Quick, Oliver, into the car. It seems we've made our getaway, Oliver. Now I want to phone Lieutenant Farrell and report this outrage. Basil. Oliver, is your voice changing? It's me, Basil, darling. It was. There's a dame in the back seat. <laughs> Why don't you get in the back seat too, Basil, honey? Uh, that's an enchanting invitation, I'm sure, but I make it a practice never to get into back seats with strange ladies. But I'm Bunny. Bunny? Oh, now, Basil, sweetie, please stop teasing. After those thrilling letters you've been sending to me all spring. Now, just a moment. Letters I've been sending you? Of course. To Chattanooga. Ch uh, my dear young lady, Bunny. I... Bunny. The name is Bunny. You can't do this to me, Basil. I've run away from home on account of those letters you wrote me. I've left my husband. Good heavens. Oliver, stop the car. Now, look here, madam. I never saw you before. I never wrote to you. It's all a fantastic mistake. I suppose you just hop out of the car and run along back to your husband. There's a good girl. All right, Basil. All right, sir, but you got no call to treat me like this. You got no call at all, and I won't let you get away with it. 
I'm warning you, you'll be sorry. You'll be the sorry. So that's why I phoned you, Farrell. It's been quite an eventful evening. First I got shot at, and then I got involved with a strange blonde. Look, Rathbone, the blonde is your problem. Oh, thanks awfully. I'm only interested in the shooting. Well, the gunman's a very poor shot, thank goodness. About five bullets, and they all missed me. Well, that's pretty bad marksmanship. I mean, any idea who might have done it? Of course not. Why should someone want to kill me? Maybe they saw your show. Uh, look, I'll investigate this thing. Meanwhile, uh, are you still going away for the weekend? Well, I don't know now. Oh, uh, you go ahead. When people start shooting at you, I always say there's no better time to get out of town. You may have a point there. All right, Carol, I'm on my way. If you want me, I'll be up in Westchester at the Wayside. Uh, the what? The Wayside. It's a small hotel. <laughs> Say, boss, this is a real nice hotel you made reservations for at. Hey, you want I should register? Uh, no, thanks, Oliver. I'll do it myself. Oh, uh, can I help you, sir? Yes, please. My name is Basil Rathbone. I have a reservation. Oh, Mr. Rathbone, of course. Uh, would you mind stepping into that telephone booth over there? Well, I did have a larger suite in mind. Uh, there's a long-distance call for you. New York. I'll have them switch it right over. Oh, yeah, thank you. Hello? Mr. Rathbone? Yes? Mr. Rathbone, you've got to come back to New York right away. You're the only person who could help me. I am? Yes. I'm at the Grace Hotel, room 714. Hurry, please, while there's still time. Time for what? To save me. I, I've been threatened, Mr. Rathbone. I'm going to be killed, and I... Oh, no. No what? He's, he's here, Mr. Rathbone. He... No. No, please, I... No, no, no. no. Ah! Hello. Hello, what's happening there? It's already happened, Rathbone. Good night. Hello. 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 New York Police Headquarters. Quick, send an officer to Grace Hotel, room 714. Someone has just been murdered. Come on, Oliver. We're going back to New York right away. On the car radio, will you, Oliver? There might be some news of the murder by now. Oh, sure. Uh, it's a terrible thing, that murder. A terrible thing. Ah, oh, music. You want I should look for a news plug? No, no, leave the music, Oliver. It's good to hear. Makes you forget bloodshed and murder. Hey, what happened? Ladies and gentlemen, an important announcement. What's this, Oliver? Basil Rathbone, noted stage motion picture and radio star, has just been discovered brutally murdered. We continue now with our regular program. I... Oh, I, I just can't believe it, Sergeant. Rathbone dead. Yep, head bashed in with an iron pipe. I'm glad they took the body away before I saw it. Tell me, was he badly mangled? Face smashed beyond recognition. But beyond recognition? Well, then how do you know it was Rathbone? Well, like I told you, Lieutenant, the hotel room was registered in his name. I found letters in the dead guy's pocket addressed to Basil Rathbone. Oh, I just can't believe it. Rathbone gone. Somehow I... Kind of expect him to walk in and say, Hello, Farrell, need some help? And... Hello, Farrell, need some help? Rathbone, what are you doing here? I'm curious about my murder. Uh, where am I stretched out? In the next room? No, oh, they took you to the morgue. I mean, well, I didn't think you were killed. Did you rent this room? Of course not. Well, it's registered in your name. The dead guy was evidently pretending to be Basil Rathbone. But why? I... Uh, wait a minute, hold it. Yes? Who is this? Farrell, homicide. Who is this? My name is Mrs. Lionel Kroll, and I... Oh, did you say homicide? That's right. Then you've got to believe me. My husband didn't kill Mr. Rathbone. He didn't? No, please, you've got to believe me. My husband hardly knew Mr. Rathbone. He couldn't possibly have killed him. Please remember that. Goodbye. 
What is that all about? The woman says her husband didn't kill you. Oh, how interesting. Why don't we ask her husband? His opinion. Good idea. She said she was Mrs. Lionel Crawl. I'll have Cole picked up right away. Oh, Lieutenant Farrell, a call just came through from headquarters. Well, uh, hold that a minute, Sergeant. I want to send out a general alarm for a man by the name of Lionel Crawl. Well, I don't think that'll be necessary, sir. Oh, and just why don't you think that'll be necessary, sir? Because they've just identified the dead man. His name is Lionel Crawl. <laughs> This girl's apartment must be at the top of this front, Daryl. Yeah. You know, this is really the kind of a job I hate, Rathbone. Telling a woman her husband's been murdered. I know. By the way, uh, have you sent out a denial of my death yet? After all, someone might just care. Well, now, relax, relax. The early morning papers probably have the right story by now. Good. Well, ring the bell. Sure, but I don't... Now, look, this is more up your alley. You tell Mrs. Crow. Yes. Uh, oh, go ahead, Rathbone. Rathbone? Did you say Rathbone? Yes, I'm Basil Rathbone, Mrs. Crowe. You I... killed him. What? You killed my husband. Now, wait a minute, my dear lady. They just called me and told me it's my husband that's dead. And you killed him. Oh, now, look here. Why, I, I didn't even know your husband. How can you stand there and say you didn't know Lionel Crowe? Because I didn't know the... Oh, was... Was he the Lionel Crowe who ran a correspondence course in dramatic art? Of course. Dramatic art? Hey, Rathbone, those letters addressed to you, the ones in Crowe's pocket, they were about a dramatic course. I remember now that Lionel Crowe once came to ask me to endorse a course in dramatic art he was preparing, and I refused. That's the only time I ever met him. The but... only time? You had a date with him tonight. Tonight? You called my husband and told him to meet you at the Grace Hotel tonight. You said he... What's the matter? Look. Behind you. It's a hand. A hand? Yes. Poking over the banister of the stairs. Rathbone duck. The hand's pointing a gun at you. Get down. <laughs> hey, Miss B. It's that bad marksman practicing again. You stay here, Rathbone. I'm going after that guy. Mr. Rathbone, what is it? What's happening? I'm sure, Mrs. Crowe. In fact, I'm only sure of one thing. What? I hope somebody catches that gunman before practice makes perfect. <laughs> We'll be back in just a moment with the second act of tonight's Tale of Fatima. Now back to tonight's Tale of Fatima, Time to Kill, starring Mr. Basil Rathbone. What are you doing out here in the street? I'm trying to find the gentleman who took those punch shots at me. Well, don't. You just stay out of sight. Finding that guy is my business. Well, how's business? Rotten. If I could just figure out why someone is trying to kill me. And while you're at it, figure out why Crow was pretending to be you. Maybe the answer to that lies in a closer investigation of Mr. Crow's affairs. How do you mean? Well, that correspondence course in dramatics he was connected with. I'd like to look into that. Well, I suppose we could check his office. Then suppose we do. Here's the office, Rathbone. Lionel Crawl, dramatic instruction. Now, look. The lock on the door has been broken. Open the door. Right. Look. There's a light on in the inner office. Come on. Now. Oh. All right, sister, come out from behind that desk. Well, I, I, I... Good heavens. It's Bunny. It's who? Bunny. The woman who was hiding in my car. All right, Bunny. What's the rest of your name and what are you doing here? Durkin, letters. What? My name is Durkin and I'm here to get those letters I wrote you, Mr. Rathbone. I mean that I thought I wrote you. And what makes you think you'll find your letters here in Kroll's office? Well, I just read in the early morning papers that it wasn't you that was killed, but Mr. Kroll. So I figured out that Mr. Kroll must have been pretending to be you. What's that got to do with the letters? Well, don't you see? I found them here in Mr. Kroll's desk. I must have been writing to him, not you. But I thought it was you. I addressed the letters to Basil Rathbone at a post office box number in New York, and you answered them. 
I mean, I guess Mr. Crowell answered them in your name. Just like he taught the dramatic course in your name. Oh, no, no, just a minute. Let's start at the beginning. What dramatic course? Why, the most expensive dramatic correspondence course in America. It cost a lot because the mimeograph lessons were sent straight from Basil Rathbone himself. How interesting. And if a student had a special question, she could get it answered personally by Basil Rathbone. Oh, you don't say. For more money. And then I took a special postgraduate course, and that cost even more money. Hmm. This Kroll chap seems to have made more money out of Basil Rathbone than I have. That's how I got to writing kind of uh, personal letters to Basil Rathbone. And now I've just got to get those letters back. If they came out in this murder investigation so my husband knew about them, why, well, I declare he'd just kill little old me. What we want to know is, who killed little old Kroll? You know? Me? Why, Mr. Rathbone, you're just teasing me, aren't you? Sure, sure. Come on down to headquarters and he'll tease you some more. Meanwhile, I'm booking you as a material witness in the murder of Lionel Kroll. <laughs> Said, go away. Oh, blast. Hello. Oh, Mr. Rathbone, this is Bert Randall. I'm sorry to have to call you this early in the morning. Early? It's the crack of dawn. Well, not really. Yes, really. I just heard it crack. Yes, but, Mr. Rathbone, this is important. What is? Well, I just came over here to the theater to get some clothes in my dressing room, and I, I saw a man sneak out of your dressing room. After that shooting episode, I thought I'd better tell you. You think he's the man who did the shooting? I don't know. He looked dangerous. I thought you might like to investigate. I never like to investigate men who look dangerous, but I think I'd better. I'll be right over. Anyone here? Hello? Hello. Who... Who are you? Can't you guess? I guess you were the gentleman who's been using me for target practice. You guess right. And I still got my gun. By the way, I've never been much good at long range, but I'm mighty good close up. And I'm close up now. Uh, well, look here. Uh, why are you trying to kill me? I mean, I don't even know who you are. My name's Sam Durkin. Durkin? Oh, you're Bunny's husband. By the time you realize Bunny had a husband, Bunny doesn't know it, but I saw those love letters you wrote her. You trifled with her affections. And where I come from, that's reason enough to kill a man. And that's what I'm going to do. Now. Now, Mr. Durkin. Stand still, Rathbone. But you see, that's what I'm trying to tell you. I'm not Rathbone. What do you mean? Well, didn't you hear the radio? Basil Rathbone's dead. He was brutally murdered. Well, then, then who are you? Me? Oh, I, uh, I'm his understudy. You look like Rathbone. Yes. People have awful com often commented on how much I look like Basil Rathbone. They say the resemblance is uncanny. But you, you say Rathbone's dead? That's right. That's right. He, he, he's lying in the funeral parlor right now. Terrible thing. Great loss to the theater. It's no loss to anyone. He trifled with my wife. Oh, I can't believe that of Basil. He wasn't that type of chap at all. You're his understudy? That's right. Uh, you're his understudy? Guess I got no call to kill you. No call at all. Well, then. Sorry. Oh, that's quite all right, old man. Now, if you'll just excuse me. I didn't me. see anyone upstairs, but I... Good heavens, that's the man, Mr. Rathbone. Oh, you stupid bonehead. Oh, so you are Basil Rathbone. Yes, he's Basil Rathbone. Who are you? I'm Mr. Rathbone's understudy. Who are you? I'm the man who's going to shoot Mr. Rathbone right now. Oh, no, you don't. Yeah. I've got him, Bert. Get his gun. I've got it. 
He must be the man who was shooting at you before. Yes, but I don't think I'm going to give him any more practice. I think I'll turn him over to Farrell right away. All right, Durkin. Suppose you start answering questions. Well, I only tried to kill Rathbone here. He trifled with my wife's affection. For the last time, Durkin, crow trifled with your wife's affections. You really ought to know that, Durkin, considering you killed Crow. I didn't kill Crow. And I suppose you have an alibi for 120 last night. 120? Well, let's see. What? At 120, I was at a bar called the Green Turtle. You can ask the bartender there. All right. Okay, Sergeant. Lock him up and check his story and get back to me. Right, sir. Come on, you. This is an outrage. Oh, sure, it's an outrage, but come on. But I got an alibi. Everybody's got an alibi. What do you mean? I just let Bunny Durkin go. She proved she was at the movies with another woman last night at 120. Mrs. Kroll was with friends at home. Well, then, who could... Harold. What about Bert? Bert Randall? Your understudy? That's right. After all, he was the one who got me down to the theater today and into Durkin's hands. It might have been just chance, but it might have been planned that way. Oh, no, no, you can forget Randall, Rathbone. He's got the perfect alibi. He was visiting a friend way across town from the Grace Hotel at about 125. Now, according to you, the murder was committed at 120 while you listen. Uh, Randall couldn't possibly have killed Kroll and gotten across town in five minutes. Well, is the friend absolutely sure of the time Bert showed up at his place? Absolutely. How do you know? I was the friend. I still don't understand, Farrell. Why was Bert Randall visiting you? He just happened to drop into headquarters. He wanted to know if I had any news on the guy who shot at you as you left the theater last night. He, he was worried about you. Oh, Farrell, this is ridiculous. Someone must have committed the crime at 120. Look, are you sure the crime was committed at 120? I glanced at my watch as I hung up the phone. I suppose I could have misread it, but uh, I doubt it. So do I. Wait. The Grace Hotel operator would have a record of the call to me at Westchester, and she might have noted the exact time. We could check. Hey, we sure could. Come on. <laughs> Grace Hotel. Yes, madam. One moment, please. Excuse me, operator. Yeah? And uh, maybe see your long-distance time sheet for last night, please. Well, I... Hey. You're Basil Rathbone. Yes, but quite. But you oh, see, well, I, that I've got... settles it. I had a fight with my girlfriend. She said you were dead, and I said it was a mistake. So I'm right, huh? Yes, you're right. Boy, am I glad. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Now she owes me a dollar. Uh, miss, please, may we see the long-distance timesheet for last night? Well, that woman over there just asked for it, too. I told her I couldn't give it out, but um, since you're a cop... Now, look. Over there, it's Mrs. Crow. You check the timesheet, Ratbone. I'm going to talk to that lady. All right. Good evening, Mrs. Crow. Good evening, Lieutenant. I understand you're interested in the telephone operator's timesheet. I have a right to investigate the murder. Oh, don't you like the way the police are doing it? You think my husband was using Mr. Rathbone's name illegally? He wasn't. He had a legitimate dramatic school business and he was framed. Farrell, find out something, Rathbone? Plenty. According to that timesheet there, there's no record of any call from the hotel to Westchester last night. <gasps> the lights! They've gone out! All right, all right, everybody, stay where you are. Stay where you are. <laughs> Somebody scream. Put on the lights, somebody. Put on the lights. There. There, that's better. Now, watch that switch, Rathbone, so nobody touches it again. Right. All right, now. All right. Nobody leave this lobby till we get to the bottom of this. Rathbone, where's that timesheet? Somebody took a shuttle when the lights went out. All right. Whoever took it, hand it over. You heard what the lieutenant said, Mrs. Crow. Hand it over. I was just going to, Mr. Rathbone. Here, Lieutenant. I took it when the lights went out. It was lying on the desk, and I didn't want anybody to steal it. That's a likely story. Who screamed? I did. I felt someone trying to tear the timesheet out of my hand. Oh, now, look. Would somebody please tell me what's so important about this timesheet? Very good question, Farrell. Why should anyone want to conceal the fact... 
Good heavens. Of course. Of course. In the words of Fatima, time is the essence. A fact misplaced in time conceals the truth. Why didn't I think of that before? Ladies and gentlemen, those words of Fatima that I just recalled will help me solve tonight's mystery. Time is the essence. A fact misplaced in time conceals the truth. Now, can you guess who killed Lionel Crow? Hmm? Back to Mr. Basil Rathbone for the exciting conclusion of tonight's tale of Fatima. Why didn't you think of what before, Rathbone? Carol, there was no call made from the Grace Hotel to me at 1.20. But you got a phone call at 1.20? Exactly, but it didn't come from here. So it couldn't have come at the actual time of the murder because the murder was committed here. Well, then what did you hear over the phone? A reconstruction of the crime, Carol. An act by an actor. You mean Bert Randall? Exactly. Quite some time after he killed Crowley, he phoned me and reenacted the killing, calling from a booth right near headquarters. But why? So he could rush right in to see Farrell and establish a perfect alibi. Oh. But, of course, to make it stick, he had to destroy the timesheet. Ah, oh, no, you can't make that stick, Rathbone. Randall wasn't here just now when the timesheet was swiped. He must be here. I suggest you look in the only possible hiding place, behind that switchboard. What? Oh, now, Rathbone, you're nuts. No, he's not, Lieutenant. Randall. All right. What's the story? Well, that's easy, fellow. He was conducting the dramatic course using my name, not Crow. He merely copied Crow's mimeographed lesson. I told you, I told you my husband had an honest business. He had nothing to do with this. He had one thing to do with it, Mrs. Crow. He found out Randall was stealing his lessons, so Randall lured him to the hotel here and killed him to keep him quiet. I get it. And then planted the letters and papers on him so it would seem Crow was conducting the racket. Oh, you going to deny that, Randall? No, Lieutenant. I'm an actor. I know an exit cue when I hear one. Shall we go? Mr. Rathbone, I just wanted to remind you the name is still Bunny. In case you might want to look me up sometime. Uh, look you up? Uh-huh. How's about hopping the Chattanooga choo-choo? Well, I'd like to, dear girl, but I've already booked passage on a slow boat to China. Join us again next week when we'll have another exciting tale of Fatima. Right, Mr. Rathbone? Yes, indeed. Fatima helps me solve an amazing tale that began when a door opened... And reached its climax when a killer closed the door and laughed. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Basil Rathbone with original music by Jack Miller. Lieutenant Farrell is played by Francis DeSales. The entire production is under the direction of Harry Ingram. Michael Fitzmaurice speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. This is the man in black here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Heading our star Hollywood cast tonight is Mr. Warren William, and with him is Mr. Eric Glore. No fewer than nine times have these two gentlemen appeared together in screen thrillers based on the adventures of one of the most celebrated characters of modern crime fiction. This familiar character will speak to you now for the first time on the air, as with the story called 
Murder Goes for a Swim, and the performances of Warren William as Michael Lanyard and Eric Bloor as Jameson. We again hope to keep you in... Suspense. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to introduce myself. Nowadays, meeting me on the street, you'd most likely recognize me as Michael Lanyard, an author of sorts. But if you'll not be too free with the information, because I've been at some pains to allow bygones to be bygones, I was once known rather well by quite a different name. And there are still times when I find myself obliged, or should I say forced, to return to that character, to resort to the somewhat questionable talents of the lone wolf. As a matter of fact, my presence here this evening is prompted by an uncontrollable desire to reminisce a little. Hey, Jameson? Oh, quite right, Mr. Lanyard. And if you'll pardon a gentleman's gentleman for saying so, sir, playing nip and tuck with the police, meeting lovely ladies, you pilfering an occasional gem, I living, so to speak, from hand to pocket. Ha <laughs> ha. Those were the days, sir. <laughs> yes, those were the days. Absconding at times. Perhaps a touch of embezzlement here and there. Now, now, hold on, Jameson. If we're going to reminisce in public, I suggest we confine our recollections to our later period, when the lone wolf had become a gentleman of leisure and used his talents in the interests of law and order. In that case, sir, I suggest you relate the episode of our little experience at that horrible party we attended at that Long Island estate. Remember, sir? Of course, Jameson, the Rutherford Barnes estate. If I remember correctly, the occasion was some sort of charity bazaar. We were invited uh, for the weekend. The phone rang just as we were about to leave the apartment. Mr. Lanyard, this is Betty Lawson. You've never heard of me before, but I know you've been invited to spend the weekend with Mr. Rutherford Barnes. Please, you must accept the invitation. Come down immediately, right now. It's just a little after two o'clock. And if you're not too late, the lone wolf may be able to prevent a murder. Jameson and I arrived at the Barnes estate a bare two hours after we'd received the mysterious telephone message. I was introduced to all kinds of people. First, the famous gossip columnist, Ralph Clinton. Well, Mr. Lanyard, this is indeed a surprise. And I might say a pleasant addition to our little gathering. Something always happens when you're lone wolfing around. Oh, I know, I know, you've reformed. But a fellow can hope for a little excitement, can't he? See you later, old man. <laughs> Then I met a very, very beautiful young lady. Oh, Mr. Lanyard, we haven't met yet. I'm Cynthia Waring. I've read all your stories and admired the ingenious way you solve those baffling mysteries. I think you're wonderful. Really. And, of course, there was our host himself, Mr. Rutherford Barnes, who had recently announced his engagement to Miss Waring. I believe you've met just about everyone, Lanyard. That is, everyone except Bill Hodges. He's the firebrand of our little congregation... He's probably wandering around walking off the effects of the last ten cocktails. Just make yourself comfortable. Strangely enough, I failed to meet a Miss Betty Larson, the frightened young lady who had phoned. Anyway, the afternoon wore on through the beauty contest at which I was elected to preside as judge, and at which Miss Cynthia Waring, looking very pretty in a big picture hat and hoop skirt, was the winner. After it was over, Jameson and I managed to break away from the rest of the guests, and to escape the heat of the afternoon, we prepared ourselves for a cooling dip in the pool. I say, Mr. Lanyard... We've been to some pretty big and fancy places in our day, but this one is really something. This Rutherford Barnes person must be really an important person. Well, you're quite right, Jameson. Rutherford Barnes is listed in Who's Who as the gentleman who made a fortune out of sardines. <laughs> Just think, an entire estate built of sardines. Uncanny, isn't it, Oh, sir? Jameson. <laughs> Forgive me, sir. No more puns, I promise. Well, I should hope so. I say... This pool is constructed just like a miniature lake. Lilies and all that sort of thing floating on top. Mm, quite naturally, if you're going down for the third time, you just take a lily with you. Oh, what a jolly thought. <laughs> well, here goes. Watch this beautiful swan dive. 
I say, this is most unusual. There's a sort of a sort of a mermaid lying in the bottom of the pool. And she's very pretty, sir. <laughs> Last night it was a barmaid, today it's a mermaid. No, but, but really, sir. <laughs> well, I'm the judge in the beauty contest. I'd better go down and have a look. Don't be away too long, sir. You remember there are lots of warmer women in the world. Uh, uh, Jameson, quick. Here, give me a hand. Good heavens. It's a girl. Quick, here, lift her out of here. Hurry. I'm doing... I'm doing my best. I'll get up there. Uh, 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 here, uh, now, uh, let's, uh, let's put her uh, down uh, here. You hold, hold her, hold her there. Oh, yes, Jameson, I... Uh, uh, I'm afraid uh, she's dead. Uh, well, what, what do you make of it, sir? What, was it an accident? Well, I don't know. There's... Uh, there's a pretty uh, nasty bump on the side of her head. Or well, perhaps she slipped and, and hit her head as she fell. Perhaps. But uh, but her bathing suit, not quite the style you'd put on to take a swim. Possibly she was in the beauty contest. Of course, that's it. Uh, the uh, program listened, listed ten contestants, yet only nine girls competed. Meaning what, Mr. Lanyard? Meaning, Jameson, that this poor kid was the tenth contestant. And if my hunch is correct, her name is Betty Larson. The girl with the telephone message? Precisely. And if her call was on the level, we did arrive too late, and she was murdered. Mr. Lanyard! Mr. Lanyard! It's Mr. Barnes and Miss Waring. Take off your robe and cover up the body, Jameson. Yes, sir. Well, Lanyard, we've been looking all over for you, haven't we, Cynthia, dear? Yes, of course. And I'm glad we found you, Mr. Lanyard. I've been wanting to thank you for awarding me the prize in the beauty contest this afternoon. I really didn't think that... (gasps) Mr. Lanyard! There, at the edge of the pool! Yes, it's a girl, and I'm afraid she's drowned. Drowned? But... Oh, how horrible! Oh, but how did it happen? Who is she? I think she's Betty Larson. What do you think, Mr. Barnes? Here, look. Oh, oh good heavens. heavens. Oh. Yes. Yes, that is Betty Larson. I, well, I had no idea. Well, then you do know the girl, Mr. Barnes. Why, yes. As a matter of fact, only recently I recommended her for a job. She's the local telephone operator. And the village beauty. Mr. Barnes and Miss Larson were childhood sweethearts. Uh, Mr. Barnes, tell me, do you know any, uh, do any of the other guests know this girl... Ralph Clinton, for instance. Could our famous uh, columnist have possibly known Miss Larson? Well, if not in person, most certainly by telephone. You see, for the last few weeks, Miss Larson handled my personal calls. I see. Did she ever mention the fact that there might be a murder? Murder? Well, you see, I received rather strange message. Now, look here, Lanyard. If you're insinuating that Miss Larson was murdered, you're all wrong. It's perfectly obvious. She slipped and fell into the deep end of the pool. She can't swim. We couldn't hear her cry for help over the noise of the party, so the poor girl drowned. As simple as that, eh? Why, of course. And I'd appreciate it if you'd be kind enough not to mention this accident to any of the other guests. There's no need to disrupt the entire weekend. I'll notify the sheriff and call the coroner, and they'll take care of everything. I think it might be a good idea, Mr. Lanyard, since you seem so certain that a murder's been committed that you and your man remain on the premises. Our famous lone wolf may have a little explaining of his own to do. Come along, Cynthia. Oh, I'm completely at sea, Mr. Lanyard. The sheriff seems to think the whole thing was an accident, that this Miss Betty Larson person dived into the pool and that's how she hit her head. I doubt that, Jemison. According to Barnes, the girl couldn't swim. Hey, buddy. Oh, I think we have company. Hey, buddy. Yeah? If you see Mr. Barnes around, I want to see him. I think he's over at the other side of the house, getting things ready for the bazaar. Bazaar. They don't care how they celebrate a murder, do they? If I'm not mistaken, you're Mr. Bill Hodges, eh? Yeah. Betty Larson and I were going to get married. Everything was great until she starts going around with this society bunch. I got a few things to settle with that society crowd. Especially that keyhole peeper, Ralph Clinton. You seem quite positive, Hodges, that your girl was murdered. Well, I... What do you think it was, an accident? That girl could swim like a fish. 
Nothing could happen to her in the water. Hey, but Bon says she couldn't swim a stroke. I said she could swim like a fish. But Bon says... Did you hear me, you little runt? <clears throat> Amazing how that girl could swim. Now look here, Hodges. What makes you think Ralph Clinton had anything to do with this? Do you know you're practically accusing him of murder? Listen, Betty stood me up twice last week. I followed her in my car and she met Clinton both times. He was going to put her in this contest. And she was a cinch to win. He promised her. Then look what happens to her. She's dead. Murdered, I tell you. Well, here comes Clinton now. Maybe you'd better tell him about it. Oh, there you are, Hodges. I understand you've been looking for me. Yeah, I have. And now I'm going to fix that pretty face of yours. Yeah, uh, wait a second. Here, you can't do that. Here, Jemison, help me break this up. I will as soon as they stop punching hey, me. Hey, don't be a fool, Hodges. Stop it. Stop it, I say. All right. All right, let go of me. Let go. Oh, thanks, Mr. Lanyon. This man's a maniac. Okay. But I'm warning you, Clinton. I'll see you again. When you ain't got your friends around. Well, personally, I... I don't know whether the girl was killed or not, but... If she was, our friend there, Hodges, will have a lot of explaining to do. You mean you've got something on him, Mr. Clinton? Well, when I was discussing the contest with Betty Larson a few days ago... She told me that Hodges had warned her not to enter it. It seems he was afraid that if she won... It might go to her head and she'd walk out on him. As a matter of fact, he told her to stay away from here. Well, there's going to be a coroner's inquest in the morning. And I suggest that you tell this to the sheriff as soon as he returns. Oh, why, uh, tell that to the sheriff? Oh, oh, no, no, I, I'd rather hate to do that. You, you see, Lanyard, someone in my position, I, uh, I can't afford to get involved. After all, it's uh, my business to report scandal and uh, not get mixed up in it. But look here, you... Oh, tell you what, uh, uh, give me a chance to uh, think it over and uh, I'll, uh, I'll see you at the treasure hunt tonight. <laughs> Oh, dear. Two in the morning, Mr. Lanyard. What a ghastly hour to go tramping over the ground. Must we participate in this treasure hunt? Of course, it's all a part of the weekend. Come in. Well, it's the witching hour, Mr. Lanyard. Here's your envelope with the clues for the treasure hunt. You'd better hurry. Everybody's ahead of you. Thank you, Mr. Clinton. We'll catch up. Fine. This ought to be very interesting. Seeing the lone wolf stalking down his prey. You know very well, Clinton. Oh, Mr. sure. I forgot. You're not the lone wolf anymore. <laughs> You're just nice, innocent Mr. Lanyard. Well, good hunting. See you later. Well, here you are, Jameson. This is our clue. Go ahead, read it. Under the oak and under the cover, where have met many a lover, light a match and look deep down, find your clue and win your crown. I say, isn't that lovely? Can you decipher it? Oh, of course, sir. It means, uh, uh, well, it means, uh, well... Exactly, uh, James, on the old well. That's where we'll find the next clue. Come on, let's get going. <laughs> The well is down this path. It's right near the stables. Uh, you mean when we get to the well, we find another clue? That's right, and at the end is when we reach the treasure. Oh, the treasure. I say, what is this treasure? Uh, Jameson, it's unimportant what the treasure is. It might be a bag of jelly beans. And it all sounds very silly to me, sir. There's the well over there. And look here. It's got a, got a wooden cover on it, exactly like it said on the poem. Well, what do we do now? Uh, now, wait a minute. Um, oh, yes, under the cover. Light a match and look deep down. Here, I'll, uh, I'll take this lid off um, and, and put it here. Now, uh, you light a match, Jameson. Right, sir. Our second clue must be somewhere inside the well. Right, her, just a moment. Ah, there's the clue we're looking for. A piece of paper pinned on the wall inside the well with a big pin. Oh, Dash it all. Match went out. I'll light another one. Oh, Jamison, hold it. Hold it. The inside of this well smells like gasoline. Yes, it does. Yes, it does smell like it's full of... Full of... Get away, Jamison. Uh, blow, blow that match out. Oh, 
Are you all right, Mr. Lanyard? Yes, and no thanks to you. Oh, I couldn't help it, sir. If you ask me, we walked right into a trap. And quite obviously. Here, oh. let me help you up. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, if I'd had any idea... Ouch! Well, now what's the matter? Oh, I've, I've been stabbed. Well, let me see. Oh, steady, Jameson. I'll pull it out. Oh, be careful, sir. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh! There we are. And very interesting. What is it, sir? Oh, it's that big pin. You could have been hurt quite badly. Well, if you ask me... Uh, uh, come along, Jameson. Uh, uh, we've got work to do. We don't mind playing this little treasure hunt game of yours, but it's no fun when the prize is two bodies, especially if they happen to be our two bodies. Well, surely it was only an accident. I wish I could believe that, Miss Waring. But there's no rhyme, no reason for what's been happening. If the accident at the well was another attempt at murder, then... Well, then... Then all our lives could be in danger. Steady, Cynthia, darling. I presume you have some idea of who the murderer might be, Mr. Lanyard. <laughs> you flatter me, Mr. Barnes. I would think you had surely lined up one or two likely suspects, Mr. Lone Wolf. Why don't you tell them about our friend Mr. Clinton, sir? Clinton? <laughs> oh, well, there are some mighty interesting aspects to that road company, Winchell. He was meeting Betty Larson secretly. At least that's what Hodges says. I can believe that. Clinton would stoop to anything. I didn't want to have him around, but Cynthia felt that we should cater to him for the sake of publicity for the bazaar. Uh, Hodges also insists that Clinton arranged for Miss Larson to enter the beauty contest, and that Clinton promised her that she would win. And uh, there's the little incident at the well. If you ask me, Clinton is in this thing right up to his, uh, his clues. Help! Mr. Oh. Barnes! Somebody come out here! Hurry! That sounds like Hodges. He's right out there at the side of the house. Well, come on. We can go through these French windows. In here, in the bushes, you better hurry. What is it, Hodges? What's wrong? I don't know. Don't ask me. I don't know anything about it. Great heavens, look at Clinton. Oh, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. What awful things are going on. <laughs> I don't know how it happened. I was just coming down the path. There in the bushes, he was lying He's right He's done for, all right, Mr. Lanyard. Shot. Murdered. Murdered. You did this, Hodges. You said you'd get even with Clinton. Now you've done I it. I tell you, I don't know anything about it. I was just walking down along the path. I don't know anything about it's it. It's all right, Hodges. You'll have an opportunity to prove your innocence. Don't you have some theory about all this, Mr. Light? And this there, whole thing. there, Miss Waring. I think I can promise you at least that there won't be any more murders. <laughs> Hold the flashlight a little higher, Jameson, on the clock on the mantelpiece. Yes, sir. Just as you say, sir. But aren't we taking a bit of a risk, Mr. Lanyard? Leaving the estate without checking with the sheriff? Shh, quiet, Jameson. If I don't find what I'm looking for here in Clinton's apartment, I'm afraid we'll have a lot of explaining to do. I'd just as soon we didn't go back. There's been two murders already, and they say things come in threes. Hmm, how interesting. Uh, Jameson, uh, why do you think I've got you flashing the light on that clock on the mantelpiece? Well, sir, uh, well, I'm a bit rusty. I, I think it might be safe to say, well, well, it would be safe. Exactly, Jameson. You never fail the safe behind the clock on the mantelpiece. I say, I was right. Ingenious, eh, Miss Leonard? Uh, you have your moments. Well, it's a long time since I've operated in this fashion, but uh, we'll see, Jameson. If you don't mind, sir, this is like old time. I do mind, Jameson, but unfortunately, certain situations are born of necessity. Then allow me to compliment you, sir. You haven't lost the old touch. No, I'm not so sure. Ah, there we are. <laughs> Uh, not much of a haul, if you ask me. Nothing but a stack of letters and a notebook. Let's have a look. All that trouble just for a bundle of papers. Just a waste of good time and talent. Well, it could have been a pound of butter or a gas coupon or a back axle or... Aha! Uh -huh. I say, what's so interesting? Just the... Did you find a clue to the murders? Just the motive, Jameson. Just the motive. <laughs> Look, 
Look here, you can't keep me here, Sheriff. All I did was find Clinton. You can't hang a guy for that. Keep your shirt on, Hodges. Nobody moves out of this room till Lanyard shows up. If he doesn't come in five minutes, I'm going to put out a call and have him pulled in. It seems to me that Mr. Lanyard has admitted his guilt by disappearing. Well, whatever the case may be, I think you should allow me to go. After all, this is my house, and I do have guests. They might think it rather strange if their host isn't around. Look, Mr. Barnes, party or no party, there's been a couple of murders committed around this joint, and everybody in this room is under suspicion. Really, Sheriff? If you're going to keep us here and allow Mr. Lanyard to stay... Good evening, Sheriff. Jameson, say good evening to the Sheriff. He's been very patient, I hope. Good evening, sir. I mean, Constable. I mean, Sheriff. All right, you two. You'd better make it good. Running away from the scene of the crime won't sit so well in court. Please accept my apologies, Sheriff. Well, now that you're here, Mr. Lanyard, perhaps we can clear up this nasty mess. Yes. I presume you've been spending your time checking up on the murders, Mr. Lanyard. That's right. And I've uncovered a few details which uh, I'm sure will prove most interesting, Miss Waring. You're wasting time, Lanyard. Somebody in this room has been running around committing murders. And I'm going to find out who it is or die Or trying. die trying. Who said that? Oh, if it's all the same to you, Sheriff, I think I'll join the other guests. Now, isn't that thoughtful of you? Get away from that door before you tempt me to bring the murder score up to three. Do as he says, Jameson. After all, you don't want to miss all the fun. In just a minute, you're going to have the pleasure of meeting the murderer. Yes, that's just what I'm afraid of, sir. All right, Lanyard. Let's have it. Very well, Sheriff. First, allow me to review events from the beginning. Just as Jameson and I were leaving for Mr. Barnes's residence, we received a rather unusual telephone message. It was Betty Larson. That was about 2 p.m., wouldn't you say, Jameson? <clears throat> Five minutes after two, to be exact, sir. Thank you. We arrived at Mr. Barnes's estate by 3.30. At 5, Jameson and I went for a swim in the pool. It was then we found Miss Larson. At what time did the coroner examine her, Sheriff? I, uh, around seven in the evening. But what difference does it make? The poor girl had been dead for ten hours. All the difference in the world, my dear fellow. Simple arithmetic will show you that it was impossible for Miss Larson to call me at two o'clock. At two o'clock, she'd already been dead for five hours. Hodges, you did it. You paid someone to make that call. You're crazy. I had nothing to do with it. Pipe down, Hodges. Go on, Lanyard. Sheriff, uh, what do you think was used to murder Miss Larson? Well, I... Could this have been the weapon? The pin. The pin, the one I fell on when the well exploded. Yes, Jameson. Let me paint a rather gruesome picture for you, Sheriff. Miss Larson is called down to the edge of the swimming pool. Someone who poses as a friend suggests that she try on a hat. In trying it on, our murderer, pretending to assist, neatly jabs Miss Larson and thrusts the pin through the base of her brain. Oh, how horrible. Uh, could I examine the pin, please? Oh, of course, Mr. Barnes. Why? Why, it's a hat pin. Well, Cynthia, it's the one you had in the large hat you wore in that beauty contest. Uh, Cynthia, it was you. All right, stand back, all of you. Look here, sister, you can't get away with this. Shut up! And listen, all of you. I assure you, I know how to handle this gun, and I'm not afraid to use it. Cynthia, stand I... Stand back, Hodges. I don't get you, Cynthia. What earthly reason would you have for killing Betty? She wanted to be your friend. <laughs> That's a laugh. Listen, little boy, Blue. A telephone operator sometimes hears too much for her own good. How do you think she got all those fine furs? From some boyfriend? No, she was too daffy about you, so she decided to try her hand at blackmail. Blackmail? That's right. Only she pushed me just a bit too far. Why, Get you... Get back, all of you. Do, prune face. Who? Who, me? I don't mean your brother. Open the door. Go on, open it. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Now, stand back, all of you. Ha! Very amusing picture. That's right, Mr. Lanyard. Step forward just a little. I'd like to thank you for spoiling a most delightful weekend. Here's a little something to remember me by. Jameson, uh, are you all right? Yes, I... I, I think so, sir. Oh, well, thank heaven. Oh, yeah, you did a good job, Jameson. Oh, yeah. Not only saved Mr. Lanyard from getting shot, but when you oh. fell against this door, you also managed to knock Miss Waring colder than a doornail. Oh, it was nothing, really. And as for you, sister, maybe these bracelets will keep you out of trouble. Because when you come to, you're going to find yourself booked for murder. Double murder, Sheriff. Dig the bullet out of the wall over there, and you'll find it will match the one found in Clinton's body. Well, what do you know? Come on, Hodges. Give me a hand. Okay, Sheriff. I can't believe it. Wait, Cynthia and I had so many plans together. 
Oh, it's hard to believe that, that she could be responsible for those horrible murders. I'm afraid she was. Mr. Barnes, this is Mr. Clinton's notebook. Several canceled checks and a few letters. Look them over, and you'll discover that your dream girl, Miss Cynthia Waring, has quite a number of aliases, and in certain circles has a reputation for landing the biggest fish in the pool. Then, after she's collected enough money, she tosses them back. You were her next victim, Mr. Barnes. And as for the unfortunate Mr. Clinton, being a newspaper man and gossip columnist, he ferreted out her little scheme and in turn was blackmailing Miss Waring. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, I guess that just about puts the cap on that story of our little adventure at the estate of Rutherford Barnes. Miss uh, Cynthia Waring was a very shrewd and fast-thinking young lady. She got one victim with a gun. She almost got Jameson and me at the old well when the gasoline exploded. All of which began with the first and most ingenious of the murders. The particularly cold-blooded murder of Betty Larson with that hat pin. And, uh, Jameson, of course, we have you to thank for having discovered that most important bit of evidence, the uh, pin itself. <laughs> ah, yes, Mr. Lanyard. <laughs> and I must say, I got quite a lift out of that myself when I discovered it. Uh, <laughs> now, now, Jameson, remember your promise. Uh, Suffice it to say, you discovered the pin the hard way, I admit. Oh, yes, sir. There's no doubt about that. The criminal would never have been stuck in the final analysis if I hadn't sat down and got myself stuck. That will be, be or that will be all, Jameson. Oh. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> And so closes Murder Goes for a Swim, starring Warren William with Eric Blore. The first appearance of the lone wolf on the air. And tonight's tale of... Suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next week when Laird Kriegar will star in the suspense play, The Last Letter of Dr. Bronson, with a cast of four distinguished Hollywood players, Helen Vinson, Harold Huber, Ian Wolfe, and Theodore von Eltz. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who, with Robert Louis Cheon, the guest director... Bernard Herman and Lucienne Marowick, conductor and composer, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Andrea J. Graham, author of the Web Surface series, Oh, and a Madam's Wife. You're listening to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Welcome back. Eric Blore is always a highlight of the Lone Wolf stories. He wasn't part of the original Lone Wolf formula. You know, the whole Lone Wolf thing. He was given that name because he worked alone. Not with an amusing butler sidekick. But he really became part of the films. And was one of the better comedy relief sidekicks. They were a regular feature of golden age detective films, and it was somewhat mixed as to how well these sidekicks actually worked. Many, uh, I think particularly viewed from a modern perspective, 
them off as pretty annoying. But Bloor, I think, is genuinely funny, and they manage to work in some great lines for him as the mystery goes along. And this really did have the feel of a lone wolf movie uh, condensed down to half an hour, and, and it's actually really entertaining that way. The story does reference the fact that the lone wolf used to be a criminal. And that really is his origin, as explained in the novel by Joseph Vance. And in many ways, he's got a very similar backstory uh, to what Leslie Charteris would use with the saint. He was uh, abandoned and uh, brought into a life of crime, and he mastered it and excelled at it. And he was counseled to simply walk alone because any partners he had would get him into trouble, thus the name The Lone Wolf. He actually reforms kind of in the middle of his first novel, uh, and uh, which is definitely a different path than The Saint would take, and certainly it's very different from the path the character takes uh, in the film. One thing that Suspense said, which I think is uh, kind of dubious, is that this was the first appearance by Warren William as the Lone Wolf. Uh, not necessarily so. He actually appeared a couple years before on radio as the Lone Wolf. It was part of the Good News program of 1940. The Good News program was a simply fantastic a variety show. It was an hour long, and it would feature comedy, music, and a dramatic bit. The music was great. A comedy had Frank Morgan as well as Fanny Bryce as Baby Snooks. The dramatic portions were generally very good as well, with high-profile actors recruited to play the parts. I often did short stories and things like that, occasionally movie previews, and this is one of those, with scenes from The Lone Wolf Strikes, which was the second of nine Lone Wolf movies that Warren William would do. It runs about 15 minutes, and it's introduced by the host of The Good News of 1940, Edward Arnold, original air date February 22nd, 1940. This is Edward Arnold again, ladies and gentlemen. We continue our Good News Maxwell House program with a special preview of Columbia's new picture, The Lone Wolf Strikes, starring Warren William with Eric Bloor and Joan Perry. In our radio version tonight, you will hear Warren William playing his original part as the Lone Wolf and Eric Bloor as his butler, Jameson, and Miss Iris Meredith, the young Columbia starlet who will portray the part originally played by Joan Perry. The adaptation of this Columbia screenplay was written by Robert Riley Crutcher, and now, Meredith, if you will ring up the curtain, the lone wolf strikes. It is with some hesitation that I introduce myself as Michael Lanyard. I have so many names. You may have met me as William Brown or Jack Smith or even heard of me as the lone wolf. But that title belongs to the past, to the days when I took pride in the craftsmanship of my profession. I was a thief. But since then, I have reformed and retired into quiet respectability. True, there are times when I'm glad I haven't lost my skill entirely. In fact, there are times when my appetite for adventure is whetted more keenly than ever. For example, I'd like to tell you the story of two murders. <laughs> The guilty person of the first murder is obvious. But in the second murder, well, I'll come to that later. The story begins one evening when Stanley Young of the Young and Jordan Investment Corporation called at my apartment. I was working in the aquarium with Jameson, my valet. Look, Jameson, fungus is forming on the killer again. Oh, very well, sir. I'll go draw his bath. It does seem a lot of trouble for just a fish. Just a fish? You call that finny beauty just a fish? Are you out of your mind, Jameson? If I am, sir, it's because I'm jolly well fed up being a gentleman's gentleman to a lot of sardines. <laughs> sardines? Well, this isn't like you, sir. I miss the excitement of the chase. Life was thrilling in the old days. We were always on the go. 
The peace just a half step behind us, their hot breath on our necks. Now, now, Jameson. Ah, oh, forgive me, sir, but it grieves me to see you so, oh, so domestic. Don't you miss the old life, the people we used to meet? <clears throat> Excuse me, sir. Mr. Stanley Young, sir. Hello, Stanley. How are you? Fine, Mike. Fine. It's swell to see you. That's all, Jameson. Very good, sir. <laughs> Finny beauty. <laughs> a fish. <laughs> well, Stanley, what have you been doing with yourself? Here, sit down, have a drink, and, uh, and what's the matter? Mike, I need your help. Certainly, how much? Quarter of a million. Certainly. Eh? I beg your pardon? Well, I'm not joking, Mike. <laughs> well, I don't carry quite that much on me. You can get it. How? I have a pearl necklace with me. Yeah, take a look at it. Real? No. No, a young lady named Benny Weldon has the real ones. She stole them from my partner, Philip Jordan. I can't prove she stole them, but I know she did. I have to get them back. And you want me to... Uh... Uh, yes, Mike, I do. Sorry, no more of that for me. I've retired. I haven't told you the whole story, Mike. It's not just the pearls. It's it's what happened to my partner, Jordan. Yes, I read about it last week. Nasty accident. It wasn't an accident. It was murder. <laughs> So, Stanley told me how Jordan had made a fool of himself over this girl, Binnie Weldon. The necklace had belonged to his wife before she died and was to be given to his daughter whenever she married. But one night, he let Binnie wear the pearls to the opera. And though he was with her every minute, somehow she managed to switch them. He discovered it as he was about to replace them in the safe. He telephoned Binnie immediately. But, Philip, there must be some mistake. Jordan told her he wanted to avoid a scandal and he'd give her a chance to return them. You know perfectly well that I would... Jordan said uh, he would be at her apartment in an hour to get them. It was a long drive back into town, and he was hitting 65, when suddenly another car darted out from a dark road and swerved into his. Philip Jordan was dead. You see, Mike, I can't prove anything. But with your help... Stanley, you don't understand. There are lots of good agencies you could contact. Oh, it isn't just for me. It's his daughter. She's been living abroad now that she's home. But, Stanley... Mike, I... I hate to remind you of a promise you once made when I... When you helped me out. <laughs> Sorry I hesitated, Stanley. I am at your service. Thanks. I knew you'd say that. I brought Delia Jordan, Philip's daughter, with me. She may have some ideas. First, I think we should hire five or six private detectives to watch Benny Weldon. Get men you can trust, because we don't want any publicity. Well, uh, that's fine, Delia, but suppose we give Mr. Lanyard a chance to think over the situation. Really, I don't see anything wrong with my ideas. I think we can make much better progress working together on this, don't you, Mr. Lanyard? <laughs> I'm afraid I'd be out of character, Miss Jordan. You see, I, uh, I am the lone wolf. <laughs> Benny Weldon was asleep in her apartment dark when I raised the window and slipped into the room. Swiftly and methodically, I searched the panels of the walls and behind pictures and books for a hidden safe. Nothing. There was no alternative. Binny would have to find the necklace for me. I took a vase from the table and smashed it on the floor. <coughs> then I stepped behind the curtain and flattened myself against the wall. Suddenly, the apartment was flooded with light. Binny stood in the doorway, a gun in her hand. Who's there? She looked out of the window, then rushed back to the telephone. I could see her glancing uneasily around the room as she waited for an answer. Hello? Hello, Jim. She explained what had happened. I'm sure there was someone here, Jim. They must have thought I had the necklace. Oh, no, no, I wasn't dreaming. Vases don't get knocked over in a dream. Oh, Jim, I'm afraid. Well, when is Gorlick going to arrive? Wednesday? I know, I know. I'll give him the biggest party he ever heard of but I won't rest until he gets out of town with those pearls. So, Emil Gorlick is in on this. It isn't going to be as easy as I thought. And who is this Jim that had the necklace? Was he the one that killed Philip Jordan? And how could I prove it? Well, there was nothing to do but wait until Gorlick arrived. I returned home that night to find Delia, who bombarded me with questions. Did you get them? What? You were in Benny Weldon's apartment, weren't you? How did... Jameson. I I couldn't help myself. Miss Jordan's like a, a vampire, sir. She fairly wormed it out of me. 
I hope you understand, sir. Only too well, Jameson. Only too well. Thank you, sir. Then if you'll excuse me, sir, I... I think I should be doing something else... somewhere... else. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Did you get them? No, she didn't have them. Are you certain? Quite. Well, then where are they? A friend of hers, someone named Jim, is taking care of them. She told you that? Well, not exactly. I overheard a telephone conversation. About what? They're waiting for a man named Gorlick, a famous fence, to get here from Europe. They hope to sell the pearls to him. Good. <laughs> I'm glad you approve. What do we do next? We? Of course. As soon as we finish your coffee, we're going to take you home. Then I'm going to get a good night's sleep. Hello. Well, it's been nice not seeing you for a couple of days. Has it? Mm. I haven't even heard from you. So far as I know, you haven't done a thing. There hasn't been anything to do. What about that man Gorlick who's going to buy the necklace? He arrives today. Aren't you even going to see him? Benny Weldon is giving a party for him, and, and one can't very well go to a party uninvited, Delia. Very bad form. Oh, stop talking to me as though I were a child. I have a right to know your plans. If you have any, which I doubt... You seem to think... I think you're getting yourself needlessly upset. Why don't you run on home and let me worry about things? I won't leave here until I know exactly what you're going to do. <laughs> In that case, you'll be staying. Jameson? Yes, sir? Entertain our guest while I'm gone. Show her our fish. I'm sure they'll interest her. This way, miss. Oh, you and, and your fish. I beg your pardon, miss. They're not my fish. I loathe fish. <laughs> Jameson, where is he going? That I can't tell you, Miss Jordan. But from Mr. Lanyard's manner today, I imagine he's out on the chase once more. Oh, I only wish I were with him. It should be a glorious night. Glorious. Should it, Jameson? Why? Well, I'm only judging for the past, Miss Jordan. But every time Mr. Lanyard has met Emil Gorlick, there's been a lovely mix-up. Lovely. I went to see Gorlick at his hotel. He was a particularly dangerous man. And I had pulled so many tricks on him in the past that he was suspicious of my visit. But by selling him a diamond pin at a fraction of its value and telling him I had stolen it, I put him off guard. He warmed up, and we laughed about old times. <laughs> those parties. Oh, those parties. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to one tonight, Gorlick, and you're going with me. Oh, I'm sorry, Mike. There'll be lots of nice girls. Yeah? Uh, no, no, no. I can't, Mike. Some other night, maybe. Tonight, I must refuse. Oh, that's too bad, Gorlick. I especially wanted you to meet these two people who are giving the party. They're artists like ourselves. They do very lovely work, too. Well, you'll have to meet them before you leave. Vinnie Weldon and Jim... Uh... Vinnie Weldon and Jim Ryder? Ryder, that's it, Ryder. Ah, that's where I'm going tonight, to their party. Really? <laughs> now, isn't that a coincidence? Well, then, we're in for a great treat tonight. They're a grand pair, aren't they? I'm glad to hear it. I've never met them. You never met... Gorlick, that's all I wanted to know. Mark, let me go. What is it? Let me go, Mark. Let me go. Let me go. I very apologetically tied and gagged Gorlick. Then, borrowing his eyeglass and accent, I myself became Emil Gorlick and went to the party. But I wouldn't have felt so much at ease if I had known that Delia had followed me to Gorlick's hotel and that while snooping around outside his room, she had been instrumental in releasing him. No, I was very pleased with myself and uh, thought him safely out of the way. After the introductions were over, I spent some time with the guests... Because Gorlick, of course, would have stayed with the girls, and uh, after all, I was acting the role of Gorlick. But I should have gone into the other room and seen the pearls as soon as Jim asked me. Because when I did... Here they are. Just like I said they were, aren't they, Mr. Gorlick? Yeah, yeah. Dear Mark Neville. Then you'll buy them? I take them. It will not be so easy, but... Uh... <laughs> I take them. Benny, see what's the matter out there. I tell you, I am Emil Gorlick. What do you mean? This man here is Gorlick. Him? Him? He is the lone wolf. Turn on the lights, quick. He's got the necklace. Here we go. Get him. I returned the pearls to Stanley at his home, and he gave me the imitations for my collection. I thought the adventure was over, but when I returned to my apartment, the telephone was ringing. It was Binny Weldon. 
I don't know what you plan to do with the pearls, Mr. Lanyard, but if you hope to see them around Miss Jordan's neck, I'm afraid you're going to be horribly disappointed. She told me they had Delia Jordan, a prisoner there, that Gorlick had brought her. I didn't believe her until I heard Delia's voice. Please, please don't. You're breaking my arm. Oh! They wanted the pearls back immediately, but I had only the imitations. I decided to take a chance. The phonies had fooled me when Stanley first showed them to me, so I went back to Benny Weldon's and released Delia by palming off the imitation pearls. Then I took Delia to Stanley's home, where she could get the real necklace. But we found Stanley dead and the necklace gone. The police were there and arrested me for his murder. But I didn't kill him, you know that. You were with me all the time. Who did kill him? Everyone except me had an alibi. Binny Weldon and Jim Ryder had been waiting for me at their apartment. Gorlick didn't even know Stanley. Delia would hardly kill the man who was helping her, and besides, the pearls belonged to her. Who killed him? This is what might have happened. You admit you were the last one to see him. What? I didn't kill him. We have only your word. Delia. And what does your word mean? Everyone knows you're a crook. Delia, you said you trusted me. But this has changed everything. If you didn't kill him, who did? Can you tell me that? Yes, I know who killed him. But just let's start at the beginning. Binny Weldon stole a string of pearls from Philip Jordan, whose daughter was living and studying at a school on the continent. His partner, trying to recover them, knew Jordan had been murdered. And to avoid scandal for his daughter's, for his partner's daughter, he didn't notify the police. He came to me. Binny Weldon and Jim Ryder meant to get both Stanley and me out of the way by killing Stanley and throwing the blame on me. But they couldn't have murdered him. They were waiting for you in their apartment. I know. They had an accomplice, a third person. I first suspected it this afternoon. She knew too much about the arrival of Emil Gorlick. She? So I immediately sent a cable to the school in Europe where Delia Jordan was studying. They answered that she had been in the hospital there since her father's death. This girl knew that Stanley had never seen Delia Jordan, so it was easy to pose as Delia in order to keep check on my moves for Weldon and Ryder. You're not Delia Jordan, and you murdered Stanley. the most unusual story I've run across in 15 years of reporting. You may think it belongs in the Sunday supplement. I think it deserves the front page. Details follow. Signed, O'Hara. CBS brings you O'Hara, starring Jack Moyle, the adventures of a freelance foreign correspondent in the far places of the world. Tonight, O'Hara cables from Hong Kong, a story titled... The Judas Face. It was morning in my room at the Hotel Far East, and my back was stiff. All night I'd slept under the slowly revolving blades of the ceiling fan. Now the morning sky outside was burning with a gas blue flame. Monsoon weather. I was standing, sweating, looking through my single outside window down into Sing Long Street, wondering whether to shave or put my clothes on, when I saw something interesting below. It was His Majesty's resident commissioner of the constabulary, Sidney I.E.R. Phelps, being pulled by in a rickshaw. Sidney rarely uses a rickshaw, and he didn't glance up at my room window as he usually does. I shaved fast, dressed, and hurried down to his office at 1010 Regimental Road. You're bleeding. Bleeding? Where, Sidney? The lower face. Oh, must have cut myself shaving. Is it bad? No. Hurrying on so sultry a morning, O'Hara? Oh, just like you. I uh, saw you pass my room in that rickshaw a few minutes ago. If Sing Wong Street were wide enough for my car, it wouldn't have been necessary for me... What brought you that way? Business? An impertinent question. But since you ask it, allow me to counter with one of my own. Please do, Sidney. Please do. O'Hara... 
Of the two millions of persons now living in Hong Kong, how many do you think are named Calhoun? Calhoun? Ah, uh, you got me. There are three legitimate families in Hong Kong named Calhoun. Oh, that's interesting. And someone, a man, has been annoying these families, Calhoun, with anonymous telephone calls. What's a man say? Just, hello, Mrs. Calhoun. And if a man answers... Hey, wait a minute, Mrs. Calhoun. I was wondering how long it would take you to recognize the name. Sure, Mrs. Calhoun, that strange little woman who hangs around the waterfront. I did a feature on her once. In which you pictured her as something of a nefarious woman wasting her life in Hong Kong. Oh, is that the way you read it? I didn't think I wrote it that way. Uh... How was Mrs. Calhoun this morning? Why, well, Sidney, that's obviously what you were doing in St. Long Street. Well, Mrs. Calhoun wasn't home. She evidently hadn't been all night. Hmm. Just a moment. Yes? Yes, go ahead. Put him on. Oh, Hannah, one of the calls. Oh, here? Yeah. It was a simple matter to have all Calhoun numbers routed to my desk. Uh, hold the receiver away from your ear. Yes. Uh, Hello? I say, my man, who are you? Hey, Sydney, can you trace it? We've tried, no use. Well, okay, I'll be seeing you. O'Hara, if you plan trying to find Mrs. Calhoun... I do. I warn you, I've always considered that woman potentially dangerous. <laughs> Sydney, what woman isn't? I walked to the rickshaw stand, remembering Mrs. Calhoun. She was British, maybe 31... When I'd known her before, she'd made her living circulating among the waterfront guys. She'd wear soft sole ballet-type slippers, carry a piece of chalk, and she'd get some seaman to draw a long line on the saloon floor. Then, poising herself on her toes at one end, she'd turn a forward flip in the air, landing on her feet exactly at the other end of the line. Of course, some joker would always draw another chalk line, shorter. What was her name? When she'd earned enough drinks, she called herself Mrs. Calhoun. Anyway, I finally managed to talk a coolie Chinese into pulling his rickshaw through the heat. we just started when a skinny man with eyes like vegetable soup jumped in the rickshaw beside me. He was shaking with nerves. Uh, Howard. Mr. Howard. Look, I'm not Mr. Howard. No, no, no. Howard. I'm Howard. Well, that's great. Now, it's a little crowded, Mr. Howard. There were plenty of rickshaws back at the no. stand. No, no, I've, I've got to say it. Ask you. Ask me what? Oh, I I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Okay, you don't want to know what? Where, where is Mrs. Oh, what? Where is Mrs. Calhoun? What makes you think I'd know where Mrs. Calhoun is? Oh, then you don't know. You don't know. See, now you can't say I didn't ask that's you. See? Now, wait, Howard. No, I want to talk. No, thank you, Mr. O'Hara. Mr. Howard disappeared into the sidewalk crowd. Strange little guy. Looked American, but his voice certainly wasn't the one I'd heard on the phone at Phelps' office. Something told me to get to Mrs. Calhoun's on the double. I flashed a pound note, and my rickshaw boy, wearing a water-soaked handkerchief over his shaved head, got the idea. About a mile past my hotel, we came to where Sing Wong Street closes in on itself. The Chinese temples, sagging hotels, and hovels all jammed together, with the street running suddenly out of sight into alleyways. That's where I found Mrs. Calhoun, off an alley, the door open to let in a little air. She was bending over a pasteboard suitcase. Oh, oh. oh sorry, I didn't mean to make you knock your suitcase off the bed. Who are you? I'm O'Hara. Don't you remember? Get out. Or oh, at least let me pick up your suitcase. Don't touch it. Hell, yeah. No. You, you might have broke my bottle I got packed. You might have... Oh, no. It looks all right. Well, what do you want with me? Six weeks ago, I did a newspaper story about you. Remember now? No, I... I ain't seen you before. Sure you have. You remember. Yeah. Seems lately I ain't got the memory I used to have for faces. Sure, sure. Well, why, why don't you sit down? All right, thanks. I ain't got no cup, but, uh, did you take a nip from this bottle? No, no, thanks. I... That is, unless you'll join me, Mrs. Calhoun. Mrs. Calhoun? <sighs> See, there was a time I'd have had to have a whole bottle because, well, before I called myself that. Now, listen carefully. 
In my newspaper story, I mentioned how you sometimes called yourself by that name. You did what? A feature story in papers read around the world. Oh, 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 so that's it, huh? Now, I think someone's in Hong Kong looking for you. Well, why do you think I'm packing? Why do you think I've got to get out? What was the trouble that brought you here? Oh, he's an ugly man, you know. Ugly? To them that can't see him for his face. Who do you mean? Who's ugly? First, I... I was afraid of his face. Like all the rest. Tell me about it, huh? Then I... I got so I... I wanted to see that thing. Feel it with my fingers. Yeah. Then, you know what? He thought I was in love with him. You weren't? Sometimes when... When he talked to me in that... That voice of his... I'd be looking straight on his face. But not seeing it. A soft voice, maybe? Low? Was I 19? Or was it 20? <laughs> then everybody began laughing at us. Laughed, they did, and called me by his name like maybe I was his wife. Oh, Mrs. Calhoun. All of you are laughing. He was born with something you'll never be. Easy, easy. No. No, he's... He's come for me. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, Mrs. Calhoun, if you love him, why are you afraid? He's come for me. And I... I look like this. Oh, I see. Well, you know, when I used your story, I left you some money. You need any more? Money? Yeah. And maybe, maybe if I, if I fixed up a bit, huh? Sure. Here, take this. Yeah, I'll, I'll just get fixed up. A little something to maybe wear around my neck, huh? I have got a little line there, huh? <laughs> and you know where to find Mr. Calhoun? Yes. Yeah. Coming home. Early this morning. I... I saw the place he stays. Then you're... going to see him? Just to say hello. Proper. Like a... lady. I guess there were more questions I could have asked her, but there didn't seem to be any point to it now. But going back to my hotel, I realized that I had figured out one thing. Mrs. Calhoun had been with a circus. The tumbling act in the saloons, plus the way she described Calhoun, had set that up in my mind. And the clincher? Well, I knew that a small traveling tent show had moved in on a vacant lot near Hong Kong just three days ago. Calhoun would be with that show. But I wanted to keep out of it now. That is, until I reached my hotel room and found my phone ringing. Somehow, I... I knew it would be on the other end of that line. I dreaded to pick it up. But I had to. Yes? Hello. Mrs. Calhoun. You, you don't know where she is. You, you don't know. When I tried to answer, the man hung up. From what he'd said, the nervous little man that had jumped into my rickshaw began to fit into the picture. Sure, and maybe I'd made a mistake about Mrs. Calhoun. I hurried back to her room, but she was gone. Suitcase, everything. There was only one place to check now, the circus. I found the seedy tents on the once vacant lot. The banner read, The Great Armenian Gypsies All-American Show. And in a small shed on wheels, I found the huge Armenian himself wearing a soiled Hamburg and a cigar. He was selling tickets. I bought one and asked where I'd find Mr. Calhoun. Who told you we got Mr. Calhoun, Papi? Well, haven't you? Wrong show. We got nobody named Mr. You Calhoun. You sure? You nice fella. You go away. How do I say Mr. Calhoun? <laughs> I'm not used to being called a liar, Papi. I'm not used to being called Papi. Here's your money back. It's clobbering up to a store. You don't want to get caught in a tent in a store. You the owner of the show? The great Armenian gypsy? You're gypsy, Papi. Now go away. Not till I talk to Calhoun. Okay, okay, you win. Calhoun is in the caravan car. Thanks. Which one? One without windows. Right over there. Thank you. All right. Step right up. Yeah, this must be it. Close the door. 
Sure. Mr. Calhoun. Thank you. You know me? In the dark like this, I have to go by the voice. Sure, I know you. Yeah. And I... I, you. I take one pace forward and then... And feel to the side with your left hand. Feel the chair? Yeah. Sit down, please. You, uh... You phoned my hotel, Mr. Calhoun. Why? Was it because... You're O'Hara, newspaper man. And you read my article on a woman who calls herself Mrs. Calhoun. I should have had him search for you the moment we arrived here. You say him. That couldn't be a nervous little man with funny eyes. (laughs) You're so descriptive. A geek. Yeah. My friend. A geek, huh? But his real name is Howard. Uh Uh-huh. A geek. Sideshow feature. Yeah, I saw a poster advertising him out front. He dresses as a wild man from Borneo, and the management throws him a live chicken at each and every performance. My best friend. I see. No. No, you, you don't see. Living as I must, always surrounded by blank walls. He's my perambulation. My only contact with the, the outside. And he's been helping you find Mrs. Calhoun? Yes. I'm sorry, but I get the feeling he doesn't want to find her. Oh, he's he's over-anxious. And something more, Morgan. I know the girl you call Mrs. Calhoun isn't your wife. She is my wife. Not according to her. But this may interest you. I think she's on her way down here now. Oh, she... She's coming to me? Yeah. Each rose cradles a moon of blood. To seek it, you must destroy the rose. I've never heard those lines before. Oh, oh they're mine. He said she's coming to see me. That's what she told me. Well, then, well, then you must stand outside and intercept her as I perform my act. Why? You haven't yet seen me, O'Hara. I don't want her to become frightened. She may have forgotten. Look, Calhoun, why don't you turn the light on? No. No. Take time to know me, O'Hara. Okay. But one more question. When you made those calls, why'd you always hang up? (laughs) Living alone, my my ears have become exceptionally keen to, to nuance. Each case, when I get an answer, I... I knew by the tone of voice that she wasn't there. No, I... I almost believe him. You do believe me. Here, O'Hara. What's this? British shilling worth a few pennies American. What for? In a few moments, I change from a person to an act. That's the price of admission. I turned and left the darkened caravan wagon. Outside, I saw where the back of the wagon was attached to the sideshow tent. Calhoun had his own private entrance and exit. I looked around for Mrs. Calhoun, but no luck. Then I played my way into the sideshow. It was filling up with a typically mixed oriental crowd. One large woman was standing nursing her child in the front row. Then the Armenian gypsy took the stage and made his pitch. Prepare. Prepare to witness the most awe-inspiring, terrifying spectacle of the ages. Eleven years and ten days ago, while I was touring the parched desert of the Lebanon, I happened upon the most terrifying, unknown, unopened grave since the world began. I dug, and what did I find? A grave lined with seven pieces of silver. Yes. Now, I pull the drawstring. And you see the face that suffers even in death. The mummified head of Judas Iscariot. Someone went into hysterics. The head was thrust up through a hole into the fraudulent velvet box, but it wasn't Morgan Calhoun. It was a woman staring straight at me, motionless, eyes open wide. She was dead. It was Mrs. Calhoun. CBS is bringing you O'Hara, the adventures of a freelance correspondent in the far places of the world. Tonight, 
from Hong Kong, a story titled The Judas Face. A wind was rising out of the west. Fat black clouds were coming in high and slow across the bay from Indochina. But the feeling of dread I'd had hadn't come from the thick weather as I first thought it might. In a roundabout way, Morgan Calhoun's anonymous phone calls had brought back the woman he called his wife, Mrs. Calhoun, only for her to be stabbed to death. In the crowd's confusion, it took me time to get back to Morgan Calhoun's wagon, but Morgan Calhoun was missing. I went through the inside passageway back to the sideshow stage. The body of Mrs. Calhoun was missing, too. I put through a call to Commissioner Phelps. He arrived ten minutes later, and I told him the whole story. All I knew. Hmm. And you say these are Morgan Calhoun's quarters, eh? Like I said, no windows. And, of course, no mirrors. You've talked to the owner, the Armenian gypsy, and Howard? Yes. They're both pretty broken up about this. Oddly enough, they rather like this man, Calhoun. Eh, he's not so bad. But careful interrogation has revealed he had logical reason for finding and killing the woman. Why, Sidney? It seems they were rather close some 11 years ago. That she ran away and left him. So he finally found her and killed her because he loved her. And received, shall we say, his complete revenge by placing her where her head would be publicly displayed, as his had been. Uh, maybe. At any rate, my men have scoured the grounds. Both Morgan and the body of the woman still missing. Where would they go? The native quarter, likely. Disappearance is easily managed there. In any event, that's where I intend to search. Sidney, I don't think Calhoun is guilty. We shall see, O'Hara. We shall see. Phelps left to begin his search at the native quarter, but I had other ideas. There were too many places around a tent show where a body could be hidden, and Calhoun would know them all. I went to the office of the gypsy. Empty. But I happened to notice the pictures on the walls, faded photographs of the circus in better days, evidently much better days. And I saw something else. One of the pictures was of a bareback rider leaping from one horse to another. It was pretty clear who she was. I went outside. It was getting dark, and the tents were flapping in the rising wind. I waited, and I saw the geek slip out from behind two wagons and start down the street. I followed. He went some six blocks, then turned in at the office of a marriage broker. The office belonged to a guy named Olin Marquine. I waited till Howard came out, then I went in. Oh, Hara, my friend. Hello, Owen. Aha, you finally find the little girl you like, yes? Yeah? Uh, I'm not here to get married. No waiting here. All in six, license. That little guy that just left. Ah, he not get married either. <laughs> smart fellow like you. Uh, I'm not so smart that way. Well, Olin Makina arranged snappy divorce, too. What the little fellow want? Oh, I could not preach a confidence, O'Hara. Okay, okay. Here you are. Oh, but then he did not swear me to secrecy. He hired me to perform a marriage ceremony tonight. Marriage? I'm to be at the carnival with my briefcase at nine o'clock sharp. Who are you supposed to marry? Oh, he would not tell me, but I can fill in official documents after affair. Mm, if you're not too nervous to hold a pen. Only my nervous. <laughs> Only with women. Wait until one minute after nine. Maybe you'll change your mind. Huh? <laughs> back to the tent show. All the lights were out. I searched among the tents and the small boxes on the wheels that served for living quarters, trying to find the one that belonged to Howard. No luck. Then I heard a metallic rattle and saw a slender figure passing nearby. I stepped quickly over and found, about to take a tray of hot food into a dumpy box on wheels, Howard the Geek. Careful. I almost stopped. Listen, is Morgan inside your wagon? Mm -hmm. Stay away from them now. And he's in there, huh, with her? Please, leave him be. Before I go in, I want to know one thing. Uh, Why did the Armenian's big-time circus go broke? Oh, it was never a big-time circus. All right, but why did it go broke? Because, because she, she stole all the money and ran away with it. Mrs. Calhoun? Mm. How would you know that isn't the truth? Yes, she, she was the bareback rider. She stole all the money. Okay, Howard. Look, I want you to do something. What? Go find the gypsy. Bring him here. It's important. You're going in? Yeah. Oh, I'll be back. I'll be back. Please tell him I'm his best friend. Who is? Not Howard Morgan. O'Hara. O'Hara. The light switch is by the door. Yeah, I see it. I turn the light off. 
I don't feel like giving a performance. The light stays on. I'm not used to talking to a man's back. Hey, you want me to, to turn and face you? It's about time we talk face to face. All right, you keep a warning this. All right. I'll turn. Oh. Why don't you gasp like my public? I've been around, Morgan. Maybe too much. I've seen too many people who had nice faces and nothing else. At least they Howard had... said the woman was in here. He... Where is she? Behind this? No, don't, don't. Don't, don't go behind that curtain. Look, I know you didn't kill her. She came back to me. I, I guess we weren't ever really married before. We will be now. Morgan, I gotta tell you something and rather not. Eleven years ago, this was a fairly big circus. Eleven years ago, she ran away. The circus went broke overnight. Oh, they say she took the money. She's been living in Hong Kong in eleven years, broke. Not a dime. Well, then, she didn't take the money. She, she was running away from me. Morgan, there's something you know, but you won't believe. What? A face doesn't make a man. Yeah, but if she didn't take it, who, who did? You're aboard. My friend, you're still with us. Howard. Howard, maybe you'd better talk now about what really happened 11 years ago, huh? Yes. I... I took the money, Morgan. So she would be blamed and go... Go away. Away from you. You took the money? I... I was lonely, Morgan. You took my money? I never spent it, Gypsy. It's under my bed. Always I thought... She did it. I... I thought so, Gypsy. Revenge. You killed her, Gypsy. It was a mistake. Geeks steal my money. Oh, he goes now. No, no, Gypsy. See, I... I have a gun, too. Careful, Morgan. Once all, all of us, your performers, saved to buy this gun. It took a long time. You're not a man. You no shoot nothing. We chose lots to see who would kill you. I, I took the gun to stop them. I made a mistake. Morgan... Then you go first. I... 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 feel bad. It's all over, Morgan. Gypsy's dead. I... I never killed before. No. No, Morgan. Give me your gun. Howard, you've been hit. Now, you see... O'Hara, I shoot the gypsy. <coughs> O'Hara, you, you, you saw the gypsy wasn't dead. I killed him. You, you saw. Howard. Sure, Howard, I saw. And I'll remember. About put 30 to my story. I called Commissioner Phelps from the telephone in Morgan's caravan car, told him everything, then went back to my hotel to try and sleep. The next day, it was cool and clear after the rains. Now, back in Commissioner Phelps' office, I watched him plug in his hot plate to brew his favorite oolong tea. Tea, old boy? Yeah, thanks, Sidney. It's been kind of chilly. Here we are. Storm's running out. So it is. Uh, Phelps. Yes, old boy? What are you going to do about Morgan Calhoun? What you mean to say is, who really killed the gypsy? Morgan Calhoun or Howard? Well, no matter who did it, I'd call it self-defense. Hmm, possibly. But there's really nothing I can do. Now? What do you mean? My men informed me that at precisely 7.10 this morning, a man answering the description of Morgan Calhoun was seen ascending the gangplank of the SS President Grant, obviously en route to the United States. You mean he was out walking in the daylight? So I am informed. Sidney. And I'm afraid his extradition will be quite impossible. Yeah, but, uh... Sidney, if the ship left this morning, your men had plenty of time to pick him up. Well, sometimes, O'Hara, the wheels of justice grind exceeding slow. Hmm. But like the mills of the guards, Commissioner, sometimes they grind exceeding fine. <laughs> Oh, hello, Stop.
stars Jack Moyles in the title role, with Byron Kane as Commissioner Phelps. Others in the cast were Anne Stone, Sidney Miller, Fritz Feld, Edgar Barrier, and Ira Gosell. <laughs> O'Hara is written by Gilbert Thomas and is produced and directed each Sunday night at 8.30 by Tommy Tomlinson and Sterling Tracy for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. O'Hara, Hong Kong, October 29th. Here is the story of a very unfortunate little boy who got stranded down an old Macau. O'Hara, the transcribed reports from one of America's noted foreign correspondents, whose syndicated column appears throughout the world. Whenever I feel in the need of a little excitement, or when I find myself becoming bored with Hong Kong, or I'm running short on stories for the column, I make the 35-mile trip to the Portuguese colony of Macau. They call it the Monte Carlo of the Orient, and they boast that if you can't get it in Macau, you can't get it anywhere. A friend of mine lives in Macau. His name is General Yip Kim Chung, and last Thursday I decided to pay him a visit. So a little past eight in the morning, I was leaning against the rail of the small passenger steamer, watching a school of porpoise racing along in front of the bow. I'd been standing there maybe five minutes when he came out of the cabin to join me. Boy, they sure can swim fast, can't they? Huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they sure can. How fast do you think they're going now? Oh, maybe 16, 17 knots. Gee. Uh, well, how many miles an hour is that? Well, let's see. That's uh, almost 20, I think. Gee, I sure wish I could swim 20 miles an hour. <laughs> what would you do if you could? Oh, get in the Olympics and stuff like that. Oh, you want some gum? It's American. No, thanks, son. Not right now. Hey, are you a sailor? No. No, I'm not. Do I look like one? <laughs> not exactly, but you know all about knots and those porpoises. Well, I used to do some sailing on weekends. A friend of mine had a boat. Gee, that sure must have been fun. Yeah. Hey, hey, w- will you look at the junks? Boy, hundreds of them. Mm-hmm. They're all fishing. Gee, those black ones remind me of pirate ships. You suppose we'll meet up with any pirates today? No, I doubt it. Pirates were chased out of these waters almost 20 years ago. Well, that's not what my pop says. Oh? Uh-uh. In his letter, he said a lot of smugglers make their headquarters in Macau. And he said a lot of pirates have gone into business there. <laughs> You know something? I have to admit, your pop's right. Well, sure he is. My pop wouldn't say anything that wasn't... Hey, look at those porpoises, Joe. Yeah. Where do you live, Tommy? In Tokyo with my mom and stepdad. We moved there last week when he got transferred. Before that, we lived on... Hey, how'd you know my name? It's on the tag that's pinned on your coat. Oh, I forgot about that. You traveling alone? Yeah. I'm going to visit my pop in Macau for a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. What's your name? O'Hara. Bob O'Hara. Well, I'm glad to meet you, Mr. O'Hara. Oh, thank you. I'm oh, glad to meet you, Tim. Please do not ever disappear like that again. Oh, gee, I just came out to watch the porpoises jump. What's the matter, Sturtis? Are you giving you trouble? No, not really, Mr. O'Hara. But it is my duty to watch him, and every time I turn my back, he's gone, just like a firecracker making noise. (laughs) Now, you come along inside, Tommy. I want you to finish your milk. I talked to the boy once more before we rounded the point that marks the entrance to the small harbor of Macau. I learned that his father was a Portuguese national. He had met Tommy's mother while in the States going to college. And then, a few years after Tommy was born, they were divorced. It was just 11 when they lowered the gangplank, 
I went ashore and stood in line with the other passengers waiting for the immigration officer to check my passport. Hey, Mr. O'Hara. Yeah, Tommy? Do you know how long this takes? I'll only take a few minutes. You, you got your passport handy? Sure. Do you see your father anywhere, Tommy? How can I? Gee, it's so crowded. Where exactly did you say for you to meet him? Right here where they look at your passport. You should be waiting on the other side of the entrance gate. No, I told you. He said he'd meet me right here. Well, don't you worry about it, Tommy. He'll show up. Oh, I'm not, Mr. O'Hara. My pop always does everything he says he's going to do. He'll be here. Because I go over to Macau quite often, most of the immigration officers know me. And a moment later, one of them handed me my usual 24-hour tourist permit. I said goodbye to Tommy and told the stewardess that I'd be going back on the same steamer that afternoon. A few minutes later, I arrived at the business establishment of my friend, Yip Kim Chung. Kim Chung had once been a general in the Nationalist Army. Since his arrival in Macau, he had acquired the most luxurious gambling house on the inappropriately named Street of Happiness. The general seemed taller and heavier than I remembered. We had a long talk, an even longer lunch, and then I returned to the dock to board the steamer. Mr. So O'Hara, please. What is it, stewardess? The Castro boy. Tommy? Well, what about him? His father has not yet come to meet him, and he feels very bad. Well, that's a shame. Where's the boy? Over there, against the wall, watching everyone who comes in from the street. Oh, I see. Uh, did you try calling Mr. Castro? Several times, but there was no answer. Please see what you can do to help him. Sure. He cannot stay here, in this place. And because he is a child, they will not allow him to enter Macau unless an adult assumes full responsibility for him. They they want him to go back to Hong Kong this afternoon. It will be difficult to make him leave, Mr. O'Hara. I'll take care of him. Hi. Hi. Well, I hear your father must have his dates mixed up. I guess he thinks you're arriving tomorrow instead of today, huh? Oh, no, Mr. O'Hara, he couldn't be mixed up. He bought the airplane tickets and reserved the seat. And in his letter, he said to take this boat today. Well, maybe he's a little absent-minded. Maybe he forgot, Tommy. If you had a son and he was coming to visit you for the first time in seven years, would you forget? No. No, I, I guess you're right, Tommy. Mr. O'Hara, I must go aboard now. Will you? Yes, sure. I'll, I'll catch the late boat tonight or the early one tomorrow morning. You, you go right ahead, Stuart. Thank you. Tommy, I... Hope your father comes for you very soon. He will. I know it. Goodbye, Tommy. Bye. And thanks. Oh, Tom, you, you still got some of that American chewing gum? Oh, yeah. Can I have a stick of it? Okay. Now, mint or raspberry? I don't really care. Oh, raspberry's the best. Here. Thanks, Tom. Hey, you mind if I sit down there beside you? Oh, no. It's not very clean. Oh, that's Okay. Tommy, we're going to have to figure out something. I guess you know those immigration men don't want you staying here. I won't go back to Hong Kong or any place else. They can't make me. Oh, yes, they could if they wanted to. But we're going to see if we can't fix it so that they don't want to, huh? Well, how? Well, if they'll let me, I'll be responsible for you until my permit runs out tomorrow morning. Well, oh, gosh, Mr. Now, now wait, a, wait a minute, young man. I, I don't know yet if they'll let me. I'll tell you what, you stay right here and I'll go and ask him. Had a deal? Yes, sir. Oh, Tommy, uh, you know what your father does, don't you? I mean, what kind of a job he has? Oh, sure. He's the principal of one of the schools here. Oh? Uh -huh. Well, do you know which one? No, I... Oh, that's right. Don't worry about it. Now, look, here's what we'll do. I'll call your father's house again, and if he isn't there, we'll find out where he teaches. Okay? Sure, Mr. O'Hell. That'll be okay. I signed the necessary papers and then tried to reach Mr. Castro by phone, but there was still no answer. So, with Tommy's help, we carried his things out to a cab and asked the driver to take us to the Macanese equivalent of the Board of Education. It was in a large stone building. Tommy stayed with the cab while I went inside.
Estamos cerrados hoy. Vuelvo mañana. Oh, 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 friend. I, I'm sorry. I don't understand you. Do you speak English? Yes. I said we're closed for the day. Come tomorrow. Well, I won't have time tomorrow. I'm leaving for Hong Kong on the early boat. Uh, sorry, sir. Now, wait a minute. Oh, hold it. Look, all I want is the name of the school where Louis Castro is the principal, the, the head teacher. You are an American, are you not, sir? Yeah, that's right. Where are you staying? At the Bella Vista. Do you have your passport? Well, sure, but... May I see it, please? Oh, look, don't you understand? All please, I want is the name sir. of... All right. Hey. Thank you. Very well, Mr. O'Hara. You're satisfied now? That you're an American? Yes. Excuse me. Hmm? I hope you don't mind talking out here in the hall. I found it to be much safer. Safer from what? You all need school teachers? Mr. O'Hara, why are you so interested in locating Mr. Castro? Because his son is waiting outside. Now, Castro was supposed to meet him this morning when the boat docked, but he didn't show up, and I'm helping the boy find him. Okay? That is your only reason? Now, now, look, mister, I've answered all the questions I intend to. Will you tell me the name of that school? The name does not matter. Castro is not there. All right, where is he? I don't know. All I do know is that he telephoned his school's office this morning before the first class. He said he would not be in today. Well, that's all? He didn't, he didn't say why, or he isn't sick, is he? No, and he has not been at home all day. Now, we know that already, well... Next thing to do is check the hospital. He is not in a hospital, Mr. Hara. I inquired this afternoon. Now, why would you do that? Uh, Mr. Hara, I'm sure I could be of more help to you later tonight if you would care to meet me. All right. Where? Any public place where we would not be conspicuous. How about General Yip's gambling palace? Fine. Say at 11... Oh, it is uh, usually a very crowded... Perhaps we should arrange to meet in a particular section. I'll be right outside the general's office. I shall find you, Mr. O'Hara. You better. I didn't trust the little clerk any more than he had trusted me. And I knew he'd be watching as I walked to the cab, so when I reached it, I had Tommy step out on the curb for a moment. Then we started for the Bella Vista. I was wondering why that clerk had been so cautious when I noticed that Tommy was watching me. I smiled at him and hoped he hadn't realized just how worried I was. There's a terrace dining room with a dance floor, orchestra, and a view at the Bella Vista. And to give our morale a boost, I decided that we should have dinner out there. We'd finished our dessert and were watching the dancers when a waiter approached and handed me a note. Mr. O'Hara? Mr. O'Hara? Now, look, let me finish on it. I'm not sure, Tommy. Oh, isn't it signed? Yeah, yeah, but... Tommy, you're getting to be a big boy now. You're almost a man, and it's time that you knew that people have to do things sometimes that seem cruel to, to other people, but are really the best thing for everybody. You mean like Mom making me take cash Yeah, away? that's right. Well, sometimes when they do these things, they can't always explain why they're doing them. Now, do you understand that? Yes, sir, I think so. Oh, good. Now, Tommy, would you recognize your father's handwriting if you saw it? Well, sure, he writes up. It's from my pop, isn't it, Mr. O'Hara? Yahoo! When's he Tommy, coming to get me? Tommy, now... Did he say? Is it going to be tonight or in the morning? Tommy, will you stop? Tommy, stop it, will you? Well, now, look. Will. Now, wait a minute. Now, you read this, but first I want you to tell me if it's your father's handwriting. Well, let's see. Yeah, that's Pop's writing room. All right, now you're sure of that, huh? Yes, sir. Oh, Pop wrote it. And that's the way he always signs his name. Didn't you believe he wrote it? Well, I just wanted to be sure, Tommy. All right, you. You go ahead and read it now. Okay. Dear Mr. O'Hara. Hey, how come he didn't send it to me? Just, just, just read it, Tommy, will you? Yes, sir. I regret not being able to thank you personally for the great kindness you have... Uh, uh, it's accorded, Tommy. Oh, yeah. Uh, for the great kindness you have accorded my son, Tommy. However, business affairs which arose while my son was en route allow me no time to see the boy much as I would care to. Go on. Go on, son. Just, just remember what I told you. 
Enclosed, you will find his return plane ticket. Please see if he leaves at the earliest possible moment. Thanks again. Louis Castro. I'm sorry, son. He could have at least found time to say hello to me. He could have brought this letter himself or called on the phone. Why didn't he, Mr. O'Hara? It it isn't fair. Gee, we made all kinds of plans. We're going to go hiking and do so many things. So all right, he got busy, but why couldn't he take time out just to... Just to see me for a minute. Why, Mr. O'Hara? Why couldn't he? I don't know, son. I just don't know. I've been around a long time. I've seen a lot, and there isn't much that one human being can do to another that will really bother me, but this did. Upstairs, I told Tommy I was sure his father really wanted to see him, and he probably felt just as bad as Tommy did because he couldn't. Tommy didn't believe me, and I didn't believe it myself. I wanted to meet this Louis Castro. I wanted to see a man who was so busy he couldn't spare five minutes for his son. Finally, I managed to get Tommy into bed, and about an hour later, he was sound asleep. I asked one of the bellboys to keep an eye on our room, and then I walked down to General Yip Kim Chung's gambling palace. I had told the general at lunch that I was leaving on the afternoon steamer for Hong Kong, so I knew he'd be surprised to see me. Oh, Mr. O'Hara, you go right in the place. Thank you, Pian. No, by my troth, no man who is mortal can possibly be here in this room and in Hong Kong at the same time. So hold, fiend or devil, whatever ye be, and state your purpose, or else I won't buy you a drink. <laughs> so after that bit of literary murder, you ought to buy Shakespeare. <laughs> and how I would like to. What wonderful gutty stuff that man wrote. What a soldier I could have made of him. Well, General, you probably would have. Ah, oh, I see your point. Well, I am glad you're staying overnight. But you should have let me know earlier. We could have arranged something. Here you are, my friend. Thanks. I really didn't know until after I reached the boat that I was going to... Oh, a girl? No. No, a little boy's father didn't show up to meet him. So I'm taking care of him. Oh, uh, where is his father? He's busy. Too busy to see him even once. Instead, he sent a note telling the boy to go back home to his mother. So he's doing that in the morning. The father and mother are divorced? Yeah. Hmm. That is sad. Excuse me. Hmm. Who? Who is there? Here. I have heard that you're Miss O'Hara. Yes? Miss O'Hara, there is man who saw you enter here. Portuguese man. He say... He meet with you now, 11 o'clock. Now you tell him to forget it, Pian. Tell him it, it isn't important anymore. Yes, sir. I tell him as he said. Who, uh, who was that Portuguese man? Oh, man who might know where Tommy's father is. But right now, I don't care. Well, how is he... your drink, my friend? Oh, it's fine. It's fine. Thanks. You know, you're tired. You should relax more, O'Hara. Sure. It's a good thing you're not in my business. You would soon be bankrupt. Now, what makes you think so? Oh, you let the troubles of other people become your own. Well, sometimes I can't help it. General, how many Portuguese live here in Macau? Ah, last census, 1,204, of which almost 73% favor this house when they play. Well, then you know most of them, huh? Oh, not by their faces, but by their characters on wealth or lack of wealth. Well, do you know a man named Louis Castro? He's the principal, head teacher for one of the schools here. Oh, I know of the man. Uh, to my knowledge, he has never been inside this house. Well, what do you know about him? Only what I have heard. The two sons of my nephew attend his school. My nephew believes that Mr. Castro is a man who should be much respected. Oh, really? Well, I have a story for your nephew. 
Castro's the man who's too busy to see his own son. Luis Castro? No, I find that hard to believe. Well, I can show you the note he sent me. Oh, I don't doubt your word, O'Hara. But for a man who loves children as Castro does, enough to have made them his life's work, it is indeed strange he would treat his son the way you have described. What was that? Do you not listen when I speak? No, no, I heard you, General. I heard you fine. What the general had said was an obvious fact, a truth. Yet it hadn't occurred to me because I had wanted to believe only the worst of Louis Castro. I'd started disliking him at the dock when he hadn't shown up to meet Tommy. And this, with the effect the note had had on me, had made me blind to the facts. So blind that someone who didn't want me asking questions about Castro's disappearance had been able to make a first-class fool of me. I looked around the gambling hall a couple of times and then went outside. Pardon, senor. Huh? Are you a doctor? No, no, I'm not. Oh, excuse me. I must find a doctor. What? The man has been stabbed. He ran down into the gambling palace. I looked down into the street where several people were gathering, and then I started down toward them. Excuse me. Hiya. Will you, will you let me through? Please? Excuse me, please. Here, let me Here, don't, don't, don't try to talk. Today is good. Don't. Oh, Hara. Yeah. Oh, Hara. What? Please, ask them to call the priest. I will. I'll get him for you. Wait, huh? uh, what do you wanted to know? Uh, members of Dragon Society of Juan Castro. He wouldn't listen. They take him. No, please, get priest. By the time I found a priest, the clerk was dead. I needed a couple of stiff drinks and a lot of help. So I went back to the general and I told him what had happened. But it was not your fault, O'Hara. Oh, now, don't try to con me, general. Of course it was my fault. All I had to do when he came here was stand up and walk to that door and ask him to come in. And an hour later, you would have had a knife in your back. Maybe. But in the meantime, we'd have known where to find Castro. We can still know this. Oh, how? The Dragon Society is not a large organization, O'Hara. But it is a rich one. Most of the members are merchants. And most of them play here. Among the names in my file, I am sure there are many who belong to this society. I will choose one with little courage. Great. And we ask him to take us to Castro, and of course he does. Yes, exactly. It may take a few minutes before he's willing to do this. Well, now look, General. Well, if you do not care to witness the interrogation of her, you may wait outside. I played Fantan, lost a few dollars, then tried Mahjong and lost a few more. Then Pien, the general servant, told me it was time to go back into the office. Ah, friend O'Hara, allow me to present another friend of mine. This is Mr. Sun An Yi. He is a member of the famed Dragon Society and has asked to meet you. Yes, I just bet he has. Is he not a miserable specimen? <laughs> you will never imagine where my men found him. Okay, I give up where. Here. Yeah. Playing Fantan. Huh? <laughs> Amusing? Oh, and before I forget, this knife you may have for a souvenir. It was his duty to silence the clerk. Oh, he's the boy, huh? Will he talk? <laughs> like a magpie. Oh, please. I tell you anything. Please. All right. All right. Where is Castro? He, uh, he is being held at the Lung Chi. You know where that is, General? Oh, yes. It is a hotel. Not far from here. Why are you holding him prisoner? What did he do to you? He did nothing to me personally. But to the Dragon Society, he is a dangerous man. Tomorrow, they send him to China. Keep talking, Mr. Sun, please. Yes, yes. Dragon Society members are merchants, traders. Do most of business with the Red China. If trade with China stopped, we would be bankrupt. Mr. Castro, dangerous man. But why? 
How could he hurt your trade with China? He is a strong anti-communist. He is teacher. He teaches communism not good. He is respected by many people. They listen to him. They believe what he say. And now he is to be given government post. Who can say what changes he will make? Of course to be made. Perhaps China become angry with us. Then no more trade. Ah. Well, General, I think it's time we call the police. Oh, please, my friend, not the police. Hmm? They would raid Lung Chi's and find only the usual filth. All right, so you're a general. You tell me. I have ten Koreans working here. They are very tall, very large men. They would welcome the exercise. You know what you are to do, O'Hara. Yes, General. I know. Repeat it, please. I do not want you to have any trouble. All right, I'm to wait out here near the entrance until you bring Castro out. Then it'll be my job to get him away from here. That is correct. Now you wait here, O'Hara. time I got back to the hotel. I had Tommy get up and dress. I didn't tell him where we were going or why, and he didn't care. He sat beside me quietly, expressionless, like a little lost boy. At the hospital, I asked him to go inside with me to visit a friend. Okay, Tommy. Go on in. Huh? This is my friend's room. You go on in. Okay. Go on. I waited a few minutes, and then I went in to speak to Mr. Castro. He told me he had known the Dragon Society men were after him, and just before they caught him, he had talked to the clerk from the school board. Then he sent the note to me so that Tommy would not become involved. It's funny about kids. In a moment, Tommy had forgotten everything bad that had happened to him. He wasn't lost anymore. I don't think he ever will be again. O'Hara stars Stacy Harris. It is transcribed and directed in Hollywood by Anthony Ellis. Tonight's story was written by Charles B. Smith. Featured in our cast were Richard Beals, Virginia Gregg, Don Diamond, Charlie Long, and Ben Wright. Musical supervision by Carl Fortina. Hello, this is Stacy Harris stepping out of the role of O'Hara to say that one thing foreign assignments teach you, whether they're real or fictional, is the greatness of our own free elections. One week from tomorrow, November 6th, you have a chance to cast your vote in one of the most important of those elections. Don't fail to do so. And join all of CBS News' distinguished correspondents, newsmen and analysts, stationed here, there and everywhere, to bring you the fastest, most complete election story ever. Right here on CBS Radio. The American Broadcasting Company challenges you to a startling puzzle in crime. The Adventures of Bill Lance, starring Gerald Moore, with Howard McNear as Professor Ulysses Higgins. Hello. I'm Bill Lance. I'm a composer. Also a criminologist. Perhaps it's more accurate to call me a student of human nature. You know, I believe that crime is the result of a delinquent society. That the criminal mind is a sick mind. 
and that the symptoms of that sickness are always apparent in the behavior of the criminal. So if you would expose a criminal, look for fingerprints on the doorknob, but also look for imprints on the human mind. In short, human emotions are my clues. Oh, yes. <laughs> I also play the piano. One night, I drove up into the Santa Inez Mountains with my good friend, Professor Ulysses Higgins, to visit John and Ethel Lindsay. Well, I knew the Lindsays only slightly, but their invitation had sounded urgent in any way. I liked the country. I didn't mind the sudden thunderstorm, even when I turned off Highway Number 1 onto a dirt road, which climbed through a valley to the Lindsays. But uh, I'm afraid Ulysses, as usual, thought he was unhappy. If I'd known we were going to run into a stormy night like this, Bill... I'd have thought twice about taking this trip with you. Oh, my dear professor, if you thought twice about anything, you'd never go anywhere with me. Why, did you ever give me a chance to think twice? Before I even... Watch out. Hang on, Ulysses. Well, here's your chance to start thinking, old boy. Can I look now? Yes. Open your baby blues and consider problem number one, a fallen tree across the road. (laughs) Problem number two, we're in a ditch. What do you advise me to do, Mr. Anthony? Next time, try the train. Now, he tells me. Now, let's see if we can get back on the road, huh? Oh. We're stuck. Obviously. Mm. Well, Lindsay's can't be more than five miles away, and I love to walk in the rain. Uh, five miles straight up? Why not? You always say you're the goat. No, no, thank you. I'll just stay here in the car. All right. In that case, I'll send somebody back for you with a rowboat. Wait a minute. I saw something in that flash of lightning right over there. You see it? A house. Oh, yes, yes. Come on, we can phone for help. Built-in shower. I don't know why you need me to help you telephone. You might have to borrow a nickel. I'll give it to you now. Here. Yeah, on second thought, I may not need it after all. I see what you mean. Yeah. Can't be anybody in this broken down shack, much less a telephone. Uh huh. It's all boarded up. Well, come on, Ulysses. Don't you know when to come out of the rain? Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Thoughtful, weren't they? <laughs> and boarded up the windows and left the door unlocked just so we can get dry. After you, Ulysses. I think I'll go back to the car. Matt, are you afraid of the dark? Here, you carry the flashlight. Not even a ghost. I think I'll go back to the car. You're in a rut. Why don't you find yourself a comfortable spider web and sit down? Uh, what are you going to do? Well, it's going to be a long night, Professor. There's a shadow over there in that corner. Looks suspiciously like a piano. Oh, no, not that, Bill. Yes. Rain on the roof, wind in the night, a house with ancient memories. What more do I need to complete my concerto? You don't need me. That's a cinch. Oh, but, Professor, I do. Why... Your tin ear is indispensable to me. When you start grumbling, I know my music's good. Oh, my, wouldn't you know it? We break down a hundred miles from nowhere in a rainstorm, and you have to find the piano. I will admit it sounds better in this hovel than in our apartment. Yes, Professor, you're right. Sounds almost too good. <laughs> well, since I put you to sleep with my music, Professor, I felt it only fair I should wake you up same way. What's the matter? <laughs> I think the Marines have landed. We're going to be rescued. Huh? Oh, my good, good. Hey, yeah, both of us. Come on in. Oh, you, Mr. Lance? Yeah. How famous can I get? Mr. Lindsay was expecting you. I'm Parker, his chauffeur. He got worried, and so he sent me looking for you. Oh. Well, we, uh, we had a little accident. Yeah, I saw your car back there in the ditch. I'll drive you up to Lindsay's now. They're waiting for you. I can pick up your car in the morning. Oh, thanks, thanks. Come on, Professor. Our troubles are over. Oh, 
And Mr. Lance, I'd like you to meet our niece, Alice. Hello. How do you do? Oh, fine. Uh, I mean, <laughs> this is my friend, Professor Ulysses Higgins, John Ethel Lindsay, Alice Lindsay. Hello, Nice to meet you, sir. sir. <laughs> Gesundheit. Thank you, Bill. Uh, good evening, everybody. Why, you poor man, you're shivering. Yeah, well, that's all right. Oh, nonsense. Alice, take the professor and get him a nice hot cup of tea. Of course, Aunt Ethel. How about you, Mr. Lance? Would you like something? No, no, thanks, Miss Lindsay. Just take good care of the professor for me. Ah. Your niece is very attractive. Does she live here with you? Yes. She's a wonderful girl, Mr. Lance. She's one of the reasons we asked you to come here. That one's enough. The main reason's Alice's father, my brother, Julian. Tell him quickly, dear, before Alice gets back. I'll try to make it brief. Three years ago, my brother suffered a nervous collapse. It's been necessary to keep him in a sanitarium in the East for treatment. I see. For three years? Yes. Huh? Well, that's a long treatment for a breakdown. Unfortunately, it was something more than just an ordinary breakdown. It was much more serious than any of us had realized. He'd become dangerous. Does your niece know this? We've tried to spare Alice as much as possible. She only knows that her father's been very ill, that he's needed special care. You see, she doesn't know that he tried to kill her mother. I'm a cytomania. Yes. Huh? Well, uh, why would he want to murder his wife? If we knew that, perhaps we'd know the real cause of his illness. Nobody ever suspected how he felt. But he must have nursed a secret, insane hatred for her for years. And when it came out, well... It was lucky it wasn't worse. In a way, it was a blessing when Florence did die. I've always felt it was the shock of finding out the truth about Julian that really killed her. Was that when he cracked up after she died? He went completely to pieces, turned against everyone. Mr. Lance, we're frightened. Oh, but he's in a safe place. What can he do to you now? Julian disappeared from the sanitarium two weeks ago. Oh, fine. This was his home. He'll come back here. Who's that? Uh, where? That, that picture on the piano. Oh, that's Florence, Alice's mother. Oh, what a beautiful woman. Her daughter looks very much like her. Yes. Alice loved her dearly, Mr. Lance. But she loves her father, too. She mustn't ever know what really happened. That's why you wanted me to come here, huh? There's no telling what Julian might do. At that time, John was Julian's closest adult relative. So he was the one who had to declare him incompetent to keep him in the sanitarium. It wasn't an easy thing to do, Mr. Lance. No, no, it's never easy. We've had to assume complete responsibility for this place here and for Alice. I'm sure in Julian's mind, however warped, we're to blame for everything that's happened to him. I can't condemn him for that, but you can understand why we're frightened. Mm -hmm. What's even more frightening is that Alice looks just like her mother. What? A homicidal maniac might not be able to tell the difference. <gasps> well, oh. It's Alice we have to worry about. Yes? Mr. Lance, it's Alice Lindsay. Oh, hello, Miss Lindsay. Uh, I'm glad you haven't gone to bed yet. I, I wanted to talk to you. Well, come in, please. I know who you are, Mr. Lance. Oh, that's nice. You're a criminologist. Oh, I thought it'd be better than that. Does, does your being here have anything to do with, with my father? Why should it? Your father's convalescing in the East, isn't he? Yes, of course, but... Oh, I don't know. I, I just think something's wrong. Wrong? Ethel and John are wonderful to me, but they forget that I'm an adult now. If something's happened to my father, I want to know. Naturally. But what makes you think anything's happened to him? I, I just feel that my aunt and uncle are worried. That they're trying to protect me from something. And then I came along, and because I happen to be off and on, a criminologist of sorts, you expect the worst, huh? <laughs> well, I, I've got news for you. I'm really a frustrated piano tuner. <laughs> <laughs> you play the piano? No, not anymore. No, that's too bad. Look, if, if I tune the piano downstairs, will you promise me to start practicing again? Well, perhaps. I know I should never have given it up. Father loves music so much. He always wanted me to... Yes. Tell me, have you seen your father since he's become ill? No, I, I'm almost afraid to. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry if I've bothered you, Mr. Lance. I, I'm, I'm really very glad you came to visit us. I hope you'll stay a while. Young lady, you don't know what you're saying. I can become an awful nuisance. <laughs> I don't think I'd mind. Well, good night. Night, Alice. Uh, 
Did you come all the way up here to the Lindsay's just to throw pebbles in their pond? Uh-huh. So I could watch the ripples. You know, I haven't done that since I was a little boy. It's funny, Ulysses. One minute a man's mind can be as clear and as placid as this pond. And one little thing can muddy it up. Now what's happened to confuse you? I wasn't talking about me. I was just wondering. A man with a beautiful wife, a lovely daughter... Turns out to be a homicidal maniac. Why? If you try to tell me we came up here looking for a lunatic? I don't know what we came up here for, but that's why we're staying. What are you supposed to do about it? You're supposed to try to prevent him from satisfying his ugly impulses, are I guess. Are you a criminologist or a bodyguard? I'm a piano tuner. Oh, no, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as a matter of fact, I might even teach Alice Lindsay to play part of my concerto. Oh. Now you're throwing pebbles in the pond, Professor. Why? <laughs> I just want to show you a picture. Of how a young man's mind can become distorted by a pretty girl. Mind if I ride with you, Alice? Oh, good morning, Mr. Lance. Hello. Going any place in particular? Well, where are you going? Same place. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad the weather's turned clear. Last night's storm wasn't a very nice greeting for you. Oh, sound and fury signifying nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Did um, Uncle John ask you to follow me? No, darling. Nobody would have to ask me to do that. I just wondered. He doesn't like me to go too far from the house alone. About two weeks ago, we had a bout with a rattlesnake. Any resemblance is purely coincidental. <laughs> well, you never get into trouble if you keep your eyes open. Oh, oh boy! Oh, 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 oh. Oh. That was a rifle. Uh, Bill, you think somebody was shooting at me? Oh, no, no. I must have been an amateur hunter. Well, what would he be hunting around here? I don't know. But a hunter might take a pot shot at the wrong game. Bill, if you don't mind, I, I'd rather you wouldn't mention this to John and Ethel. It... It would only upset them, and after all, nothing did happen to me. Uh, homicidal maniac. Never did like the country anyway. Uh, let's see. If you ask me, uh, I can find a better place to die in. Let's see. Oh. Going someplace, Professor? Home? Oh, we just arrived. Nothing for you to do but enjoy a vacation. Oh, yeah, it's a vacation, all right. A long one in a morgue. Charming thought. If you want to stay up here in the wilderness with a lunatic at large, that's your pleasure. I'd like to live a little longer. You would. Well, what brought you to such a cataclysmic decision, Professor? Oh, nothing much. I just went for a walk, got a little tired, lay down underneath a beautiful tree, and somebody tried to murder me. You look pretty healthy for you. Only because of the dream I had. Oh, dabbling in psychoanalysis now. I dreamt I was crossing the university campus and some football players started throwing rocks at me. <laughs> Undoubtedly because you flunked them in their midterm. And I woke up just when the rocks started hitting me. Real rocks. Half the mountain sliding down right on top of me. Oh, you picked the wrong tree. I don't all. think that was any ordinary landslide either. Why not? It was a heavy rain last night. Somebody shoved that mountain down on me. Powerful fellow. Your lunatic. Mine. You can have mine, leave it. Yeah. Just when it's getting to be fun, huh? Well, it's not like you, Professor. Oh, it's easy for you to say that. Nothing's happened to you yet. Oh, nothing has. Uh, well, let me tell you something. I got shot at this morning. You got shot at what? Yeah, so we're even. Oh, but Ulysses, please, don't talk about your last slide in front of Alice Lindsay. Huh? Well, she might believe you. There's no point in alarming her. <laughs> Lance, do you mind waiting a little longer for lunch? John should be here any minute. Oh, I'm happy, Mrs. Lindsay. Don't worry about me. Um, can I help you, Aunt Ethel? No, Alice. You stay and entertain, Mr. Lance. Yes. And how can I entertain you, Mr. Lance? Uh, <clears throat> yes. Well, do you have any old Parcheesi sets lying about? Yes. What? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're here, Bill. It's fun having company. Yeah, well, it must be pretty lonely for a young girl up here in the mountains. Oh, I was never really lonely until Mother died and Father went away. Oh, I'm sorry. I I'm supposed to be entertaining. Anyway, I I've stayed here because I've wanted to. Uncle John has asked me if I'd rather live in the city, but I, I grew up here and I'm used to it. 
You know, I can see it would be very easy to get used to with you around. Oh, thank you. Now you're entertaining me. No, just appreciating you. And knowing myself as I do, I... Yeah. Hello, Parker. I'm glad I found you, Mr. Lance. Uh, could you come with me, please? Well, uh, Mrs. 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 Lance, it's I... about your car. I'll take 1750 No bonus. <laughs> Go ahead, Bill. I ought to help Aunt Ethel anyway. All right, since you put it that way. But don't be too long. Lunch is nearly ready. Mm. All right, Killjoy. What's the matter with my car? Well, I didn't want to alarm Miss Alice, but something has happened to Mr. Lindsay. <laughs> Mr. Lindsay. Mr. Lindsay. He's coming, too. Nasty bump on his noggin. Yeah, he must have fallen. Oh. What happened? Well, I found you lying here outside the stable, Mr. Lindsay, and I couldn't rouse you, so I went for help. Thanks, Parker. It doesn't look like anything serious, but you'll probably have a whopper of a headache. Headache? Oh, yes, yes, of course. But I'm all right now. I just stumbled and fell, I guess. Yeah, well, here, I'll help you out. No, 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 thanks. I'm fine. It's all right. Gee, I'm glad it's nothing serious. Oh, yes. I won't be needing you anymore, Parker. But um, don't mention this to Mrs. Lindsay. She'd only worry, and it was nothing at all. Okay, uh, I won't say anything. I guess we'd better start for the house. Ethel's pretty punctual about lunch. Don't you want to take your rifle with you? A rifle? Oh, 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 yes. I must have dropped it. When you stumbled and fell. You know that isn't what happened. I know you're not that clumsy. Bill, he's come back. You see him? No, but no, no. But I, I know it was Julian. i just come in from riding and put my horse back in the stall. I came through this door and he must have hit me from behind. He, he tried to kill me. That's what you were afraid of, wasn't it? That's why you took your rifle with you. Yes. Do uh, people hunt much in this district? Not much. Why? Nothing. You had a good reason for taking your rifle. Lance, I... Asked you to come up here because I was afraid of the worst, but I don't think I honestly believed he would come back. But now, Bill, where's Alice? In the house with your wife. She's all right. Good. Now, if you can only stop him without Alice finding out. It might not be so easy. Maniac hasn't much consideration for other people's feelings. <laughs> Bill, I don't mind taking a walk after dinner, but three times around the house, I'm getting dizzy. Yeah, we have been going around in circles, haven't we? Oh, Ulysses, do me a favor. Go back inside and amuse the Lindsay's. Oh, how? Well, give him your freshman lecture on biochemistry. Oh, that's very funny. Well, where are you going? For a walk under the stars. Perhaps if I contemplate the music of the spheres, it will give me some ideas of my own, huh? And then if I can find a piano. There's one in the living room. Hmm. It's out of tune. Well, where are you going to find another one in this... Ca- you mean you're going all the way down the mountain to that broken-down shack? Professor, you're positively psychic. Oh, boy, oh. Mr. Lance, 
You must have been waiting for me. You play very well. Something of your own, isn't it? I like about this new generation. Imagination. Courage. You have a great deal of courage, Mr. Lance. And that's why my dear brother and sister-in-law ask you to stay with them. To, uh, protect them. Wasn't it? <laughs> but Mr. Lance... Is going to protect you. Ah, here he is now. <laughs> well, Bill, you'll never believe this, but I was just saying that you've missed your calling. You should have been a musician. Yes, Bill. Won't you play something for us tonight? Some other time, Alice. Right now, I'm afraid I have bad news. Oh, what? Uh, what is it? Bill. What's the matter? Well, this isn't very easy to say, but somebody's got to say it. Alice, your father escaped from a sanitarium two weeks ago. Escaped? Oh, oh I was sure something was wrong. Where is he? He came back here. You've just seen him. Wait, please. Alice, you remember that shot? Uh, shot? Yes, somebody shot at Alice on me while we were out riding. Julian! <laughs> and Ulysses, you were right. Huh? A small landslide that had you hustling was started by someone, by Julian Lindsay. And, John, you have a large bump on your head to tell you your brother's return. What is all this? What are you trying to tell us? I met your father tonight. He's here? I want to see him. Alice, your father was a sick man. Was? He wasn't responsible. He thought I was his enemy. He tried to... Well, what I had to do was in self-defense. Do? Uh... What? Oh, no. No! Daddy! Oh, Jerry! I'm terribly sorry. Oh, oh, Dead. Oh, my poor Alice. Alice, oh, there's no. nothing I can say. You have to believe me. I couldn't help it. You couldn't help it. You killed my father and you say you couldn't help it. Please, Alice, I'm responsible for this. I asked Mr. Lance to come up here because I was afraid that something, something even worse might happen. Worse? My dear, we didn't want you to know how really sick your father was. You don't kill a man because he's sick. Alice, darling, it's our fault because we didn't tell you. You you don't understand about your father. I know he wasn't well, but you tried to tell me that he was insane. Isn't that it? Well, I won't believe you. I'm afraid, Mrs. Lindsay, you'll have to tell Alice the real reason why our father was committed to the asylum. No. No, I well, can't. I, I want to know what was it. I had hoped we'd never have to tell you this, Alice. But I don't suppose you'll believe any of us unless we do. Your father tried to kill your mother. Oh, no. Okay, Julian, there's your cue. Julian, no. I hope, oh. Ethel, that that will be the last lie you ever tell my daughter. Father. I told you. I told you it wouldn't work. I knew he'd come back. I knew they'd find it. Shut daughter. up, Ethel, you fool. Why, Mr. and Mrs. Lindsay, how revealing. <laughs> Um, how were you so sure Julian Lindsay was in that old shack all the time? Professor, if you had listened more attentively when I played, you'd have realized that the old piano in that shack was in tune. And pianos just don't stay in tune all by themselves. All oh, right, all right, all right. But I knew he was around here without listening to music. You did, huh? You mean you let your imagination run away with you? <laughs> what you call a landslide was just a few harmless rocks rolling down the side of a hill. Oh, no, wait a minute. And Dad. there was really no more danger to you than the, the shot that missed both Alice and myself by several feet. Or the lodge, but innocuous bump on John's head. You know, all those attempts were just a little too clumsy and a little too obvious. Is that so? Yeah, it made me wonder. You see, there was evidence that a sick mind was at work. Mm -hmm. But evidence can point in many directions, isn't that so? Yeah. It only makes real sense when you can link it up with human behavior. Yes, but how did you know uh, how Julian would behave? You didn't even meet him until just... So I had to imagine how he must have felt. He had a breakdown. And when he came out of it a little, he, he discovered that he wasn't in any ordinary hospital, but an insane asylum. Yeah, yeah. Then he realized what his brother and his sister-in-law were up to. 
They had him committed to a living death and had, incidentally, taken over a very tidy estate and everything he possessed. Mm -hmm. Now, Professor, if I were Julia, knowing all this, I'd say that the wrong man was committed to the asylum, that the really sick mind was John's. John was frustrated. He wanted everything his brother had. Oh, so Julian escaped from the asylum and tried to scare John to death. Yeah, you can put it that way. Julian knew that since he had been declared insane, nobody would believe him. So he thought he'd come back and terrorize his persecutors, hoping he could break them down and expose them. Oh, and you helped him out by making them think he was dead. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. But the hardest thing I had to do was to make Alice suffer. But Ulysses was the only way I could catch the Lindsays off guard, give them a brief sense of security. Yes? <laughs> well, that's not bad. That's not bad at all, William Ferdinand. <laughs> but tell me, what real evidence did you have that Julian Lindsay wasn't crazy? Human emotion, that's all. When his brother told me Julian had an insane hatred for his wife, I wondered. I wondered if a man hated his wife so much that he tried to kill her and then go to pieces when she died. But look, if if he loved his wife and she died... Well, Professor, can you think of a better reason for a man to have a breakdown? Well, frankly, Bill, I can think of a better reason for a man to have a breakdown. All right, Professor Higgins, what is a better reason for a man to have a breakdown? Having to go on week after week at the same time over the same stations, listening to you play the piano. You have been listening to another in the series of intriguing mysteries starring Gerald Moore as Bill Lance with Howard McNear as Ulysses Higgins. Tonight's supporting cast included Herb Butterfield as John, Bill Boucher as Julian, Georgia Ellis as Alice, Anne Stone as Ethel, Jack Carrington as Parker, with music composed and played by Rex Corey. us again next week same time over most of these same ABC stations when we bring you another of Bill Lance's strange experiences developing from a man's fear that his wife and her lover will kill him. Tonight's Bill Lance adventure was written by Milton Merlin. The production was directed by Dwight Hauser. is Mr. Moto, Mr. I.A. Moto. NBC presents the world's greatest international secret agent, Mr. I.A. Moto, the popular Japanese character created by Pulitzer Prize winner John P. Marquand. With the straightforwardness of his American heritage and with the subtlety of his Oriental ancestors, Mr. Moto is fighting the war against communism ruthlessly and bravely. His only weapons are his brains, his courage, and his fabulous knowledge of the world from Nome to Cape Horn, from Cape Town to Murmansk. Tonight's story, The Smoke Screen, starring Mr. Moto. Mr. I.A. Moto. The boy, unbelievably young, writhed on the floor of my New York apartment. His legs convulsed in the rope which tied them together. His thin adolescent wrists strained hopelessly at the handcuffs. It is impossible not to feel sympathy for a human being possessed by such a devil. He had bitten his forefinger almost through. He screamed about a white crippled cat that clawed at him. There were hollows of anguish under his eyes. His skin glistened bloodless, and his throat stretched with suffering. Mr. Moto, please, please. Tell me the truth, Sasha. Not me, a cabin, I will. 
Please, Mr. Moto, melt me some of God's medicine. I can stand it much longer than you, Zosh. And I have plenty of time. I'm going crazy. Crazy! Zosh, there are a hundred tons of opium somewhere on Manhattan Island. You know where. Now, tell me. I can't. They'll kill me. They won't. They will. They're devils. Please, Mr. Moto. I'm an addict. I'm hooked. Give it to me. You can break the habit, Zosh. I'll help you. You can be strong again, because you are young. I can't kick it, I tell you. I'm hooked. And I'm not young. I'm old. <laughs> Assignment smokescreen began in several cities of the world at once. And at first, I was the only one in America who knew of its beginnings. My information came from a friend from Tokyo, a Count Takahashi, a man of immense wealth who flew from Japan to New York to have one hour's conversation with me. Immediately after my talk, I called on Captain Beresford of the Narcotic Bureau in his New York office. Captain Beresford is a quiet, cultured man who seldom swears, seldom raises his voice. My story shocked him into a hard-faced, Stunned silence. Mr. Moto, I... I can't believe it. I am afraid, Captain Beresford, that it is quite, quite true. Tell me about this Count Taka... whatever you said. Count Takahashi. An old Japanese family. My house once served his house with honor and self-sacrifice. He feels he owes me a debt. Do you mean to say he flew all the way from Japan just to talk to you for an hour? He did. You see, he knows what opium has done to the Orient. And you're sure his information is accurate? As I am that the sun will rise in the morning. He is an ex-addict himself. I see. He knows how dangerous a weapon it can be. For 700 years, this drug has debilitated, weakened, ruined. While we may think it is impossible here, the fact remains that at one time in history... 25% of the population of the Orient either smoked opium or were addicted to its morphine derivatives. Oh, but surely in the United States we're... I to... wonder if we are. We are an erratic, excitable people. Opium has an enchantment that is difficult to resist. That is why it is so terribly dangerous. Yes, I know. Count Takahashi has reason to believe that four months ago, a shipment of 50 tons of raw opium was dumped on the market in Hong Kong. From there, it went to Tokyo. In Tokyo, it disappeared. How? It vanished as completely as if it had been swept into the sea. Hmm. Five days ago, an additional 200 tons did the same thing. Vanished. Disappeared from sight as completely as a, a tea bug in the heart of a puppy. 400 tons of opium, Captain Beresford, would supply the entire medical needs of the world for two years. The whole world. For two years. Well, frankly, I just can't believe that 400 tons of anything could get into this country without the customs department getting wind of it somewhere. The drug was smuggled to America aboard a submarine owned by the Chinese Communist Navy. It was taken ashore at night on Stewart Island. The San Juan Islands? Yes, hmm. in the state of Washington. From there it came across the continent in trucks as a shipment of canned salmon. And your friend believes it has... International implication? Count Takahashi assures me it is another tentacle of a communist octopus. Spread the dope habit. Devour the blood of America's young men and women. Lower the birth rate. You know, of course, that prolonged drug addiction frequently results in sterility. Certainly I know. Moto, we've got to work fast. Exactly, Captain Beresford. I have asked that this be made my personal assignment. <laughs> Two weeks later, a resolution condemning the Chinese Communists for permitting an international traffic in opium was adopted by the United Nations. The next month, the Kitfofa Committee was informed that large quantities of the drug would be routed through Japan to America. Captain Beresford was getting alarmed. Moto, I'm getting stepped on from higher up. In what way? There were 26 rejections yesterday from one, one army recruiting center. The draftees claimed exemption on the grounds of dope addiction. There's been 43 cases in the last week of teachers discovering addiction in children as young as 10. 10? 
Isn't that sickening? Man's inhumanity to his brother was Yes, but a lot of people are getting excited. I've been given two weeks to break this case. We've got to work through the children. I have exhausted every possible alternative. Yet for me, the children are difficult. Well, what do you mean? For a Japanese bachelor to make friends with teenagers is more difficult than it sounds. Boys, as well as girls, are suspicious of older men who attempt casual conversation. Where is that? What? I've had an idea. Jeffrey Ellington. Who's he? I read in the paper yesterday that he had recently been appointed chairman of the board of trustees of Halsey College. You know him? I knew him casually in the Orient. We were never close friends, but I would have no hesitation in telephoning him. What for? He might invite me to the school to uh, lecture on Japanese culture. Well, it doesn't sound too hopeful, but we're at the end of our rope. What's he like? I should say he is one of the most charming men I have ever met. He was born in the Orient. His father, an Englishman, left him phosphate holdings in the South Pacific, which he sold to the British government for something over two million pounds sterling. He lives in New York? Yes, in a vast house on Fifth Avenue. He's middle-aged now, and he gives his time to philosophy and his money to charity. He injured his leg as a boy. He has difficulty walking, and as a result... He's intensely interested in young people and youth work. Wants to see them get every opportunity for self-development. With that attitude and two million pounds, he might be very useful. I shall telephone him immediately and invite myself to luncheon. But, Moto, I don't quite understand why you're suddenly so interested in meeting young people. Jeffrey, may I be very rude and not tell you? Oh, your work. I see. Well, as a matter of fact, you've chosen a good time. In what way? Oh, do you mind if we have our liqueurs at the table instead of in the drawing room? My leg's acting up a bit today. Not at all. Uh, did I mention I've just recently been elected chairman of the Board of Trustees for Halsey College? Yes, I read about it. I'm beginning to center my ambitions in the coming generation. I'd like them not to lose faith in their elders. I would like them not to lose faith in themselves. Well, then you may count on my complete cooperation. The reason I say you've chosen a good time is that tomorrow night I'm giving a sort of graduation party for all these students. be about 200 of them. Would you like to come? You can meet every single one of them if you want to. I should like that very much. <laughs> Fine. Buffet, supper, and dancing. Come any time you like after 9 o'clock. The next night, the huge house blazed with light. Two hundred young people were dancing and drinking champagne. In a way, they were representative of the young of our country. Clean, decent, honest. Watching them whirl around the big ballroom, I felt proud, yet sadly nostalgic. These are troubled times for the young. They live in the threat of war. The draft hangs over their careers and their marriages. Tonight, there is a desperate quality to their merriment, as though they were snatching one last hour of dancing before settling their bill with a piper. Well, Momo, enjoying yourself? But are we not both at the age, Jeffrey, where enjoyment to be really savored should be taken in small doses? Yes, I suppose we are. Personally, I wonder where they get the vitality. That boy there is getting his from a source other than the young lady's laughing eyes. Uh, what boy? The one dancing with the girl in the white taffeta. The big blonde boy. Have you noticed his eyes? Oh, what do you mean? The pinpoint brilliant pupils. I was introduced to him. When I shook hands with him, I was shocked. Shocked? Why? His skin temperature is at least 102. See here, Moto, what are you getting at? I am suggesting that the young man is a morphine addict. Moto? Yes, a rather recent addiction. Well, you're... You're joking. On the contrary, Jeffrey. I'm deadly serious. Dope addiction in adolescence is all I think about these days. I'm working on it constantly. Oh, would you care to tell me about it? Certainly, if you are interested. But come along up to my bed. It's uh, upstairs, away from the rest of the house, and the party will run quite smoothly without us. Then, by all means, you lead the way. 
uh, through that door. I had a small elevator installed from the garage to the fourth floor. After you. Thanks. Go ahead. The elevator's automatic. Thank you. How wonderful to be able to afford private elevators. Uh, my leg bothers me quite a bit. Stairs are difficult for me. Moto, are you sure about this dope business? Quite sure. Now, this is my own private hideaway. In here I can be quite cut off from the rest of the house. Uh, sit down, make yourself comfortable. Thank you. Would you like a drink? Yes, thanks. Good, good. I have some very special rye whiskey. Hanfield Royal Ark. I believe it sells in the Chambord for $25 a pony. Really? And you're wasting it on me? <laughs> Not at all. I only serve it to my very special friends. Here you are. Thank you. Mmm, what superb bouquet. You'll forgive me if I don't join you. My doctor forbids it. Certainly. Now, tell me about this dreadful business. Oh, excuse me, won't you? This phone never rings unless it's something important. Hello? Oh, yes, Senator. I, uh, I'm afraid I can't tell you yet, but I can let you know by tomorrow noon. Well, yes, of course. I'll call you tomorrow, then. Oh, not at all. Good night. Forgive the interruption. Now, you were saying... I have been working without success for some time now on the problem of dope addiction among teenagers. Yes. I have reason to believe that Jeffrey had it suddenly gotten uh, very warm in here. Moto, what, what is it? Are you ill? I... It hurt me up. Could you... Oh, what's the matter, Moto? I... I don't know. Don't you, Moto? I do... Treffel, get over here quickly. I found the source of our interference. Use the garage entrance and the elevator and hurry, will you? <laughs> oh, what a pity the Japanese haven't learned to mind their business. It's about time. I got here as soon as I could, Mr. Errington. Who's that? His name is Moto. And don't underestimate him. A uh, trip in a boat? Yes. Can you do it tonight? Sure. And get him out of here. Anybody see you come in? I drove into the garage, took the elevator. I'll pick him up and get him out of here. What did you give him? The usual. He'll be unconscious for at least three hours. Good. Okay. And he's small, isn't he? So are rattlesnakes. You coming? Yes, go ahead. All right, don't worry, Mr. Errington. Everything's okay. Anything to report? Yeah, Zasha's in the car. I don't want peddlers who are addicts themselves. It's dangerous. Zasha's okay. Take him to the house on Long Island tomorrow. No withdrawal. He'll kick it cold turkey. Tell Dr. Holliston to cut him off cold. That's an order. All right, Mr. Errington. Anything else? Yeah, Nick got 40 new peddlers in the last week. Get young ones. Real young. 14, 13. The younger, the better. Okay. Will I put our friend in the back seat? Yes, he'll be out for three hours. Hello, Zosh. Hi. He's just hitched up the monkey. He's floating. I mean a trap off. He kicks it tomorrow. Okay, boss. Now, what about the chink? Oh, hey, listen, boss. You know I... how I react to that kind of word. It's bigoted and disgusting. He is not Chinese. He's actually an American of Japanese descent. Well, I didn't mean anything. What are you... What are you so touchy on that stuff? 
Someday I'll tell you. All right, take Mr. Moto out on the boat, shoot him and dump him overboard. As far offshore as you can get and still be back by dawn. Then take Zosh out to the Long Island house and report back here to me. All right, boss. And, uh, Trepov. Yes, Mr. Rankin? Tell the good Dr. Holliston that I'm quite aware of the process involved in developing morphine from opium. Tell him I expect him to do much better. I want 5,000 decks a day out of that lab. Uh-huh. Can I go now? Yes. And I'm sorry I struck you. Someday I'll explain why I feel so strongly about it. Well, good night, Trebov. Big meathead, who's he think he's pushing around? All right, get over, so I should stay awake. Hi, boy. I tell you, the cat's swinging high tonight. Waving anybody. This is Fifth Avenue. Gentlemen, hey. I am quite capable of shooting you both. What? The... And don't turn around, Mr. Trepoff. Just drive. My apartment, if you please. Left on 72nd. And if you don't do as I tell you, I will blow your head off. Keep quite still, Trepov. I'm warning you. Come in, Captain. I got here as soon as... Hey, what's this? This is a man named Trepov. He was commissioned by Jeffrey Errington to kill me. Errington? Incredible, isn't it? Errington tried to drug me with chloral hydrate and whiskey. He made a slight error, which I will explain later. I was to have been taken out of the boat. I overheard enough information to send Errington and his gang to jail for 20 years. Take this man and book him for felonious assault, attempted murder, whatever you like. All right. Well, what's the matter with the boy? Hiya, copper. Having fun? That is Zosh. He's riding morphine a million miles away. Okay, now come on, you. You can't make it stick, copper, never. Uh, leave me your handcuffs, will you, Captain? What are you going to do? Perform an experiment. Whatever you say. Thank you. And come back here as soon as you can. And then began the heartbreaking vigil. The boy dozed on the floor alone in a world of drugged enchantment. I tied his feet together, restrained the thin wrists with Beresford handcuffs. By the time the captain got back, Zash was conscious. Normally defiant and belligerent. Think I'm going to spill anything to you guys? You're nuts. We've got lots of time, Zosh. By five in the morning, he was white-faced and pleading. Listen, Moto. I've got two decks with me. The three of us can jump together. Come on, Captain. There's a needle in a box in my pocket. Please. No, Zosh. No. By seven, he was crying. By ten, he was screaming. <laughs> By noon, he was suffering unbelievably. The hacking attic's cough racked at his frail lungs. A thousand devils tore at every whip-lashed, quivering nerve. I'm dying, I tell you. I'm dying, dying, dying! At one in the afternoon, he talked. Names, addresses, everything. Captain Beresford took it down. And then... Because we were afraid complete withdrawal might kill him, we called a doctor. The doctor gave him two grains in his right arm. As always, the results appalled me. As the morphine hit, his eyes became dewy bright. The glow of health returned to his cheeks. He went quite happily with the doctor to Bellevue. I wish every kid in America could have seen that. If they knew what it could do, they'd... Oh, it's so rotten. Yes. Well, take 20 men to the Long Island house. You will catch Dr. Holliston doing the converting. Send another detail to raid the warehouse in the Bronx. Right. Oh, and what about Arrington? Mr. Arrington I shall deal with 
personally. In the Fifth Avenue house? Yes. He really moves quite slowly. He injured his hip as a boy. I shall step out of the elevator with a gun in one hand and this in the other. What is it, a knife? In Japan, it is the national form of honorable suicide. Literally translated, it means belly cut. You know it better, perhaps, as Harakiri. <laughs> I'm a cripple. I, I, I... Sign it. No. Now take that knife away from my eyelids. Harrington, there is no time for discussion. I, I have a right to, to a trial, a, a free democratic trial. Harrington, before... you have no rights at all. This morning I watched a boy suffer agonies. But what is the use of telling you? You know. In five seconds I shall go to work with this knife. <laughs> Believe me, you will not enjoy it. I, listen, now. One, I... two... You're insane, you're three, four. All right, all right, I will. I will, for heaven's sake, take that knife away from my eyelids. Sign it. Thank you. And now, before I take you to Captain Bennis, but one question. Why? What is behind this monstrous inhumanity? You've no idea. Short of pathological insanity, none. I... I'm a Eurasian. You... You're what? Yes. I'm surprised you didn't guess. I really look very white, don't I? I'm gifted, educated. But I committed an unpardonable sin. My mother was a Singhalese peasant. I knew it. I knew there must be something. White Asiatics forbid my cleaning toilets... They also forbid me to enter their clubs or their homes. I'm neither white nor yellow nor black. I'm not a European. I'm not an Asiatic. What am I? Tell me. It is so useless to beat against... Useless? The... It's hell. I'm nothing. A wandering, hopeless, marginal man. Outside of a barefoot, savage, peasant girl, there isn't one woman in Asia who would marry me. If I marry a white woman here and take her to Singapore, what do I let her in for? Insults, heartbreak, misery. I want to live in the East. Singapore is the only civilized city in the world, but I can't, I can't, I can't join their stinking bourgeois club. But Arrington, democracy... Democracy, I spit at it! I hate it! I hate the world! But don't you see it is this... Do you know how I was crippled? A gang of melees beat my hip to a pulp in a Singapore street fight. Hate... Moto, you don't know the meaning of the world. And every grain of morphine in the veins of an American boy means one less enemy for communism, and I don't care who the boy is. You must care. I don't, not even for Zosh. Zosh? Zosh is my son! Well, now you know. Now you can take me down to your police station and introduce me to justice. Do you know why she's pictured with a bandage over her eyes? Because of justice could see she'd throw up. Mr. Moto, we've done it. Twenty-six indictments and charging conspiracy to import opium. We've got every single one of them. And recover the opium? Over five hundred tons of it. Good. Then the smoke screen has lifted. But I have one of my own. But surely everything is quite, quite clear. That whiskey Arrington gave you the night of the party. Why didn't you drink it? He had to be dramatic. He told me it was Hanfield Royal Ark Special Rye. It so happened it is distilled in England. During the war, the warehouse was bombed. All but five cases of Hanfield Royal Ark were destroyed. They never manufactured that particular blend again. But Arrington is wealthy. Wasn't it possible? No, he... no, no. Of the five remaining cases, Sir Graham Hanfield gave three to King Farouk of Egypt as a wedding gift on the occasion of his first marriage. Don't tell me that the other two were... Yes. In return for a trifling service some years ago, Sir Graham gave them to me. <laughs> Moto, you're incredible. Don't you ever make a mistake? Sometimes, sometimes I wince and lash out inside. 
when people call me a dirty Jap. I was born in San Francisco. I am as American as you are. No, but surely these people are... Uh... Well, they're... That is true. They are ignorant and narrow, and their number is decreasing. Yes, I think we're growing up. Slowly, maybe, but growing. I hope it is not too slowly. I hope we achieve maturity before it is too late. That is one way everybody can fight communism. Simply by growing up and out of prejudice. It is a battle in which every one of us can be... A soldier. You have just heard the world's greatest international secret agent, Mr. I. A. Moto, in Smokescreen. James Monk starred as Mr. Moto. The script was written and directed by Harry W. Junkin. Produced by Carol Irwin. Others in the cast were Ross Martin, Bob Haig, Bernard Grant, and Edwin Bruce. The music was transcribed. This is Fred Collins speaking, and here with a preview of next week's story is Mr. I. A. Moto. The poet Sain Chua has written... A man who lives a falsehood must each day die a little. Next week, the story of truth twisted. A journey into horror made by a gracious woman and her desperate son, both caught in a sickening web of blackmail. And now may sleep fall upon your eyes as softly as poppy petals on a placid pool. May your soul be blessed with repose, your dreams with enchantment. <laughs>